gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak, for hire. says, Pat Novak for hire. You don't get in the blue book that way, but you don't embarrass your friends either. Because down in the waterfront in San Francisco, they don't separate the good and the bad. They let them run together, and before long you got a caste system. You're either alive or dead. If you're on top, you keep fading the crowd and trying for sevens until you lose the dice. It's about the only way to play it, unless you like worms. I rent boats and do anything else that'll put a fast handle on a buck. But it doesn't always work out because down here all your luck is junior grade and trouble is trumps. I found that out Tuesday night. It was the first time I ever saw Reuben Calloway and the last time, too, if you like to keep a tidy record. It was about 7 o'clock and I'd just started back across the bay from Sausalito. You could still see Mount Tamalpais squatting on the Marin shore. Light brown near the top, but dark and black farther down, like a cupcake that's been in the oven a little too long. A low fog was beginning to squeeze in on the far side, so I kicked in the searchlight, and that's when I picked him up. He was struggling feebly with his face near the water, and he was almost bald, so that when the light hit him, he looked like a cantaloupe that somebody got tired of. I pulled alongside and started to haul him aboard. He brought most of the bay with him. Help me! Please help me. Yeah, well, we'd like to get a hold of you, will you? Come on. There. Sit down. No, here. Lean against the gunnel. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Is the water red or you've been shot a little? Do you have to know everything? No, it's your load. Carry it, mister. Yeah. Move your feet. i got to get us ashore. If you like it, go ahead. But don't hurry for me. Well, if you feel that way about it, pick another spot to die in. Go back in the bay where you'll have company. You've got to help me. I want you to... Get in touch with a girl named Alma Biggs. Yeah? You'll find her at the Empire Club out on Geary Street. My name's Reuben Calloway. Tell her about me. She'll pay you for it. What she do, collect bodies? Just give her this key. It's for a locker down in the bus station. Now look, Pop, you don't know me. Suppose I use the key. You can't spend it. You better take the money. All right. Just see, Alma, and tell her it didn't work out. It didn't work out for me at all. I guess that's right. Huh? On the big things, you're 100%. I don't need a check. Oh. Here, set up. I told you I don't want you dying in here. Stop beefing, fella. You don't have all the bad luck. <laughs> I must have sent a fast chariot because when I leaned over, the guy was dead. And he was working hard at it, too. He was a skinny little guy, all bent up and twisted in the bottom of the boat like an old paper clip. It wouldn't do any good to straighten him out because he wasn't going to sleep easy. His eyes were open and rolling around at the sky as if he was on the make for a star. And the skin hung loose around his face so that when you touched it, it felt like an empty baked potato. I pushed him into a corner and started for Pier 19. When I got there, I hauled him on the dock and went down to call homicide. Must have been about 8.30 when I took a cab out to the Empire Club. It was a gambling joint out on Geary Street where they cut their whiskey and cards in different rooms. I asked a guy at the window if he knew Alma Biggs, and he pointed her out by the roulette table. She was wearing a white satin evening gown. As I walked up behind her... 
I noticed she moved in rhythm with the roulette wheel. It was interesting. If it had been a merry-go-round, they'd have pinched her. I squeezed in next to her at the table, and I was thinking of trying it again when she started to talk. It's a tight fit. Are you sure you like it? I'm not going to stay long. That's what Rudolph Hess said. Make your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Gamblers, make your bets. Stake me, Alma. I can't afford you, darling. Well, go broke for Reuben Calloway, then. Four on the red. Mm, I ought to keep you for luck, darling. Will you comb your hair? I'll take the chips. They'd look bad on Calloway. Oh. It's too crowded here. Let's find a closet. All right. Did he look pretty? For a fish, he was all right. How are you? Pat Novak. I picked him up in the bay. He said to look you up and tell you it didn't work out. Hmm. That would please Turk. Yeah? Who's Turk? The reason it didn't work out. Is that all, Mr. Novak? Except for a key. It fits a bus station locker here. You keep it, Mr. Novak. It won't buy anything. Now, look, sweetheart, I picked up your boy and dried him out, but that's all. We were small friends at best, so the services stopped. You can come to a slow stop for $200. Just take the key and pick up what's in that locker. I'll get it from you later. Yeah. I'll meet you in an hour. Where's a good place? Your apartment? Well, it's a place. I'll find it in a book. I hope you don't mind. No, the thin walls will save me. What's in the locker? What would it prove? Proves you got a small mouth, Angel. Unless you're going to kiss it, don't worry. 9.30 then? All right. I'll bring the 200 with me. Don't worry about the dough. Oh? Because I scooped your chips off the table. See you later. She stood there watching me as I walked over to the cashier's window. Oh, she gave you a nice warm feeling like a Bunsen burner in the middle of your back. And as she stood there in the center of the floor smiling, you knew she could turn a glacier into a steam bath at 400 yards. A nice little mouse that made you want to go home and test all the old traps. Well, I cashed in her chips and the boy at the window shoved out 200 rocks and a pained look as if he'd just handed over his right lung. I got a cab and rode down to the bus station at 7th and Market. There were a few people sitting at the counter and a couple of old men on the benches waiting for somebody to get up and leave the funny papers. I went over near the wall and opened up the locker. It was a long trip for a small package. It was a square manila envelope and it was an address up in the corner. Reuben Calloway, photographer. I squeezed the envelope and it felt like photographs, but I wasn't sure. I started to close the locker when I turned and then I tumbled for the first time. It's like getting a drop of rain on your hand before you ever look up at the sky. The two of them were standing over by the cigar counter watching me. A guy with a heavy overcoat and a little small guy about the size of a hangnail. It wouldn't do any good to sit down because I knew they'd stay until somebody condemned the building, so I walked past him out onto the street. There was a cab standing right in front. Cab, mister? Yeah. Swing up toward the St. Francis, will you? Yeah. Now, look, you're going to be tailed, so brush up on your alleys. If you like it that way. Hey, you were supposed to take a left there on mission. I got a license. Where's yours? I told you to double back over market. Look, get out and walk if you don't like it. I've been bought, mister. Oh, my two friends. That's right. You should have come first. I ought to part your hair. You got more chance with them. Here we are. Where are you going? You like alleys. That's what you're going to get. Yeah. Take it easy, fella. You're not going anywhere. You were nice while you lasted. Take it easy. You better walk off a wall. They'll block the alley. See? Crowded alley, huh? Yeah. Give me the envelope so we can all get out. Can Junior help you? Give me the envelope. There. Now let's see it. Yeah, it's still sealed. You all through? I don't know. I'll see. You like him, Joe? No. That's the way it is, mister. He'll like you. <laughs> I slid down like an old sock on a bony leg. I rolled over a couple of times and tried to stand up, but it wasn't easy. You might as well try to find a hair in a bowl of chop suey. Well, it began to rain, and I figured it'd be easier to float out to the street, so I went to sleep. 
When I woke up, the rain hadn't helped the alley much. It's like washing your kid's face and finding out he was ugly to start with. The mud had washed up against the walls, and there was a thick, sour smell. And down the alley, across the street, there was a part of a sign sticking out that said, Eats. And that isn't what you felt like at all. I started groping around to get up, and my hand hit the pictures. They were scattered all over like clothes in a boarding school. I picked them up and started for the street. On the way up in the cab, I got a chance to look at them, and they didn't make sense. There were six of them, and they were all just about the same, a bunch of mob scenes of that fire over in Oakland. I didn't have time to figure it out because the cab pulled up in front of the St. Francis, and I went in to call Alma Biggs and tell her the party was off. Part of that alley must have come with me because when I walked into the lobby, the doorman looked at me as if I'd just blown up a nunnery. I tried the number once, but nobody answered. I decided to wait 20 minutes and call again. That was a mistake because I just got in the booth and started to dial and somebody started rapping on the door with a nickel. It was Hellman from Homicide. Hello, Novak. Come on out. You can't get a date in that suit. What do you want, Hellman? Come on out. Oh, you're a hard man to find. Well, you don't look in the right places. I'm a family man. Tell me about the dead guy. I don't know, Hellman. He died in my boat. That's all I know. He didn't say anything? Just sentimental stuff. His name's Reuben Calloway. Somebody threw him in the bay without instructions. I don't know a thing about him except he takes pictures. Yeah? Oh, wipe off the drool. They're not your kind. Who are his friends? He's got new ones by now. I don't know, Hellman. How about that guy up in your couch? Huh? I just left your place. How about that guy on the couch? There's a gal up there, but that's all. Does she wear suspenders? Huh? Then take my word, it's a man. And you're going to tell me he's dead, Hellman? No, I'm not going to tell you he's dead, Novak. He may be a soft breather. When Hellman mentioned the stiff up at my place, I knew we were going to be in low gear the rest of the night because Hellman isn't an easy guy. He wouldn't give his wife an aspirin if she had concussion of the brain. He took me out the side door and we rode up to my apartment. The dead guy was lying on the couch with his arms across his chest as if he wanted somebody to give him a lily or a way out of this. The lamp was shining down in his face and the light was distorted, but when you stood over him, you could see his face with the color of pressed seaweed. If he had anything to be happy about, you couldn't tell, because his mouth was open and hung over to one side like a loose change purse filled with old teeth. His clothes were rumpled and his shirt was open at his neck. You could see a chain around his neck and a silver medal in the dull light against his chest. It looked out of place and made you feel funny, like seeing a picture of a Madonna in a bowling alley. I watched him while Hellman made noise. He still looks like a man. Yeah? Who is he? George Leggett. What does that prove? Who his mother was. We're checking for a record. The gun, too. What gun? One was lying here on the floor. I want to know if it's the same gun that killed Reuben Calloway. Well, you'll need some prints. Anybody can buy a handkerchief. Where were you tonight? In an alley down near Mission Street. You like it down there? It's all right. You'd like it. I got shoved in and pushed around for these pictures. They don't look like the right kind of pictures. Well, I can't explain that, Hellman. Maybe they took the good ones. How do you fit in? Calloway gave me a key to a locker down on the bus station. It was for a girl named Alma Biggs. And the girl sent you down? That's right, with 200 bucks of running money. If you want to know about Calloway, look up a guy named Turk. Turk what? I don't know, Hellman. Maybe he's only got one name. Maybe the other was Stinker. You got a police file? Look him up. The girl mentioned him. That's all I know. We'll look him up. But I'm not going to forget you. One guy's dead on Pier 19. Another up here in your apartment. You mixed up, Novak. There's a connection. I'll shop around till I strike it. You couldn't strike oil on a filling station. You got a double murder shop for a pair of people. I'll shop far enough to get you, big shot. Far enough to see you fry. Well, you got the lard for it, Hellman. <laughs> if you keep your mouth shut now, you can hold in the blood. Oh, uh, Hellman talking. Yeah? Where'd you find out? <laughs> That'd make it easier. You sure the same gun killed them both? Yeah. Yeah, I'll be in. Well? Huh? Oh. Wrong number, Novak. They didn't give Hellman a sense of humor. They gave him a loud laugh instead. When he walked out of my place, he was smiling like a funny man who's just exposed Santa Claus. I didn't feel very funny myself. I took another look at those pictures, and I was as mixed up as a guy with a Mexican divorce. They were just ordinary pictures of a fire in Oakland. What made them so important? I was sure that Gunsel had taken some pictures, but... Well, 
Were they any different than those? And why was Alma Biggs afraid to pick them up? And who was a guy named Turk? I was full of questions, but no answers, like some guy at a peace conference. If I went over it anymore, I'd be counting my toes. So I got out of there and looked up Jocko Madigan. Oh, he's a good guy, and he was a smart one, too, until he decided the only way you can get a good trade-in on hard luck is with a bottle of whiskey. I found him at Emilio's bar, patting Bill, the bartender, on the back with one hand and pouring jiggers of gin with the other. At the table down at Murray's in the place where Louis dwells. Jocko. Ba, ba, ba. Gentlemen, songsters off on a spree, doing from here to its end. Jocko, I want to talk to you. Shh, Patsy, I'm driving a Harvard man crazy. He's at the end of the bar. And stop drinking and listen to me. I've got to keep on drinking, Patsy, if I want to preserve any continuity in my life, because I don't drink to forget, but rather to remember. To remember all the pleasant events of my life. Uh, there were two of them, I think. All right, Jocko. The first was a girl. I met many twilights ago, and the second was a summer night in St. Louis when a bartender felt crazed with the heat and set him up on the house. Will you stop it? I'm in trouble. Memory is a blessed toy, Patsy. But you have to be careful because it can be dangerous, like uh, giving a rifle to a small child for Christmas. It's true he can get some temporary pleasure out of it by shooting various neighbors, but sooner or later he's going to kill the only rich relative in the family. Jocko, I'm tired. And memory is the same way. So you're entitled to collect the few good ones you have. You're allowed to straighten them out and put them in order. After all, an old pool ball gets racked now and then. You all through? Yes. I, I've run out of memories. Hellman thinks I killed two guys ten miles apart. Wasn't it difficult? The same murder gun. The whole thing is tied up with some pictures. In uh, color? A guy by the name of Reuben Calloway died in my boat. He gave me a key to a locker downtown. The pictures were there. Is that one of them? Yeah. Take a look. Oh, uh, if it's a group picture, they were a very unruly family. It's the Oakland Fire. Two Gunsels followed me and took some of the pictures. In the meantime, some guy got shot in my place. Everybody's after the pictures. Why? Have you seen the other pictures? No, I took an intermission. That's why you got to help. Now, you'll find Reuben Calloway's address in the phone booth. Get up there and go through his stuff, will you? It doesn't sound legal. Neither's a bum murder rap. Get up there and go through his pictures. Try to find anything that'll fit in with his set. Where are you going besides jail? I got to find a gal named Alma Biggs. Oh, you'll have trouble with a name like that. She's probably changed it. The locker key was tabbed for her, but she hired me to run her errands. Is she pretty? Yes, if you like a fast track. Now get up there, Jocko. Why can't I see her? Will you stop it, Jocko? Just get up there. Forget about her. She'd scare you to death. Yes. Well, at least I'd die hopeful. Good night, lover. <laughs> Finding Alma Biggs was quite a job. I knew she was around, but I couldn't get to her. It was like trying to get a peanut shell out of a back tooth. I called the Empire Club, but they didn't know anything about her. I went through all the phone books and the city directories, and I didn't get anything but a sore thumb. Well, I didn't do any better with the hotels. I sat in lupos and called them all one by one, and by one o'clock I knew more desk clerks than a vice squad cop, but no Alma Biggs. Finally, I went out to the Empire Club and started talking to the cabbies. About 15 minutes later, one pulled up and remembered taking a girl in a satin evening gown up to an apartment on the hill. I called Hellman and rode up there to check the names. Alma Biggs had an apartment on the second floor. I knocked on the door and she didn't answer, so I tried it. The lights were out, so I closed the door and groped over to the desk. I should have noticed the draperies as I passed because they were full of people. <laughs> Wait a minute. All right, now. Wait a minute, Mr. Nilfax. Stop breaking things. One day you may want to mend me. Uh, do you always sleep in the curtains? Do you always talk this long in the dark? Turn on the light. Yeah. I wanted to see who you were. George Leggett, maybe. Oh, do you know him? We're roommates. He died on my couch tonight. Anything serious or just humdrum death? He's satisfied. What do you know about him? Well, I never heard anybody say a bad thing about him. Of course, I never heard anybody mention him. Now, look, Angel, it's late. Who's George Leggett? Why do you care? Because homicide cares. They got Calloway and Leggett back to back, and they want my skin. Mm, it's a nice skin, darling. Where are the pictures? Unless you're a social worker, you're not going to like them here. Let me see. They're not all here. Yeah, I figured that. Where are the other pictures, Patsy? In some Goniff's album. 
two of them jumped me down near Mission Street. Who are they? We never got that friendly. Well, there couldn't have been two of them. Well, maybe the little guy was just window dressing, but he gave the right answers. Patsy, I think you're a liar. You're nicer than homicide. I want those pictures. You do. Well, I'm going to take them away from you. Well, if I had them, that's a big enough gun to do it. Get the pictures, Patsy. It's a bad time for murder, Angel. Homicide's working this week. I haven't time, Patsy. I'll push you down like a blade of grass. Get the pictures. Now, look, sweetheart. I took a job for 200 bucks. It covers a tandem murder rap and a sapping down on Mission Street, but it won't cover big talk from you. Now, put the gun away or I'll bend you hard. Don't move up when you talk. You're around behind. Come on, give it to me. No. Up it, Patsy. Feels good. Let it go or take the pain. Drop it. You don't have to hang on. I'm not a barbell. Now, you're handy now. Who's Turk? Stop it. You're hurting my arm. There's a guy named Turk. I want to know who he is. Late for that. Who is he? Go ahead, tear it off, and you'll die ignorant. Yeah. You sound blue, Novak. Oh, what do you want, Hellman? I want to give you a reason. We got the coroner's report on George Leggett. Yeah? He died in your apartment. The blood off your carpet looks good on these slides. All right, so the murderer sold me the rug. So what, Hellman? So we ran down George Leggett's record. A Detroit gunman who got out here six weeks ago. Yeah? He traveled for years with a guy named Turk Spaniel. Now, that's your boy. You better find him. We already have. Don't tell me he's up on the couch. He was born too soon for you. We checked with the Detroit police. What'd they say? They know all about Turk Spaniel. He was killed nine years ago in West Detroit. But they found the guy that did it and sent him up to Lansing for life. Yeah? Yeah. He was a guy named Joe Biggs. Say hello to your girlfriend. <laughs> Well, I didn't talk to the girl because I knew she'd close up faster than a Dublin meat market on Friday. I left her and went down to the Chronicle morgue to find out what I could about Turk Spaniel. Hellman had covered it. Spaniel talked too much and Joe Biggs killed him and left him growing out of a ditch like an old weed. I didn't know where to turn now. With Turk gone, who was after those pictures besides Alma Biggs and what did they prove? I knew the answer was there. Probably in plain sight, like a blimp on a football field, but I couldn't get near it. It was past two when I got back to my apartment and the phone was screaming for help. Yeah. Hello, Patsy. This is Jocko. What'd you find out? That Callaway was quite a photographer. Yeah? You should see some of the pictures. Ooh, I'm in love with you. All right, Jocko. Did you find anything? There's a check for a thousand dollars from Alma Bates. Yeah, what else? Some more pictures of the Oakland fire. One of them looks good. Yeah. It's just like the rest, except in the background, something is circled with a red pencil. That'll do it, Jocko. And there's a clipping here with another picture. I can't tell, but I think they match. What's it say? Well, it's all about... Jocko, what's the matter? Are you all right, Jocko? Jocko, you all right? He says to tell you no. After Jocko's call, I grabbed a cab and rode up to Calloway's apartment. When I got there, Jocko was sitting in the middle of the floor as sad as a steer on a sheep ranch. He hadn't seen who hit him, and the picture was gone, so was the clipping. I asked him if there were any negatives around. He said no. That meant that somebody was still on the prowl for those negatives. So I called Hellman and briefed him. He said he'd meet us at Reuben Calloway's studio in ten minutes. When we got there, it was dark, but I sensed Hellman in the back room. Turned out to be a couple of pans of acid, but Hellman was there going over the negatives. All this guy did was take pictures. Let me take a look, will you, Hellman? Can you spot the right one here, Jocko? Hold him up to the light. All right. Here are the fire pictures. Uh, how about this one? No, no, I had that one. Yeah, that's it. And, and this fellow back here is the one that was circled. Hold it up so I can see. Hello, Turk. You waited too long. Give me the picture, mister. All that gun will do is make noise, Spaniel. It won't make enough to keep a secret. Just hand me the picture. Somebody knows you're alive now. The picture's for laughs. It's your word against mine. And I'll be so far away I can't hear the argument. Let's have it. Don't give it to him, Novak. Yeah, I'll give it to him. You take it away, Hellman. Thanks, Novak. That alley taught you manners. Just stand over there. I want to remember the way you looked. Don't worry. I'll tell you about them, Turk. Huh? Keep backing into this gun. It's going to show around your breastbone. Well, guns are getting cheap. You better drop yours, Spaniel. Over there. Hmm. You look the same, Turk, or almost the same. You got this all wrong, Alma. Joe doesn't look the same. Nine years in the cooler and you lose your personality. 
Please, Alma, don't do anything crazy. After nine years, you lose almost everything. Joe's lost everything but me. Down on the floor, Spaniel. I want you on your knees. Please. Alma, you got it wrong. I got it all right, Turk. Because Joe wouldn't lie to me. When he said he didn't kill you, I knew you were alive. Please, Alma. Down on the floor beside the table. Go easy, baby. You got a copper here. I can't hurt him, Novak. Turk Spaniel's legally dead. All you can do to a dead man is kick up the dust. Please, Alma. You're not seeing this right. I'm going to have a better chance than you. You couldn't see, Spaniel. You couldn't see your way back to help Joe out. You look good on your knees. Over by the table. Leave that asshole alone, sweetheart. I'm going to help him see. With a whole pan full of it. I'm going to help you see, Spaniel. Please. Please, Alma. You wouldn't do that? You got the short end of the bat. You better look at him, Jocko. Don't bother, unless you're a baby doctor. We may need you, lady. Not for this copper. Remember, Turk Spaniel's dead. Detroit says so. He looks live now. He can't be dead there and live here. I like your climate, but it's not that good. You can't see me, Turk. But I'll bet you can hear me walk out of here. Goodbye, Turk. I'll send you a cane. Hellman managed to get most of the story out of Turk Spaniel. Reuben Calloway stumbled into the whole thing and he didn't know what hit him. He went over to Oakland to take some pictures of the fire and he got a picture of Spaniel in the crowd. Spaniel saw him and trailed him over to this side. He had to get the pictures because back in Detroit he'd framed Joe Biggs with a riddled up body and skipped out of the country. He'd been away until a few weeks ago and Now he was waiting for a boat out of San Francisco, so he had to stay dead. He sent George Leggett after the pictures, but Leggett figured it was a good way to double-cross him and stay in the clear, so he tipped off Alma Biggs, who'd come out here on a lead a few weeks before. Turk finally tumbled. With a local gunstall, he killed Calloway and left Leggett in my apartment where he trailed him. (laughs) It almost worked out, but he didn't get to that shop in time. Well, Hellman asked only one question. When I first met her, did I know that Alma Biggs was that hard? No. In that satin evening gown, I didn't think so. The American Broadcasting Company has just brought you the fifth of a new series, Fat Novak, for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Fat Novak is produced and directed by William P. Rousseau. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. In our cast were Yvonne Fady, Charles McGraw, Herb Butterfield, and Herb Ellis. This program is being released to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Be with us again next week when over most of these same ABC stations, we will bring you Pat Novak for Hire. This program came to you from Hollywood. Now, a brief reminder. There is no mystery to this statement. Wherever they serve, at home or abroad, the men who wear the uniform of the United States are men of whom we can be proud. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. All of them serve our country and us with pride and honor. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. of California, on behalf of standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. 
If you need the kind of help you couldn't get from a cautious man, then you've got a job for me. George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, you may have forgotten the one time we met. You were the best man at my wedding. Yes, I'm Joe Burke's wife. You won't believe what's happened to him. Easygoing, happy-go-lucky Joe. He's a pitiful mental case, and they've got him in a sanitarium. You were so close to Joe in the army, I thought maybe if he saw you again, it might do more than the doctors have been able to do. I thought of this when I saw your ad in the paper, like a ray of hope. Won't you try to help me? It signed anxiously, Laura Burke. Joe, a mental case? Oh, no, not the Sergeant Burke I knew. Well, George's wife would hardly make up anything like this. But Brooksy at Palermo, when everybody else was either cussing or praying, that hard-headed Irishman just sat around playing a harmonica. Danny boy. It's funny I never heard you talk about him. Well, you know how those things are, Angel. You swear on your G.I. dog tag that you're going to be sure to keep in touch with each other, but as Tempest fugits, all lang syne becomes just the name of a song. But you were his best man. This kid, Laura, came down to camp. We hopped a jeep over to the chaplain, and it took 15 minutes for the tender vows. A minute for me to kiss the bride, and they were off. All Joe had was a 48-hour pass. Golly, she sounds so desperate in this letter. Yeah. What's that address, Brooksy? We'd better get right over there. Maybe it's only one chance in a thousand. I had to turn to you, Mr. Valentine. The name is George, remember? He's in that place, getting worse every day. How he doesn't even recognize me. Laura, we do want to help you. But, honey, you're making it so much harder. Here, sit down. I'm sorry. I know this is tough on you, Laura, but try to tell us the whole thing from the beginning. How did this happen to Joe? When? About a month ago, they brought him home from Egypt. Egypt? What was he doing there? Well, after he got out of the army, he got a job with an export company, Kessling Limited. The money was so good he couldn't refuse it. He planned to keep it for two years so so he could put some money aside. Oh, it must have been terrible being separated again. Did Joe uh, begin to lose his grip while he was abroad? Oh, he sent letters regularly, wonderful, cheerful letters about the future. And a couple of months ago, he stopped writing. Yes, Laura? And then, then one day he walked in... Dr. Tarouk. Wait a minute. Who's Dr. Tarouk? Some kind of psychiatrist the company sent back with Joe to take care of him. Mr. Kessling, he's the president of the company. He's been very kind. What did they say happened? Some kind of an explosion outside the city. Joe happened to be around, and when he came to in the hospital, he... he, he... Now, take it easy, Laura. Hey, you want to knock off and have a cup of coffee? No, go on. I'm all right. I'll never forget it. Dr. Tarouk left us alone for a minute. Joe just stood there. Right where you are. Looking at me. Looking through me. He tried to talk, but it seemed to hurt too much, so he just kept staring and staring. Oh, George. Yeah. He took a box of face powder from his pocket and handed it to me. Powder? I guess he meant it as a gift. So pathetic. A box of cheap powder. It was horrible to watch. Okay, Laura. I think we've heard enough to begin with. Uh, where have they got Joe? The Hillcrest Sanitarium. His company's paying all the expenses, and Dr. Daruk says in time he hopes Joe will be all right. Yeah. But he's getting worse, you see. I, I thought if you saw him and talked to him, maybe... Maybe by some miracle he'd begin to remember things. He thought so much of I you. I know. All right, Laura. You want to come along with us? No, I... I always seem to upset him. Okay. Yeah, Claire and I'll drop in on Joe. And he's hoping it'll do some good. A sanitarium should have peace and quiet, but they should build it where people can find it. Yes, it is out of the way. Gosh, and every time I look down into that valley, I get dizzy. Kind of unusual, isn't it, Brooksy? What? A company going to quite so much trouble for one of their people. A sanitarium special psychiatrist who seems to stay on and on. Well, darling, maybe the milk of human kindness doesn't curdle as easily as most people think. Ah, uh, maybe not. Brooksy, I've been in some tough spots. But I think seeing Joe like this is going to be just about the toughest. In dealing with the mind, Mr. Valentine, 
One is never sure what will be good or bad for the patient. Yeah, I think I know what you mean, Dr. Turok. Perhaps this visit from a dear friend out of the past may do Mr. Burke a world of good. However, on the other hand... Will we be able to see him soon? In a few moments. But perhaps it would be wiser for a young lady like you, Miss Brooks, not to see him at all. Huh? There are just a few things I want to know, Doctor, before... Uh, Dr. Turok... Uh... Oh, Rodney, will you come here? Yes, this imposing but very competent gentleman is the male nurse I've hired to be with Mr. Burke when it is impossible for me to be present. Oh, yeah. He's acting quiet now, Doctor. Good. Very good. We can go in uh, this way, Mr. Valentine, Miss Brooks. Okay. There he is. Hey, Joe. Danny boy. <laughs> Don't you have anything to say for yourself? What did you do? Lose your harmonica? <laughs> oh, George. Yeah. Rodney, wipe Mr. Burke's forehead. Yes, Doctor. You can see, Mr. Valentine, what an effort it costs your friend to try to speak. I'm not blind, Doctor. Mm. Permit me to explain... The blow he must have received in that accident has injured the tiny wires that crisscross in the brain. His thoughts cannot get through a form of motor aphasia. Well, that's good to know, but it doesn't help Joe. Doctor, does he know what we're talking about? I am quite sure he does not. You see, the wires of the brain that are blocked make it more difficult for him to get his thoughts through. The theory is... Okay, doctor, but look... Uh, yes, Mr. Valentine. I'm quite sure you're a very competent psychiatrist, but I... I know you won't mind if I have Dr. Hunter, a friend of mine, come in and have a look at Joe. Just a consultation. Very well. If you feel that way. And it might help to look a little more into that accident. Anything to help your friend, Mr. Valentine. Uh, Rodney. Yes, doctor? The other case downstairs I was so interested in, I think the crisis may come even before I expected. Uh, would you mind being there to do what is necessary... Then let me know exactly what happens. Huh? I'll take care of everything, Good. Dr. Turok. Try talking to him again, George. Hey, look, you big oaf. Stop holding on to me. You know who I am. Hey, we got a lot of old times to talk about. You know me, Valentine. <laughs> oh, I suppose it's no use. Hey, how is it, Dr. Tarouf, that Joe was able to walk when he came home to his wife, and now he's flat on his back and can't use his hands or his legs? I thought he was being cured. It is my hope to arrest the progress of the paralysis. Yeah? To shield him from emotional disturbances. Rid his mind of fear. Fear? What fear? Joe was never afraid of anything in his life. This is a different kind of fear. The fear of becoming a mental basket case with no future and no hope. Oh, cut it out, Doctor. Mr. Valentine, I was just stating the facts. <laughs> And to hold from this day forward till death us do part. What are you trying to say, Don? I'm just the best man with a photographic memory. Oh, I know how you feel about Joe this and Laura. Isn't death, Brooksy, those two should be together. Something's got to be done about it. Look, do yourself a favor, George, and listen to me. This is something you don't know anything about. You're no psychiatrist. No, no, you listen to me, Angel. I know Joe looks as though his head was full of nuts and bolts, but he recognized me. What do you mean? We used to have a way of winking at each other, just to say, keep your skin on, brother. This man's war will be over someday. Well? Well, that's what he was giving me back there. I know it. Are you sure you aren't imagining something you want to believe? I don't care for that oily Dr. Brooksy, and I care less for that overgrown meatball Rodney hovering over Joe every minute of the day. I just have a feeling he's not getting the right chance. You can't let it be a question of feelings, darling. Believe me. George! Wow. Golly, me too. Oh, a fine place to get a blowout. A few more yards and we would have gone pitching into that valley. Let's hey, wait see. a minute, Brooksy. Don't open that door. Get down. George, what's the matter with you? Maybe that wasn't a blowout. What? Just playing safe. Well, there doesn't seem to be anyone around now. You stay where you are, Angel. I'll take a look-see. Did you find anything? Yeah. A neat bullet hole in our tire. What? Somebody shot at us from those rocks up there. But who could it be? It'd have to be somebody who knew we'd be coming back this way. Brilliant deduction, Brooksy. But we'll go into that later. Right now, we fix a flat and then get back to town. Hello? Yes, he's here, 
Oh, just huh? a moment. It's Walker, financial editor of the Bulletin, Good, returning yeah. your call. Good. Yeah, uh-huh. You, uh, hold it a second, Walker, huh? Look, Claire, take this down as I give it to you. Okay. Go on, shoot. Uh-huh, yeah. Kessling, export and import, fine $50,000 six weeks ago, smuggling, diamonds... What? ...and a shipment of face powder. Since then, out of business, gave up corporate charter. Yeah, thank you, Walker. That was very helpful. Goodbye. George, what have we gotten into? A very touching little situation, Brooksy. The great big corporate heart of Kessling Limited bleeding for one of its employees was hurt. Yeah. In fact, it keeps on bleeding now, long after it ceased to exist. Because it was caught smuggling diamonds, no less. Well, how do you think Joe fits into all this? I don't know yet. But right now, we're picking up Dr. Hunter and going back to Hillcrest Sanitarium. Let him take a look at Joe. <laughs> Yeah, Doc. What'd you find out, Dr. Hunter? I took a good look at your friend, George, and had a long talk with Dr. Taruk. Well, Frank? In Taruk's place, I, uh, I'd i have to diagnose the case exactly as he has. Oh. Motor aphasia. Now, progressive paralysis. The whole thing apparently started from some severe shock. I see. Well, now I don't know what to do. His wife told me if we found anything wrong to get him out of here. He's getting all the proper care, as far as I can see. Frankly, I wouldn't suggest that he be moved in his present condition. Okay. Okay, Frank, you know what you know and I know what I know. Now, Maybe George... I'm wrong about Taruk as a doctor, I mean. But there are too many other things wrong about this setup, including that bullet in my tire. Yes, and I still say Joe Burke was winking at me. <laughs> We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about the great American pastime. Batter up, it's baseball season again. And here's a seasonal gift for you. It's a 48-page handbook of baseball. The title is Batter Up. To get your free copy, just ask for Batter Up at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station. This guide to baseball fundamentals was written by Bert Dunn, former pro. It has 45 illustrations and photos. Boys will be keen about it. Batter Up tells how to play each position, pitching, catching, fielding, and how to bat. Girls will go for the chapter on softball. Lefty O'Doul of the San Francisco Seals and Joe Cronin of the Boston Red Sox give their views in this grand book. Another article was written by Clarence Rowland, president of the Pacific Coast League. Here's baseball written by a recognized authority. Get your free copy tomorrow. Batter Up is available at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, you go through the war with a fellow who becomes your buddy... You lose sight of him, and suddenly his wife shows up saying he's in a sanitarium, a mental case. You try to see what it's all about, a bullet comes at you from nowhere. More than that, you're told your buddy is getting the best possible care. You're not convinced, so you decide to dig deeper. In George's case, that means going with Claire to the customs service to have a chat with one of the agents. Well, there really isn't much to it, Mr. Valentine, just what you see in this folder. Uh-huh. What does it say, George? Nothing we didn't know before, Brooksy. Kessling Limited tried to smuggle in diamonds, caught with their carrots down and so forth. Well, I don't know what you expected to find, but compared to some of the stunts we run up against, this wasn't anything too brilliant. Apparently not. The company's out of business now. now we've had people try to get diamonds through in glass eyes and wads of chewing gum almost every way. Hiding them in boxes of face powder, well, <laughs> maybe they thought it was so obvious they'd get by. Yeah, maybe. Face powder, Brooksy. Why didn't it hit us before? Of course. Joe gave Laura a box of face powder. What's that? Yeah, it's not important, at least not yet. Uh, say, tell me something, Craven. Yes? What happens to the rest of the cargo when you catch people smuggling? We have regular custom sales like an auction. In fact, there's one tomorrow. Oh, that's very interesting. It'll be held in one of those loft buildings down on Fayette Street. There's a public notice in the papers today. Good enough. Come on, Brooksy. Uh, thanks a lot for your trouble. Oh, don't mention it. George, I think when Joe gave Laura that box of powder, he was trying to tell her about the smuggling his company was doing. Could be, Brooks. He could be. But maybe we'll know more about that tomorrow. Young lady, you and I are going to an auction. All right, right over here, everybody. 
everybody. Lot 114, 3,000 boxes of face powder, quality second grade, trade name, Cleopatra Secret. Sorted shades. Now, well, what do I hear, The whole lot isn't worth 100 bucks, Poxy, but here I go and we'll see what happens. $300, Mr. Auctioneer. How uh, much did you say? 300 If you get stuck with all that powder, I don't know how we're going to get it out of here. Well, I don't suppose there'll be any more bids, so... Uh... 400 George! Yeah, no, Angel. I'm going to hit it again just to make sure. 500 600 What is it? The uh, gentleman who said 500 You uh, got another bid, sir? Not me. Count me out. Okay, if the gentleman who bid 600 is just in it right over No one ever did find out Cleopatra's secret, Brooksy. What do you say we go downstairs and see if we can't make history? George, it's getting dark. Let's make believe it's dinner and I'll go down to that lunch wagon and get us a couple of containers of coffee. Okay, but... Hey, hold it, Brooksy. Huh? That little black truck over there. They're loading something into it. Cleopatra's secret. Hey, you see any name on the truck? I can't. Oh, no, there isn't any name. Oh, I should have known better than to ask. They would have thought of that. Okay, take it away. Brooksy, we're off again. We'll keep a good half a block behind them, just like this. Darling, I never want to see another warehouse as long as I live. They could at least put some lights in the window. Yeah, and some fluffy organy curtains. The only light I'm interested in right now, Angel, is that little red one up ahead. It's turning the corner. Hey, a dead-end street and no truck. But we were right behind them. Truck can't just disappear into thin air. There's only one warehouse on this whole street. Yeah, and it's all boarded up. Hey, that big overhead door could have been up. Just waiting for that truck to get in and then close down. Well, I can't think of any other explanation except magic. Yeah, well, we're not going to go ringing any doorbells and tip our mitt. <laughs> Look out! We're getting out of here. That shot came from that warehouse. This is getting monotonous. Being used for clay pigeons twice in two days. Hey, Brooksy. Yes? Take a good look at that street sign under the lamp and yes. remember it. Listen to this, Brooksy. All the dope on that warehouse on Barrow Street. It's owned by the Fallon Trading Company. So? And the offices and stockholders of Fallon are the same as those of the late Kessling Limited, including the very kindly Mr. Kessling Laura told us about. George, I can't make head or tails out of this. Why would they go and buy up all that old worthless face powder? I don't have the answer, Brooksy, but maybe Laura has. That's why we're going over and see her right now. Laura! What happened to you? I, I don't know, really, Claire. Something hit me. Oh, didn't you see who it was? No, I, I was sitting here waiting for a call from you, and then I, I don't remember anything except waking up on the floor. George, this place is in a shambles. Well, they didn't take anything. What's that? No, I, I looked all around. My pocketbook with almost $100 in it. And all my jewelry. All oh, that's still there on the dresser. Uh-huh. Oh, what about Joe? Tell me what that doctor friend of yours said. Did he think there was any hope? Of course there's hope. You've got to believe that. There's time. every hope, Laura. But tell me something. Where did you put that box of face powder Joe gave you? Powder? Yes, yes, you remember. You told us about it. Oh, yeah. I, I just opened it and then I put it in that drawer over there. Yeah, I'm sure of it. It isn't here now. Laura, listen. That firm Joe worked for was a smuggling ring. Diamonds. What are you saying? Joe would never be mixed up in anything like that. I didn't say he was. But as far as we know, there could have been a fortune in gems in that box of powder he gave you in the one moment Dr. Taruk left you two alone. What does all this have to do with Joe? That's all I care about. George, you don't think the sanitarium, the auction sale, the warehouse, all that was a part of a search for something that was here all the time? Oh, Claire, I'm tired of guessing. I feel like a dime being pushed around on a shuffleboard. What do you mean? Somebody is in an awful hurry about getting something done, trying to meet a deadline. What about Joe? That's what makes me think. Taruk wasn't too worried about me bringing in another doctor to look at Joe. How does visit prove that? The important thing was to keep me from snooping around, interfering with their schedule. That was the reason for the double talk with Rodney and the pot shot at us. What schedule, George? What are you talking about? Something's coming off and coming off soon. Look, stay here with Laura, Angel. I've developed a sudden interest in boats. Incoming and outgoing. <laughs> Oh, you 
you again, Valentine. Yeah, Craven, the Customs Service and I are getting to be just like that. I'll be right with you as soon as I clear this manifesto. All right, Doherty, you can put that shipment through. Hey, look, fella, this is really important, and time is what we don't have the most of. Huh? Oh, if you've still got that Kessling deal on no, your mind, No, no, I... no. Same people, but a different name. As far as you know, is there anything coming through for the company known as uh, Farland Trading? No, I don't know, but I can soon find out. Here, just a minute. Yeah, Farland. Well? No, I don't see anything. Are yet. you sure? Everything points. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah? Uh, here it is. I missed it because the boat's already in. Uh-huh. Tank it out there in the harbor. Has the cargo been cleared yet? No, that's scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, what's Farland bringing in? Uh, three crates of powdered cocoa beans from the West Indies. Shipping in on the Pandora, Peruvian registry. Captain Martin... No, no, we can skip that, Craven. How soon can we get out to the Pandora? Why, tomorrow we'll I be told unloaded. you, Kessling and Farland are one and the same trading company. Hey, I think I see what you mean, Valentine. Go take a speedboat, get right out there to the Pandora. Custom service, Captain, we're coming aboard. Come on, Valentine. Yeah, what can I do for you? I thought you weren't ready for us until tomorrow. Yeah, something special turned up, Skipper. Yeah, specifically powdered cocoa beans from Farland Company. Mm, Good Lord, trip. this trip. Those are some of their crates right here on deck. Okay, let's try this one for a start. Say, so, what are you fellas looking for anyway? Carrots, Captain. Huh? Are you kidding? Diamonds, Captain. Oh. Now, you feel around that side, Valentine. I'll take this. Okay. Farland, eh? I got a new tomorrow. That's a new one on me. All right, Craven. Here we are. Huh? Yeah, it's a beauty, too. Take a look at it. Hey. Oh, nice size. I wonder how many more we're going to find. Oh, just enough, but not too many. What's that supposed to mean? Uh, look, Craven. Can I take a sample of this cocoa? Just enough for a cup, let's say? <laughs> sure. Go ahead. Help yourself. I doubt if they'll miss it when we auction the stuff off. Uh, thanks again for the tip, Valentine. Oh, you're very welcome. But don't be surprised if I get in touch with you again. Well, Mr. Ross, what's the verdict? What does the chemical analysis show? <laughs> Powdered cocoa, huh? Oh, never mind the suspense. What did you find? Oh, there is cocoa here, all right. But mixed with something that sells for roughly $7,000 a pound. Dope. Seven thousand dollars a pound. No wonder Kessling and the boys could afford to use diamonds for window dressing. Uh, what's that? Oh, it'd take too long to explain. Thanks. And remind me to submit your name for the Nobel Prize. What do you want, Valentine? Out of my way, Rodney. You can't go in there. Nobody sees Burke. Dr. Taruk's orders. You're a sucker for Taruk's orders, aren't you? Uh. You shouldn't have missed me when you took a shot at my car on the road yesterday. Uh. I was just waiting for that big yap to open like that so I could... Goodbye, Rodney, what is all... Greetings, Dr. Taruk. What have you done, Mr. Valentine? The scene should speak for itself. And if you don't want to join Rodney, you'll just sit right down on that bench. Maybe you should be a patient here, Mr. Valentine. Oh, yeah, sure. I got a persecution complex. I can't rest. I can't sleep. I see things. Have bad dreams. I'm afraid there's no hope for me until I hear you and your friends try to explain more than a million bucks worth of dope. I... I... I have nothing to say. When the police and the customs men get here, Dr. Taruk, you'll have plenty to say. Oh, can you beat that, Valentine, using diamonds for a smokescreen? Yep, Craven, that was the racket. They plant the diamonds, not too expensive ones, of course, in case the shipment is open. If they're found, nobody looks any further. And they pay the fine. And they buy up the supposedly worthless stuff at the auction for peanuts and make themselves a million. Uh, tell me, uh, how did that friend of yours in the sanitarium fit into all this, Valentine? Well, as I get it, Joe found out what Kessling was doing and was going to talk. All that stuff about an accident in Egypt was a bunk. Now, they gave him a brutal going over. When he came out of it, he had what a psychiatrist so pompously called functional neuroses induced by severe blows on the head. Gosh, they probably meant to kill him. Sure, but why take chances? There might be investigations. Now, they figured it was better this way. Taruk could see to it that Joe didn't snap out of it until this shipment came through, and they'd all take it on the lam. That was their deadline. <laughs> Well, 
Well, how do you like your new barracks, soldier? <laughs> oh, don't try too hard to talk, Joe. We always used to understand each other without too many words. I don't know how we'll ever be able to thank you and Claire. Dr. Hunter says Joe's going to be all right. Uh, George, what about that wedding present? You know, the one the best man forgot to give? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, Joe. You and Laura ran out on me so fast that day in camp, I didn't get a chance to give you the usual set of toilies or a percolator or something. Well, uh, now he can at least be the messenger of some good news that may make up for that. This cu- customs man told us. It says right in the book, anyone instrumental in thwarting a smuggling attempt is entitled to 25% of what the Treasury gets on dutiable goods. Yeah. And those diamonds don't come cheap, you know. That's right, Joe. You're really the guy who was, uh, instrumental. <laughs> at ease, soldier. Hey, you know, Brooksy, this time I'm sure he winked. <laughs> And now, a message of importance to motorists. It's a safe bet that along with these first days of spring, a young man's fancy lightly turns to thoughts of love, but it's also a safe bet that every motorist's fancy has already turned to thoughts of the open road. If you're making weekend trips at this season with frequent starts and stops for the family car, here's something worth knowing. When you've got Chevron Supreme gasoline in your tank, you get instant action every time you press the starter. It's a premium gasoline that's tailored to the season of the year and to each different altitude zone in the West. Besides saving you a lot of grinding, starting wear, Chevron Supreme gives your car speedy pickup in your stop-and-go traffic, and it assures full power for rugged hill climbing. Best of all, you're never far from Chevron Supreme gasoline. Throughout the West, you can get it at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations, where they say and mean... We'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Well, here we are. Now, out you go, Brooksy. You know what you're supposed to do. Yes, George. But you don't know what you're asking of me. That Rene woman brings out the fishwife in me. Anything can happen. Well, go on now, Angel. That gal in there didn't tell us half what she really knows. Maybe because you do rub her the wrong way, we can find out some more. Well, okay. So good to me. Well, now for Rene. I wish I'd let my fingernails grow. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Betty Lou Gerson, Paul Fries, Jack Crucian, Dick Ryan, Herb Vigran, and Joe Duvall. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The amazing Mr. Malone. Operator. Operator, get me the office of John J. Malone. The American Broadcasting Company presents The Amazing Mr. Malone, an exciting half hour of mystery created by Craig Rice and starring Frank Lovejoy. Our locale is the city of Chicago, the time, the present. And the hero of these weekly adventures, the amazing Mr. Malone. Malone is the name John J. Malone, attorney and counselor at law. 
And tonight I'd like to turn the spotlight on the old cliché, cleanliness is next to godliness. As a case in point, I give you Tony Milano. Mr. Milano is one of Chicago's biggest operators. He runs half a dozen nightclubs in town. And rumor has it if you're bent on a little more action, Mr. Milano can accommodate you there, too. Of course, to run an enterprise of this kind, he needs help. And that's where Georgie Kelk comes in. Kelk is his right-hand man, but Tony never believes in letting his right hand know what his left hand is doing. Which no doubt explains Georgie's bafflement as he walks into Milano's private office with a nondescript little man in tow. Here he is, Tony. Is he the one? Yeah. Grimes, this is Mr. Milano. Uh, gee, it's a great pleasure, Mr. Milano. Uh, wait till I tell my missus. You're not going to tell your missus anything. Huh? This is strictly between us, Grimes. You know what I mean? Oh, sure, Mr. Milano. Anything you say... Just to step back a little like a good fella, huh? What? Mr. Milano doesn't like people breathing into his face. It uh, spreads the germs. Know what I mean? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Did Georgie tell you what I wanted? Uh, No. How could I? I didn't know myself. I was saving it for a surprise. Mr. Grimes... You're the janitor of the Bellmore Apartments, you know? Uh, janitor? Oh, no, I'm the superintendent. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I mean the superintendent. You got a tenant living there named uh, Reed? Y- you mean Jack Reed? Oh, you bet. He's a swell as He's a Mr. Grimes. and not so close. Oh, yeah, yeah. Excuse me. <sighs> now, how about you letting me and Mr. Kelke here in Jack's apartment? Oh, I, I couldn't do that, Mr. Milano. That wouldn't be right. I'll give you a hundred bucks. What? All you got to do is loan me your pass key. Uh, no, no. Two hundred. Well... All I want is the key for just one hour. Oh, what are you going to do in Mr. Reed's apartment? Oh, nothing that will get you into trouble. You said three uh, hundred? I said the two, but I let you chisel me. Okay, Mr. Milano. You, you want to shake on it? If you don't mind, uh, let's just say it's uh, a deal. Huh? Mr. Milano doesn't believe in shaking hands. Oh, oh, giant. You know what I mean. Give Mr. Kelk the key. <laughs> Reed does all right for himself. Tony, I don't approve of this whole idea. There are a lot of things I don't approve of, Georgie, but I don't let them make me unhappy. For Pete's sake, That's enough. Got... See if there's anything in the desk. All right. Hey. Hey, will you take a look at this? You got something? Yes, indeedy. Jack obviously doesn't believe in banks. I bet there's close to uh, the 20 G's in his bundle. Put that back. Oh, I just put that we... back. Okay. Hey, hmm? what's what's this thing here? Oh, that's a rabbit's foot. A rabbit's a foot? Yeah, it's supposed to bring you luck. But what's this charm attached to it? It, uh, you know, the Jack Reed from Gene. With this and me, you can't lose. Who's a Gene? Oh, it must be the gal whose picture's on the piano. Hey, that's what I call a good-looking girl. Find out... Who she is and where she lives. Yeah. And uh, put that rabbit's foot in your handkerchief. What for? I want it. Now, look, Tony, this whole thing here, it doesn't cost a half a buck. Maybe, but it's worth a half a million to me. Wrap it up, Georgie. Or we take it home. Come. Hello, Christy. Why, if it isn't my old pal, Tony Milano. Have you been, you son of a gun? Put it there. If you don't mind, Chris. Oh, you and your germs. You know Georgie Kale. Of course. How are you, Georgie? Fine. Now, sit down, gents. You, uh, you're not too busy? I'm never too busy for you, Tony, but you know how it is. When you're a politician, your time isn't your own. You're always out slaving for your constituents. Slaving for constituents? Yeah. Uh, what's the matter? Anybody giving you trouble? Yeah. Who? 
You just say the word Jack and... Jack read What? I said the Jack read He opened up a place two blocks from mine. Oh, well, I'll take care of that. Well, I'll shut him up so fast that... Who do you think you're kidding? Well, I, I don't understand. Reed couldn't operate five minutes without you. Are you insinuating yeah. that... Oh, now, now, cut it out, Tony. You know, if someone was to walk in now, they wouldn't realize you're kidding. I'll tell you what we'll you do. You ain't going to do anything, Christy. When I buy somebody, I expect them to work only for me. Know what I mean? Oh, for, for Pete's sake, man. You don't realize what you're doing. I've got a wife and two kids. They get by on your insurance. Tony, please, you've got to listen to you're me. You're breathing in my face, Sir Christie. It's a very unsanitary... Well, you've got to give me a break. I swear I'll straighten this whole thing out. I'll talk to Reed. I'll... 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 Uh... It took you long enough, Tony. What were you waiting for? I just want to hear what he's got to say. Where's that uh, rabbit's foot we got from Jack Reed's apartment? Oh, here it is. Put in his hand. Okay. Maybe it will bring Mr. Christie luck where he's gone. Ah, you got that step all wrong, Marge. I'll show you. Hey, Rex, give me the Wang Wang Blues. I want to show Marge that break. Now watch, honey. That's it. Hey, mister. Go away, but I'm busy. Now what, Marge? <laughs> mister. Are you still here? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Milano. I... I didn't recognize you. That's all right. You got a girl singer in the show named uh, Jean? Jean Patterson? Yeah, that's the one. She around? Yeah. Uh, would you like me to show you her dressing room? I appreciate it. Oh, that's okay, Tony. What? Oh, I... I mean Mr. Milano. Say, uh, you wouldn't have a spot for a hooker in one of your clubs, no. would you? I just thought I'd ask. No harm trying, you know. This it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, Gene! Gene, uh, you decent? What do you want? Uh, you got company. Just a second. Hello. Who are you? Tony Milano. Well, I'm glad to be of some service, Mr. Milano. Hey, Rex, wait a minute. I want to see you. Well, are you... You're going to invite me in? Why should I? Well, it's awfully drafty standing here. You know, that's how most people catch a cold. What do you want, Mr. Milano? Just to get acquainted. You see, I saw your picture somewhere, Jean. Jean? You can call me Tony. Not really. What's the matter, Jean? Don't you want to be my friend? Well, it's a wonderful offer, Mr. Milano. But you see, I already got one. Oh. You mean uh, Jack Reed? Who told you about me and Jack? I got a spies. Well, I don't know where they pick up their information, but apparently it's from a reliable source. So you see, I... We can't be friends. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Milano, but if you care to leave your name and address... You will let me know if there's an opening. Well, I wouldn't hold my breath if I were you. Oh, that's all right. When I see something I like, I'm a very, very patient man. Goodbye, Jean. Don't forget... Don't forget to give me a call. Yes? Hello, Jack. What? Oh, no, no, it can't be. Oh, but it is. Well, how are you, Lieutenant? Fine, fine. Don't let me stop you playing. Oh, I was just toying around. Hey, uh, what brings you here? Can't you guess? <laughs> I told that jerk so for am I not to pluck near the plug. It's a little tougher rap than that, Jack. Ever see this rabbit's foot before? May I? I'm afraid not. But I'll be glad to read you the inscription on the charm. It says, To Jack Reed from Gene. With this and me... Where'd you get that, Lieutenant? Oh, then it is yours. Not necessarily. Come on, Jack. There's no use being cagey. I already checked it with the jeweler. 
He told me it was bought a couple of weeks ago by a girl named Jean Patterson. Where'd you find it? In the one place we shouldn't. You know Chuck Christie? The boss of the Pelham district? Yeah, only Mr. Christie just got himself a new territory. I think we've had enough riddles for tonight. He was murdered at 5 o'clock this afternoon. Well? Well, right near the body, we found your trinket. Looks like losing that foot was the worst possible luck for you and that rabbit. Let's go, Jack. I got a car downstairs. <laughs> You are listening to the amazing Mr. Malone. Today, more than ever before, Americans must be made to realize that freedom and the rights of the common man are a precious heritage. History has proved that people start to lose their freedom the moment they think it's forever secure. That's why we must all work at keeping our American heritage of freedom, for freedom is everybody's job. As a good citizen, remember your American heritage and work to defend your individual liberties. Do this by taking a more actual part in the affairs of your community and in fulfilling at all times the duties of American citizenship. Now, back to the amazing Mr. Malone. And that's where yours truly got into the act and without even seeing the script... For six hours after the arrest of Jack Reed for the murder of Chuck Christie, I was pounding the pillow at home. I was right in the midst of a horrible nightmare. An ape-like face was bending over mine, tickling my throat with a razor. And suddenly I made an interesting discovery. It was no dream. Come on, Malone. Get up. You're uh, asking the impossible, comrade. If I ever moved now, I'd be minus a head. And you know something? I'd look better without it. You put that razor away. Do I look weak-minded? You don't expect me to answer that while you're caressing my throat. Well, you shouldn't blame me, Malone. I know. I got the skin you love to clutch. Say, you're a regular vaudeville show, ain't you? Yeah, ain't I? What's your name, friend? Rube Gelder. Rube Gelder? Yeah. I work for Jack Reed. You know him? I know him. Well, early tonight, the police picked him up for the murder of Chuck Christie. The politician? Yeah. It's a lucky thing for that cop I wasn't around. Otherwise? Otherwise, I would have broken his back before I let him walk off with the bus. What's this all got to do with me? Well, I love that guy. When Jack says to me, Rube, go out and get a lawyer. He decided to give me the business. Yeah. So you're the best mouthpiece in Chicago. Oh, it don't seem possible. It isn't. Well, we'll soon know. Now, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to get dressed and go down to see Jack, and you're going to get him out. Am I? Well, you'd better. Did it ever occur to you once I'm out of your sight, I might tell this story to the police? And did it ever occur to you that it might occur to me to visit you some other night with this razor? Only next time I might not bother to wake you up? I see what you mean. Then what are you waiting for, Malone? Get going. Now, of all the idiotic stunts, wait till I get my hands on Rube, so help him. No, on. no, don't upset him. Well, I, I want you to know I never suggested that piece of business to him. I'm sure you didn't. <laughs> what a small. He seems awfully fond of you. He's nuts. I don't know why I keep him around. I, I'm sorry you got in your hair, Malone. That's all right. Lieutenant! What are you calling him for? I thought you were ready to go. But you want me for a lawyer? Sure, but I think. Oh, forget you... it. No. Did you kill Christie? Why should I? But the police have a pretty convincing theory. They believe Christie was selling you protection for your club. So? So maybe Christie was told to close you up. By whom? Tony Milano. Why couldn't Tony have killed Christie? Well, he could have. Only there are a couple of things that argue against it. One, Tony had Christie in his hip pocket. You don't generally destroy what you control. There's even a stronger argument than that. What? The rabbit foot they found near Christie's body. Oh, that's a frame. You generally carry it with you? No, I don't believe in that stuff. Last I saw, but it was in my desk. Anybody else have a key to your apartment? Nope. Oh, that's just dandy. About this gal who gave you the rabbit's foot, what's her name? Jean Patterson. You think this Jean No, might... no, I want her kept out of this, Malone. Hey, you're asking the impossible, She's Jack. got nothing to do with this. Suppose you let me decide that for myself. Lieutenant! I want out! Yes? Hello, Jean. 
Do I know you? No, but that can be easily remedied. My name is Malone. And you heard me singing one night and you decided I was the girl of your dreams. No, not quite. You say I'm a lawyer. Well, when I want to sue somebody, Mr. Malone... Oh, don't call me. I'll be tied up with Jack Reed. Jack Reed? <laughs> Didn't you see this morning's papers? No. They're holding him for the murder of a politician named Christie. Maybe you better come in. Thanks. Now, what's this all about? Well, you see this Christie... I'm not interested in that. How am I involved? Well, they found a rabbit's foot you gave Jack near the body. You listen to me, Malone. I didn't even know Christy. No one says you did, Jean. All I'm hoping to accomplish... Don't tell me your plans. I'm not interested. Jack's got some nerve ring in the end of this. Well, in all fairness to him, lover, it wasn't Jack's idea. Don't tell me it was yours. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Malone. This is just the kind of publicity I love. You don't seem to realize your boyfriend's in a jam. He may go to the chair. Oh, I'm awful sorry for Jack. What about me? What about you? I got my career to think of, and if you'll excuse me, Mr. Malone, I'll give it some thought right now. All right, all right. Take it easy. Yeah? Is Mr. Milano in? Oh, you're Gene Patterson, aren't you? Would you mind telling Mr. Milano I'd like to see him? He isn't here. Well, when do you expect him? Uh, never. Now, if I were you, sister, Where I'd... Where is it, Georgie? It's nobody, boss. I'll it's be right... It's me, in. Tony. What? It's Gene. Oh. Hello, Miss Patterson. It was Gene last time. Yeah, but you say then you don't want to be friends. Can I change my mind? Should I throw her out, Tony? You crazy? Jeannie, come on in. Thanks. Say, this is quite a place. <laughs> Nicer than uh, Jack Reed's? Well, different. Who picked out this color scheme? You don't like uh, white? Reminds me of a hospital. It's very antiseptic. Oh, yeah, of course, that's okay. Sit down, baby, sit down. Uh, maybe, maybe you'd like a drink, huh? Yeah, well, there's something else I'd like first. Well, you just name it. A little privacy. All right, Georgie, you heard the lady. What's the matter with you, Tony? Go on and beat it. Jeannie and I got a lot of things to... Discuss. Are you crazy? How do you know she wasn't sent here by Malone? Go on, sister, blow. You gonna let him talk to me like that, Tony? Now listen, sister, I know all Shut about Shut up! <laughs> now get out. Okay, Tony. I'll see you around. Don't bother. Why, Mr. Milana, you're all right. A dirty low life. Look. Look what he did to my knuckles. Oh, oh you caught him. Maybe I can make it. Better. No, no, no. We mustn't take a chance on infection. You, you sit there, baby. Tony, be right back. And then we're going to have a nice long talk. Hello, Rube. Where can we talk, Malone? What's wrong with this? Well... I did like you told me. I followed that Jean Patterson. And where do you suppose she went? Where? To see Tony Milano. Tony Milano? You sure about that, Rube? I swear on my mother's grave. I wonder where they first met. Well, it couldn't be so long ago. Jean's been going with Jack ever since she came into Chicago. Uh, what happened? Well, they got long swell. The boss was nuts no. about her. I'm in Milano's apartment. Oh, well, how should I know? I'm no peeping, Tom. Oh, yeah, a couple of minutes after she walked in, Georgie Kelp came out. Tony's boy? Yeah, uh, he was rubbing his jaw. Sounds like they might have had trouble. Well, what do you think, Malone? You did all right, Rube. Let's hope I can do as well. Well, there it is, Lieutenant. What more can you want? A little proof. For it's as thing. obvious as a hole in your head. Tony framed Jack Reed. Why? Man? Could be for a million reasons. Oh, I love how you throw those figures around. Well, it's true. Now, suppose Tony had a yen for Gene Patterson. So he kills a politician he has in his pocket. Just to get rid of Reed. All right, maybe that came later. Maybe Tony didn't have Christie in his pocket. We know Christie was selling him out. How do we know that? Well, Jack was still operating. He couldn't do it without Christie's help. You're changing horses in midstream. Yeah, yeah. Well, the more I think about it, I bet it's the real reason. Milano had an exclusive on Christie's services. When Christie double-crossed him, Tony put him away. And what about that rabbit's foot? I don't know where Milano got his hands on that, but if you work hard enough, you'll find the answer. 
You're amazing, Mr. Malone. <laughs> oh, am I? Yeah, you're making sense for a change. And you believe my client was framed? Yeah, the only thing that bothers me is how to prove it. Well, Georgie Kelk must have been along with Tony at the time of the killing. You don't think Georgie talk? He might if you staged it, right? What do you mean? Let Jack Reed go. Are you stark raving? It's our only chance. What do you think will happen when Tony finds out the police no longer suspect Jack Reed? What? I don't know either. Let's find out. <laughs> I'll be ready in just a minute. Hello, Jean. Jack. Smart, aren't you glad to see me? Oh, of course, darling. It's just... Well, it's such a surprise. Well, that Malone's quite a lawyer. Then they know you didn't kill Christy. That was my impression. Well, who did? What's the matter, Jean? You're thinking of hedging again? I don't get you, Jack. I heard about you and Mr. Milano. You what? Mm-hmm. Rube filled me in on the gory details. Oh, listen, Jack, you gotta believe me. I was only doing it for you. Oh, baby. Oh, I mean it. I thought I could trap Tony into making some admission. <laughs> I've got to hand it to you, Jean. That's a, that's a nice piece of ad libby. Ah, oh, darling, when I cross you. You'd cross your own grandmother if you thought it'd do you any good. Well, what are you gonna do now, baby? It's only a question of time before they pick up your new meal ticket. You think you're so smart. Well, Tony's twice the man you are. Good for him. You think he's gonna take this laying down? No, what's he gonna do? You just watch and see, Mr. Reed. You just watch and see. <laughs> Huh? Brooks. I never would have known. How we doing, Lieutenant? Great. What do you mean? That plan of yours is working like a million. Letting Jack Reed go certainly started the ball rolling. What did I tell you? You certainly did. I'll bet Tony Milano doesn't know where he's at. Uh, probably not. Huh? What about Georgie Kelk? You hear from him? Yeah, about ten minutes ago. I figured he'd be scared, silly. What do you have to say? Not very much. Why won't he talk? For two reasons. One, he ain't in the mood. Two, he's got a bullet through his head. I want to see you, Malone. You are listening to the amazing Mr. Malone. Everybody knows about today's critical housing shortage and the various reasons for this shortage. But there are many people who do not think of one very important contributing factor. Forest fires. Last year, forest fires burned enough trees of saw timber to build about 86,000 five-room homes. Nine out of every ten forest fires are man-made. Most of these man-caused fires are due to plain carelessness. And that's why everyone, therefore, should follow these simple rules of forest fire prevention. Crush out cigarette, cigar, and pipe ashes. Break matches in two after using. And drown all campfires. Remember, you are a potential firebug, so be careful. Now, back to the amazing Mr. Malone. Twenty minutes later, I was down at headquarters. When I walked into Lieutenant Brooks' office, the first one I noticed was my client, Jack Reed. He didn't say anything, he just shook his head sadly and motioned toward the desk. And then I saw Brooks... It's lucky I did, because he was sighting a revolver at me. Well, if it isn't the amazing Mr. Malone. I got a good mind. You haven't got a good mind, and put down that gun. If you had any brains, I swear I'd blow them up. What happened? You tell him, Jack. Well, I, uh, I went up to Georgie Kelch's place about 8.30 the night. Now, what did you do that for? I told you to stay away. Yeah, yeah, I see now it was a mistake. Anyway, Georgie was certainly surprised. I think if I'd had five minutes more, I would have gotten the whole story. Well? And suddenly, the door opened. All I saw was an arm and a gun. I yelled to Georgie to get down, but I was a little late. It was a shot. A second later, someone tossed that rod into the room and almost brained me. Is that the gun there? Yeah, I want to see it. Yeah, what about the... Fingerprints. Nario one. It's as clean as a baby's thoughts. Whose gun is it? Mine. What? Yeah, yeah, it's an old one I had in my apartment. Well, how did it... Well, how did my rabbit's foot get near Christie's body? Here we go again. Listen, Lieutenant, you looked into that angle? Uh-huh. What's the story? The superintendent of the house, a boy named Grimes. 
Has the only pass key. You think this Grimes might have done business with Tony Milano? We're checking that now. Uh, when you finish, give us a call. We'll be over at Tony's. <laughs> I know Jack. What are you worried about, Jeannie? I know Jack, too. Yeah, but you don't understand. Malone got him out. He's a pretty good lawyer. Now you listen to me, doll. You got nothing to worry about. Didn't Tony say he'd take care of you? I know you will, doll. It's only that... Yes? Hello, Tony. Malone. Jean and I was just talking about you. Well, I appreciate that. You know Jack Reed, don't you? Jack? Sure. How are you, fellow? He's the boy, Malone. <laughs> I'm a water boy. Uh, where were you around 8.30 tonight? Why? That's the time Georgie Kelk was murdered. Not a good old Georgie. Yes, a good old Georgie. You got an alibi for that time? Yeah. Yeah. I was right here. Uh-huh. And, of course, Gene's your witness. That's right. Oh, now, look, I don't want to be involved. Oh, sure, you got your career What's to think What's the matter, of... doll? Don't you remember? We were sitting right there. You're lying, Tony. You sound like you can prove it, Jack. I can. He's the one who shot Kelk. You're out of your mind. You didn't see his face. No, I didn't have to. You see that bandage he's got on his knuckles? Where did you pick that up, Tony? None of your business. I'll tell you. Shut up. He hit Kelk when Kelk insulted me. I didn't think that was possible. What? Go on, Jack. What about the bandage? Well, when he tossed the gun into the room, I noticed You're it. a liar. I don't think so. Whoa! Come in, Lieutenant. How did you make out? Couldn't be better. Superintendent admits he sold Tony here the use of the passkey for 300 bucks. What do you say, Milano? Nothing until I see a lawyer. What's wrong with me? You mean... You mean you take my case? Well, it all depends. I think I could get you off of Georgie's murder. Are you out of your mind, Malone? Don't you think I can, Jack? No. Ah, oh, you're just saying that because you killed him. He what? Let's have that again. What for, Jack? You got it the first time. You killed Georgie Kelk. I don't know how you do it, Malone. Shall I tell you a secret, Lieutenant? No, you don't need it. All right, what's the real story? Well, it all comes down to Jack Reed's idea of poetic justice. He thought once we figured that Tony killed Christie and planted that rabbit's We'd foot... We'd figure Georgie Kelk's murder was the same routine all over again. That's it. What convinced you otherwise? Jack's gun. Why was that any different from the rabbit's foot? Remember you told me there were no fingerprints on it? Oh, there weren't. Well, obviously then, Georgie's killer had to be wearing gloves. How do you arrive at that? Jack claimed he chucked the rod into the room right after the shot, taking no time to wipe it off. So? So, later... Jackie said he knew Tony was the man because he spotted him by that bandage on his knuckles. But if the murderer wore gloves, how could you see a bandage? You couldn't. Oh. See how simple it is? Well, being simple-minded yourself must help you a great deal. Yes, it does. When you work up to that state, you'll find out. Mm. Well, you know who I'm sorry for. Yeah. Jane Patterson. No, I wasn't thinking of her. Well, I was. Ah, poor girl. She tried to blade both ends against the middle. Mm. Wound up with nothing. I beg your pardon. Where are you going? Well, I, uh... I owe Jean something for putting away both her friends. Maybe I can further her career. Good night, Lieutenant. <laughs> Ever hear the story of the blasé character who thought nothing could surprise him until he tried murder, and then he was shocked to death? I'll fill you in on all the details next week, so why not pick me up at my office at the same time? I'll be waiting for you. Good night. Frank Lovejoy was starred as John J. Malone. Our program was written by Gene Wang with direction by Bill Rousseau. Music by Rex Corey. The Amazing Mr. Malone is produced by Bernard L. Schubert. And now this is Dresser Dahlstedt inviting you to tune in next week. The events and characters depicted in this story were entirely fictional, and any resemblance to actual places or people, living or dead, is entirely coincidental. The amazing Mr. Malone has come to you from Hollywood. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. You post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every 
week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war Old Dutch Glenter brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. You just took a $10,000 fee from a client and then accused him of murder. That's right, Patsy. But I don't understand. How could he have committed the murder? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. But he was with us when it happened. Yes, I know. You and I, Patsy, are his alibi. And yet I'm positive he killed William Lasher. And now, the case of the perfect alibi. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by a new post-war Old Dutch Glender. It is almost 8 o'clock in the evening, and Nick Carter and his assistant Patsy Bowen are bound for the theater. It's one of those rare evenings when Nick is not working, and Patsy is happy enough to sing. Oh, Nick. First the theater, then supper and dancing. Oh, we won't get home until morning. Well, we well, get Patsy, home until morning. We're taking an evening off to see you so happy. <laughs> oh, I am happy, Nick. They'll just be us tonight. No policemen, no crooks, no anybody. Hey, look at that fool. Think he's driving right at us. Hey, Patsy, brace yourself. Oh! Oh! Why the... Oh, that driver must be drunk. Crazy He's not injured. I'll tell him a thing or two. Are you in there? You hurt? No. No, I'm okay. Well, get out and let's have a look at you. It, it was my fault entirely. I'll be glad to pay all the damage. What's wrong with you? There's plenty of light on this street. You must have seen us coming. I know. I, I said it was my fault. Here. Here's my license and my registration. I, I'll call my attorney in the morning and he'll get in touch with you. Here, Paul Sanders. Yes, yes. Now, you must have just started out. The radiator of your car isn't even warm. Well, I was traveling slowly. I was just driving. With your eyes shut. Well, my name is Nick Carter. You'll need that in your accident report. You're, you're Nick Carter? Really? He certainly is, really. Mr. Carter, I need your help, desperately. For what? Mr. Carter, a man is going to be murdered tonight, and I'm the man with the strongest motive in the world for killing what? him. You have the strongest motive? Yes, I have. Mr. Carter, you may be the means of saving my life and the life of William Lasher as well. William Lasher? Yes. Not the man who used to be district attorney. That's right. He represents certain clients who are after my scalp. Naturally, that makes him my enemy, too. So what? I phoned him just a little while ago. I argued and pleaded with him, but it was no use. He can ruin me, and he's going to do it, if he lives. You don't make sense yet. Go well, on. Well, while I was talking to him on the phone, he received a letter by messenger. He, he read it to me and accused me of sending it. It said that Lasher was going to be killed tonight. Nick, isn't Lasher that DA who was so tough they refused to let his name go up for re-election? Yes, Patsy. Stepped on too many toes. Oh. I must have a reliable person who will swear that I couldn't have killed Lasher. Will you take the job, Mr. Carter? You know, Mr. Sanders, I think maybe I will. I'll pay you any fee you ask, anything. The fee will be $10,000, Mr. Sanders. $10,000? Well, well, that's pretty steep, but... Okay, I'll pay it. All right. First thing to do is to establish the fact that Lasher's alive right this minute. Suppose we use my car, Mr. Sanders. Mine will run. Yours doesn't look as if it would. Very well. I don't like this, Nick. Neither do I. Why do you think I accepted this case? Well, come on, Mr. Sanders. Let's look into this murder you say is going to happen. For your sake, Mr. Sanders, I hope Mr. Lasher is alive. I hope so, too, even though I detest the man. Uh, I think someone's coming, Nick. Yes? I'd like to see Mr. Lasher. I'm Nick Carter. You're Nick Carter, the detective? Yes, may I see him, please? Well, gee, I'm sorry, but he left strict orders that he wasn't to be disturbed under any circumstances. In spite of his orders, I want to see him while he's all right. We have reason to believe he might be murdered tonight. Murdered? Why, well, well, all right, I'll knock on the study door. He gets awful sore when I disobey him, but, well, I'll try it. Who's he, Mr. Sanders? Name's Joey Wilson. Nice boy. Lasher's his guardian. Oh. Mr. Lasher? Mr. Lasher! Go away! I told you I don't want to be disturbed. You see? Here, let me try. Mr. Lasher, this is Nick Carter. I want to talk to you. I said go away! I'll see no one tonight. Well, I'm afraid you're going to see me because I want to see you. Confound you! Get out of here! What? Oh, what happened, Nick? Oh, he threw a book at me. Fortunately, oh. his aim was bad. Uh, then he's still alive. Yes, Sanders. Luckily for you, he's very much alive. 
Oh, Joey, do you know Mr. Sanders here? Why, yes, sir. He comes to see Mr. Lasher sometimes. When was the last time he came to this house? Mm, let me see. He hasn't been here in a long time. At least for two months. Yes, yes, at least that. I see. Well, it's now 8.32. Remember that, all of you. Lasher is alive now. What's more, Sanders? Yes, Mr. Carter? We're going to take further precautions to see that he stays alive, at least as far as you're concerned. Come on. <laughs> Carter, what's the idea of bringing me here to police headquarters? Because I want to look in on my friend, Sergeant Matheson, before we go back to Lasher's place. Well, at least the last two hours have passed quickly. Seeing your offices in laboratory was quite an experience, Carter. Well, at least it was one way of killing time while we were establishing your alibi. Uh, here's the sergeant's office, Nick. Hi, Maddie. Oh, hi, Nick. Patsy. Hello. This is Mr. Sanders. Sergeant Matheson. Hiya, Sanders. And you. Any further word from Lasher, Nick? No, Matty. I called Joey half hour ago. He reported Lasher was still very much alive. Good. I sent four men up there, as you suggested, just to cover the house and sort of keep a watch over Lasher. Thanks, Matty. I also did some checking down here. You know, Nick, Lasher was about the toughest DA we've ever had. Yeah, so I recall. One of the boys he put away and one who hated Lasher like poison got out of prison yesterday... Well, that's interesting. Who is he? Pete Arnold. Lasher got him sent up for 15 years for armed robbery. And the day he was sentenced, Arnold swore he'd get Lasher for sending him up. I think I remember him. Wasn't he a big, powerful fellow? Yeah. Mean. And dangerous, too. You know, Nick, I think we ought to go see Lasher again, whether he likes it or not. I think you got something there, Matty. Let's go. Come on, Sanders. All right. Where you go, I go. For tonight, at least. Got your men well hidden, Matty. Didn't see one anywhere. They're here all right, Nick. Don't worry about that. Hello. Oh, it's you again, Mr. Carter. Yes, Joey, and this time we're going to talk to Mr. Lasher, orders or no orders. Well, it's at your own risk, Mr. Carter. I know, Joey. Mr. Lasher, I'm coming in. I want to talk... Hey. Nick, he's dead. Oh, no, he can't be. He's dead all right. Dead, is he? Well, everyone stay right where you are. Don't touch a thing. Now, let me see. There's no blood, Nick. No. No sign of a struggle, either. Just that terrible expression on his face. For me, that means just one thing, Patsy. Lasher was poisoned. Nick, someone was here with him. Look at that bottle of liquor and the two glasses here on the desk. And the glass beside Lasher's hand is empty. But the other one's full. I'll call the medical examiner and the homicide boys. Now, you four go back in the living room. I don't want anything disturbed in here, intentionally or otherwise. Hey, Nick. A little while ago, two of the men I got outside saw someone peering through the window of the study where we found Lasher's body. Did they catch him? No, they lost him in the darkness. Huh. They said he resembled Pete Arnold in size. So the window's being dusted for prints, and so are the bottle and glasses. Oh, those glasses are hobnailed, Matty. They're huh? too rough to take an impression. Yeah. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right. Well, I'm going back in the study, Nick. You carry on, huh? Okay, Matty. Uh, Joey, why did Mr. Lasher insist upon being alone tonight? I don't know. All I know is that every once in a while he'd clear everybody out of the house except me. And my job was to see that nobody disturbed him. Mm-hmm. When was the last time that happened? Well, I'm not sure. About a year ago, I guess. Hey, Nick. Oh, yes, Matty. Yep, there were prints on the window. They match Pete Arnold's. That's so. And the medical examiner says he thinks it's poison. Just in the glass that Lasher drank from? No, in both glasses. The murderer must have slipped the poison into the bottle before it was poured. I see. Well, one thing is sure. Sanders didn't kill him. He was with us all the time. Thank you, Miss Bowen, for those kind words. Well, I'll get back to headquarters in case something breaks down there. Okay, Matty. You'll phone me just as soon as the poison's identified? You bet I will, Nick. Good. The minute I find out. Well, two lucky things happened to me tonight. That's so. Lasher is dead, and I'm saved from bankruptcy. Also, I ran into Nick Carter, who furnished me with a perfect alibi. I'm not even suspected of the murder. Well, you're a lucky man, Mr. Sanders. Uh, now, there was something said about a fee. The fee? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yes, I've got the cash right with me. 
Here, in $500 bills. Oh, lucky. Yes, there you are, Mr. Carter. $10,000 for three hours' work. Sanders, how does it happen you're carrying all that money around? Well, I always carry a lot of cash. Wouldn't be that you purposely had that much on you so you could wave it under my nose if I didn't want to take the case. What? Why, I didn't even know I'd meet you. No? When you collided with me, the radiator of your car was almost cold, yet you said you'd been driving around. Well, I had been. I doubt that. I believe you were parked at the curb until you saw Patsy and me start away from my house. I believe you were waiting for us. Are you trying to say that I framed that smash-up? I am. You deliberately planned to have me furnish you with an alibi. <laughs> I suppose next you'll say that I actually murdered Lasher. Yeah, I think you did. Well, oh, Nick, how could he? Carter, that's crazy. How could I have been with you and be at this house at the same time? I don't know the answers yet, but I'm going to find them. I'm sure you killed him. I don't have to stand here and listen to slander. You're not free to leave yet, Sanders, so stick around. Don't worry. I'll be around if you need me. Nick, what's going on here? You just took a $10,000 fee from a client and then accused him of murder. That's right, Bessie. Well, I don't understand. He was with us when it happened. You and I are his alibi. Yes, I know. But in spite of that, I'm positive Sanders killed William Lasher. As the case moves swiftly to a climax, Nick and Patsy serve as the alibi for the man Nick accuses of murder. In just a moment, we'll learn whether Nick can make this accusation stand. Now, back to the case of the perfect alibi. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. It is a short time later. The police are gone. Nick and Patsy are upstairs investigating Lasher's bedroom. Well, nothing here that gives us any clue. Uh-uh. You really think he murdered Lasher? I do. Well, what about Pete Arnold? He swore he'd kill Lasher someday. Pete Arnold didn't do this job. Well, how can you be so sure about that? Look, Patsy, Lasher knew Arnold was dangerous. Would he have invited him in for a drink? No. No, I don't suppose so. Besides, men like Arnold don't use poison when they kill. Yes? It's me, Joey. Oh, come on in. Yes, Joey? I thought I'd see if there was anything I could do. Oh, yes, yes, perhaps there is, Joey. Uh, Lasher was obviously a hot-tempered man. Was he always that way? Oh, no, sir. That was just on the surface. Underneath, he was a swell guy. Oh, that's so. Why, he built a new wing on the hospital and it cost him a quarter of a million dollars. That's the Blystone Wing. Why do you use that name? Because he didn't want his own name on it. He didn't even want anybody to know he'd paid for it. Well, uh, who was Blystone? Anyone special? Oh, yes. Mr. Blystone saved Mr. Lash's life in the First World War, and he was nearly killed doing it. Oh. He used to come here every year to talk about the war and old times and stuff. It was sort of an anniversary. You know where Blystone is now? Oh, he died five years ago. Oh, he... Oh, uh, must be Maddie calling about the poison, Patsy. Oh, I'll get it. Okay, thanks. Uh, about this Blystone... I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh, Draft dark stairways like. <laughs> Are you all right, Patsy? Oh, oh Patsy. Nick. Nick, I, I tripped. Never mind. Are you all right? Are you hurt, Miss Bowen? No. No, I, I don't think so. There was something stretched across the stairway. I, I felt it hit my ankle, and then I lost my balance. Gee, that's too bad. Sanders did that. Huh? I think scared. He knew I expected a phone call and wanted me to break my uh, neck, but he tripped you instead. But what was it that tripped me? This is an open stairway with a railing on both sides. You could have passed a wire or a cord across the step, pulled it up as you came down, then pulled the cord free and got away. Oh, gosh, what a dirty trick. I'll say. Help me up, Nick. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm all right. All right, let me help you to the studio, Pat. Mm -hmm. Sit down there and rest for a bit. Thanks, Nick. Okay? Much better. All right, there you are. Take it easy now until you feel okay. I will. Oh, Nick, that's Sergeant Madison probably wondering what on earth's wrong. Shall I answer it? No, no, I'll get it. Nick Carter speaking. Look, why don't you answer the phone? I was getting all set to come out there and see if you were still alive. I'm sorry, Maddie. Patsy tried to answer your first call, but she fell down the stairs. She fell? She didn't hurt herself. No, no, I don't think so. Nothing serious. Oh, good. Well, your hunch was right, Nick. The autopsy shows the liquor was poison. That was potassium cyanide in the bottle and both glasses. So that's why it works so fast. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you, you better watch out for Pete Arnold. 
My boys never did see him leave the place. Thanks, Mary. I'll do that. What did the sergeant say, Nick? Says it was poison. Cyanide. Oh. Hey, Joey. Were there any more glasses to this set Mr. Lasher used? Not that I know of. I never saw more than two of them. I see. Hey, this brandy. It's imported from France. More than 40 years old. Golly, it must be priceless. It is if you go in for that sort of thing. <sighs> now, to whom would Lasher serve 40-year-old brandy? Have to be somebody very special. Mr. Carter, I remember now. Yeah, what? Mr. Blystone, every time he came here, that bottle of brandy would turn up. Well, now. And about a year, once about a year since Mr. Blystone died, I, I'd i found the bottle here on the desk again with the two glasses. Did Lasher drink much? Oh, he never drank, Mr. Carter, except, well, maybe the times I found the bottle left on the desk. Nick, take him here quickly, by the window. Yes, what is it, Bessie? The second floor of the garage. Watch that window right in the middle. Yes. Someone's looking out. Someone with a cigarette in his mouth. Could... Could that be Pete Arnold? I don't know. But it won't take me long to find out. Watch it now, Patsy. He may... Get down, get down, get down. Nicky... Look, you stay right here. Don't move. But what are you going to do? I'm going around the other side. He's out of the garage now and around the west corner. I saw the gun flash. Oh, Nick, please be careful. I'll be careful. Now, if I can just make it to the... Uh-huh. Still shooting over the other way. Now, if I jump in fast... I grab that gun! Why, you... That'll hold you. Nick! Nick, did you get him? I did. He'll be with us as soon as he wakes up. Oh. Uh, having trouble, Mr. Carter? Well, Mr. Sanders. Yeah, Sanders, where have you been while all the fireworks were going on? I was just walking around, uh, thinking. Okay, suppose you take all of Pete's legs. We'll carry him into the house. Then we'll all do some thinking. Together. <laughs> Okay, one handcuff around this wrist, the chain behind the steam pipe, and the second cuff on his other wrist. Which takes care of Pete Arnold for the time being. Uh, Carter, why did you bring Arnold upstairs? Why not just turn him over to the police? Because there are no police here at the moment, Sanders. Matty took his men away. Figured that whoever had been prowling around had gone by now. He's waking up, Nick. Where am I? All right, cut it, Pete. You're not fooling anyone. I'm Nick Carter. They try to kill Patsy and me. Oh, what a sap I'd been. What a sap. Pete, did you kill Lasher? No. I was going to, but when I looked in the window, he was sitting there, dead. Then what happened? I heard the cops moving around, so I hid in the garage. Why? Because I had to. The cops seen me here, they'd have framed me for the job. Nobody's framing you, Pete. But the police are going to ask you a lot of questions. Well... I guess I'll be here when they come. Is this all you're going to do, Carter? Sit here in the study and wait? Aren't you going to send for the police? I'll be glad to, Sanders. You decided to confess? You're crazy, Carter. Here you have a man who swore he'd murder Lasher, who even tried to shoot you. Don't you know when you've caught a killer? <laughs> Sanders, there's an old photograph hanging on the wall here behind Lasher's desk. Huh? Looks like some of the men from Lasher's old infantry company. Yes, that's what it is, Mr. Carter. Oh, I know that picture. I've got a copy of it. Uh -huh. You're the third one from the left, aren't you? Yes. Who are the others? Can you name them? Yes, yeah, most of them. Brown, Myerson, Kelly, Blystone. And you knew Blystone? Of course I did. Oh. He's my sergeant. But if you're trying to tie him into this, you're wrong. He's been dead for five years. Yeah, so Joey told me. Oh, Patsy. Huh? Come into the living room a minute, will you? Of course, Nick. You too, Joey. Sure, Mr. Carter. Now listen, both of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I'm going to accuse Sanders of murder again, point blank. And I'm going to show him how I can prove it. Gee, can you do that? I'm going to try. I get it. You want to make him so desperate, he'll do something that will give himself away. That's it. 
Oh, but what about Pete Arnold? I've told you, Patsy, nothing as far as Lasher's murder is concerned. But if Pete didn't do it, and Sanders was with us, who was with Lasher when he was killed? Somebody had to be. Patsy, when Lasher died, there was no one with him except possibly a ghost. But a ghost? Nick, are you trying to tell me this is a supernatural case? No, simply the work of a murderer who planned every move well in advance. Oh. Now, let's get back to the study while I tell Sanders how he murdered Lasher without even being present. Well, be careful, Nick. Sanders may have a gun. I shouldn't be surprised. That's where Joey comes in. Me? Oh, gosh, I'll do anything I can. Okay, Joey, take one of those heavy bookends off that table. Go out of the house and around to the back. You have three minutes to reach the windows looking into the study. But then, then what do I do? Joey... When the time comes for you to act, you'll know it without me telling you. Oh. Well, you back again, eh, Carter? Yes, Sanders. Want to establish some facts? Oh? You knew Lasher and his dead friend Blystone from World War One. Suppose I did. You knew that Blystone saved Lasher's life and that Lasher and Blystone made a pledge after the war was over to meet once a year and celebrate the rescue. Does that make me a murderer? Now, Lasher never used liquor except once a year when he and Blystone each drank a small glass of this fine old brandy. And that celebration always took place on the same day, the date of Lasher's rescue, a date you knew because you were there when it happened. So, two men celebrate an anniversary and that makes me a murderer. It does because you knew about it. Joey tells me the bottle and the two glasses were kept in plain sight in the cabinet over the desk. You must have seen them many times. It's been very easy for you to come here to see Lasher, and then, while you were waiting here in the study for him... So that's it. Get it, Patsy? Of course. Sanders poisoned the bottle of brandy when he was here over two months ago. He knew it wouldn't be used until tonight... And he planned to set up an alibi for the exact time when Lasher would be killed. All right, both of you, put your hands up fast. Oh, I told you he had a gun near... Get him up. Thank you. So you found out about me. I did. You were too anxious to have Patsy and me be your alibi. And you were too eager to pay too much money for such a small job. I'm admitting nothing, Carter. But don't move, either of you. I have plans for you. Sanders backs away, his finger tightening against the trigger. We'll see what Nick does about this in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the perfect alibi. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Sanders slowly levels his gun at Nick and Patsy as he says, Here's where you and Miss Bowen get it. I hope you're ready. Right down, Patsy. Oh, nice going, Nick. That was some haymaker you landed on his jaw. Well, he won't do any more shooting for a while. Was it okay, Mr. Carter? Ah, you are marvelous. You were wonderful, Joey. Oh, gee, thanks, Miss Bowen. Mrs. Bowen. Boy, is he out cold. <laughs> well, Nick, your plan seems to have worked. Yeah, when Joey smashed the window, Sanders reacted just as I hoped he would. And that gave you a chance to go for him. Yeah. Well, Matty, you'll have two prisoners now. Pete Arnold and Sanders. Gosh, it's hard to believe. Sanders killed Lasher and wasn't even here when it happened. That's right. Then Blystone was the ghost who was with Lasher when he was killed. Right. Oh, gosh, Nick, that was a clever scheme. Yes, and safe, too. The brandy was never used for anything else. <laughs> he simply set a murder trap and waited for the reunion to set it off. Right, which is murder in the first degree, as he'll find out very shortly. <laughs> Pay to the order of the community chest. Ten thousand dollars. <laughs> Nick, this is the first time in a long time a murderer's money has helped a worthy cause. A murderer's money? Hmm? Well, I like that. That's my money, Patsy. I earned it by giving Sanders the alibi you wanted. <laughs> oh, that's right, you did. Now, if you just sign the check, I'll get it into the mails right away. All right, then you can go home. Oh, it's too bad you had to miss the play, Patsy. Yes, it's a shame. It was a mystery, Nick. Honestly, I love mystery plays more than any other kind.
Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cudahy Packing Company, makers of new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Norman A. Daniels. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance therein to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Sonny Dollar. George Reed, Johnny, at Floyd's of England. Well, hiya, George. What can I do for you? Well, Johnny... Johnny, I'm afraid I've got myself into a rather embarrassing situation. Yeah, what have you done this time? One of the company's most important clients is a man named Orson Ogilvy Terwilliger. Oh. Retired. He's a collector. He lives down near the little town of Bethel, New York. Where's that? Across the Hudson, east of Poughkeepsie, between Monticello and Coshecton in the Mongop Valley. Yo, oh, 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 hold it. I'd better look it up on the map. Yes, I wish you would, Johnny. Then go on down there right away. Oh, why not? What for? Terwilliger insists that someone from the company, preferably I, call on him immediately. Immediately, Johnny, regarding some change he wants to make in his life insurance policy. What kind of a change? Well, I haven't the least idea, but it's a really sizable policy. How sizable? Over half a million. That's sizable. With a double indemnity clause. Wow, we... You can see why it's important that we cater to this man. All right, so why don't you tear on down there? Well, you see, Johnny... Well, I... Oh, dear. Yeah? What's the matter, Georgie? I'm making this call from the city jail. You what? No, some fool <laughs> traffic cop. I mean... One of our fine highway patrolmen. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid in my anxiety to get down to see Mr. Terwilliger, well, I may have been speeding a little, and, well, I made the mistake of arguing with this this officer quite vehemently, oh, Johnny. Oh, no. Man, well, my hearing isn't until tomorrow morning. Well, look, why don't you send somebody else from the office to see this man? Have my own employees find out what's happened? All right, then telephone. And have him find out? Oh, please, Johnny, go down there and listen. I'll double whatever your expenses are and give you $100 besides. Oh, but now is that really all there is for me to do? Just find out from him what change he wants in his policy? Yes, but why do you ask that way? Oh, uh, nothing, nothing. Only every time you hand me one of these real easy assignments, I find I'm lucky to get out of it alive. <laughs> CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Next time you refresh, enjoy a frosty, ice-cold Pepsi-Cola. Sociability, Charlie. All right, Kay, how's this? Pepsi is light, refreshes without filling. You like to refresh? Have a Pepsi right now. Well, offer it to everybody, Charlie. I will. Enjoy Pepsi at the fountain. It's delicious at home, too. Have one at lunch or with a snack. Charlie. At the beach or at dinner. Wherever you go, wherever you're thirsty, Pepsi is there. It's here, too, in our Be Sociable song. Be sociable. Look smart. Keep up to date with Pepsi. Drink light, refreshing Pepsi. Stay young and fair and get an air. Be sociable. Have a Pepsi. For the weekend, have plenty of Pepsi around. Pick up an extra carton today. CK, I'm sociable. With Pepsi, everyone is. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, North American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the collector's matter.
Expense account item one, nine eighty five for a cab to Bradley Field and a plane to New York. Item two, fifty dollars deposit on a rental car, and I drove north and west on six and seventeen, and finally Route seventeen B in my search for the little town of Bethel. The foot of the Catskills country is mighty beautiful this time of year. I wonder it's a famous vacation spot for thousands who spend most of their lives in the noise and dirt of the big cities. Lots of mountains, trees, fresh air, and flowers. The so-called town of Bethel was little more than a crossroads with a couple of general stores and gas stations and Emma's Hotel. At Emma's, I asked directions to the Terwilliger place. Oh, you mean the big place over the lake? Well, I don't know, is it? Yeah, it's a beautiful place. And if they do decide to sell it, well, you know the rumors about it. Yeah, well, how do I get there? Well, you see that road right across the highway? That's it. Well, first you pass Lake Superior, the Scott Place, uh-huh. about a mile and a half, maybe two miles. You see a turn to the left. Uh-huh. It takes you up the side of the little mountain to the big house. Okay, thanks. Such a narrow, twisting road, though, so be careful when you drive. Oh, sure, and I'm but not such a... a beautiful view it gives of Mr. Tavilico's private lake. Oh, that's fine. I'll give it a good look. And maybe he'll show you his wonderful collection of guns and weapons that he has. That yeah, beautiful gun. Yes, I'll ask him about them, and thanks and again. And you come back if you feel like a nice, cool beer on this hot water. Yes, I'll stop by again. Thanks. I passed the Lake Superior, he'd mentioned. Then a couple of miles beyond, made a left turn that put me on the narrow, winding road up the side of a hill above another, a smaller lake. I wondered why Terwilliger, with all his money, hadn't improved this road. I thought of what might happen to someone trying to negotiate it too fast. Well, I didn't have time to think about it for long. Huh? The other car must have been coming down the hill, but apparently had taken the narrow little turn much too quickly, then skidded and rolled over to land against a huge boulder that stuck out on the side of the hill just below the road. After a struggle with it, I managed to get one of the doors open to see if the man inside was still alive. He wasn't, though his body was still warm. I reached into his pocket, pulled out a billfold, looked at the driver's license in it. Yeah. Orson O. Terwilliger. That's a warning signal for all drivers. And that can be a warning signal for drowsy drivers on long, monotonous trips. You see, driving can make you drowsy no matter how much sleep you get. And driving and dozing just don't mix. Why take chances? Take no-dose, stay-awake tablets. Millions of times a year, safe no-dose keeps drivers awake and alert. Helps you bounce back so that you feel sharp, ready for any emergency. How does no-dose do it? Ask your doctor. He'll tell you that no-dose contains a safe and accurate amount of caffeine, the same refreshing stimulant you get in your coffee or tea. But safe no-dose acts faster, is handier and more reliable. Best of all, it is not habit-forming. And no-dose is so safe, it is legally sold on a national basis without a prescription. Get no-dose, stay-awake tablets, to help you stay awake and alert. It could save your life. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Collector's Matter. Yeah. The man lying there in the car that had skidded off the road was the man I'd come to see. Orson O. Terwilliger. And he was very dead. Not knowing what sort of police or medical facilities the town of Bethel had to offer, I decided to poke around a bit. But before I could lift the body out of this car, another one came down the narrow road from the direction of the big house on top of the hill. Well, stranger, did you have some trouble with your... Oh, no, that's Orson's car. This gal was a doll, maybe five foot two with blonde hair and for a moment sparkling blue eyes. And a figure inside a tight blue capris and yellow silk shirt that would have made any man turn his head. She stood there a moment, staring at the body, and looked out of disbelief on her lovely face. Then I caught her as she started to slump to the ground, hands covering her face, her whole body shuddering with her sobs. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry. I... <gasps> Why did a thing like this have to happen? Just when Orson and I were... Easy now. Easy. Just take it easy. Uh, Makes you feel better, Glenn. No. No. 
What good is it to cry over him? It won't... It won't bring him back to life. No, I'm... I'm afraid nothing will now. Why does it have to happen to people like... I'm terribly sorry. I didn't mean to throw myself into your arms. Oh, that's... That's uh, perfectly all right. The shock of suddenly... I'm Blanche Terrilliger, his wife. Who are you? My name is Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar? Insurance investigator? Yes, that's right, Mrs. Terrilliger. Your husband had asked that I well at someone for the office. Sounds like a terrible thing to say, John. Yeah? But I'm glad it was you who found him here. Oh. After all the awful things that people... Only they aren't true at all. They never were. They... Well, we'd better, I... I suppose we'd better call Dr. Parker and the police and... Shall we go up to the house, Johnny? Yeah. Sure. At the house, I made the call to Dr. Parker. In a matter of minutes, he and another man, a Mr. Harry Allen, arrived, and together we went back and inspected the scene of the accident. No question to me. No question at all. Ah, yes, Mr. Dollar. I'm the whole police force here in Bethel. Somebody's got to do it. I see, Mr. Allen. Uh, Chief. Don't you uh, agree, Doctor? Plain as day, isn't it? Yeah, Chief. Mr. Dollar, it's just an unfortunate accident. Those marks on his head and body are simply a result of the car rolling over. All of them, Doctor? Why Orson didn't know better than to take this turn too fast is... Uh, What'd you say, Mr. Dollar? Well, this bruise on his forehead... When he struck the windshield. That's right. Killed him instantly. And here, on his chest, from the steering wheel. Uh Uh-huh. But that, uh, that round contusion, I guess you'd call it, there behind his left ear. Small, a perfect circle. Mm -hmm. Something inside the car when it rolled. Was it? Yep. Maybe. Suppose you show me one thing, anything, inside the car that could have made that clean, clear mark. Now, you look here, darling. Yes, Chief. It was pure accident that killed him, no doubt about it. The doc knows it, I know it, and you know it. Just because you're one of these high-powered, big city-type special investigators, just don't let your imagination run away with you. Chief is right, Mr. Dollar. Sure. Now, come on. Let's haul the body up to the house and help Mrs. Terwilliger make arrangements with that funeral home down to Monticello. Anything else we can do? Very good idea, Chief. And, uh, say, Dollar, you're a healthy young buck with a sharp eye. Now, what's that supposed to mean? Well, now you tell me the truth. Don't you think Terwilliger's wife is one of the prettiest girls you ever did see? Yeah, she is. Such a shame that she and him never really... Rumor, Chief. That's just a lot of idle gossip. Yeah, yeah, Doc. I guess you're right. Is he, Chief? Huh? I wonder... Up at the big home on the hill, Mrs. Terwilliger, only I called her Blanche now, at her insistence, she called to make arrangements for her husband's funeral. Considering her obvious shock over the whole affair, she was doing very well. She'd also call one of the local garages to remove the wreck of the car. It would be so horrible to have to see it there day after day. That car, the thing that killed him. Yes, yes, I know what you mean. You're very understanding, Johnny, and I like you for it. Yeah, well, I... uh... Yeah, I guess there's nothing further that we can do now. I've made out the death certificate and, uh... Um, Blanche, my dear. Yes, Doctor. You sure you wouldn't like to come down the hill, stay with Mrs. Parker and me until this is all over? Oh, no, Doctor, but thank you very much. You've all been wonderful to me and I appreciate it. That means you too, Chief Allen. Oh, now, it's a real pleasure, Miss Blanche. Well, yeah, I suppose you're... Oh, but Johnny. Yes? Would you stay and help me make out the insurance? Oh, it sounds terrible to talk about it at a time like this. Uh, yeah, but all those things have to be done, my dear. So, Mr. Dollar, if you'd like to stay here... Uh, no, no, I'd better run on down to Amherst Hotel and arrange for a place to stay overnight. A hotel when we have this nice big house with plenty of... Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot that I'm alone now. You really shouldn't be, my dear. 
Johnny, maybe you'd come back to tell me what I must do about the insurance. Maybe have dinner with me? Oh, that would be a good idea. Yeah. Maybe this. Expense account item three ninety cents for a phone call at Emmer's Hotel. Orson Terwilliger is dead. And George, there's just one thing I want to know. Johnny, I simply can't. Yes, what is it? Who are the beneficiaries of Terwilliger's insurance? Why, there's only one. His wife, Blanche Terwilliger. Yes. I know it. George, is that policy pretty much a standard form? Yes, it is. Double indemnity, as I think I told you. But he said he wanted some changes made. To quote him exactly, he said he wanted to make a change in it. But frankly, I can't imagine what or why. Five will get you ten. He wanted to change the beneficiary. Really? But the beautiful Blanche played it smart. She didn't give him a chance. Yes, I suppose that is a... What? Yeah. Now, Johnny, no, listen. If you mean what I think you do, what I mean is... Yeah, George. Give it some thought. That's a favorite pastime these summer days, munching Fritos corn chips. There's nothing else like them. No other kind of chip that can match Fritos' crisp, refreshing flavor. Fritos are made to munch by the bag full or with salads, sandwiches, and long, tall drinks. They have just the right taste and texture contrast to make good food or iced drinks taste even better. Children love them, and they're a really healthful, nourishing between-meal snack in summer. Grown-ups find there's contentment in every munch of Fritos corn chips. Their special flavor is really satisfying. Get a bag today. F-R-I-T-O-S. Fritos corn chips. Munch, 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 Frito corn chips. It's not polite to smack your lips. But you can't help it with Fritos corn chips. Munch, 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 Frito corn chips. Now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dr. Parker and Chief Allen were convinced that Terwilliger's death was accidental. Well, I wasn't. Yet, all I had to go on, some talk the Terwilliger place might be put up for sale, and nothing in itself unless I could find out why. Or perhaps the reason might tie in with the rumors, the, the gossip that had been mentioned to me. Rumors of what? That Blanche and her husband weren't getting along? As for actual evidence that he was murdered, all I had to go on was that funny little mark behind his ear. I borrowed a flashlight there at the hotel and drove back to the scene of the so-called accident. I went over the ground with a fine-tooth comb. Nothing. Then I went up to the place where the car must have started its skid. I searched the bushes all around and then... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What under the sun is... And more important, where did it come from? It's much longer than an ordinary. Hmm. As for the fletching... This thing's been used all right, recently. And instead of a point, it has the heavy, round stone head. Who is it? Speak up or I'll shoot. Oh, that's a nice way to welcome a dinner guest. Johnny. Johnny, you got me from... Oh, well, I'm sorry, Blanche. I saw your flashlight down here and couldn't imagine who it was. And since you hadn't come up to dinner as you promised. Oh, I was on my way. I hope I'm not too late. Hey, do you always wander around carrying a gun? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Here, you'd better take it. Yeah. I'm not used to these things, though heaven knows I've seen enough of them. Your husband's gun collection. But why'd you stop here, Johnny? What were you doing? And what in the world's that? Oh, just a... Well, there, there must have been some Indians around here at one time or another. Oh, yes. I understand this was great Indian country. Now, Johnny... Yeah? My invitation to dinner still stands. Great. I'm starving. Mighty fine dinner, Blanche. More coffee? I'm almost embarrassed, though. Now, why do you say that? But a chance to be close to someone is, well... More coffee? Oh, no, 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 not another thing. Well, then let's go in by the fire in the library and talk. Johnny. Yeah? It's a great comfort to have you here tonight. Thanks, you, uh, 
You don't mind if I hold your hand? Kid stuff, huh? No. It isn't. Oh. Uh, now, this collection of weapons you were going to show me. No. You have to look at it. Well, I, I kind of like to. All right. It's in the library, too. Okay. You know, Blanche, with your figure... Hmm? Well, I, uh, well, what I meant was you must have been quite the athlete when you were in college. Now, what brought that on? Swimming? Tennis? That sort of thing? Sure, everything. Blanche Ransom, girl athlete. Uh, pistol team? The way you handled this gun a while ago. Only a person who knows guns has the proper respect for them. Well, I still don't like them. Then all things considered, it's better that I keep this one. What? All things considered? Your husband had to drive very slowly around that curve, didn't he? Yeah. I guess he didn't for once, or he wouldn't... Slowly enough so that somebody couldn't have missed him with a pea shooter, much less a deadly weapon. Tell me, what in the world... Archery was your best event, wasn't it? Archery? Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid that's why I took your hand. Johnny... Phalluses like that come from only one thing, using a heavy bow, a hunting bow... This one here on the wall? Now, Johnny, listen, honestly. Why did you do it? Why did you do it, Blanche? I... I don't know what... With this bow and with the arrow I found out there... Johnny! His flat, round, heavy stone head just before he reached that curve in the road. Well... All right, Johnny. But listen, if you knew how long I... If you knew what I had to... Listen, please. Murder. For a chance and a lousy million bucks. I guess I lost. Didn't I? Oh, yeah. You lost. And according to the law, no person convicted of the murder of the decedent shall be entitled to any portion of the estate, including the insurance. But just don't forget my commission on that amount. Expense account total, including room and board at Emmer's and the trip back to Hartford, one eighty-five sixty, Doubled. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Constipation is something people don't talk much about, but it can be a problem for anyone, even doctors. And when constipation occurs, it's interesting to see just what doctors consider important about a laxative they might use or recommend. Now, a majority of the doctors we heard from had this to say. A laxative should be effective, gentle, close to natural acting. A medicine that can be used with complete confidence. Well, pleasant-tasting chocolated X-lax is effective. Overnight, it helps you toward your normal regularity. X-Lax is so gentle, so close to natural acting, there's no upset. That's why many doctors and millions of people use X-Lax with complete confidence. X-Lax, the laxative that helps you toward your normal regularity gently, overnight. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Well, next week, well, you know something? It's probably the most unusual case I ever set out to investigate. What's more, it shows to what extremes a clever and genius man can go to cover to up any possible connection with a crime. In this case, murder. And remember the title of it. It's called The Back to the Back Matter. Now, keep the title in mind when you listen to it. Maybe if you do, you'll be able to spot the solution to this murder long before the end of my report on it. Just remember, though, it involves one of the cleverest alibis ever established. One that only the suspect himself can break down. Join us then, won't you? Yours truly... Johnny Dolan. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, G. Stanley Jones, Horace Lewis, Vic Perrin, and Bart Robinson. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is John Wall speaking. 
Get your goose pimples at the ready. Suspense follows in just one moment on the CBS radio network. The United States Marine Corps is now accepting men between the ages of 20 and 27 who are college graduates for the officer candidate course. If you are mentally and physically qualified, you can train as a candidate for 10 weeks at Quantico, Virginia, and win your gold bars as a Marine Corps second lieutenant. Find out how you can serve with the finest. The United States Marines. See your local Marine recruiter. This is WRW 590 on the dial, serving the Tri-Cities from Albany, New York. Donald Crisp says, I just shared a very happy experience working with Jane Wyman and Richard Egan in Walt Disney's Pollyanna. See this new Disney motion picture. For Pollyanna is a story that's filled with every human emotion. Yes, you'll share the experience of thrilling entertainment filled with drama, fun, and happiness when you see Walt Disney's Pollyanna. Don't miss this heartwarming picture starting Wednesday at Fabian's Palace, Albany. Proctor's Troy, Proctor's Schenectady. Starts July 13th, Glove, Gloversville. The time now is 5.30. Thank heaven someone's come. Help me. What's the matter? What's happening? Oh, it's awful. Oh, Mrs. Gordon, for not, she's just fine. Yeah, her dress is all torn. Yeah, I see. If you don't cut that out, sir, I'll... Mr. crazy. Don't, don't let him hit me again. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Joseph Curtin and Alice Frost. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, The Premature Corpse. It's a beautiful night in New York, clear, fresh, and in the snug apartment of Purdy Hathaway, warm. A night for music, for friendship, for love. And Shirley Hollis seems to have this last on her mind as she snuggles up to Purdy on the sofa. Oh, Purdy, I was just getting comfortable. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to run along, Shirley. Some people are coming over in a little while. Will they be here long? I don't know. It's business. He's Jerry North, the publisher. They're going to discuss a book I've written. Well, I'll wait till they leave. I want to talk to you, too. I, uh... Come here. What do you want? Put your arms around. Now, look, Shirley. Then I will. There. Hello, Ferdy. It's, uh... It's getting awfully warm in here. Yes. Isn't it? I, uh... Yes, Ferdy? Is this what you want? Oh, yes, darling. That's just what I want. Now, that didn't hurt, did it? You little cheat. Ferdy. My brother's wife. What do you want with me? You know I don't love Doug. I knew it when you married him. But you loved his money... I tried to tell him, but he wouldn't listen. I don't know why you've always hated me. Because you're a little cheat. You married Doug for his money, and now... Yes, now now what? What do I want with you? You don't have money. You want something. I want you. That's all. Can't you see that, Ferdy? It's always been That's what you want me to think. But I know you. It's just another one of your schemes. I wouldn't put it past you even to try to get me to... to get rid of Doug for you. Now that you have his money. Is that what you want, is it? Oh, poor suspicious Ferdy. You didn't answer my question. I know why you don't like me, Ferdy. It's not Doug. There's nothing to do with Doug. You still didn't... It's that stuffy superiority of yours, that stuffy righteousness. You're a Hathaway and I was just a chorus girl. That's why you didn't want Doug to marry me. That's why you think you're too good for me. You're a cheat. That's why I... Oh, that Hathaway superiority. Well, how about Doug? I suppose he's not a cheat. What are you talking about? I'm talking about your brother. A Hathaway, a crook. That's a lie. You know it isn't. Well, maybe you don't. Maybe you've blinded yourself with that phony righteousness of yours until you can't see what's going on right in front of you. What do you mean? What's going on? You say I married Doug for his money. Well, how did he make that money, huh? The Hathaway fortune? Business. Sure, business. Some business. Black market in the wartime. You're crazy. It so happens I can prove it. And that's not all I can prove if I have to. I know enough about Doug to send him to jail. How would you like that? A Hathaway in jail, Get out of here. Why don't you stop kidding yourself, Ferdy? So your grandfather was Colonel Hathaway. You're just a hack writer. Your brother's a crook. Stop it. Come on off that high horse. You're no better than I am and no worse. We could be friends. Good friends. Never. Oh, Ferdy. Look at me. You 
cheap, lying, dirty oh, look. I'm not taking any more of that. Let go. I tried to be nice, but you I... don't want it that way. All right. Hey, those nails are sharp. And so am I, Keith. So I'm... You're asking for this. Put down that poker. I will on your head. No, no, you don't. Let me have it. Oh, you're hurting me. I haven't stopped. Ah, don't try biting again or I'll make sure you don't have any teeth left to bite with. Now, come on. Drop that poker. All right. That's better. And now get out of here. I've got to get cleaned up before the Norse get here. What's so funny? You're always concerned about impressions, aren't you, Ferdy? Well, brother, I promise you, you're going to make a beaut. The more I think about it, Jerry, the more I think his sister will have to be killed, too. What? Uh, but not shot. I think strangling would be better. What on earth are you talking about, Pam? Well, about Mr. Hathaway's book, of course. Well, what did you think? I didn't know. The way you start a subject out of a clear blue sky. It wasn't a clear blue sky. It was a murky green elevator. Mm. And it's in Mr. Hathaway's building, so I, I should think you'd know what I meant. I see. Well, let's go tell Mr. Hathaway the sister ought to be strangled. I'm sure he'll love the suggestion. It'll mean rewriting three chapters. But it'll make a story much stronger. In one woman's opinion. Well, did... Golly, what was that? Sounded like it came from the apartment at the end of the hall. Jerry, it's Mr. Hathaway's apartment. Yeah, I wonder what... Oh, thank heaven someone's come. Help me. What's the matter? What's happening? Please. Oh, it's all... Don't listen to her, Mr. North. She tried to kiss me when I wouldn't let him. He hit me. Jerry, her dress is all torn. Yeah, I see. She's just trying to embarrass me, Mr. North. Why would she try to do that? It's kind of hard to explain. No, bet it is, you maniac. Oh, stop it, Shirley. Did you hit her, Mr. Hathaway? Her face looks bruised. Well, yes, I, I guess I did, but... Why? Well, be, because she bit me. Stop it, Shirley. Jerry, keep hysterical. It's just a night. If you don't cut that out, Shirley, I'm going to have to hit you again. Oh, no. Mr. No, don't, don't let him hit me. He won't. Now, come on. Let's go in and see what this is all about. No, no. I, I want to go home. I, I want to see Doug. I want my Doug. <laughs> Doug, it was awful. When I wouldn't let him make love to me, he... Well, he got like crazy. He, he said all kinds of awful things about you and me. All right, Shirley, forget it. It's over. Oh, I can't, Doug. I, I'm afraid. He said he'd see you in jail. What? That's right. He said you were crook and he can prove it. Bertie said that? Yes, he started talking about your tie-up with gambling. How and... does he know about that? I don't know, but... He said he's going to make sure you get what's coming to you unless... Unless I... Oh, oh... Doug, I can't. Not even to save you, I can't. All right, sweetheart, you won't have to. I can handle Ferdy. Oh, he'll deny it. He'll make up some story. Don't worry. If you don't believe me, you can ask the Norths. They say... I believe you, Shirley. I... I hate... hate to have to tell you this about your own brother, Doug. Yeah, my brother. My dear, sanctimonious brother. Be just like him to keep his threat and run to the police now that he knows about me. I've got to figure some way to shut him up. But How? I'll think of something. And one thing's for sure, he's going to keep away from you, or I promise you, Shirley, I'll kill him. What's the matter, Ferdy? Don't you like this restaurant? Sure, Laura. Well, you're not eating. I'm not hungry. Laura, I've got to tell you something. I don't know how to begin. Laura. Yes, Ferdy. I love you, Laura. You know that. <laughs> For someone who says he doesn't know how to begin, I'd say you're doing fine. I only hope you believe what I'm going to tell you. My sister-in-law, Doug's wife, Shirley, came over to my place last night. Yes? She made a play for me. What? She tried to get me to make love to her. When I wasn't interested, she blew her top. Ah, oh, the woman scorned. Well, it's more than that. She doesn't want me. She wants to use me. Use you? What for? I'm not sure, but... Well, you know she only married Doug for his money. Yes. I think she wants to get rid of Doug. I think she wants me to help her. Get rid of him? Well, how? How? Kill him. 
Oh, no, Fred. You don't know Shirley like I do. Yeah, Laura, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what she wants. Well, why are you telling me this? Because I think Shirley's going to try to go through with it, with or without my help. So I've got to warn Doug. Well, I still don't see... He's not going to want to believe me. Especially because she's probably filled him full of lies. But I, I may be able to convince him. I've got to. Maybe if I tell him some of the things she said about what him... What things? Oh, it's beside the point. The point is, she's going to be afraid I may convince him. So she's going to try to shut me up. How? I told you about last night. Yes? Well, she's already turned that around to make it look like I attacked her. Oh. Yeah. And that she's poured it on heavy to Doug. Yeah, that's why I wanted to get to you first. I, I wanted you to hear this story from me the way it really happened. I see. Because you've got to believe me, Laura. I, I can't let her break us up. And she's going to try. I know she is. If she can't shut me up one way, she'll try another. There's nothing she won't stop at to get what she wants. But it's not going to work. At least, I hope it's not. Hello. Hello, Jerry. This is Bill Wagon. Oh, yes, Bill. How are you? Okay. Say, Jerry, what can you tell me about Ferdy Hathaway? Hathaway? I'm considering publishing a book he wrote. Why, does he want to go to your office and do research on how the homicide squad works? No, no, it's the other way around. What do you mean? Oh, we got to see him, and it's not research. This is the real thing. You mean he killed somebody? No, that's the other way around, too. Somebody killed him. Let's go. Pam, it hasn't been two minutes since I hung up the phone. And you asked me to tell Bill we couldn't possibly to get over to see him for at least an hour. Oh, we're not going to see Bill. We're not? No. But darling, he wants to talk to us. I told him about the incident last night and he wants all the details. Oh, we'll tell him. Later. <sighs> all right, dear. But if we're not going to see Bill right now, where are we going? To see Laura, of course. Oh, yes, of course. Laura. That's a good idea. Oh, I thought you'd agree, darling. Uh, there's just one thing, though. Oh, what's that, dear? Who in blazes is Laura? Oh, you know, Jerry. I do? Uh, Laura Arnold. Uh, Freddie Hathaway's girlfriend. Mm -hmm. oh, don't you remember? He mentioned her last night. He was afraid that she might hear about Shirley's accusation and, and might believe it. Oh, that's right. And if she did believe it, it might make her angry. And you think it might have made her angry enough to commit murder? Well, you never know. At least it's worth checking up on. As long as Bill wants us to give him information, maybe we can take him more than he counted on. Yes? Are you Laura Arnold? Yes. Well, I I'm Pamela North, and this is my husband, Jerry North. Oh, the publisher. I've heard Freddie mention you... What do you want with me? We'd like to talk to you, if we may. Well, I'm I'm pretty busy right now. We'll only take a few minutes. Uh, well, all right, come in. What's it about? Ferdy. What about him? I'm afraid you're in for a bad shock, Miss Arnold. He's been murdered? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Why do you ask that? He said Shirley wouldn't stop at anything, so... Well, naturally, I've been afraid... When did he tell you that? Today at lunch. And that's the last you saw of him? Yes. I, I came home right afterward, about one. I've been here ever since. Well, that's funny. When we asked if you were in just before we came up, the desk clerk said you got in only about 20 minutes ago. Well, I... Uh, what did oh, Mr. North, I'm frightened. I don't know what to do. Well, maybe we can help you, if you tell us the truth. Yes. Yes, the truth. I, I did have lunch with Ferdy. He told me about Shirley. And, uh, then we went back to his place and talked a while... And I left. But about an hour later, I realized I'd left my gloves up there, so I went back. Mm -hmm. And there he was, on the floor, dead. I'll never forget how he looked. I don't want to think about it. You'd better sit down, Miss Arnold. <laughs> there are a couple of things I'd still like to ask you. Because if we're going to help you, we'll have to know what we're doing. Yeah. 
She says she was afraid you'd suspect her, Bill. That's why she wouldn't give a name when she phoned that uh, she discovered the murder. And why she ran out before you got there. Uh-huh. Well, I'll get around to her later, after I've had a talk with Hathaway's brother and the brother's wife. Uh, find out if they own a, a yellow convertible, Bill. Yes, that's right. Miss Arnold says that a yellow convertible pulled away from in front of Ferdy's place just as she arrived the second time. Did she know the make? No, she said she never saw one like it. It was very long and low. And, and it had a funny-shaped back, uh, kind of like... Um... Uh, well, the, the way she described it, it, it must look something like... Well, like, like the back of that car parked right in front of us. Hey, Pam, that is the car. Fits a description to a T. And it's parked right in front of Douglas Hathaway's apartment. Uh, let's go in and see what he has to say about it. You have your job to do, Lieutenant, but is it necessary to question me now? After all, it's quite a shock hearing my brother's been murdered. Well, suppose we question your wife. And from what I hear about last night, I don't imagine his death should make her too unhappy. I didn't kill him, if that's what you're implying. I'm not implying anything. I just want to ask you some questions. I suppose you want to know where I was. Well, I was right here. I've been home all day long. Was your husband with you? No. He was at the office, Mrs. North. Oh, well, then nobody was with you here. Nobody saw you. The servants did. Part of the time, anyway. And part of the time, not. Oh, Doug, are you going to let them suggest... No. Look, Lieutenant, I can't take this now. I don't feel up to questions, and I certainly don't intend to sit by while you badger Shirley. Well, let's clear up the matter of the car, at least. What about the car? Did you drive it to work this morning? Couldn't. It's brand new. It wasn't delivered until noon. Then you didn't have it with you at the office. I just told you... All right, all right. You didn't have it. And you, Mrs. Hathaway, uh, you didn't go out at all? How many times do I have to tell you? Well, then who did have the car? Nobody. The salesman delivered it, left it out front, and it's been there all afternoon. Well, if you want to get by with a story like that, you should get a car that's not quite so distinctive. What do you mean? Tell her, Jerry. Well, Mrs. Hathaway, it so happens your car was seen driving away from your brother-in-law's right after the murder. And with a custom job like that, there can be no mistake. Well, I... Well, that is, I, I don't... All right, Lieutenant. I had the car. Oh, you did, Hathaway? Yes, I... I came home from the office early and picked it up, went to see Ferdy, but I didn't kill him. Why'd you go there? I wanted to talk to him, but there was a man with him. What I had to say was private, family matter. Didn't care to discuss it in front of a stranger, so I left. Well, who was the stranger? Ferdy didn't introduce us. I was only there a minute. What did he look like? Tall, blonde, well-dressed. You'd know him if you saw him again? Yes, but now that's enough questions. Uh, not quite. I still... I said that's know. enough. Now, look, Mr. Hathaway, I'm just trying to find out with... What? Say, where are you going? To call my lawyer and see if I have to put up with this. Don't answer anything until I come back, Shirley. When you know Doug better, Lieutenant, you'll know better than to try to cross him. What? What was that? Well, there must be someone in there with Doug. They're fighting. Oh, shot. Come on, Bill. Yeah. There's Hathaway on the floor. Oh, uh, he, he got away. Window to the terrace. I'll go see what I can find, Jerry. And you stay with Hathaway and see if he's all right. Right. Doug. Oh, oh Doug, what happened? He was hiding in here. A fellow I saw at Ferdy's tried to slug me with a blackjack. But I heard him and turned, just grazed the side of my head. Yes, you've got a gash there. I put up a fight. He broke away, ran for the window. I fired at him. Guess I missed. Blow had me kind of woozy. You're sure it's the same man you saw at Ferdy's? Positive. Well, I took a quick look outside. No sign of anyone now. Well, he could have crossed the terrace to another apartment or, or gone down the fire escape and ducked in below. But then he's still in the building. Yeah, he'll be out of it before he can do anything about it, Pam. Then what do we do? Well, first of all, Hathaway, you stop being coy and give us a detailed description of this character. Or do you still want to call your lawyer? No, Lieutenant, you win. I'll tell you whatever I can. There's your coffee, Jerry. Jerry. Jerry North! Uh, oh, uh, uh, what then? <laughs> Your coffee. I, I know you don't like it cold. Oh, thanks. Where were you? What? Just now, in your thoughts. Y you were miles away. I was thinking about the Hathaway case. It's been three days now, and no sign of the mysterious stranger. Well, maybe they'll never find him. He had time to get far away. But I don't think he did. That's what I've been thinking about. Do you think you know where he is? Maybe. Anyway, I'll bet there's one place they haven't tried yet. Where's that? The morgue. The morgue? Mm-hmm. 
And somehow I have an idea it might yield results. Pretty good idea of yours, Jerry. Uh, I don't know, Bill. Wait till we see if Hathaway identifies the body. Yeah. I could be wrong, but this seemed like the logical bet. Well, here's where we find out. Here's Hathaway. Morning, gentlemen. Morning. Oh, good morning. Am I late? No, right on the nose, Hathaway. Well, should we go in and get it over with? Yes, let's. All right. Right through here. You really think it's the right man, eh, Lieutenant? Well, that's for you to say, Hathaway. He seems to fit the description you gave us. Oh, here he is. Well, Hathaway? That's the man. Are you sure? Yes, Lieutenant, I'm sure. Well, Jerry, seems you were right. Mm-hmm. You know, Hathaway, this is very interesting. Now, you say you saw this man at your brother's the day your brother was killed. That's right. Your brother was killed on Tuesday... But it so happens this fella died on Monday. You see, Pam, I thought that if Hathaway was lying, he'd jump at the chance to strengthen the story. So I suggested that Bill show him a corpse that approximated the description he gave us. Yes, after all, the corpse couldn't talk back. Right. And now that we've eliminated the mysterious stranger, we can concentrate on the real suspects. And Bill thinks he can wrap it up. That's why he asked us down here today. Come in. Oh, Pam and Jerry. Huh? Well, how's it going, Bill? We just started. I don't see why you had to bring them in, Lieutenant. Because, Mrs. Hathaway, they were present when you had your unpleasantness with your brother-in-law. All right, we had an unpleasant scene, but it wouldn't make me kill him. That depends on the reason for the scene, Mrs. Hathaway. I told you the reason. He tried to make love to me. And... I can suggest another. Yes, Jerry? Suppose Mrs. Hathaway wanted to get rid of her husband. What do you mean? He has a lot of money, Mrs. Hathaway. Maybe that's what you married him for. Then you tried to get Freddy to help you kill him, and when he refused... You're lying. You're lying. Hey, 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 talk to me like hey, that. that's just... enough, Mrs. Hathaway. Now, stop it. Stop it, Mrs. Hathaway. You said I'll tear his eyes out. I believe you would. Oh, Doug, help me. You know he was lying. Of course he was, so calm down, will you? You don't believe him, Doug. I told you I don't, but this is no way to answer him. Yeah. Yes, you're right, but you made me so mad. I see I did. You have a low boiling point, Mrs. Hathaway. You couldn't expect her to like what you were saying, North. I didn't. You just said it to upset her. I just said it because I wanted to see if it were true. What on earth gives you the idea that it might be? Things that Laura Arnold told us. So that's it. Laura, wouldn't you know? Why do you say that? Can't you see she's behind this whole thing? It all ties up now. I'll bet she's the one who claimed to have seen my car at Ferdy's, too, wouldn't she? What if she is? Lieutenant, you said I've been trying to shield Shirley. I have. Mm-hmm. When you said my car was seen at Ferdy's, I could see Shirley was upset. She didn't know what to say, so I stepped in and said I'd been to Ferdy's. And you hadn't? No, but I thought Shirley might have. But now that I know she wasn't, at least not at the time of the murder... How do you know that? Because now I know when the murder happened. It's been in the paper. Well? Well, I did have the car at that time, but I was nowhere near Ferdy's. So if Laura says she saw me there, she's lying. Mm. It seems to come down to your word against hers. Well, I've sent for her, too, so let's see what happens when she gets here. Oh, uh, I don't think we'll have to wait for that, Bill. I know which one to believe. You do, Pam? Yes, Laura. Mr. Hathaway's still lying. So it looks like he's the murderer. Don't be ridiculous. Laura says she saw my car at Ferdy's. That means she had to be there herself. Uh, that's just it, Mr. So Hathaway. naturally, she's going to lie, try to play somebody else there, but too. But she couldn't have been lying. Why not? You told us your car was brand new. It had been delivered just a short time before the murder. That's right. Well, then how could Laura have described it unless she really did see it at Ferdy's? <laughs> Jerry, get him! I've got him! All right, Hathaway, sit down. Looks like you've told one lie too many. It's a beautiful day, isn't it, dear? Yes. Poor Shirley. Well, how do we come to Shirley? Out of a clear blue sky. The sky's clear, and you just mentioned the weather, so you see, there is a logical connection. You win, dear. <laughs> but why do you say poor Shirley? Well, it's quite obvious that she just married Doug Hathaway for his money. Mm -hmm. And now that he's caught for murder, they've broken him down about how he made his money. His whole crooked house will come tumbling down. That's right, Jerry. And all his money is tied up. And so poor Shirley gets none. Now you see what I mean, dear? Poor Shirley. Mm -hmm. But somehow it doesn't break my heart. She knew Doug was a crook. Ferdy knew it, too. That's why Doug killed him, to shut him up. He claims Ferdy was always a tattletale as a kid. Hey, Pam, why are you stopping? Oh, I just want to look in this window. Look at that car, Jerry. Isn't it beautiful? Mm-hmm. It's sort of like the Hathaway's car. 
Oh, it must be wonderful to be able to afford a car like that. Well, even if you could, where would you ever find a parking space for it in Manhattan? Well, if you didn't live in Manhattan. But we do live in Manhattan. And we can't afford the car anyway. I know, Jerry. I, I'm just thinking. Don't you ever like to think of what it would be like to have a car like that? I don't let myself. How do you prevent yourself? Oh, easy. I just walk over to the curb, like so. Yes. And then? Then I just shout, like so. Hey, taxi! The adventures of Mr. and Mrs. North are brought to you through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. much. But don't you wish you were in my boots, Bill? We'll take that up some other time. But now I've got to finish dressing and get out in the arena. I'm due to ride soon. Be careful you don't get killed, won't you? But not too careful. You think if something happened to me, Slim will stay married to you, don't you? Well, think again. You can't hold him, Hazel. Nobody's gonna say I didn't try. I wouldn't try anything where I was concerned. I've got a very good friend in town, Hazel. Boston Blackie. Ever hear of him? Sure. Well, he's here tonight. I sent him tickets friend of mine out west said to look up Blackie in case I ever got in trouble. I'm just playing it safe, asking them to come tonight. Better go on out and ride that Bronco. Hey, anybody decent in there? Everybody is, Barney. Wait a minute. Go on in and talk to Hazel, Barney. I'm due out at the arena. But don't get too close to her. Rattler's bite can be cured, but hers, uh-uh. Bye. So long, Bill. <laughs> kind of a feud going on between you two gals, ain't there, Hazel? I wouldn't say that. I'd like people to think that, though. I always felt a rodeo ain't no place for feuds. We kind of all ought to be more like a family. Ever see a family without a feud? I never did. That ain't what I meant, exactly. The way the boys are saying, though, anything ever happened to Belle, you'd be blamed. I'd like that very much. Not the second part, of course, just the first. I don't know, Hazel. I still... Hey, listen. Boy, that's slim. It was his turn to ride when I came in, and that's the way the crowd always yells when he's riding. He's a good man on a horse, Barney. Yeah. Best, maybe. Hey, what's wrong with me? Nothing. Slim wasn't around. You know, I think that without Slim here, you might have a... Hey, careful. All right, boy. Hey. Careful. Bring her in. They're right down that cart over there. Okay, Doc. Uh, be careful now. All right. Hurt real bad. Shut that door. Easy. Hey. Hey, hey Doc. Hey, Doc. Hey, Doc. What's happened? happened to Bill, Doc. She's not moving. No, that's right. I don't know yet how bad she's hurt. All I know, she got thrown from that Bronco she was riding. Got thrown, got thrown bad. Bill. Poor Bill. Poor Bill. You're kidding, ain't you, Hazel? And now meet Dick Colmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy... 
friend to those who have no friend. This is the dressing room where they took that girl ride, Mary. Come on, let's go on in. All right, anything you say, Blackie. Uh, tell me one more thing, Doc. Is it hurt bad? Well, it's too early to tell, Barney. We'll have to wait till we get to the hospital. Yeah. Hey, hey, Bud, nobody's allowed in here. I know that, cowboy, except by invitation. I'm Boston Blackie. I understand Bell Adams wanted to see me. Oh, yeah. Hey, Doc, uh, this is the guy Bell keeps asking for. Oh, yeah, Boston Blackie. Didn't get here a minute too soon. Just about to take her to a hospital right here. Oh, this is it, Mary. Come on. Okay. Hey, you uh, tell her Barney asked for her, will you, Doc? Yes, Barney, I'll tell her. <laughs> Who's Barney? Her boyfriend, Doctor? Uh, one of them. Belle's the most popular girl in the road here. Uh, is she badly hurt? It's hard to say this early. Had a nasty fall. Just regained consciousness a few minutes ago. Uh, Belle. Belle. Yeah. Boston Blackie's here. Uh, Hello, Miss Adams. You wanted to see me? Yeah, Blackie. Nevada Pete told me if I was ever in trouble to talk to you. Well, I'm in trouble. Terrible trouble. Oh, no, you're not. You'll be all right in a day or two. Well, you don't get it, Blackie. Hazel fixed it so I take that spill. Hazel wants to kill me. Hazel? Hazel who? Uh, she must mean Hazel Henry, another writer in the rodeo. Yeah, Hazel Henry. She tried to kill me. She did something to the horse that was riding... Look at the horse. Uh, I, I don't oh. think she ought to talk anymore, Blackie. All right, Doctor. I'll look at that horse, Bell. Now, don't worry about anything. Come on, Mary. I'm right here. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye. And thanks for coming down, Blackie. I was glad to do it. Oh, uh, hey, uh, how is she, Blackie? How is she? She's hurt all right, Barney, but it may not be too serious. Which way is it to the place where they keep the horses? Well, you, you turn to your right and you keep on going straight. You can't miss it. Thanks. Oh, wait a minute, Blackie. I almost forgot my hat. Oh, sorry, Mary. The corral is down this way. Okay, I got it. Oh, sure. I can even hear it. Blackie, what did Belle mean when she said Hazel Henry did something to her horse so she'd be hurt? She meant Hazel did something to make the horse buck harder than normally, I guess. We'll find out in a minute. Here's the corral. Big place, isn't it? How are we going to find that horse that Belle rode? Well, we could spend all afternoon looking for it, or we could ask that cowboy spinning and throwing that rope over there. Oh, oh, maybe he'll teach me how to use a lasso. You know, I've always but wanted to be able... But not now, Mary. Not oh. now. Say so you with a rope. Yeah. Uh, say, uh, where's the horse that Belle Adams was riding when she was thrown? Right over there in that stall, mister. She's a wild one. Don't go near her. Don't worry. I won't. Say, they've taken the saddle and bridle off her. Was everything all right? Funny you should ask that, stranger. Why? Funny the way you make that rope spin, too, cowboy. Listen, c could you... Later, to... Mary. Look, later, uh, please. Uh... Why is it funny, I asked you, cowboy? Because the handlers found a burr under that bronco saddle. That's what made her toss Bell the way she did. There was a burr under the saddle, huh? Blackie, then Bell was right. Hazel Henry did try to hurt her. Looks that way, Mary. I don't know if it was Hazel who put that burr there or not, but if it was, mister, it wasn't put there to hurt Bell. What makes you say that? Because the horse that Bell rode was supposed to be ridden by Slim Waters, but he didn't show up on time. Oh, I see. Funny thing, too, Mr. Slim Waters ain't never been late for a rodeo contest before in his life. All right, Slim. So somebody tried to fix you by putting that burr under the saddle of your horse. But you didn't ride it. So what am I supposed to do about it? Do what I sent you for, Inspector Faraday. Arrest Hazel Henry. She's the one who done it. How do you know? Because I'm married to her. But I want to leave her and marry Bill Adams. And Hazel swore she'd kill either me or Belle before she'd give me a divorce. Okay, okay, but that's all just talk, Slim. Give me some proof. I gotta have proof before I can do anything about it. On the first place... If that's Hazel, I want her arrested, Constable. Constable? Ah, uh, Constable... Come in. Slim Waters? Yeah? Blackie, what are you doing here? Well, hello, Faraday. What are you doing here? Has somebody been murdered? No, but with you around, somebody probably will be. Slim, this is Boston Blackie. Hiya, Slim. Hi. What's Faraday got you on the carpet for? He ain't got me on the carpet. I sent for him. I want my wife Hazel arrested for trying to kill me. And getting Belle Adams by mistake. I ain't sure. Maybe she was trying to kill Belle and not me. I was late for the contest because my watch was slow, and it ain't never been slow before. Well, what's that got to do with Hazel trying to kill Belle Adams? Well, I let Hazel use my watch this morning. 
She might have said it back just so I would be late. Or you might have said it back yourself, Slim. Huh? What do you mean by that? Nothing, except you could put a burr under the saddle of your horse if you knew you weren't going to ride. I don't like that. I'm getting out of here. What am I doing here anyhow? Nobody's done anything. Nobody's dead. Nobody's even hurt bad, as far as we know. Now I'm going home. Wait a minute, Inspector. Ain't you going to arrest Hazel? What for? So you can get rid of her that way? And I swear she's trying to kill me. Or kill Bell. Okay, okay. I'll go have a talk with her. Thank you. And tell her to stay away from me. Uh, Bob, tell us something. So long, Faraday. Goodbye. Come on, Slim. Now you suppose you tell me the truth. Maybe you'd better go where that cop just went. Out the door. Look, you'd like me to prove Hazel tried to kill you or Bell Adams, wouldn't you? When I want help like that, I'll get it from the police. Now, now, beat it. All right. But I still think you could have put that bar under the saddle of that Bronco and were purposely late so Miss Adams would ride it. Oh, you do, huh? Yes. It would be an easy way to get rid of your girl and your wife. I think I'll give that some thought, Slim. So long. Maybe you'd better give a couple of other things some thought, too, fella. Maybe you'd better think about keeping your nose out of my affair. Oh, I don't know why you'd say a thing like that. Wow. This knife sticking in the wall could be sticking into me if I were a foot taller. Yeah, sure could. Do you grin every time you miss somebody with a knife, Slim? Maybe. Well, this just about clinches what I think about you, Slim. Then you better do some more thinking, you. Hey. Hey. Who are you? Hazel, where'd you come from? Down the hall, Slim. What's this guy trying to do to you? Nothing. It's any of your business. No? But don't seem to be his business, either. And don't go accusing Slim of throwing that knife at you, mister, because I threw it. You're Hazel Henry, huh? You threw it. Yeah. Why? Just a little warning to you, mister, that I don't like nobody accusing Slim of trying to kill nobody. <laughs> Hey, Faraday! Faraday! Hey! What are you doing in your car, Blanky? Trying to find out who fixed up that Adams girl? Too much for you? No, I've got to get back because I have a dinner engagement with Mary. Well, where is she? Oh, she went home about half an hour ago. Some cowboy gave her a rope and she went home to practice throwing it. Yeah, I'll bet. Well, that's probably what she's doing instead of getting dressed for dinner right now. Which is what she went home to do. Uh, hop in, I'll drive you downtown. I'm not going downtown. I'm going home. Okay, hop in. I'll take you home. If we can stop by Mary's first. All right. I want to talk to you anyway. What about? This business at the rodeo. You keep your nose out of it, Blanky. Nobody's done anything serious yet. But with you messing around, there's no telling what'll happen. No one's done anything serious yet, huh? Well, Belle Adams is lucky she didn't have her neck broken, and I'm just one foot short of being dead with a knife in the back of my head. What? Yes, and guess who threw it at me? A pleasant little girl named Hazel Henry. So that's why I couldn't find her. She was throwing knives at you. Yes, Barney, and if you're smart, you'll find some way to lock her up. She's dangerous. I wouldn't be surprised if you had a homicide on your hands before long. So you think maybe Hazel Henry is the one we want, huh? Yes, and I think you've got an assault charge against her, and you'd better use it before you have to grab her on a murder rap. You know, I think you're out of your mind, Blanky. Well, if Hazel Henry makes trouble... You're out of luck. Turn on the radio, will you? I want to hear the news. Sure. It's a better way to kill time than listening to you. Uh, when am I going to hear over the radio that you've left town, Blaggy? When radio is such an obsolete instrument, people won't even remember what it was. About uh, the year 10,000. Here's a last-minute report just handed to me. There's more than the excitement of thrills and spills at the rodeo over at the Coliseum. Murder has struck the gaily event. Murder, Back he said. rodeo rider uh-huh. Hazel Henry was found shot to death in the corral under the stand. The body was found within He's the last ten shot. minutes. Turn that off, Barry. You bet I will. And you turn this car around. I was going to have trouble because of Hazel Henry, was I? <laughs> you sure were, and you sure are on Faraday. Now you don't have to worry about killing time. Just concentrate on who killed Hazel. And now back to Boston Blackie. <laughs> A girl rodeo rider, Belle Adams, is badly injured when thrown from a bucking bronco. A burr is found under the bronco's saddle, and Belle accuses Hazel Henry of putting it there. To complicate matters, Belle is thrown while riding Slim Water's horse. And it seems that Hazel was trying to injure Slim, who, while he's her husband, wants his freedom in order to marry Belle. 
But just when Blackie is building a case against Hazel, she's murdered. As we return to our story, Blackie, his friend Mary, and Inspector Faraday are at the rodeo, scene of the crime. So she was shot, was she, Faraday? Well, she has a bullet in her, Blackie. Even you should be able to tell she was shot. Uh, I wish the coroner would get here, so I can go home. It's raining out, Faraday, and the streets are slippery. You want the coroner to get here alive, don't you? Yeah, I've had enough trouble for one day. Hey, Miss Wesley, what are you doing over there? Waiting for you and Blackie to decide who killed poor Hazel Henry and... Also, trying to learn how to throw this rope. Now, I wonder what I'm doing wrong. Mary, put that rope away, or you'll end up in not yourself. Well, all right, but you two hurry up and find out who killed Hazel. Now, come on, come on, hurry up, or I'll do it myself. You'll do it yourself, huh? Well, somebody better, Faraday. You never will. Well, that somebody won't be you, genius. Uh, you don't have any idea who killed her, do you, Blackie? No. No, I don't. Well, in that case, I say it was Slim Waters, her husband. He was afraid of her, and he'll probably claim he killed her in self-defense. You think Slim killed her, huh? Then I don't. Well, then maybe it was Barney. Barney? Who's he? Oh, Blackie, I remember him. He was the cowboy in the dressing room who kept asking if Belle Adams was all right. Oh, yes. But how does he fit into this? I don't know. I'm only guessing. But maybe Barney was in love with the Adams girl, and he was trying to get rid of Slim. So he kills Hazel, Slim's wife. Now, that makes a lot of sense. I'm not talking about killing Hazel. I'm talking about that burr under the saddle of Slim's horse. I think Barney put it there. Barney and Slim are the top riders in the rodeo, you know. So you think if Barney didn't do it for the love of Belle, Adams, well, did it for the love of prize money, huh? Well, it could be. Could be. Don't prove murders, Faraday. I know that. Well, I know one person who didn't kill Miss Henry. Who? Belle Adams. She's in the hospital. You think so? I know so. Wasn't she hurt? Yes, but she's still alive, Faraday, and the fact that you think she's still in the hospital gives me a pretty good idea that she isn't. Oh, Blackie, you don't suspect Miss Adams, do you? I suspect everybody, Mary. That's why I solve cases when Faraday doesn't. My hunch is getting stronger every minute. I don't think Miss Adams is in the hospital. Well, I say she is. Well, I'm going up and prove she isn't. Uh, do I have to go all the way up to the hospital with you in all this rain? No, Mary, you stay here till I get back. And stop trying to throw that rope. Oh, golly, it didn't work that time either, did it? Now what did I do wrong? Never mind what you did wrong with the rope. I've got to find out who did wrong by Hazel Henry. <laughs> Look, nurse, there's something funny going on here, and I intend to find out what it is. I'm very sorry, Blackie. Miss Adams is very ill. No visitors are allowed in her room. And I think I know why, too. She's not in her room. I'm very sorry, but you can't Look, go I in Look, I don't know there. what you're trying to pull, but you've convinced me. I'm going into this room, and I'll guarantee it's empty. Yo, what is it? Oh, hello, Miss Adams. So you really are in the hospital, huh? Oh, Blackie, come in. Yeah, of course I'm here. I've heard about the awful thing that happened to Hazel. You found out anything? Yes, I just found out something. I found out what a fool idea I had. Come in. Hello, Bill. Oh, Slim, don't. Come in. Oh, what a surprise. I thought it was Blackie coming back again. Blackie was here. What for? I don't know. It didn't say. I don't like that guy. Don't like the way he snoops around. Oh, he's all right. Let's don't talk about him. Ah, let's not. How you feel? Oh, better. Doctor says there's no broken bones. Guess I was lucky. Yeah, you sure were, honey. You could have been killed. Yeah. Look, you feel good enough to ride in the rodeo tonight? Oh, I could ride with my head cut off. Swell, honey. Then you're going to get out of this hospital and ride. Huh? We need you down there. Oh. You're the best girl rider we got. Oh, now that... Well, now that Hazel's gone. You always were better than Hazel in everything. <laughs> well, I guess it sounds sort of low for me to talk that way on account I was married to her, but... You know, I ain't going to shed any tears over her. No, I don't suppose anybody is. But I certainly never wanted to kill. Me neither. But, well, it's happened. We are rid of her, like we wanted. And look, you can ride tonight, huh? Yeah, you bet I can, Slim. We make enough in prize money between us to buy ourselves a ranch. I thought you'd say that, Belle, baby. You're an all right. Hey, are you expecting company? No, go see who it is, will you, Slim? Sure. Slim, what are you doing here? I could ask you the same thing, Barney. Oh, Barney, come on in. Thanks, Belle. How you feeling? A lot better. Seeing this here good-for-nothing cowpoke ain't going to do you no good, honey. Now get your good wishing over with, Barney, and get out of here. 
Bell's going to ride tonight. Huh? Hey, why, you can't do that, Bell. You got hurt last night. You still ain't... It ain't none of your business what she does, Barney. I suppose it's some of yours. I'm the one she's going to marry, ain't I? Yeah, but I'm looking out for her better than you. She ain't fit to ride tonight, and you You know... let her decide about that. I say she rides. Oh, that's sure letting her decide. You stay out of this, Barney. You don't want her to ride because you know me and her will take a pack of that prize money away from you. I'm just worrying about her, not the money. Since when did you ever care about boy, anything boy, but... Boy, now stop it, both of you. Thanks for your interest in me, Barney. I appreciate it, but I'm going to do what Clint says. You're a fool, Bell. That's you... enough out of you, Barney. You won't be fit to ride tonight yourself. Now, come on. We're getting out of here, the both of us. Okay, but Get Bell, rest, Bell, and be down the road. You own plenty of time. Because you're going to ride tonight. We're going to give them a show they'll never forget. <laughs> Contestant in the trick riding division. Next event, the finals featuring the riding pool, Slim and Barney. And once again, the pride of Arizona, Belle Adams, who despite her injuries of last night, comes back to perform for us again tonight. The event will take place in exactly three minutes. Well, looks like we're on in a couple of minutes, Slim. Yeah, Belle. We're going to take the first two prizes, too. Oh, yeah? You'll have to beat me, both of you. We'll beat you, Barney, both of us. Yeah, you won't even finish the money if I... Hey, look who's coming. Hmm? Boston Blackie, that policeman Faraday, and that Miss Wesley Dane. I wonder if anything's wrong. We're usually called out to the arena before the start of the contest. We haven't been called out yet. Hello, Blackie. Hello, Mrs. Adams. You know Inspector Faraday and Miss Wesley, don't you? Uh, yeah, more or less. Um, Belle... You think you know me well enough to teach me how to spin this rope? Uh, after the show tonight, Miss Wesley. Oh, good, thanks. I can't seem to find out what I'm doing wrong. Uh, never mind about that rope, Miss Wesley. Come on, Blanky, tell these two guys what you have to tell them and get it over with. We can't hold up the whole show. All right, Barney. Listen, Slim, and you too, Bonnie. I know a little bit about who killed Hazel. How much? This much. That she was killed by either you or Slim. I didn't kill her. And I didn't kill her. I don't expect either of you to confess. But I've got a plan I want to tell you about. I know which one of you killed Hazel. And I think that whoever killed Hazel also put the burr under the saddle of the horse that threw Miss Adams here. It wasn't Slim, Blackie. I just know it wasn't. Oh, trying to say it was me, huh, Bill? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Nobody has to say anything because I've already done something that's going to make the killer confess. What, Blackie? You two are riding out together in the trick riding contest in a moment. So I've arranged to put a burr under the saddle of the horse to be ridden by the one who killed Hazel. You did what? Nice little touch, don't you think? I can't kill the guilty man for killing Hazel, but I can give him a dose of the same punishment he gave Bell. Pleasant thought, huh? I'm not going to ride any horse with a burr under the saddle. And I'm not either. That's a good way to get busted in, too. Yes, I know. But if you didn't kill Hazel, you don't have to worry about a burr under the saddle. Come on, your horses are waiting to be ridden out into the arena. Over this way. How about that? You don't have to worry about anything, Slim. I don't, huh, Bell? Well, this guy Blackie can make a mistake, can't he? But I didn't make a mistake this time, Slim. I know who killed Hazel. And the bar is only under his saddle. Well, here are your horses. Look, Blackie! Oh, shut up, darn me. I almost got the rope around that pole. I almost did it. But I, I don't know why I can't do it. What did I do wrong? Listen, we'll worry about the rope later. Hey, where's Faraday? Uh, I'm over here. Where did you think? I want to be out of the way of those horses. Good idea. I guess we'd all better get back. All right, Slim, you too, Bonnie. Get on those horses. Okay, I'm getting up in the saddle. Go ahead, honey. You even bothering to get on, Barney? Of course I am. Right now. Well, so am I. Well, nothing's happened to me. Me either. Okay, let them go, boys. Here we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, Blackie, what's going on here? Nothing happened to either one of those riders. Yes, I just noticed that. What do you mean? You just noticed it. I bet you didn't put a burr under either of those saddles. No, I didn't, Faraday. I thought just telling those two I had done it would do the trick, and it did. What do you mean, it did? What's it done? It's told me who killed Hazel Henry. How? What? Why? Well, both Slim and Barney were convinced there was a burr under the saddle of the man who killed Hazel. Isn't that right? Well, they seem to be. Uh They were all right, Faraday. I could tell by the way they climbed into their saddles. But they did get into them. And why would they dare? Well, because they knew whoever got down would be accused of killing Miss Henry. Yeah. That's right. But they also knew that the burr was under the saddle of only the one I thought killed Hazel. 
So each one felt safe in getting into the saddle. Hey, that's right. Because Slim knew he didn't do it, and Barney knew he didn't do it. So what we proved is... We... Hey, what have we proved? That our pleasant little killer is sweet and pretty Belle Adams right here. What? I killed Hazel? Yes, you Belle. Be... You killed Hazel. You left the hospital to do it, and you bribed your nurse not to say you left the hospital, but it didn't work. If she told you that she's lying. She didn't have to tell me. I knew you'd go on out when I went up to the hospital to see you. It was raining out, remember? So? So the soles of your shoes were wet. So this girl killed Hazel and tried to kill Slim by putting that burr under his saddle yesterday at the rodeo. Oh, no, I didn't. Hazel did that out of spite. Because he wanted to leave her and marry me. I made her admit that before I killed her. You won't get me for that. And you won't get me for killing Hazel either. Now, don't move either one of you. Blackie, she's got a gun. I know a gun when I see it, Faraday. Then you know what I'll do with it if you make a move to come after me, Blackie. Mary, drop that rope. Get out of her way. She means business. Look, Blackie, I can spin the rope and I can throw it like this. Ah! Grab her, Faraday. Get that rope off of me. Rope around her arms. Drop that gun, sister. Let go of me. Let go. Drop it. All right. Uh, And let me out of here. And the rope is off now, Bill. Is that better, too? No. Get her out of here, Faraday. You bet I will. Come on, sister. Now, Paul. Come on, Francis. Mary girl, I'm right proud of you. I am right proud of you. Why, well, I was waiting for you to say that. You know, I caught her with that rope, didn't I? And it whirled, Blackie. And I roped her with a lasso just the way a cowboy ropes a steer. And you know, all the time I was practicing, I wondered what I did wrong. Well? Well, this time, I wonder what I did right. The Amazing Mr. Malone. (laughs) 
Operator. Operator, get me the office of John J. Malone. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Amazing Mr. Malone, an exciting half hour of mystery starring George Petrie as the lawyer whose practice before every type of bar has become a legend. Our locale is the city of Chicago. The time, the present, and the hero of these weekly adventures, the amazing Mr. Malone. Malone's the name, John J. Malone, attorney and counselor at law. Tonight in our study of the cliché, let's examine the familiar early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. If that's true, Jeff Lewis is destined for failure. Jeff's a good-looking boy coming home at four in the morning. It's easy to understand why he keeps the same hour as I do. He's a musician. He plays piano with Rusty Gates' band. But Jeff's not the only musician in the family. He's got a wife who can sound off, too. But, of course, her solos aren't nearly as sweet. Is that you, Jeff? No. Uh-huh. Thought you'd be asleep, Claire. Can I sleep? You realize what time it is? Yeah, it's four o'clock. Where have you been? You got off at two. I went out for coffee with Rusty. You went out for coffee with Rusty? Yeah, that's what I said. I suppose you two were alone. Oh, look, Claire. Do we have to start that? I'm tired. You're tired. Do you ever think of me sitting here till all hours of the night, worrying myself sick, wondering what's happened to you? Thinking maybe you got hit by a car? Oh, now you're being ridiculous. Where are my pajamas? Now I'm ridiculous. Yes. I don't know why you bother coming home at all. I sometimes wonder myself. Then why do you? Why don't you just say you're tired of me? Well, if you want to know, I... Oh, wait, look. Look, honey, please. Let's, let's not fight. You know how I feel about you, but every night it's the same thing over and over again. I'm... I'm sorry, Jeff. I don't mean to act like this. I just can't help myself. I love you so much I can't see straight. I love you too, honey. I don't blame you for being angry. But every time I see all those women hanging around the bandstand... They're just a bunch of jerks. I wouldn't give two cents for any one of them. You're a darling to put up with me. Come on, forget it, will you? I'll make you some coffee? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a good idea. Okay. I'll get right to work. Uh, maybe you can make a sandwich, too, huh? I thought you ate with Rusty. What? When you came in, you said you were out with him. I was. Then how come you're so hungry? All I said was, was that I... Was Rita want... there, too? Rita? Oh, haven't you met Rusty's wife? Listen, Claire, I thought you... you two were old friends. After all, she's been singing with the band for three years. Now, look... Don't you... think you're fooling me. I know what's going on. You're out of your mind. You must have been... And I am now not to see it before. Well, I'll say one thing for you, Mr. Lewis. You were real clever. But you're not going to get away with it, understand? I'll kill you first. Oh, that does... Jeff! Jeff, where are you going? I didn't mean it, Jeff. Honey, please! Jeff! Look, you... Hi, hi, Malone. What's your idea, Jeff? Well, I was in the neighborhood, so I thought I'd just drop by. What's the matter, Claire lock you out? Not that I blame her in your condition. You're loaded. <laughs> Ain't I, though, huh? Well, that's one case I'll never get to handle. I thought you never touched this stuff. Go on, celebrating. Hey, you better sit down. Yeah, don't mind if I do. Oh. <laughs> What's the trouble? Trouble? Who's got trouble? Obviously, you have. Well, you know, you're right. Claire? Yeah. Well, I suppose it was bound to happen. What do you want me to do, start suit for divorce? What What makes you say it was bound to happen? You forget, I've seen her in action. Every time a dame asks you to play a tune, she goes nuts. Well, she, she says she's crazy about me. I suppose she is. Well, it, why can't we make a... If you're thinking what I think you are, uh-huh. forget it. Rusty would break your back, and I wouldn't blame him. You let me get you a nice divorce. The only girl I ever loved and you want to see is a part. Now, look, Jeff. All Claire needs is a lesson, and 
She asked for it, and she's gonna get it. I tell you, you're handling this the wrong way. How would you know you were never even married? Mm Mm-hmm. And this sort of thing vindicates my judgments. You know, you're trouble, Malone. You're a cynic. And now I'm gonna prove that you're wrong. Any of you guys want to get something to eat? What about you, Jeff? You coming along? Well, I I thought Rita and I were going to run over a couple of tunes. We were going to what? Well, don't you remember, Rita? You said you want to go over that new cold porter thing. Well, that's right. I did. Uh, why don't you kids do it tomorrow, huh? You know what they say, Rusty. Never put off for tomorrow. Who you can do today. <laughs> Aren't you and the boys go to Mike's? We'll meet you. All right. You fellas ready? Yeah. What are you waiting for? We'll see you cats later. You bet. Come on, let's get it. Well, I must be losing my mind. I, I don't get you, Rita. I don't remember asking you to run over any tunes with me. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you did. I guess I misunderstood. No, you didn't. Why did you tell Rusty we were going to rehearse? Because I've been working with you for three years, and this is the first time you ever gave me a tumble. Well, if you'd uh, like to skip it... Uh... Are you kidding? Well, <laughs> well, shall we get right down to work? You know you're cute. Hmm? I was wondering if you'd ever come around. Look, uh, Rita, I uh, I made a mistake. You see, uh, I... Did I ask for any explanations? It's enough you wanted to be alone with me. No, you, you, you don't understand. I Kevin. understand that we're wasting time. we got to meet Rusty. No, but, but I, you I, don't... I, 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 mm. Hey, we shouldn't have done that, Rita. Why does it hurt? No, but I, I, I don't think you that... You aren't the darndest man for talking. Lucky I know a wonderful way to shut your mouth. Come here, baby. Let me show you. Yeah? Is that you, Jeff? Oh, listen, Claire, I told you before not to... please. You can't hang up on me. You don't know what I've been going through all this week ever since you moved out. I should have done it long ago. Maybe now you've got an idea what I've been through these past four years. Look, Jeff, I'm sorry. I'll make it up to you. If only you'll come home. No. Jeff, please. I promise I'll never be jealous again. I know you're only seeing Rita to teach me a lesson. What makes you think so? Because you love me. Maybe I don't anymore. No. Jeff, you mustn't say that. You don't believe it yourself. Look, Claire... You've got to get this through your head. Comes a time when a guy gets fed up. I've had it, baby. And you're the one who did the job. Rita, see this in Variety? Ray Herbeck's working at the Riverside Hotel in Reno. I can't hear you, Russ. My old... What? No, I'll tell you later. I think we got company. Just a second. Claire. I'm sorry to bother you, Rusty. Oh, that's all right, honey. Come on in. Have you seen Jeff? Well, what do you mean? He hasn't been home in a week. I'm going out of my well, mind. You better sit down. You want a drink? No, no, thanks. Rusty, you got to help me. Oh, uh, look, Claire, I, I don't like to interfere in somebody else's but business. But this is I... your business. It never would have happened if it hadn't been for Rita. What? She turned him against me. You're nuts. Look, maybe she can fool you, but she can't fool me. I knew she was after him the minute I saw him. If you don't believe me, just... What's going on here? There she is. Ask her. Ask me what? Don't play innocent, Rita. It's out of character. All right, Claire. I think you better go. You don't believe me. How can you be so blind? Can't you see? She's nothing but a no good... Get out of here before I throw you out. Why don't you ask about the other boys in the band? Why do you think Hank's wife made him leave? She was running after him. That's a lie. That's why you picked on Jeff. But he doesn't love you. He couldn't. Listen, you, the day I couldn't take... Go on, Rita. The day you couldn't take what? Honey, what's the matter with you? Are you going to listen to a crazy dame? Who are you calling crazy? I don't know about you, Rusty, but I don't have to put up. You see? All right, Claire, all right. You said your piece. Now just clear out. Not until I... No, I've heard enough. Come on. Let go of me. Let me go. I'll let you go when you're outside. No. Yes. Let go of me. Let 
girl's insane. That's possible. Now, what is this about you and Jeff? You're not going to believe her. Not if you can convince me she's wrong. Rusty, I swear there's nothing to I it. I wonder. Barney made a remark about you last night, about your rehearsing all the time. Well, if you don't want me to approve Look, myself. how come so suddenly you're interested, huh? You never cared before. Look, maybe it's time we did a little work together, huh? All right, Rita, you start singing. And you better make it good. <laughs> Yes, sir. This is Jeff Lewis from 419. Oh, yes, Mr. Lewis. I called for a bellboy 20 minutes ago. What happened to him? Oh, he's probably on his way up, sir. How's he coming? By way of Cicero? Please see if you can... Oh, never mind. He's here now. Just a second. I said just a second. You take a year and then... But... What are you doing here? No, you shouldn't have... All right, Lieutenant, what do you want? Well, it... Hey, wait a minute, Counselor. How'd you know it was me? Well, I've been answering my phone this way all week. The law of averages said I'd be right once. Oh, you're amazing, Mr. Malone. That's what I keep telling you. What are you doing? Well, what else would I be doing at four in the morning? Ooh, what I know about you. Don't be so funny. I assume you have a reason for disturbing me at this hour. You assume properly. Look how soon can you get down to headquarters. Why, what's up? You know Jeff Lewis? Ah, oh, very well. What'd he get himself into? The morgue. What are you babbling about? He was knocked off at 2.30 this morning. Who did it? Well, we kind of suspicion it was his wife, but naturally you're going to prove we're wrong. Did Claire ask you to phone me? You don't think I'd waste the taxpayer's money on a call of my own? Come on down, Malone. Your public's waiting. You are listening to The Amazing Mr. Malone. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. For mystery adventure fans, there's more first-rate radio listening Sunday with The Saint and Dimension X. Tom Conway stars as that debonair gentleman adventurer, Simon Templer, better known to the underworld as The Saint, who never eases his campaign against crime. Then later, Dimension X brings you the tales in the future tense. This week's feature, Pebble in the Sky. Written for radio by Ernest Canoy. It tells the story of time when the civilization of the galaxy spreads across 200 million worlds, when the black void of space swarms with ships of interstellar commerce. But far off the trade routes, almost forgotten, lies the dying planet Earth in the backwater of the universe, a place of exile, a pebble in the sky. Sunday, on this station. And now, back to the amazing Mr. Malone. Well, like the man says, that's life for you. One minute you got it, and the next minute you ain't. Jeff Lewis found that out the hard way. Half hour after I got the news, I was on my way to headquarters. And when I walked in, I was greeted by Lieutenant Brooks with the most original line of the year. Well, if it ain't the amazing Mr. Malone. You know something, Lieutenant? You could stand some new material. Yeah, but where am I going to find a writer on my salary? Where's Claire Lewis? You want to see her now? What do you think I came down here for? Well, I kind of hoped it was me. Sussman, get Claire Lewis. I... What's the matter with him? He didn't even say hello. Well, he didn't recognize you with that briefcase under your arm. What do you got in there, your laundry? Excuse me. The sergeant... Oh, come on in, Claire. Malone. You came... Uh-huh. Sit down. They tell you about Jeff? Uh-huh. He's dead, Malone. Jeff's dead. I know. I don't want to live anymore. Well, you're talking like a fool. I don't want to live without him. Why'd you send for Malone? Well... Oh, he's got a point there, lover. Now, either you want me to get you off... I don't know what I want. What do you think killed him? Rita. Rita Gates? Yeah. She did it, Malone. Why should she? Because she... She knew he didn't care for her. He was just using Rita to get back at me. Did Jeff tell you that? He didn't have to. When was the last time you saw him? Uh, I I don't remember. I can tell you. It was at 2.30 this morning. He went to his hotel when he opened the... No, 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 no. That's not true. 
I love Jeff. Why don't you lay off her, Sidney? Can't you see what she's going through? Oh, use your head, Malone. She'd kill him as sure as you're standing. No, no. All right, Lieutenant. You made a lot of accusations, but where's your evidence? We'll produce it at the trial. Then you haven't any yet, huh? Have you any? She didn't. No, I guess we're all in the same boat, and it's up to me to find a paddle. All right, Claire. Take care of yourself. I'll be seeing you real soon. Hello, Rita. Why, Malone. Can I come in? Well, Rusty's not here. It's all the better. I never believed it's so nice to have a man around the house. <laughs> You're not the one. Ain't I, though. <laughs> Let me take your coat. Oh, bother. It's fine. No, I should be mad at you. What on earth for? You haven't been over at the club to hear me sing in months. Oh, I'll never forgive myself. Would you feel better if I slashed my wrist? <laughs> You're cute. You ought to see me in my confirmation suit. I look like a doll in it. Too bad I got to break it in at Jeff's funeral. Oh, do we have to talk about him? Oh, what would you sooner talk about? Us. And then we have to come back to Jeff. I don't like to start a campaign with my last rival still warm in the morgue. What's that supposed to mean? Well, it occurred to me maybe you killed him. Are you crazy? You know, when you found out he was playing you for a sucker. He played me for a sucker? Yeah, it was an idea he got one night in my apartment. You're lying. He wanted to give Claire something really to worry about. I tried to tout him off. Get out. What's the matter? Don't you think I'm cute anymore? You better get out of here. Now, Rita, don't you dare throw that box. Hey, you missed me. I'll show you. Uh, Don't bother, lover. I'm convinced a girl like you couldn't miss twice. Maybe I'll give you another chance later. It's only me, Rita. Oh, Rusty, I'm so glad you're home. I am. You know, I had a miserable afternoon. How'd the rehearsal go? Real bad. Boys are all sick about Jeff. Yeah, I guess it'll be tough breaking in a new piano player. Is that all you can think of? Oh, now, Rusty, I explained that. Claire was imagining things. Jeff didn't mean a thing to me. Mm-hmm. What was Malone doing here? Oh? Malone, the lawyer. Oh, oh. He's representing Claire. He thought maybe I could help her out. Mm, what'd you tell him? What could I tell him? Maybe about you and Jeff having a deal. Oh, you're getting as bad as she Look, is. if you mean I'm jealous, you're right. Only I got a good reason. Look, Rusty, we've been all through mm-hmm. this before. Sure we have. And you convinced me Claire was nuts. Yeah, you really talked me out of it. Uh, but since then, honey, I've been doing a little checking. Well, you've got your nerve. You know, I'm crazy about you, Rita. But you're no good. Uh, Everybody knows it. Don't you talk to me like that. Who's got a better right? Do you know what's funny? It doesn't make any difference. I don't care what you did. I still feel the same way about you. Well, I'm overwhelmed. Now I want to know what Malone said. None of your business. Yes, it is, baby. And I'm going to find out if I have to shake it out of you. No, Rusty. No. I hate... It was just one of those things, just one of those crazy things, one of those bells that now and then ring. A little flat there, Malone. Just. Now, look, Rusty, I can go along with a gag, but this is too much. You know, this is the third week in a row I've walked in here and found the joint occupied. You better get a new lock. It's an idea. What do you want? I just finished having a little talk with Rita. Now I suppose it's my turn. Mm -hmm. What'd you say to her? Didn't Rita tell you? Maybe I want to compare notes. You don't have to worry, Rusty. This was purely business. Is it about Jeff Lewis? Yeah. Yeah. And she was telling the truth. You're trying to frame her for his murder. I don't have to frame her. Malone, if you involve Rita in this, I'll kill you. I mean that. I believe you do. Her name is not to be mentioned at Claire's trial. Do you understand me? Don't see how we're going to keep it out. I want to you bring her in and I'll break every bone in your body. Even my little pinky. No matter, don't you think I can? You're taking in a lot of territory. According to the encyclopedia, there are hundreds of bones in the human frame. And if you think I'm... Oh, wait a minute. You wouldn't hit a man who was yellow, would you? I'll show you. You're pushing me Hold it, Rusty. Why can't we be friends just to prove I've got no hard feelings? Get away from that I just want to get this bottle. Maybe we can split it. Together. Well, that's opening it the hard way, but you'll have to forgive me, friend. I forgot my corkscrew. Yo ho, is anybody home? Oh no. What did I do to deserve this? Nothing. 
why you should be grateful. Look, Lieutenant, I want to talk to you. Must you? Yeah, but first, how about shutting off that teletype? Are you out of your mind? I'm expecting a very important flash. The score of the White Sox game will be through any minute. Well, if you won't do it. You know, that's what I like. I like to see a man make himself at home. Where's Claire Lewis? You know, Tom, where was she is. Well, you got to let her go. Oh, I suppose you can prove she's innocent. Yes, I got it all figured out. I'm telling you, Brooks, you bring her to court and I'll crucify you. You haven't even established a motive for the girl. Are you kidding? Claire was crazy about Jeff and she lost. No, she didn't. Jeff was only seeing Rita to needle her. Look, look, Malone, I got work to do now. Now, why don't you go home? I can't. Home ain't a fit place for me right now. You know who's there? All right, I'll play straight. Who's there, Mr. Malone? Jeff Lewis is killer. No. I'm serious, Lieutenant. It's Rusty Gates. What's he doing at your place? Right now, I imagine he's dozing. I put him to sleep with a bottle. What are you talking about? I had a conk him. Why? Well, it was either him or me, and naturally, I was prejudiced. Did he have a gun? No. Well, why didn't you use your fist? Are you kidding? Rusty must weigh 240 pounds. So? So, he would have murdered me. That's no excuse. Well, look, Lieutenant, quit the kibitz, and I tell you, he killed Jeff. Why? He thought Jeff was breaking up his happy home. Oh, you make it sound very convincing. Thanks. I said it sounded convincing. Actually, it ain't. What are you babbling about now? Jeff was killed at 2.30 at the Hillcrest Hotel. So? So, at 2.30... Rusty was doing a benefit on the North Shore where he was seen by 80,000 citizens. Well, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's right. Now, how can one man be in two places at the same time, unless he's a Nazi? And you're the only one who reads that, Billy. Well, it's been Grand Malone. Drop by again when you can't stay so long. You are listening to The Amazing Mr. Malone. In this great year of decision, the armed forces of the United States offer a greater challenge to the young men of America than ever before. It's a vital, exciting challenge to anyone interested in his personal welfare, the welfare of his nation, or the welfare of the world. Service in today's modern armed forces means a career, a career in which any man can take pride and satisfaction. The new training program prepares the serviceman not only for advancement and leadership in the armed forces themselves, but for positions of responsibility in civilian life. A career in the armed forces means education and technical training in the world's best technical schools. Yes, today's volunteer serviceman has opportunities never offered before. That's why alert, intelligent young men all over the country are entering the armed forces every day. The standards are high and not everyone can qualify. You must have the brains, the ability, and the character to become a leader. But if you can qualify, go to your nearest recruiting office for full information. Here again is the amazing Mr. Malone. Well, there was no use denying Malone had done it again. Here I'd worked out so neatly why Rusty Gates had to be the killer and Lieutenant Brooks had to knock it out of my head. You'd think he had a grudge against me the way he kept ruining my theories. <laughs> Actually, Brooks is crazy for me. He just hides it so well, he even fools himself. You know your trouble, Malone. You get emotionally involved with the clients you represent. Now, why can't you be like the other lawyers in town? Why should I? You ever hear their names on the radio? Now, look, I thought you were going to talk sense. You wouldn't understand me if I did. Now, listen, Sidney, are you positive that Rusty was at that benefit? Absolutely. What'd he do? He led the band. What'd you think? Now, how come Jeff Lewis wasn't there? He wasn't feeling good, so they used the sub. When did the band go on? At a quarter after two. Well, suppose Rusty got off the stand for a while. Uh-uh. Not a chance. Besides, he never could make it to the Hillcrest. It would take him at least 45 minutes to cut across town. Well, he must have worked it somehow. Now, how could one man be in two places at the same time? Hey, I asked you that. You know something, Lieutenant? I got the solution. Oh, no, not again. I mean it. Don't you see the answer? No. Well, can we get all our suspects together? Who do you mean? Rita and Rusty. What about Claire? Oh, of course. We'll need her, too. We don't want to play to a house that's only two-thirds full. Well, get on with it, Lieutenant. I'm ready to give the downbeat. <laughs> You want me, Mrs. Gates? Yeah. How long do you intend to keep us here? Till I get orders, contrary-wise. Well, my husband's sick. He needs medical attention. Can't you see he's got a cut on his hand? I'm all right, Rita. No, you're just trying to be brave. Is it hurt bad, sweetie? You picked a fine time to start worrying about him. Keep out of this, Claire. She killed my husband and you asked me to keep out? You're really crazy. I'll show you who's crazy. Rusty, help. All right, come on, uh, Claire. Uh, I'll cut it out. Uh, now, now, ladies, what will the police think? Uh, let me go. Better open up, Lieutenant, before we here. have a bloodbath. All right, you two, that's enough. Let me go. I said that's enough. Now, behave yourself. She started it. If I ever get my hands on you. Are you going to behave? 
I'm sorry, Lieutenant. Is it safe for me to come in? Oh, don't worry, Cuts. Let the girls won't hurt you. I was thinking of Rusty. Oh, forget it, Malone. I had it coming. Oh, that's very charitable of you. What's the idea, Malone? That's a very good question, Rita. Fortunately, I'm prepared with an answer. We're trying to solve the murder of Jeff Lewis. She did it. That's what I thought for a while, Claire, but I had to discard that theory. The truth of the matter is, Jeff didn't mean enough to her. As far as Rita was concerned, he was just another guy. Why, you know... Now, that... lover, that's no way to talk to a man who just gave you a clean bill of health. Well, if she didn't kill him, who did? You're leaving yourself wide open there, Claire. What? Yeah. You did it. No. No, that's not true. I'm afraid it is. I'll tell you for this. Me too? Hmm. I just don't understand you women. Here you claim you couldn't live without Jeff. And when I arrange for you to join him, you complain. Well, I guess there's no pleasing some people. I can't get over it. I just can't get over it. There's something bothering you, little man. Yeah, yeah. How you can have the colossal nerve to sit there and eat after lousing this whole case up. That's gratitude for you, and after all the work I did. After all the work you did? What do you think clinched your case against Claire? Don't you know without me you'd have never gotten a conviction? What do you eat that gives you so much gall? I'm perfectly serious. Why any decent lawyer could have gone into court and gotten an acquittal? All he would have had to do is cast a reasonable doubt on your evidence. I ended that doubt once and for all. Well, I don't see how. By taking care of all the other suspects, I proved Rusty couldn't have killed Jeff. You proved? With a little assistance from you. Uh, the unknown factor in the case was Rita. I knew she wasn't guilty. Uh, and how did you know that? Because when I went up to see her this afternoon, she convinced me Jeff meant nothing to her by making a play for me. And no woman who's lost a great love would have done that. Aren't you forgetting your charm? Now, what are you so bitter about? Here I demonstrate to the public that their police force is on the job day and night. And despite all the propaganda to the contrary, the cops are right once in a while. Jade, thanks. And what do I get out of it? Two women in the case, and I wind up in a night spot with you. Well, don't feel too badly, Counselor. I've got a feeling before this evening's over, you're going to wind up with something else. Yeah? What? The check. Good night, my lord. Ever hear the story of the boy who worked out a scheme to convert common metals into precious ones? It paid off in reverse. But two ounces of gold, he got one of lead. I'll tell you all about it next week, so why not pick me up at my office at the same time? I'll be waiting for you. Good night. George Petrie was starred as John J. Malone, with Larry Haynes as Lieutenant Brooks. Our program is written by Eugene Wang and directed by Richard Lewis. The Amazing Mr. Malone is based on a famous character created by Craig Rice and produced by Bernard L. Schubert. The events and characters in this story were entirely fictional, and any resemblance to persons living or dead is entirely coincidental. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Straight from the pages of the Saturday Evening Post comes that famous Oriental detective, Mr. Moto. Created by John P. Marquand, Mr. Moto stars James Monks in the title role Sunday on NBC. Fred Collins speaking. The amazing Mr. Malone has come to you from New York. Stay tuned for The Man Called X next over most NBC stations. Mr. Collins. It surely is. After all, the temperature does vary in the Argentine. A capillaris can be very warm if he's after a woman. And very cold if he's out to kill a man. You know, of course, that I'm married to Greg Collins, the famous private detective. I'm Gail Collins. And I'll be back in a moment to set the stage for our puzzling crime. It's a crime, Mr. Collins. Tell me, Senora Collins, you mentioned the Argentine. 
What's our story titled tonight? I call it The Chrome Yellow Death. Mmm, sounds exciting. Believe me, Jack, it was. Greg and I received an invitation to Los Colorados, just outside of Buenos Aires. Very wealthy tobacco magnate Tom McDougall owned an exquisite hacienda farther inland. In rather fetid, tropical, almost jungle area. He had known Greg a long time, and he'd asked us to fly down from San Francisco as his guests, including the plane fare. What especially intrigued Greg, though, was that instead of the usual come-and-visit-me note, the letter from McDougal hinted that there was some high jinks going on in Cruz Angelo. Anyway, we had left the airport and driven way inland to Tom's Hacienda, where the foreman greeted us. Bienvenido, senor y senora Collins. Welcome. I am Antonio Sebastian, senor McDougal's foreman. I will take the baggage, I think, no? Hello, Antonio. We haven't seen you in about five years, have we? No, senora. It is a pity. It is a shame. Where's Tom, Antonio? Out in the tobacco fields, I suppose. Ah, no, senor Collins. Uh, Senor McDougal, he never go near. He just let Antonio grow the tobacco. He stay here all the time. Uh, He will be here soon, I think. Uh, Would you like to make yourself comfortable? Sure. Here, I have prepared a daiquiri for you. Oh, that's oh, well, that's Antonio. Nice. Antonio, make the best daiquiri in all Argentine. Uh, thank you, Antonio. Well, salute. Salute y pesetas y amor, Antonio. Salute, senor y senora Collins. Mmm. Sensational. Oh, I'm going to steal you from Tom, Antonio, just to have you in San Francisco. We'll pay you twice what Tom does. And all you have to do is make Dakiri. Antonio. Antonio. Ah, there's Senor McDougal now. I'm here, Senor, with your visitors, Senor and Senora Collins. They're here. I hadn't expected them so soon. Greg, my boy, and Gail, how are you both? We're fine, thanks, Tom. And you look a bit hot and bothered. Something wrong? Yes, a fire. Almost destroyed my tobacco crop. What is that? Oh, we got it out. But it was a pretty close thing. You were in the field, senor? Yes, Antonio. And something's very funny down there. I'll talk to you about that later, after dinner. Daddy! Oh, Lorna. Uh, Greg, Gail, you remember my daughter. Yes, of course. Oh, hello. 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 Um, Daddy, did you tell me the truth? Do you swear you didn't hurt yourself putting out that fire? No. Have I ever lied to you, Lorna? Yes, often. <laughs> <laughs> I want to show you something when we finish dinner, Greg. Huh? Uh, what's that, Tom? Something I found in my tobacco field. A rag soaked in kerosene. You found what, senor? A rag, Antonio, soaked in kerosene. Somebody started that fire deliberately. But why, Tom? I don't know, Gail. Something screwy is going on here, and I can't figure it out. Today, we had a brush fire. Last week, someone put poison in my wells. Antonio and I have watched and waited. We even notified the police. and had a few agents to police here, hanging around for a while. Anybody in these parts got it in for you, Tom? Oh, no, senor. Senor Tom, everybody love him. Everybody except Granite. Who's Granite? Jeppel lives about ten miles from here. Wild little fellow. He's an exporter. He's also a nut about Latin American culture. He collects things. Has about a dozen rooms full of Aztec weapons, Mexican novelties, Brazilian coins, all kinds of junk. Well, what's he got against you? He wanted to buy this place. Of course, I wouldn't sell it to him. But you're wasting your time thinking it's granite. He's clever. He wouldn't be pulling any of these stunts. They're too obvious for a man like him. Daddy, I still say you should sell and let's get out of here. I, I hate this place. It's horrible. I can't sleep nights. Oh, please, senorita, do not cry. Hello, Lorna, darling. Oh, hello, Stuart. Greg, Gail, this is Stuart, my fiancé. Ah, uh, hi, Stuart. Oh, Howdy, oh. You're just in time for dinner, Stuart. He's always just in time for dinner. Oh, now, Daddy, you've got to stop that. Young man, I'm among good friends, so I can speak freely. Someday, I'm going to take you by the seat of your pants and toss you up once and for all. Look, McDougal, you might as well get used to the idea that I'm going to marry Lona. 
Because that's exactly what's going to happen. It is, eh? Why, you insolent... Daddy, young... please. We have guests. Oh, oh, oh yes, eh? I'm sorry, Greg, uh, Gail. It's okay, Tom. Daddy's just in a bad mood because we've had some more trouble. I know. I heard about the brush fire. Mr. Granite told me. You know Mr. Granite, Stuart? Yes. I work for him. I'm his foreman. Is he in town now? Yes, he is. And he's on his plantation. Now, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Collins, but you're on the wrong track. Mr. Granite isn't the only person in town who has a grudge against MacDougall. Stuart, don't start that uh, look again. Look here, Stuart. Oh, Senor Stuart, please. You know how you say uh, exaggerate. Do I, Antonio? I began to see that Tom MacDougall's beautiful hacienda was actually a very strange place. There was hatred and suspicion everywhere. But keep your ears pinned, friends. We'll be back in a minute with more of our story. After dinner, Greg and I took a stroll in the grounds. It was cool, the stars were out, and we stood by a long line of fountains that Tom had lit up with colored spotlights. Oh, aren't those fountains gorgeous, Greg? I know something much prettier. What? You, Tim. Oh, Greg. That's the first nice thing you've said to me for ages. Why aren't you romantic anymore? I know the next line, bub. It's about how marriage changes men and they take their wives for granted. But you do. Now, look, darling. Let's go up on that little balcony. You see it? Mm-hmm. The stars are shining right on it. We'll just see if I've forgotten how to be romantic. Oh, that's a wonderful idea, Greg. Come on. The stairway's over here. Uh, Greg, Look. Under that archway on the floor. It's Tom. He's fainted. Yeah, let me see him, Gail. What's that around his neck? It's a gimmick they call Las Bolas. Three strips of leather with three lead balls. But what's he doing with it? What's wrong with him? Las Bolas has one major purpose, Gail. And it's just served that purpose very well. You use Las Bolas to commit murder. The dead body of Tom McDougall sprawled on the colored tiles by the fountains in the starlight was a gruesome paradox. Greg leaned over, loosened those leather strips that were around Mr. McDougall's throat. It's quite a weapon, Gail. Used extensively in Argentine. These three lead balls are each at the end of a leather strip, see? An expert, and only an expert, can use Las Bolas. And he tosses it, sometimes from as much as 20 feet away. One ball knocks the victim unconscious. You see that bruise on Tom's head? Yeah. The other two wrap themselves around the throat, strangling the victim. Evidently, that's just what happened to Tom. We'd better call Antonio, don't you think? He can get the police. Antonio! Antonio! You call me, Senora Collins? Madre mia! Senor McDougall! Ah, Los Bolos! He, he is dead? He's dead? Yes, Antonio. Oh, Senor McDougall. Mr. Collins, Stuart and I wanted to ask you if... Daddy. Well, what's wrong with him? What's happened? Daddy! Your father is dead, Lorna. Oh, oh no. Easy, Lorna. Easy. Come with me, honey. Sit down over here. Did you find MacDougall's body just that way, Mr. Collins? Just this way, Stuart. Not five minutes ago. Recognize this yellow leather gadget? Yes. They call it Los Volos, don't they? Yes, they do. Take care of Lorna, Gail. I'll get someone to phone the police. You kill Senor McDougal. That is what I think, Senor Stewart. Shut up, you crazy fool. You hate him. You kill him. Where'd you get that idea? When you learn how to use Los Volos. Suppose I do know how. That doesn't mean I'd murder McDougal, does it? Please, please stop fighting this way. Daddy's dead. What good does it do to accuse each other? I think I can help, Lona. How? By going to the other plantation and talking to Granite. 
stood in Lorna's stayed and waited for the police. Meantime, Greg and I got into a station wagon with Antonio and did 85 on those dirt roads till we reached Granite's plantation. Granite was a queer-looking duck, short, shabbily dressed, with very heavy glasses. He smoked small black cigars and peered at us behind a huge desk covered with paraphernalia. <laughs> what can I do for you, Mr. Collins? I have some news for you, Mr. Granite. Mr. McDougall is dead. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. I loathe the man. A heart attack, I presume? No, no heart. Somebody kill him with Los Bolos. Well, then, he had the satisfaction of dying in a rather picturesque way. Uh, most of us aren't that fortunate. You wanted to buy Mr. McDougall's estate, didn't you? Oh, yes, indeed. I'm an exporter, Mr. Collins. The McDougall estate is by the waterfront, uh, has a ready-made landing. Uh, by the way, will you give Lorna McDougall a message for me? Yeah, what is it? Tell her I want to see her. See, it's very important. I'd never have persuaded her father to sell. He's very stubborn. Well, uh, somebody saved me a headache. Do not speak of the dead this way, Senor Granat. You'll be punished. Senor, Senora Collins, please excuse me. Oh, where are you going, Antonio? I wait outside. I cannot speak to Senor Granat. If I speak to such a, how you say, man of the devil, poor Antonio will be punished himself. <laughs> like most of the natives, Mr. and Mrs. Collins, Antonio is an illiterate fool, weaned on superstition. I'm sorry, Mr. Granite. I'm very fond of Antonio. You still haven't told me why you came here, Mr. Collins. You suspect me of murder, of course. But you must be incredibly naive to think that you could just walk in and have me hand you a written confession. I haven't accused you of murder, Mr. Granite. I'm just... shall we say... Gathering information. Let me help you. Would you like to look around my place? Most of my guests find it fascinating. I've dozens of rooms in which I've gathered Latin American curiosa. One entire room is filled with the remnants of the Mayan civilization. Oh, and uh, by the way, you'll see also a bolos, uh, which I know how to use. Uh, mine is painted green. What color was the one the killer used? Chrome yellow. Disturbing shade. I don't like it. Would you and your lovely wife care to follow me? I can describe the items in my collection as we go. Thank you, Mr. Granite. I'd rather not. Then may I offer you a drink? I have one of the largest wine collections in Argentine. I think we'd prefer to leave right now, Mr. Granite. Very well, Mrs. Collins, just as you say. My man tells me you came in your own station wagon, or I'd be happy to offer you a car... Uh, the front door is this way. Good night. Good night, Mr. Granite. Coming, Antonio? The station wagon is right outside, senor. I drove it around to the front. I... Oh, my head. I feel dizzy. I feel sick. Antonio, what's wrong? Oh, sick. Antonio feels sick. The drink there was... There was poison in the drink. Oh, what drink? Uh, Try to talk, Antonio. What drink? Say no, Granite. Man, he give me drink while I wait out here. Oh. Oh, oh. Antonio! He's been poisoned. I resent the accusation, Mrs. Collins. Antonio may be ill for half a dozen reasons, but certainly not because of anything he was served in my house. Uh, I'll call a doctor. You'd better call a doctor, and quickly, too. If Antonio dies, you'll have killed him. I'll have the physician come over at once. Don't excite yourself, Mrs. Collins. Antonio! Oh, he's so cold, Greg. And his eyes... Gail, we've got to leave Antonio in Granite's hands. But we can't. We must. Why? We've got to get to Lorna McDougal. Bring her back here as soon as possible. We drove to the Hacienda, picked up Lorna, and made all speed back to Granite's place. As we walked through the huge entrance... Across the tiled floor. Look, there's Antonio. How are you, Antonio? Better, Signora. Mr. Granite did not send for the doctor. He didn't. Well, where is he? I'll tell him. I he think... took good care of Antonio. Got me these blankets. Put me on the sofa and gave me a drink. Antonio, better. See, Greg. 
Granite got a little too ambitious. He knew he couldn't let Antonio die right in front of our eyes. Where is he, Antonio? In that room, senor. He went in there. I think. Antonio, not sure. Antonio fell asleep. All right, Lauren. You know what to do. Go into that room? That's right. Tell Granite you want to know exactly what he has to say. Why he wanted to see you. And don't be afraid of him. Remember, we'll be right outside the door. What are you doing? Uh, don't worry, Antonio. Just relax. Go on, Lorna. Through that door. Stand over there, Gail. So Granite can't see you when she opens the door. Ready, Mr. Collins? Ready. Open the door. Well? See him, Lorna? No. No, he's not here. I don't see him anywhere. I... What is it? In the corner of the room. Mr. Granite. He's dead. Los Bolas. Mr. Granite was lying in the corner of his room with a yellow leather bolus wrapped around his neck. His face twisted in agony with a horrible purple tinge from strangulation. In just a minute, we'll bring you the climax of the case. Greg had examined the body and called for the police. Oh, it's horrible. Horrible. You've had more than your share, Lorna. I don't understand it, Greg. All this time, I've been thinking that Mr. Granite was... The killer? Well, I was on that trail for a while myself, Gail, but... Mr. Collins. Mrs. Collins. Oh, there's Stuart. What are you all doing? What? Oh. Mr. Granite. He's dead, Stuart. Died the same way Tom McDougall did. Mm-hmm. North Lola, sir? Where'd you come from, Stuart? I work here, Mrs. Collins. I told you that before. I'm Mr. Grant's foreman. Antonio, is this the man who gave you the drink? Drink? What's wrong with Antonio? No. Senor Granite has a houseboy. You know, I think we could wash this up even before the police get here. The police? Now, if you'll calm down for a second, Lorna, and answer a question or two. Please, please, no more questions. Not about Daddy, anyway. I can't talk about that, please. Now, take it easy, Lorna. Sit down. <laughs> have a cigarette. I'm sorry I only have these native cigarettes. Oh, no, no, thank you. I only smoke American brands. Anybody else? Antonio. I bet you could use one. Oh, uh, thank you, Senor Collins. What Antonio need. Calm the nerves, I think. Why don't you take the chair in the corner, Stuart? I'm sure we'd all stop screaming at each other if we could get at the truth. Back. Never mind the psychological approach, Mr. Collins. All this cozy business doesn't impress me at all. Get to the point. Oh, I will. Yes, yeah, Stuart, I will. If I can get everybody to cool off. Uh, how about you? Uh, smoke? All right. I'll take one. What's in this cigarette? It's marijuana. What? Greg, did you say marijuana? That's right, Gail. The killer smokes marijuana, and he... You are very much smarter than I thought, Mr. Collins. Antonio! Get out of my way, Mrs. Oh, Collins. Stop him! He'll get out through the window. Greg, the ball is on the wall. Give it to me. Here. Watch out, Antonio. I'm going to throw it. No! No, don't throw it! Oh, my legs! My legs! You're lucky, Antonio. I decided to wrap it around your legs and take you alive. You're lucky I didn't give it to you in the throat the way you did with MacDougall and Granite. After they took Antonio away and we said goodbye to Stuart and Lorna, we decided to finish our vacation in Caracas, Venezuela. As we waited in the airport... All right, Greg. Start from the beginning about Antonio. And tell me slowly. 
because I'm not in a very bright mood. Well, it isn't complicated at all, Gail. When Antonio collapsed, after he said he'd been poisoned, a packet of cigarettes fell out of his pocket. I recognized them. They were marijuana cigarettes. Well, that gave me a hunch. And when we went back to pick up Lorna, I had a look at the tobacco growing there on the outskirts of the McDougal plantation. It was marijuana. But what's that got to do with it? Uh, don't you see? I clinched it. Antonio, when we first met him, said McDougal never examined his plantation at all. He left it to his charming foreman, Antonio. Then if you knew it was Antonio... Well, I, I wasn't absolutely positive, Gail. Until I purposely offered those cigarettes to Lorna, Stewart, and Antonio. And of course, all they knew was that I had a native pack. Lorna refused them. They made Stewart sick. But Antonio enjoyed them. I know the rest. I can fit the pieces together as well as you can. Antonio was probably growing the marijuana way out near the jungle where McDougal wouldn't notice it. Yeah, that's right. Antonio not only smoked the awful stuff, but mm, probably sold it at a terrific profit. He poisoned the wells and started the brush fire because he wanted to jinx the place. He didn't want anyone to buy the plantation. They might find out his secret. But McDougal must have stumbled across the stuff, so... Antonio killed him. That's the deal. Then, to throw suspicion off himself, he slipped himself a mickey in Granite's house. But Granite, who was a very sharp apple, must have guessed Antonio was faking. So, Granite had to get the Bolas treatment, too. Yes, call for flight 63 to Caracas. Greg, darling, when we get to uh, Caracas, you owe me something. Yeah? Uh, what is it? A balcony in the starlight. Yeah. You were going to show me that even though we've been married for a few years, you could still be romantic. You are going to recite poetry and give me flowers and... Oh, no, girl. Oh, no. Oh, not me. I don't get romantic with all that icky stuff. But, Greg, when we do get to that balcony with gardenias all around it. The stars are out. And we're alone. What will you do? Hmm? Oh, I'll think of something. Well, folks, Gail and I hope you enjoyed our adventure, The Chrome Yellow Death. Be sure to visit us next time for another puzzle in murder. Where there is crime and romance, there you'll find Mr. And Mrs. Collins. You know, the only time San Francisco really gets hot is when a tourist calls it Frisco, and then it gets warm enough to give a sleigh dog a southern accent. Down around the waterfront, they don't care so much. And for a buck, you can insult anybody but Joe DiMaggio. The piers stretch out like a big yawn from south of the ferry building clear to the China docks. You pushed over on one side so you won't notice about the same spot you'll find dust in a bride's parlor. You find Pier 23. From there, it's a short skip to Johnny Madero's boat shop. My place. The sign outside looks honest, but down here, the only sign people pay any attention to is rigor mortis. I rent boats and do anything else you can blame on your environment. It works out all right. But pretty soon word gets around and you've got a reputation. That doesn't pay to argue. Because even if you're leveling, you make as much headway as a whistler with a split lip. I found that out last Wednesday afternoon. I was looking out the window watching the tide come in when somebody in back of me coughed. When I turned, Nat Finley was standing there in the office. He didn't say anything for a minute, and you noticed his eyes were as soft as the inside of a woman's arm. They had one of those faraway looks you couldn't follow with a road map. 
And then I saw the rest of him. He wasn't flabby, but he was on the way. And you got the idea he was an ex-fighter who settled down with a restaurant. I, uh... I got the right place, haven't I? If a woman screams, you haven't. What's on your mind? <laughs> that's a good question, Madero. That's a good question. Uh, that's what I want you to find out. Look, fellow, maybe I don't even want to be friendly. What's on your mind? I don't know, Madero. I don't know. All right, you convinced me. Now back out of here. We'll both be in the dark. Huh? Well, wait a minute, Madero. Listen to me. Uh, my name is uh, Nat Finley. My wife and I live up on Knob Hill, and I've been retired for a while, see? And... I don't, but go ahead. Well, you got to help me, Madero. I'll pay you 50 bucks a day to help me. At that price, it won't be help. I want you to find someone for me. But I don't know who or why, yet. We're back to that again, huh? Oh, listen to me. Lately, a name's been ringing in my ears. Just a name. Pete Sucho. Pete Sucho. Over and over again. So you read it somewhere. I don't know where I picked it up. For the last week, the name Pete Sucho has been on my mind. It's a, it's a nightmare. You've got to do something about it, Madell. Change your diet. That might help. I want you to find Pete Sucho. Find out who he is, where he is, why he's bothering me. If you do, I'll, I'll give you a $200 bonus. Look, Finley, is this a job or a career? There must be a dozen sutras from here to Jersey City. Maybe, but the Pete Sutra I want lives right here in this town. He's got to. There's a law? Now listen to me, Mayor. Oh, last night, I, I kept hearing the name Sutra again. Only this time, there was an address, too. It was care of General Delivery, San Francisco. So he's got to be somewhere in this town. Why don't you check the phone book? I have, and the city directory, too. But so far, I haven't been able to locate him. And I will, huh? Well, if you don't, you're still getting 50 bucks a day. What are you worried about? That 50 bucks a day? It might turn out to be a dream, too. You better throw in some advance money. Well, sure, Mattel. I brought a check along, just in case. Will $100 cover your doubts? Yeah, if the bank can cover your check. If they can't, you don't have to do the job. That's fair enough? Mm-hmm. Will you, will you start looking right away? Yeah. But you got to be careful, Madero. My wife's never to know about this, understand? Why? Because, well, she, uh... She doesn't like the idea. She she thinks I'm a little crazy looking for a name like this. She hates me, I think. She thinks I'm crazy. Don't worry about her, Finley, until she starts mixing your nightcaps. For 50 bucks a day, I'll chase anybody's dream. Because with that kind of dough, you're rich enough to run down a couple of your own. When Finley left, I called the bank and found out his check had solid backing. So I went down to Lofty's and I put out some feelers on Pete Sutro. It didn't take long before one of the boys came up with a lead. A couple of other people were looking for Sutro, too. One was a guy named Marty Kane. The other was a torch singer named Evelyn Day. The word was that Sutro and Evelyn used to trade mash notes in Detroit. Well, I phoned the Jade Club where Evelyn was working, but she wasn't due for an hour. So I decided to give Marty Kane first try. He was living in a motel out in the marina, so I went out. There was a sign outside that said Modern Cabins. But you knew Abe Lincoln did better in Illinois. The cabins were the size of an upper berth with enough holes to start a punch board. That didn't leave much privacy. You had more chance of keeping a secret from Matta Harry. I asked the manager where Kane's place was, and he pointed to the end cabin. I went over and knocked on the door. Kane opened it and glared. His eyes were the color of Saturday night on a week old jag, and he was so chunky you figured he'd be harder to move than an ice box through a basement window. Who are you? My name's Madero, Johnny Madero. Don't rhyme with anything. What are you looking for? A guy named Pete Sutro. I hear you got the same idea. So you got ears. I'll invite you in. Uh, I can't turn you down. Yeah, that's what everybody says about this gun. Now sit down, you get me nervous. Put away the gun and we'll both be calm, huh? After you tell me what you know about Sutro. I'm tracking down a dream. Yours? A client's. You sound anxious. What's your pitch? A wild one. Just say he owes me some dough and I need it bad now. You got the muscles? Take in laundry. I'll put you through the ringer first. I want to lead on Sutro. Yeah, we both do, but I'm not going down on my knee. Get, Get up, Mazzaro. I don't want to make a liar out of you again. Yeah, you're tough, Kane. I'll bet you got your dandruff scared stiff. Yeah, and I'll start on yours now. What Sutro to you? Fifty bucks a day. A guy named Nat Finley hired me to track him down. Does that make you happy? No, just ambitious. Who's Nat Finley? He came in and paid me to find Sutro. He said the name was giving him nightmares. Sounds like a bedtime story, Madero. Well, if you don't like it, jazz it up. It's the truth. I read the wrong papers. Give me another version. All right, if you don't believe me, Kane, make up your own. Here's Finley's check. Can you read? If you'll help me with the big words. Give it here. Nat Finley. Yeah, Nat Finley. You weren't lying. Looks like a good check. I'll take a chance. I'll cash it for you. It's giving you ideas, huh? Yeah, and the first one's about you. Well, here's your dough, Madeira. Now, get out. Get out quick. Oh, you're too good to me, Kane. Suppose the check bounces. It won't, Madeira, because I ain't going to cash it. Oh, I couldn't figure it. Kane looked at the check and smiled like a guy who just learned all about the atom bomb. 
I walked out. The only thing I knew for sure was the demand for Pete Sutra was big enough to start a business boom. I headed back to my apartment to see how much lip I could bring down with an ice bag and a little pressure. When I got there, the door was open and the light was on. Inside, things looked even brighter. The brunette was draped over the couch like she paid the first installment on it. She was about 25 with a pair of legs that would have made a silkworm turn over and write a fan letter. She wore a tan business suit, and the way it was rumpled up, you knew office hours were over. When she saw me, she began to vibrate like an alarm clock at 6 in the morning. Good evening. I won't argue, but you got the wrong room. Will I regret it? I don't know you that well. well. You'll catch up with the crowd. My name is Sheila. I'm Nat Finley's wife. You should be somebody's wife. It cuts down on the risk. I want to talk to you. Go ahead. I'll try not to stare. Let's have a drink first, Mr. Madero. Maybe it will cloud your vision. Yeah, and the issue too, huh? Mm. You serve strong stuff, Mr. Madero. Soda? I'm all charged up now, lady. What's on your mind? I have a problem. Maybe you can help me. Maybe it's too late. I'm listening. It's about my husband, Matt. He tries, but he can't hide much from me. I'll bet you have the same trouble. Look, lady, you're working too hard for a sale. If you've got a point, make it. All right, Mr. Madero, we'll skip the intermission. My husband saw you tonight and sold you a wild story. Yeah, but it paid off. So far, I'm not complaining. But I am. I want you to drop the whole silly job Nat gave you. You're not building a case. Fifty bucks a day buys a lot of hangover, lady. You don't understand, Mr. Madero. My husband is a sick man. Yeah, I know. He can't sleep at nights. He has a large imagination, and it's been getting worse lately. He, um, dreams up things. Sometimes I think... Sometimes I think he's a little crazy. Maybe it's a hobby. He can afford it. There are some things even he can't afford. Yeah, like finding Pete Sutro. That's right, Mr. Madero. There is no such man. Hmm. A guy named Marty Kane will give you odds. Who did you say? Marty Kane. He cashed in your husband's check, you know him? No. No, I never heard of him. You don't sound so sure. Marty was talking about Sutro. All right, Mr. Madero. I'm talking about something else now. Money. So far, you're whispering. Shouting, Mr. Madero. Five hundred bucks worth. I'll give you five hundred dollars to drop the job and forget everything. Mm. All right, baby. You twisted my arm. You, um... You won't let me down, Mr. Madero. Will you? If I do, it'll be nice and easy. Finley had the kind of a wife you mate with a panther. She picked up her purse and peeled off 500 fish. She wasn't talking anymore, and when she swayed out, she wondered how much night practice she'd given that rumba. Well, I was all washed up with the Finleys. It felt good already. So did the dough. I felt like a guy whose name was just picked in a chain letter. My mind was free for the better things in life. So I called up a girl out on Van Ness and told her to meet me at the Regent Bowling Alley. I got there before she did, so I started warming up the alley. A few minutes later, it got a lot warmer because Inspector Warcheck of San Francisco Homicide began spoiling my game. Hello, Madame. That was a nice strike. You're in the wrong kind of alley, Warcheck. What do you want? Some pointers? You got time? No. I can see how you hold a bowling ball. Now show me how you hold a gun, huh? All right, Warchick. What's on your mind? I was on Marty Kane's. A guy named Pete Sutro. He owed Kane some money. And you paid off? I paid him a visit. We had something in common. And you must have bored him to death. Kane couldn't quite stand a couple of slugs in his forehead, so he quit. Well, what do you want me to do, Warchick? Break the news to his wife? No. Just tell me about the argument you had. It was a monologue. Kane wanted to know where Sutro was hiding. I only knew one answer, so he did all the talking. Oh, you should have said, please, it's not polite to interrupt a guy with a gun. Look, Warchick, what makes me the blue plate special? The motel manager, he said you go into Kane's room, and then he heard a struggle, and then later on he heard a shot. Did he hear who won the fourth? Listen, copper, a guy named Nat Finley hired me to find out who Pete Sutro was. The name was playing tag in his brain all week, and he wanted to know why. Yeah, does that sound like a story? Check with Finley. He's the guy who made it up. What if he lets you down? And work on his wife. She's not bad looking, and she paid me to drop Finley's account. I'll check both your alibis, Manero. In the meantime, I want to line you up. While you're making the rounds, look up a gal named Evelyn Day. She knew Sutro, too. Go ahead. Run the police force. Tell me what to ask her. Forget it, Warchick. You're not the type. <laughs> Warchick stood there for a second, wiping his teeth with his tongue. If he'd done it on the outside, it would have been a contract job. And then one of the bowlers in a tight pair of slacks brushed up against him and went out. He looked at me once more and headed after her. Well, I didn't feel much like bowling either, so I left the note at the desk for the girlfriend and started out. I knew I was in trouble. Some days it's harder to duck trouble than a handful of pebbles. Oh, I told myself I didn't kill Kane, but that was like trying to fight a fire with an anti-smoke law. The big question was Pete Sutro. Who was he? 
There were other questions. Like, why did the Finley dame buy me off? And why did her husband want Sutro in the first place? Well, there were no answers, and I felt about as safe as an alligator walking through a handbag factory, so I looked up the only good guy I know, a waterfront priest named Father Leahy. I found him in his room flipping through a couple of raffle books. Hello, Johnny. You're just in time to buy a ticket. The boys' club is raffling off an electric toaster. I'm already a little burned, Father. I'm in a spot, Johnny. The boys gave me a quota to fill. I got stuck at a banker's luncheon all afternoon. You know what they're like on risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got to sell some tickets. All right, I'll buy a couple, but I need your help. I'm in trouble. You'd better buy five. At a time like this, both of us can afford to be generous. What kind of trouble? This won't take long, Father. You always say that, but it adds up. You don't realize it, but I lose whole weekends that way. Will you please listen, Father? Warchick wants to pin me down on a murder. You've got the weight. Who's dead? A guy named Marty Kane. I saw him a couple of hours ago, and he was still alive when I left. Can you prove it? Well, that's going to be tough. The clerk at the motel saw me go into Kane's room just before he got tumbled. So far, you don't have a way out. Why not plead insanity? I would, but I'm afraid of the competition. What do you mean? A muddled-up guy named Nat Finley hired me to chase down the name Pete Sutro. He claimed the name was haunting him. I know how he feels. Johnny, I don't think the bishop likes me either. My only lead was Marty Keene. And he seemed to want Sutro worse than I did. Sutro is certainly popular for a dream. Do you think he'll ever materialize? I don't know, but I don't think Marty Keene was killed over a dream. If he was, it must have been quite a nightmare. Did you look up your client again? I didn't have the time. His wife paid me to drop the whole job. She said Finley was a harmless duck with a pail full of wild ideas. Does the husband feel the same way about his wife? Do you want gossip, Father, or do you want to help me? That's an unfair question, Johnny. Either way, I'm embarrassed. Please, Father. Will you check up on a few people for me? Yes, yes. Look up Keen's friends, and if you run out of those, try his enemies. Find out who might have had an urge to kill him, will you? It's a tall order, Johnny. There may be a lot of people involved. I can use them all, Father. I know. But can they all use an electric toaster? Father Leahy, I knew I still had one base to tag. It was Sutro's ex-flame, a doll named Evelyn Day. I drove down to Eddy Street and I parked near the Jade Club. Well, it's not a bad place, but on a slow night, even the winos are afraid to go in. Inside, it was dark enough to hide the decimal point on a check, and over by the bar, there was a piano playing music that nobody was listening to. And then Evelyn came on. And right off, he started hunting for the nearest fire exit. She had red hair about this side of 98 degrees, and she wore a black evening gown that held up by one strap and a prayer. She was the kind of a girl who could wear a Mother Hubbard and make it look like a negligee. And when she sang, it came out low enough to strike oil. After she was through, I asked the bartender to give her a message. She walked over to me, and she wasn't happy one way or the other. Are you the man who wanted me? One of them. You're Evelyn, huh? Yeah. What'll it lead to? A crisis if you don't sit down. All right. You've got me interested. Now, what's on your mind that we can talk about? My name's Madero. Now, let's start with a friend named Pete Sutro. Let's continue. What do you want to know about him? Where is he? Are you a cop or will you pay for the right answer? I need too many of them, baby. I'm way out ahead in a murder derby and I'll pitch homicide anybody I can get. What do you want Sutro for? I think he shot Marty Kane. Someone should have. But you're betting on the wrong horse. You're prejudiced. Sutro was your boyfriend. That's right. He was my boyfriend. But I haven't seen him lately. All right, then. What was the last thing you did with him? I'll read my diary to you someday. Now, look, baby, you've got a choice. I'm going to rough you up or let the pros do it. Let go of my arm, Adero. Or I'll call a bouncer. Call Sutro. Now, start talking before I bruise you up good. Slow down, Madero. You're out of my weight class. Yeah. I'll tell you what you want to know. Should I take notes or is this going to be quick? I don't know. Depends on how sentimental I get. That's all right. I got a handkerchief. Okay, I'll tell you. I used to be... Pete Sutro's girl in Detroit. Then one day he skipped out and left me hanging on the vine. Don't worry, baby. You haven't with it yet. I started looking for him and so did Kane. Why Kane? He and Pete had a deal together. Pete ran out with all the dough. Your boy should have run for Congress. He's got a nice record. What kind of a deal did he have with Kane? I don't remember. All of a sudden, huh? I'm shy when it comes to strangers. Let's just end it by saying Pete disappeared. Let's say you're dummying up. I love Pete. And I wouldn't want anything to happen to him. Do you carry a picture with that torch, baby? Sure. Want to see? Here's a snapshot of Pete in my locket. Do you know him? Not this season, no. I want him back. He was a good guy. Yeah, your boy worked up a lot of people. He made number one nightmare for a guy named Nat Finley. I heard. 
And I want to see Finley, too. You saw me, miss. But I want to talk to Madero. Hello, Finley. I got to see you alone, Madero. And I got to see you now. You lost your option. I'm freelancing again. Well, you can't walk out on me. This is going to hurt, fellow. Your wife paid me to drop the job. That's what I got to talk to you about, Madero. I think she wants to drop me, too. Finley grabbed me by the arm, and you could tell he was scared. His jaw was shut tighter than a wall safe, and his Adam's apple rode up and down like a yo-yo. Evelyn wanted to compare notes with him on Sutro, but right now Finley was as friendly as a no-limit poker game. He hustled me out of the jade and into a waiting cab. He wouldn't say anything because of the driver. So he sat in one corner, rubbing his hands and looking straight ahead. When we got to the office, Finley paid the bill, and we went up the ramp. Inside, he had a little trouble getting started, like a big family leaving on a picnic. And then he got his voice. I'm in a bad spot, Madero. I need help. Have you tried classified? I'm trying you. I tell you, my wife's out to get me. She keeps telling me I'm crazy. She's trying to talk me into it. A lot of wives feel that way, Finley. She'll get over it. Yeah? But well, I, Madero, she's trying to send me to an asylum. She and Sucho. You got enough worries to start a peace conference. What brings Sutro back into the headlines? I, uh, I found a letter in Sheila's purse. Kane wanted $10,000 from Sheila to keep quiet about Sucho. All right, quit crowding me with ghosts. So your wife had a past. And she and Sucho have a future unless, unless you help them. Help me, I tell you. I tell you, Sucho's behind the whole thing. He and my wife must know each other and they're trying to get rid of me. You're getting a complex, Finley. Slow down. Well, you gotta help me. Well, who's gonna help me? I got a murder rap to beat Oh, but I'll clear you, Madero. I'll clear you if you help me now. You couldn't clear your own throat in an empty tunnel. What makes you eight feet tall? This gun in my hand. Now, stop pointing it, fella. You're too nervous to aim. Well, you don't understand, Madero. I'm not pointing it at you. I'm giving it to you. This is the gun that killed Kane. You were there when it happened? No, but either my wife or Sutro was. When did you dream that up? An hour ago. I found it in my wife's closet. Two slugs are missing, and I, I got a feeling it killed Kane. Send it to homicide. They'll let you know who did it by return mail. I can't, Madero. I can't just yet. I don't know whether Sheila or Sutro did it. I got a feeling inside. You've got to find Sutro or he'll end up killing me yet. That's a prediction? Wait a minute. Someone's coming down the hall. Hide the gun, Madero. They're after me now. Yeah. They got the light fuse. Lay low. They're aiming for something bigger. What are you going to do, Madero? Just waiting for something to happen. Ooh! Madero. Madero. I guess it happened. <laughs> Somebody turned a flashlight in my eyes and then hit a four-bagger. If they hung around, they could have seen me do a couple of quick quivers a chorus girl would have been proud of. I laid there in the dark for a while. And if you're going to look messy, a blackout isn't a bad place to do it. After a while, I tried to get up, but my stomach felt as empty as a horse laugh at a funeral. I sprawled out again, and I tried to figure how a name like Pete Sutro could start so much pain. Then the lights went on. They should have stayed off because Warcheck was breathing over me like a steam engine with a broken heart. Hello, Madero. Does the light bother your eyes? Yeah, Warchick. Get out of it. Get used to it. It's a lot stronger down at headquarters. Um, uh, tell me about the gun on the floor. I heard you were coming. I wanted to commit suicide. You didn't try hard enough. Just got a phone tip that said you had the gun that killed Marty Kane. Hand it to me. All right, copper. I'll make it easy for you. Finley left the gun here before somebody sapped me. Uh-huh. Who's somebody? Don't any of your friends have names? Sure. Check with Finley. He was here when it happened. It was dark, Madero. How did he see? With an electric eye? I don't know. Maybe he smelled his wife's perfume. Look her up, too. She's that interesting, huh? Kane used to think so. What do you mean? It was blackmailing her. Look, Madero, a grocery list is blackmail to you. I'll put you on the inside. Finley found a letter in her purse. Kane wanted ten grand to keep quiet about Sutro. Finley told you all about it, huh? He can't keep a family secret. And the wife tumbled Kane to keep him quiet. Is that the idea? Well, this is your good day, Warcheck. Find Sutro now, and you've licked the whole thing. No, you find him, Madero, and we'll give you a reward. You're too generous. What's the pitch? Sutro's wanted for a payroll robbery in Detroit. He's been out of sight for a year now. He hasn't been out of mind, though. Finley thinks his wife is carrying on a sideline with him. Look, Madero, I talk to your boy, Finley. He's got enough dreams to start a mattress factory. I don't believe him, and I don't believe you. You don't believe the world is round. Take stock, Warcheck, and start learning. Yeah, I will, I will. Let's see how much the fingerprints on this gun teach me. You've got a story? I'll stay after school. You'll still wear the dunce cap. That's all right, Madero. There'll be a badge on it. Warcheck wrapped the gun up in a handkerchief. And if it killed Marty Kane, I might as well start writing letters to the governor. The gun was a plant. 
but I had about as much chance of selling that to Warcheck as a pair of short pants to a reform school. Warcheck stood there and smiled, and then he walked out. Ah, there were a lot of questions again, like who sapped him, and did Finley really have a story? The more I thought about it, the more snarled it got, and then the phone rang. Yeah. Hello, Johnny. This is Father Leahy. Are you still free? Yeah, but I'm breathing hard. How'd you make out? Fine, Johnny. I sold ten raffle tickets. What'd you find out? Warcheck just got a teletype. Sutro pulled a payroll robbery in Detroit. They think Marty Kane helped him. Well, that figures. What else? Sutro and the Doe are supposed to be somewhere in town. Yeah, even the bloodhounds are worried. How does Sheila figure? She and a girl named Evelyn were both in love with Sutro. But rumor has it that Sutro's favorite was Evelyn. What about Finley? Sheila must have got tired of sharecropping, so she settled for Finley. They both came in from Detroit about a year ago. Well, but, Father, it's still fuzzy. Marty Kane was blackmailing Sheila because of Sutro. There must be a tie. Evelyn's asking the same question, and she thinks Sheila knows the answers. She's on her way to the Finley place for a showdown. Thanks, Father. I'll tag along and grab a seat on the sidelines. It'll be a free-for-all if those two girls tangle. Don't worry, Father. They won't get in my hair. Don't be too sure. Samson had trouble with one girl. <laughs> Father Leahy hung up. All the pieces began to fall into place. All but one. Where was Sutro? He was around somewhere, but it was like throwing a headlock on a shadow. I grabbed a cab out to the Stafford Arms, and when I got there, the doorman looked at me as if I'd just blown up an orphan. I took the elevator and got off on the sixth floor. And then I leaned on the doorbell, and Sheila answered. She was wearing a pair of rose-colored lounging pajamas, and I've seen baked potatoes with looser jackets. She must have been surprised, but she didn't blink an eyelash. Are you pausing or opposing, Mr. Madero? I'm looking for trap doors. Oh, I thought you're going to look that way. Come inside. Yeah. Now bring that gleam in your eye over to the fireplace. We'll warm it up a little. It won't look good in company. Why? Who's company? Evelyn's a little late. She got tied up sharpening her claws. Evelyn who? Hold out, baby. She's got a better question than that. Like what? Like Forrest Pete Sutro. The key sounds like a friend. That's too early. That's probably my husband, Matt. Oh, hello, Madero. I'm glad you're here. Somebody's been following me. Oh, you're dreaming again, darling. You see? What did I tell you? It wasn't a dream. That must be her. Hello, Sheila. Remember me? You, you must have the wrong place, lady. That's the right idea. I want Pete Sutro back. You want too much. I'll grab anyway. I've come for Pete, Sheila. You came too late. He's dead. Pete Sutro died two years ago in Detroit. Do you hear me? He's dead. Not dead enough. You're lying, Sheila. Pete Sutro is standing right behind you. What do you mean? That's my husband. That's Matt. So you gave him another name and another face. But you can't give him another voice. That's Pete Sutro. What are you talking about? What are you saying? I'm not Pete Sutro. Don't you remember me, Pete? I'm Evelyn. Oh, what did they do to your face, darling? My face? I, I was in an accident. It's, it's hard to remember things. Remember the payroll robbery, Pete? You were supposed to come back to me. Payroll robbery? Uh, there was an accident. And I, I was hurt. I, I can't remember anything else. It, it's so hard to think. Well, you, you were there, Sheila. What happened? Go ahead, Sheila. Tell him what happened. Tell him that he's Pete Su Sutro. Tell him that you stole him from me. Tell him that you killed Marty Kane. All right, Evelyn. I'll tell it to you first. It was a good campaign, but I'm voting you down Put away now. the gun. He won't stand for it. He's ten peck now. What are you doing, Sheila? You'll hurt him. I'll try. <laughs> you... You shot him. You shot... Evelyn. Please. You remember me. She... She broke us up. For good. But you... You re remember me. Yeah. Yeah. I remembered. Evelyn. I'm beginning to remember a lot of things now. Then forget them, Ned. Just you and me now. We're married. You are. Uh, you married a guy named Nat Finley. Stay away from me, Nat. Nat. Try Pete. See how it sounds. Let, Give me that gun, baby. You killed Evelyn. Let go. You didn't need her. Not anymore. I got the gun now. No, please, Nat. Please. Tell me it's a dream, baby. Tell me I'm crazy. You are, Nat. You are. I'm getting out of here. You're not quick enough. Ah! The 
gun's empty now. Yeah. So's everything. I'm tired, Nadeau. Tired. Hold out. It's going to be a long trip. Yeah. I told you, Nadeau. Pete Sutro was going to kill me in the end. Yeah. You talked yourself into it. Warchak got the whole story the next morning. Seems that Sutro and Kane were in a big robbery in Detroit. The plan was for Sutro to carry all the dough and meet Kane and Evelyn at their hideout. But Sutro got smashed up in an auto accident and never made it. Sutro's face had to be remodeled, and when he lost his memory, Sheila made her pitch. She promoted a wedding and cut herself in on half the stolen cash. Changed his name to Nat Finley and brought him out to San Francisco. Kane and Evelyn got wind that Sutro had taken off to the coast, so they followed they couldn't find him, and for a year, Sheila and Sutro got along without a hitch. And then Sutro began hearing his real name in his own mind, and before Sheila could do anything, I'd already shown her husband's check to Kane. He recognized Sutro's handwriting right away, and so he started to blackmail Sheila. He didn't make any yardage because Sheila stopped him with a thirty-eight, And then she tried to convince her husband that he was crazy. Evelyn won in the last round when she recognized Sutro's voice at the jade. It turned out that Sutro had been chasing himself until he caught himself. Well, Warchak asked only one question. How can a guy forget his own name? I don't know. A lot of hotels would like to know that, too. Johnny Madero, Pier 23, starring Jack Webb as Johnny Madero, has been presented by the Mutual Network. Johnny Madero is written by Herb Margulis and Lou Morheim. Gail Gordon played Father Leahy. Bill Conrad played Inspector Warcheck of Homicide. John Garfield Platt played Nat Finley. Others in the cast were Gene Rogers, Joan Banks. Original music was composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and the entire production was directed by Matt Wolf. Tony LaFrano. This speaks. is the Mutual Broadcasting System. California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If the trouble you're in is way off the beaten track and you need help that's strictly confidential, you've got a job for me. George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> uh, dear sir... You employed the word confidential in your advertisement. Uh, well, I need confidential help. My enthusiasm for birds has led me into a predicament. I was watching starlings, but I saw something that was never meant to be seen, and it keeps haunting me, if I really saw it. Unless my eyes deceive me... My eyes deceive me. I was the witness, the only witness, to an outrageous crime. There's nothing more I can say in a letter. Please contact me at once. And it's signed, Elliot Wormsley. <laughs> Wormsley? That sounds like a name on a Dickens. Elliot Wormsley, MS, PhD, Statistical Services, Baxter Building. Bird watcher, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of canaries is this statistician interested in anyway? Oh, stop kidding, George. <laughs> That's a pretty grim phrase. I was the only witness to an outrageous crime. Yeah, and he's in a predicament. That's a twist. What was it he could have seen? I don't know, Brooksy, but let's see what we can see. Let's drop in on Dr. Wormsley. <laughs> These are the binoculars, Mr. Valentine. Uh, the ones I used to watch starlings on that penthouse roof down there. Uh-huh. But that's almost three blocks away, Dr. Worms. Uh, I know. The river house, huh? Pretty swanky. Golly, George. You can see halfway around the world with these binoculars. All right, Angel. Stop playing. Uh, back to you, Dr. Wormsley. So you looked for starlings and saw a killer hawk. Eh? Uh, something like that, Mr. Valentine. Okay. Now, just what was this outrageous crime? What did you see that you shouldn't have seen? Uh, uh, murder. I guess I dropped your binoculars, Doctor. Did you say murder? Uh, I, I can't be sure. Uh, but I just trained my eyes down there, as I've been doing for weeks. And in that instant, I'm almost certain I saw a man push another man off the roof. 
Uh, of course, he had his back to me. What do you mean, almost certain, Dr. Wormsley? Well, it, it, it was over in a second, and I, I didn't expect to see what I think I saw. Besides, uh, statistics show that the element of error in visualization over a hundred yards is 14 to a thousand. Yeah, well, we'll take your word for that. But why didn't you go to the police with this story? Oh, no, no, Mr. Valentine. I'm a modest man, and I don't like publicity. Uh, besides, I'm coming up for the presidency of my club. And, uh, well, so many people think bird watching is, uh, well, uh, a little peculiar. Yes, I know, you wouldn't make it. But murder is a very serious business. Uh, Mr. Valentine, if I had seen any mention of what I suspected in the newspapers, I would have volunteered this information to the police. But as it is, no crime has been reported. Well, that's right, George. I didn't see anything about it. Still, the picture of those two men keeps haunting me. I, I'm thinking of my reputation, but I, I do have some public spirit, and I have to make sure. My conscience wouldn't let me rest if I didn't. Oh, I see. And you want me to check at the River House and soothe your conscience? Uh, that's it, young man, precisely. It uh, shouldn't take you more than a day, and I'm uh, willing to pay your usual fee. <laughs> okay, it's a deal, Wormsley. Oh, Brooksy. Yes, George? Just on a hunch, get out of the Bureau of Missing Persons. See Finley. Okay. Find out if anybody's been reported missing from the River House. You will keep my name out of this, won't you? Oh, yes, we'll do our best, Professor. I'll meet you back here later, Brooksy. Okay, George. I'm going over to the River House. <laughs> Oh, you're very fortunate, Mr. Valentine. Penthouse B is vacant, and it's only $5,400 a year. Yeah, a point of information, Mr. Stevens. As I get it, the uh, sun deck of this wing facing the river is for the exclusive use of Penthouse A and B. Oh, it's very private. And Penthouse A is occupied by the Dunlaps, Philip Dunlap, the broker. So that would put you in very good company, and only $5,400 a year. Well, I was thinking of something a little better, but uh, I'll let you know. and rang my doorbell. Wouldn't be the full of brush man, would you? <laughs> Not unless my samples are showing. <laughs> well, come on in anyway. I hope you'll pardon the sun suit. I wasn't expecting company. Oh, it's nothing at all. <laughs> I mean, practically. I was out on the roof sunbathing. Uh, I'm Mrs. Dunlap. That's right. Well, I'm the chap. It's been a dull afternoon. Suppose we wait a while before you tell me what you want. Hmm? Well, as a matter of fact... You aren't going to stand there, are you? Here, sit down. <clears throat> Uh, the truth is, Mrs. Dunlap, I may be your next-door neighbor in Penthouse B. Oh? Well, that would be the first improvement they've made in River House without raising our rent. <laughs> I thought it'd be a nice gesture to sort of drop in on my possible neighbors and introduce myself. Mm. There is a Mr. Dunlap, isn't there? Uh, yes, but you needn't worry about him. He hasn't been home for two days. Oh, just like that, huh? Well, let's fill it for you. <laughs> Thank heavens. He must have decided to go up to our cabin in the mountains to brood. Or he may be staying at his club. Mm. But as I said, this looked like a dull afternoon. We're not going to let it be one, are we? Ah. Uh, oh, fine. That wouldn't be Philip. He has his key. Well, whoever it is, just explain I'm looking at the penthouse next door. Hal. Listen, Paula, we haven't heard from Philip yet, and there are letters and contracts he has to sign downtown. All right, Hal. I'm not my husband's keeper. Oh, just the same. I thought you might be worried. Oh. Oh, I didn't know you were having company. But this... Gentlemen may be our next-door neighbor, I hope. Uh, Mr. The Re name's Valentine. Oh. Really, Paula? At least now you know his name. Oh, uh, Mr. Valentine, this intense young man is my husband's secretary, Hal Sterrett. How do you do? Uh, I don't know what you're going to do, Paula, but I'm going to call the police and report Philip Missy. Uh, please do that, Hal. I'd feel so much better. Lord, how I hate righteous men, especially when they're young. So petulant. Well, where were we, Mr. Valentine? Uh, I was just about to leave. Uh, a mood is a very fragile thing, isn't it? <laughs> oh, you've been right neighborly, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. I don't think it's goodbye. Anyway, it was very nice even not having known you. Valentine. Hmm? Oh, Dr. Wormsley. I, I was waiting for you to come out of the river house. But why? I thought you made it a point you were to be the unknown factor in this deal. Uh, well, uh, 
After you left, I, I did some calculating. Yeah, good for you, good for you. There must be a way of getting into this empty lot without climbing over that fence. And in my calculations, I, I discovered that the odds against anything as extraordinary as this happening to an ordinary man like me would be about uh, uh, 14,000 to one. Mm, you don't say. Uh, so if you don't mind, Mr. Valentine, I'd, I'd sort of like to uh, tag along with you and see if I'm uh, really that one in 14,000. Uh-huh. Looks as though there's a gate in this fence. If we can get these dish cans out of the way... Hey, Brooksy, you should have brought a friend. We'd have a fort for bridge. Oh, oh, hello, Miss Brooks. Oh, George, there's been no report of anyone missing in this district. Oh, thanks. I was on my way to your office, Dr. Wormsley, when I saw you heading for the river house. So here I am. Well, kids, let's see what we shall see. <laughs> Away from you, toward the river. Uh, yes, yes. Well, there's the river behind that highboard fence. And on this side of the building, there are only the windows from the elevator shafts and the stairway. So no one would have seen him fall. Mr. Valentine, over here, over here, look. Huh? That, that's a man. I, I mean, it was. Uh-huh. Past tense is putting it mildly. Oh, George. Then it, it, it wasn't my imagination after all. No. No, Dr. Wormsley, it wasn't. And just to quote a few more odds, it's at least a million to one this is the body of Philip Dunlap. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about the great American pastime. If you're a baseball fan, check these two tips for getting the most out of this season. Number one, when you're driving to and from the game, use fast-starting Chevron Supreme gasoline. Special blending agents in Chevron Supreme give your car speedy warm-up and quick pickup for traffic getaways. And when it comes to hill climbing, premium quality Chevron Supreme gasoline takes you smoothly over the steepest ones. Number two, at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where you can get Chevron Supreme gasoline, there's a grand gift for you. It's a 48-page book about baseball written by Bert Dunn. You'll find in your free copy of Batter Up the fundamentals about this great American sport. One illustrated section shows how to play each different position. Ask for a free copy of Batter Up tomorrow. It's yours at Standard Stations and Independent Chevron Gas Stations, where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now, back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. It's only natural for a member of the Bird Watcher Society, even when he's a professional statistician like Dr. Wormsley, to be watching starlings on a penthouse roof. But when instead his binoculars revealed one man pushing another off that self-same roof, well, that's just sort of a case George would get involved in. It's about an hour since George found Philip Dunlap's body in the weed-covered lot back of the apartment building. And now we join George and Claire talking to Lieutenant Riley at Homicide. Yeah, what is it? Uh, Lieutenant Riley, Donnelly just brought Hal Starrett in. Do you want to see him now? No. Let him cool his heels out there a while with Mrs. Dunlap. Yes, sir. Now, about Dr. Wormsley, Lieutenant Riley. Okay, if... Valentine, okay. When Lieutenant Johnson turned the case over to me, I didn't know what I was getting in for, but I'll do my best to keep your client's name out of the case. Ah, oh, you're a pal. Well, as a matter of fact, Lieutenant, you owe our little bird watcher a debt. He did uncover a murder. Miss Brooks, I don't want to appear ungrateful. Oh, no. I can always use a new murder. Uh oh. I'm overjoyed that when you and Valentine stumbled over this homicide, you were uh, thoughtful enough to let me know about it. Oh, well, it's nothing at all. If you hadn't, I'd lock both of you up and throw the key away. Well, now that you're back your own sweet self, would you mind telling us what you found out from Mrs. Dunlap? Uh, well, she said she was out shopping all that afternoon, and the doorman is alibying her. When she got back, this kid, uh, Starrett, was still there, waiting to see his boss, Mr. Dunlap. He hung around a little longer and then beat it. Uh -huh. Did uh, Mrs. Dunlap suggest that there might have been any bad blood between Starrett and her husband? Well, she wasn't too anxious to admit it, but it seems young Starrett was being fired. Yeah, but what was the reason? Bad spelling or making Google eyes at the boss's wife? I wouldn't know. Not yet. Mrs. Dunlap was too broken up to go into every little oh, detail. Oh, oh. Broken up, huh? I can just see her tears flowing like wine. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, just thinking out loud. Uh, yes, Lieutenant? You can send Starrett in here now. Yes, sir. 
Well, it looks to me as though Mr. Starrett has some explaining to do, or else. Well, we know that he was there that afternoon, and your Dr. Wormsley saw a man push Dunlap off the roof. Uh, come in, son, come in, come in. Lieutenant, I don't understand any of this. I... Oh, you. Hello, Starrett. What are you doing here? Just a neighborly interest in the fate of your late employer? Say, what is this? Yes, George, I didn't know you two had met. Well, never mind. Now, what's this about Dunlap deciding to fire you, Stark? Well, I, uh... Why? He, uh... He didn't like my work, I guess. That's the usual reason, isn't it? You'll save a lot of time if you tell us the truth. You asked me a question, and I gave you the only answer you're going to get. You had a fight with your boss, didn't you? No. In the struggle, you pushed him off the roof. No. A man saw you from an office building. He couldn't have. Oh, Lieutenant. Yes, Donnelly. Can I see you a minute? Yeah, okay. Mm. I'll be right back. Hey, tell me something, Starrett. Yes? If you were already fired, why were you so worried about Dunlap? Even going to the Bureau of Missing Persons yourself? Because he was the best friend I ever had. It hardly jives with the story Lieutenant Riley is building up. Hey, Starrett. Yes? You're a college man, aren't you? Oh, what of it? Syracuse, 1942. What? Why, yes, but but how did you know? This, um, Phi, uh, Phi Beta Kappa, too, aren't you? That's right. But what are you driving at, Lieutenant? Well, uh, this Phi Beta Kappa key. The medical examiner found it clenched in Dunlap's fist. It's yours. I... I don't... Know how it could have gotten there. He must have ripped the key off your chain as he fell off the roof. Okay, Starrett, I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder. It's nice of you to visit me in jail, Valentine. But what's the use of going over the same story again? Well, let's say it intrigues me, Starrett. Paula would go right on denying I ever gave her that key. I can't prove it. Why should you believe me any more than anyone else? Because I happen to know a little more about the lady in question. Now, look, friend, let's stop being delicate. Paula decided she liked your type and made you the odd man in the triangle. That's why Dunlap was giving you the gate. Oh, I... I tried to break off with her. But she always managed to be around, taunting me. She had me spinning on my head. Yeah, I know what you mean. Hey, did you have a fight with Dunlap when he fired you? No, I... I wish there had been. That would have been easier than the way it was. Go on. He was hurt... And I was sick and ashamed of myself. He knew there were others, and that made the whole thing even cheaper. Now, surely just firing you, Starrett, wasn't the answer for Dunlap? Oh, he knew that. One of my last acts as his secretary was drawing up the papers that cut her out of his will. Hey, now, wait a minute. That just puts you in deeper. That means Paula had no motive. Hey, how about insurance? Well, uh, there was a big policy Philip took out recently with Paula's beneficiary. He didn't change that. Oh, wasn't that kind of strange? Oh, it wasn't something he overlooked. There was a funny smile on his face when he told me he was leaving that as is. That's very interesting. Oh, look, Valentine, I didn't kill Philip. When I was there, I didn't even know he was out on the roof. Okay, I'll just take it easy. I'll do what I can. What can you do? You'll never get the truth about that key out of Paula. And Dr. Wor so Wormsley swears there was a man out there struggling with Philip. What man? A burglar? One of Paula's ex-boyfriends? Or possibly the man on the moon? I think I'll drop in on Paula again. I don't know what I expect to find, but... With a gal like that, the unexpected is bound to be interesting. Well, if it isn't my next-door neighbor. What now? Cup of sugar? Couple of eggs? Well, maybe I did make a little fib, but you didn't believe me anyway, did you, Mrs. Dunlap? Paula. Okay, Paula. Too bad about young Starrett, isn't it? What a thing to say to a grief-stricken widow. Can I get you anything? We may as well make ourselves comfortable. <laughs> You've got a head start in those lounging pajamas. They're really something. <laughs> I was wondering when you were going to notice them. Hey, you know, I never appreciated before what lounging pajamas can do for a woman. Didn't you? No, no. I might say if she were out on a roof and someone happened to see her from Dr. Wormsley's window, he might mistake her for a man. Mm, if he'd never seen a woman before. His office is more than two blocks away. But uh, to get back to our hypothetical woman... Yes. How much do you guess she'd have coming to her if her husband were murdered and there was a nice fat insurance policy, the only thing he didn't cut her out of? You've gotten a long way from lounging pajamas. Oh, I don't know. And I can't help wondering what the lady in question would do if she had a perfect patsy and a difficult young man who was suffering pangs of conscience. She might even do something brash. If she happened to remember the Phi Beta Kappa key he gave her in a tender moment. 
Tell me, have you confided these flights of fancy to anyone else? Oh, no, my sweet. I wanted you to be the first to know. And you, my sweet, will ruin your eyes reading all those pulp magazines. There's another angle to this lady of the rooftop. Oh, what's that? Well, with all the insurance money she's sure to get, and with an admiring eye for a certain broad-shouldered character who seems to know what it's all about, oh, she might make life very pleasant for him. Very. Uh, you couldn't say he knew what it was all about if he fell for a pitch like that now, could you? Oh. I'd better get my cigarette before we go on with this little game. Or you can quit playing any time you want to. My dear old father used to play a lot of poker. He used to say the game was never over till the last bluff was called. Uh-huh. Didn't your old man tell you that even one of those effeminate-looking automatics make a loud noise and leave holes when they go off? I have a permit for this gun. Uh-oh. Come on now, Paula. Let's see if you can answer that phone with one hand. You know, Georgie, that could be your next to the last glib remark. When that phone stops ringing, you're going to worry yourself into a tizzy, trying to guess who it was. We've been supposing a lot of things here tonight. Now, let me top it off. Suppose they found you draped on the floor there with a bullet in your head. Okay, what then? I was in bed when I heard sounds in the living room. I opened the door. There was a figure in the darkness. After everything I'd been through, I didn't stop to think. I shot the prowler. I gotta hand it to you, Paula. Skip it. Just sit there on the couch a few minutes till I get my story straight. When I shoot you, I may have to tell the story a dozen times tonight, so it's got to be perfect. Okay, you stalled too long. You missed your chance, beautiful. It'd be a mistake to shoot me now. What are you talking about? Behind you, there's somebody out there on the penthouse roof. Ah, you know I'm smarter than that. Well... I'll take the toy now. Oh, you drop it. Oh, that's you. Oh, George, there you are. I tried to call, and then I remembered about the empty penthouse next door and the adjoining sun deck, and... Well, for Pete's sake, somebody say something. Oh, just a little parlor game, Brooksy. Uh, yes, yes. I, I was just showing Mr. Valentine how I almost mistook him for an intruder. Oh. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Raleigh will probably find it very amusing when we tell him about it. Oh. <laughs> That ain't the way I see it. For the time being, Angel, we have to see things Paula's way. But more important right now is to see if we can get a man out of bed. No trouble at all, Valentine. Don't mind selling a little insurance any time of the night. Are these all representative policies, Bennett? Yes, sir. Anything you want, we've got it. Life... Accident, comprehensive liability, tornado insurance, plate glass. Any insurance against fatality during parlor games? Uh, what's that, Miss Brooks? <laughs> Just a private show. This life insurance policy. Oh, any amount you want. Just a simple physical Well, these family. clauses at the beginning, they are pretty standard in all life insurance policies, aren't oh, they? Yes, indeed. Each one of them meant to protect policyholder and the company. Uh-huh. What's up, George? Well, uh, thanks a lot, Bennett. You've been a great help. Yeah, but look, old man. Sorry, I... shopping around, but I'll keep you in mind. Let's go, Brooksy. Now, Brooksy, first thing in the morning, I want you to check with all the druggists in this section of town around River House, Dr. Wormsley's office, 20 or 30 blocks in each direction. Oh, my aching feet. I'm going to be with Lieutenant Riley. I hate to think of his blood pressure when I mention one little word. <laughs> That's the word. Valentine, if I had any hair, I'd tear it out. What are you talking about? Well, now, look, it can't do any harm, Lieutenant. No one in his right mind can doubt how Dunlap died. This Wormsley saw him shoved off the roof. Then the body was found sprawled all over an empty lot, 12 floors below. Cause and effect. I have every reason to doubt that Sterrett killed Dunlap. Uh, I suppose you're going to tell me Mrs. Dunlap killed him, huh? That she used to be the strong woman in the circus. I didn't say she killed him. Then who... What... Ah, for the love of heaven. How about that autopsy, Lieutenant? All right, Doctor. Will you tell Valentine here that he's just been wasting our time? I wouldn't say that, Lieutenant. Huh? What'd you find? Enough poison in Dunlap to stop an army dead in its tracks. All right. All right, I can't argue with the laboratory. But I don't get it, Valentine. How many times do you kill a man, poison, throw him off the roof? Ah, it's a wonder we didn't find a knife in his back, too. Doctor, just how does this particular poison work? Instantly. Every muscle in the body becomes rigid all at once and stays that way. Uh Uh-huh, then it's possible that after a couple of days, the effects of the poison could be mistaken for rigor mortis. Not only possible, Mr. Valentine, it seems just what happened. Hey, wait a minute. 
Wait a minute. If Dunlap's fist was clenched like that the moment the poison took effect, how did that five beta copper key get in his hand? That's the point, Lieutenant. It was forced into it. And certainly Hal Sterrett didn't do it. That does it. That does it. I'm going to have Paula Dunlap picked up and she'd better have all the answers. Oh, no. No, Mrs. Dunlap, you're going to have to do better than that. I know how it looks, Lieutenant Riley, but you're wrong. Believe me. Paula, you had to be the one who put that key in your husband's hand. Sterrett wouldn't sign his own death warrant. I know, but Here I... are the facts the jury will hear. You were the man Wormsley saw wearing lounging pajamas. You had the motive, the insurance money, so you poisoned Mr. Dunlap, then pushed him off the roof to implicate an innocent man. All right. All right, I'll tell you just what happened. Remember, Mrs. Dunlap, you're doing this of your own free will. Hal Sterrett left that afternoon. I went out on the roof for a moment. Philip was there, an empty highball glass next to him. He was dead. Well, don't look at me that way. He was already dead. He'd committed suicide. How do you know that? There was a note. Cruel note. Saying that I was the cause of all the unhappiness in his life. He was leaving me without a cent. Okay. I suppose you have the note. No. No, I destroyed it. Oh, no, that wasn't very smart. Don't you see? I had to. So no one would ever find out it was suicide. Now, wait a minute. There was a clause in his policy. It's in most policies. Saying that if he killed himself within the first year... The beneficiary wouldn't get a cent. That much is true, Lieutenant. What I did was wrong, but I wasn't going to let Philip leave me without a cent. That'll stand up in court, won't it? Even though I did destroy the note, they'll believe me, won't they? Since you ask my opinion, the answer's no. But my job is finished now. Oh, no, no. George. I... George. Hey, how goes it, Brooksy? What luck? You were right. I found out what you wanted to know at the Gotham Pharmacy on Morton Boulevard. Now what? What am I going to do? I've got to find a way to prove I'm innocent. This isn't fair. Remembering that gun you held in my face and Hal Starrett, I'm tempted to keep my mouth shut and let you stew in your own juice. What do you mean? Me and you both. I don't know what charge you're going to hold her on, Lieutenant. But it won't be murder. What? Did you hear what he said, Lieutenant? What are you talking about, Valentine? Looks, he just found out that Philip Dunlap bought that poison himself at the Gotham Pharmacy. On a doctor's prescription he forged. Oh, George. Oh, how can I ever thank you? Oh, that's easy. The next time you're up on that roof alone, see if you can prove the law of gravity really works. George, don't you think that was sort of a morbid joke for Dunlap to play on his wife? Well, Angel, Paula played a few pretty grim jokes herself. Yes, but to leave her name in that insurance policy, knowing that she wouldn't get a penny. Crime, punishment, so much. Oh, uh, hello. Anybody here? Oh, oh Dr. Wormsley. <laughs> I just thought I'd drop in and take care of that little bill I owe you. Oh, thanks. Um, how do the birds look these days, Doctor? Uh, what? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, that reminds me. I must thank you, Valentine, for keeping my name out of the Dunlap case. After all, I was the key witness, and I... Uh, Oh, dear. Well, that's all washed up now. Uh, thank goodness. Oh, yes. Hmm? Uh, Mrs. Dunlap isn't living there anymore, you know. Huh? It seems three young ladies are sharing that apartment now. And yesterday... Why, Dr. Wormsley, oh. what kind of birds are you watching now? Oh, well, uh, they, uh, they were very wild canaries. Oh, goodness, <laughs> what am I saying? <laughs> And now, a message of importance to motorists. If this is the time of year your family gets travel-minded, it's probably the time you start thinking about new tires. And you know which make of tire gives you a written warranty against ordinary road hazards? The answer is easy. Atlas Tires. That's right. Each new Atlas passenger tire is warranted for 12 months against blowouts, cuts, and bruises that might happen to ordinary tires. And each Atlas tire has a double warranty. First, by the manufacturer, and second, by the distributor. Another thing to keep in mind when you're buying tires is a two or four wear better than an uneven number. Give you softer riding and easier car handling. For that extra margin of safety, get Atlas tires at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car.
Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Well, Brooksy looks like playing Big Brother a la Spencer Tracy didn't work out. Eddie beat it while I was shaving. Oh, that crazy little kid. Yeah, he left this note. He's on the prowl. To quote, he's going after Stan Lucas. Oh, no. What can we do, George? i got to stop him somehow. Hey, listen. You look up Emily. Maybe she can give us a clue on how we can find Eddie. Okay, George. And remember, Brooksy, it's a race against time. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Amair appeared as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Louise Arthur, Fred Howard, Peter Leeds, Charles Seal, and Charles Lund. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Don't forget to listen again next week, one hour earlier, over the same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Johnny Dollar. Ray Barringer, Continental Insurance and Trust. Well, nice to hear from you, Ed. It's been a long time Johnny, since you called Johnny, listen. Yeah? I've already telephoned the airport, made a reservation. Well, good for you. Have a happy trip. No, Johnny. What? No, that reservation's for you. It's on the next flight down to New York. For me? What for? So hop into your car and get on out to the airport just as fast as you can. You've only got a few minutes to make that plan. Whoa, hold on, wait a minute. I'll meet you there at Bradley Field, give you the address of the man in New York and all the details. Yeah, what man? His name is Lucian Ar... Look, Johnny, there isn't time. Get on out there to the airport. Yeah, you look, unless I know why you want me to get down and see this Lucian, whatever his name is. Well? Sure, I'll tell you why. Well? Johnny, it's to prevent a murder. Oh? Uh-huh. Yes. Now get going, will you? Sure, Ed. <laughs> CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Continental Insurance and Trust Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following his account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the back to the back matter. The gas tank of my car was dry as a bone, so expense account item one is 5.30 to fill it up. Then I tore on out to Bradley Field, and sure enough, Ed Berenger was waiting for me. Over here, Johnny. Oh, yeah. Over here. Hi, Ed. How are you? Here now. Here's your ticket. Okay. And here's Mr. Fletcher's address down in New York. Fletcher? Lucian R. Fletcher, head of the Fletcher Advertising Agency. Oh, wants to buy some commercial time on my radio show? No. Well, he better talk to the folks at CBS. No, Johnny. Listen. Oh, yeah, that's right. You mentioned that nasty word, murder. He phoned me just before I called you. That, uh, that agency of his is a small one, but prosperous. Up until a couple of years ago, when he took on a partner, it was practically a one-man operation. So, this partner's name is William Spade, Bill Spade. And what Fletcher called about was to tell me that Spade is out to murder him. Why? To get his hands on the advertising agency. What else? So jump onto that now, plane. Now, wait, 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 wait. Ed. If Fletcher knows this, if he's sure of it. He's sure of it, all right. So, Johnny? Well, look, then why doesn't he call in the police? Have this guy, Spade, locked up? Spade is out of town on some business down in Philadelphia. But he's due back sometime today. There in New York, right? Now, Ed, look, Johnny, I... old man Fletcher isn't the kind to go off half-cocked to come up with a false alarm. So go on down there, find out exactly what's up, do whatever's necessary to nail down his partner, and... Well, go on, Johnny. Your plane's about ready for takeoff. Okay, okay. As long as you're paying the freight. But now, listen. Johnny, you haven't any time. I'll make it all right. Relax. Listen, as soon as we take off, you telephone Lieutenant Randy Singer. Sure, sure, sure. New York Police Department, 18th Precinct, Homicide Division. Yeah, okay. Tell him what you just told me, and then I'm on my way. Sure, sure. Now, get aboard before you're too late. Sure. 
Item two on the expense account is, uh, well, no, the ticket for the flight was already paid for, and of course I'd hate to be accused of padding the old expense account, or should I say getting caught. So, item two is a dime for a phone call as soon as I landed there in New York, and not to Mr. Fletcher's address at 614 East 52nd Street. 18th Precinct, Conroy. Yeah, Conroy, this is Johnny Dollar. Let me talk to Lieutenant Singer. Oh, hiya, Dollar. How's the private eye business these days? Special investigator to you, copper. <laughs> don't like being called a private eye, huh? What's your guess? And listen, us cops don't like being called cops anymore. Yeah, so I've heard. But haven't you heard, Conroy, that a rose by any other name? Now, what's that mean? Well, you figure that one out. Now, would you switch me over to Randy Singer? Right, I can't do that. What? The lieutenant pulled out of here about 20 minutes ago in one of the squad cars. Oh, Big emergency or something like, aren't they all? But uh, he'll be back. Well, look, do you know if he got a call from up in Hartford, Connecticut a while ago? No, uh, not that I know of. But I mean, come on duty about half an hour ago. Okay. But I know he made a lot of frantic phone calls before he took off, if that means anything. Well, does it? Also, he took the medico along with him. Uh, well, listen, Conroy, when he comes in, tell him I'll be over at 614 East 52nd Street. 614. At the apartment of a Mr. Lucian R. Fletcher. Now, Dollar, you... Tell him if he can make it, I want to see him over there. 614 East 52nd Yeah, that's right. Now, listen. Gotta go now. <laughs> Item three is 640 for a taxi into 614. For some silly reason or other, the doorman at that snooty address hesitated about steering me out to Mr. Fletcher's apartment. That is, until I flashed my credentials at him and mumbled the magic word, emergency. Then I took the elevator up to the ninth floor. Come in, Johnny. Come on in. Huh? Conroy phoned me. You were on your way over here. How are you, boy? Randy. Oh, and Ed Barron's here up in Hartford did call you. Yeah, that's right. So I came on over here to see Mr. Fletcher, find out what all the excitement was about. Well, what'd you find out? Now, why don't you just come on into the library and see for yourself? Sure, sure. Well, but if you ask me, Randy, it's seen... Huh? Yeah. This is Mr. Fletcher? That's Mr. Fletcher. Dead. That's right, Johnny. Dead as a doornail. Pepsi-Cola refreshes without filling. Why? Because it's truly light. Charlie, you're forgetting something. Wait, Kay, there's more. Yes, ice-cold Pepsi is the delicious refreshment that goes great at a picnic or a party. But, Charlie... And Pepsi goes fast. People like it. So keep plenty handy. There. Oh, you did fine. Except for one thing. Well, I mentioned lightness and how Pepsi refreshes and how fast it goes. You left out Pepsi sociability. You know the be sociable song. But, Kay, I can't sing. I can. Listen. Be sociable. Look smart. Keep up to date with Pepsi. Drink light, refreshing Pepsi. Stay up. Well, at least I can say this. Pick up an extra carton of Pepsi today. Please do. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yeah, Johnny, somebody came in here and finished him off with just exactly one nice clean shot through the heart. Uh-huh. Any sign of a struggle, Randy? Anything like that? No, sir. So it must have been somebody that he knew that let him in here himself. Uh, and I'll buy that, all right. And it kind of proves the old man was right in his fears after all. Huh? When, Randy? Any idea when Mr. Fletcher was murdered? Well, I got that call from your insurance agent up in Hartford early this morning. I tried calling Mr. Fletcher at his office, but uh, he told me he hadn't come in yet. Yeah? So I tried calling him here. No answer. So I grabbed Doc Snyder and came on over. When the doorman couldn't raise Mr. Fletcher on the house phone and he was sure that Fletcher hadn't left the place, well, I borrowed the key and the Doc and I came up here. Randy, you haven't answered my question. Oh, according to the Doc, it happened sometime very early this morning, uh, right after midnight. Uh-huh, I see. 
Doc and a couple of boys from the lab just left. Oh, did they find anything, Randy? Any clues? Eh, not a thing to work on. All they know is that he was shot through the heart and what he was shot with. And believe me, Johnny, that bullet was placed just exactly right. Well, now, what do you mean by that? Well, just take a good look at this stiff, this body, I mean. Here, here look here, like this. Well, now, what under the sun is that? Some kind of a bulletproof vest? Yeah, that's what I thought until Doc Snyder looked at it. No, Johnny, it's a, it's a kind of a corset. Corset? Yeah, that's right, a, a kind of a back support that was made for him especially. Uh, uh, on account of some kind of sacred, I mean, uh, sacro lumbar trouble or something. Oh, yeah, sacro lumbar support. Yeah, that's it. Well, I've never seen one quite like this. Now, this thing's almost like a suit of armor. Sure. That's why I say it was a lucky shot. Mm. I, I mean, the shot had to be placed exactly right. Inch or two on either side, and one of those wide steel ribs would have bounced it off. Mm. Or at least kept it from going straight into his heart. Oh, oh now, wait a minute. The thirty-eight slug packs a lot of wallop. It. Yeah, only this was a little twenty-two. Uh, but now, listen. Yeah? That insurance man, the one who called and said you were coming on down here? Ed Berenger. Yeah. Well, he told me that Fletcher had been expecting something like this. That's right. Man. Yeah, he said that Fletcher made no bones about who might try. That's right. The one man who might stand to benefit from his insurance, and somehow we have to find it. Now, well, who's that? Randy, in his advertising business, he had a partner. Oh. And it seems this partner, a man named William Spade... <laughs> oh, wait a minute. That's probably the boys with the meat wagon. And come on to pick him up. Okay, I'll let him in. Okay, boys, you can come. I, huh? I beg your pardon? Who are you? Why, my name is Spade, Bill Spade. I'm Mr. Fletcher's partner. What's that? So you're Bill Spade, huh? Yes. Well, my name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. The insurance investor? That's right. And is that a policeman I see in there in the library? Mr. Dollar, is something wrong here? Where have you been, Mr. Spade? Why, I just got in from Philadelphia. I was down there on some important agency business. Just, just got out back, huh? When? Well, my plane got in about uh, half an hour ago, maybe 45 minutes. Well, here. Here's my ticket. You can check on it. Yeah, maybe I will. Where did you stay in Philadelphia? Uh, at the Bellevue Stratford. But why? What's wrong around here? Where is Mr. Fletcher? Just take it easy, Mr. Spade. But I've got to see him on a business matter. You do, huh? Yes, it's very important about a new client of ours. It has to be acted on at once. Well, I'm afraid it's going to have to wait. Well, I called the office from the airport, and they said he wasn't in yet, so I came on over here. Now, where is he, and what's this all about, Mr. Dollar? So, you claim you were down in Philadelphia when your business partner was shot. That's right, I was. Shot? Mr. Fletcher was shot? Real surprise. Where is he? Let me see him. I said take it easy. But good heavens, Mr. Take Dollar. Take it easy. And if this business matter is so all-fired important, well, hadn't you better be down at the office taking care of it? Ah, Johnny. Well, Mr. Spade? Well, yes, of course. Of course I should. Sure, sure you should. So uh, why don't you just run along? Well, huh? wait. After all, Mr. Fletcher's in no condition to run your ad agency. That's the understatement but of all I, time. I can't believe it. Mr. Fletcher... Dead. Oh, you can. Uh, this is terrible. Uh, have you any idea who could have done this to him? Are you kidding? What do you mean? All right, now. Sir. Yeah, Mr. Spade, you'd better get on down to that office of yours. Huh? And as soon as we can tell you anything, we will get in touch. Uh, believe Johnny, me, no, no, believe no. me, if there's anything I can do, please call oh, me. Oh, now, just don't you worry about that. But get on down to the office and take over. No, wait, right ahead, me, Mr. No, Spade. I'll be in touch with you. Very well, Mr. Dollar. Now, what are you... Well, what's got into you, Johnny? You're the one just got through telling me he's the one that must have killed Mr. Flesh. So how are you going to prove it? Well, we got no other suspect, have we? And you let him go. Look here, this plane ticket. Yeah, yeah, I saw it. I saw him shove it into your hand. I knew that Spade was supposed to be in Philly, that he was due to come back here today. So when I pulled into the airport, I carefully checked the incoming flight schedule. So what? Uh, oh, this flight was due in all right, and from Philadelphia. Just when he said, half or three quarters of an hour ago. Yeah, all right, all right. So what? That doesn't prove he was actually on that flight. Randy, I think he was. That ticket could have been used by somebody else. Well, it's easy enough to check on, but I doubt it very much. All right. But if you're right about that, if he was down there in Philly, then your first theory about him is all wrong. How could he have murdered Mr. Fletcher? Sounds impossible, doesn't it? Of course. It is. Want to bet? That's a 
warning signal for all drivers. And that can be a warning signal for drowsy drivers on long, monotonous trips. You see, driving can make you drowsy no matter how much sleep you get. And driving and dozing just don't mix. Why take chances? Take no-dose, stay-awake tablets. Millions of times a year, safe no-dose keeps drivers awake and alert. Helps you bounce back so that you feel sharp, ready for any emergency. How does no-dose do it? Ask your doctor. He'll tell you that no-dose contains a safe and accurate amount of caffeine, the same refreshing stimulant you get in your coffee or tea. But safe no-dose acts faster, is handier and more reliable. Best of all, it is not habit-forming. And no-dose is so safe, it is legally sold on a national basis without a prescription. Get no-dose, stay-awake tablets, to help you stay awake and alert. It could save your life. Now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Back to the Back Matter. Expense account item four, ten cents for a call to the Fletcher Advertising Agency. No, sir. Mr. Spade isn't in yet. All right, then, miss. He telephoned that he would stop off and see Mr. Fletcher before coming in. At Mr. Fletcher's apartment. And he called you from the airport, didn't he? Yes, sir. And uh, probably left the door of the phone booth open so you could hear the background noise of the planes and so on. What? Sure. So you know he actually was calling from the airport. Be wanting to swear to it. What? Okay, miss. Thanks very much. <laughs> Item five, sixty cents for half a dozen calls to various departments of the airline company. And finally, I managed to get hold of the gal who'd been stewardess on the flight in from Philadelphia. Yes, uh, kind of light sandy hair and blue eyes. Uh-huh. And he wore a uh, dark brown tweed suit. Oh, and his briefcase had the initials W.S. on it. Yeah, then it must have been Bill Spade, all right. But, uh, how come you remembered him so well out of your whole list of passengers? Oh, how could I forget him? What do you mean by that? Oh, Mr. Dollar, from takeoff to landing, that whole flight was perfect. But Mr. William Spade insisted he was airsick. Or on the verge of it. Oh? Uh-huh. He must have pushed the call button a dozen times. Mary and I were busier with him than with all the other passengers put together. Oh, I see. Mary swore he was perfectly all right. That didn't keep him from pushing that button. Yeah, almost as though he was deliberately calling attention to himself. Yes certainly look that way. But why? I think I have a pretty good idea. Thanks a lot. Spade told me he'd stayed over in Philadelphia at the Bellevue Stratford. Item six is $1.30 for a call down there. Well, that's right, sir. Uh, Mr. Spade got his key from me and went up to his room at about oh, 10 o'clock last night. Uh, you mean he said he was going to his room? That's right. Then he checked out about uh, 8 o'clock this morning. I see. If it uh, means anything, he mentioned the importance of catching a plane to New York. He mentioned it several times to both me and the cashier. I'm sure he did. All, uh, almost like a kid about to take his first airplane ride. Oh, uh, maybe it was just to impress you with the time he left your hotel. Oh? Well, what do you mean by that, sir? Nothing. Forget it. Thanks. <laughs> From the minute Spade handed me that plane ticket as an alibi, I felt sure he had murdered Mr. Fletcher. As for all his trouble to establish, he'd been in Philadelphia that morning, then aboard the plane, then at the airport. Well, all very clever. But where was he? What was he doing before he checked under the Bellevue? And don't forget, it's only a short hop from Philly to New York. Oh, I knew what Spade's answer would be, that he was in his hotel room asleep. And I'm sure that no one could prove otherwise. No one, that is, except Spade himself, could prove he left that hotel during the night. Gone to New York under another name, killed his partner, then got back in plenty of time to check out of the Bellevue at 8 a.m. So unless I could somehow, somehow trick him. Item 785 cents for a cab to his office. Yes, come in, Mr. Dollar, and sit down. Ah, all right, thanks. I'm sorry for the appearance of my desk, but with all that's happened and with the affairs of my new client to take care of... Your new client? Well, after all, with Mr. Fletcher gone... Hmm. Hey, it looks to me like you have every newspaper in town piled up here. But they wouldn't write about Mr. Fletcher unless he were dead or murdered. 
What? Tell me, how did you and Fletcher get along? I suppose I might have expected you to ask something like that, just as a matter of routine questioning. Your questioning of anyone who knew him. Maybe. But what did you mean by saying the papers would only print a story if he were dead? Just let me ask the question, sir. Well, of course. Well? Mr. Fletcher and I ran this business together. Personally, how'd you get along? He was a very difficult person, Mr. Dollar. Created many embarrassing situations here in the office. Embarrassing for you? Yes. But I blame it all on the constant pain from his back. You see, he had a very serious condition. Uh, sacral lumbar. Yes, I know, I know that. But I had to admire and respect him. He was a genius. Well, just look at the way he built up this agency. Yeah. Be nice to have, wouldn't it? Especially by you. In other words, you had plenty of motive for killing him. Yes, of course. But if you think for one minute... And I'm sure you had no trouble getting hold of a key to his apartment. Mr. Dollar... Who knows? Maybe Mr. Fletcher gave you one. After all, his own part... Dollar, if this is an attempt to be facetious... Look here, it's bad enough that Mr. Fletcher is dead. Now, that's the second time you said that. Said what? That Fletcher is dead. Well, of course I... What? Did I say that he was? Or the lieutenant there at the apartment? You said he was shot. He must be dead. You mentioned his back trouble. Look here now. Is I myself saw that corset he was wearing, those wide, heavy stays made of steel. Oh, you should have thought about those. What? Why don't you realize what would happen if a little twenty-two bullet hit one of those stays? Well, you mean Why? it would bounce off it like hail off a roof. Now, a big gun, a thirty-eight. But you forgot all about that regular suit of armor he had around him. But he fell. I, I saw him. I saw him fall. Sure you did. And I thought the bullet... But it, if I didn't kill him, I, I was sure I had. I'd, a, I'd aimed for his heart, and when he fell... The, when he... Oh. Yeah. Oh, no. Spade, I said, if your bullet hit one of those stays. What? But it didn't. You killed him, all right. Fletcher is dead. And now that you've told me who did it... Dollar, please, listen. You, uh, mind if I use your phone? Ah, oh, it's funny how a man like that can plan a thing so carefully, carry it out so carefully, and then when he's caught, lose his head and blab all over the place. Yeah. Spade even made a grab for the little twenty-two pistol he'd used and had right there on his desk. Well, it'll be good as evidence. Expense account total, including a good meal on the fare back to dear old Hartford? Hmm. $25.80. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Maybe you'll recall this tuneful reminder of times past. This is Dennis James with something else worth remembering. It's this. You're so right to stay regular with Kellogg's All Brand. See, it's the normal, natural way to useful regularity. The whole brand content of Kellogg's All Brand supplies your system with all the bulk-forming food that you need every day. There's only one All Brand. It's Kellogg's All Brand. So relieve irregularity from lack of bulk, as millions do, with a bowl full of Kellogg's All Brand each morning. A double L hyphen B R A N. It's Kellogg's All Brand. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week? Well, a funny thing happens. I get called in on a case that I have no business at all trying to handle. It's way out of my line. So, of course, I turn it down. And along comes another insurance company with another case for me to solve. Kind of a dangerous one, too. And has no connection whatsoever with the one I refused. So what happens? Huh. A real double deal. Solving one case automatically brings solution to another. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Gene Tatum, Frank Gerstle, James McCallion, Herb Bygren, Jack Edwards, and Forrest Lewis. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is John Wall speaking. Next, the fashioning of a bizarre plan as Suspense presents Memorial Bridge on the CBS radio network. Hello, folks. I'm Smokey. Here's Raymond Burr, known to millions as Perry Mason, with a special message for all Americans. Ladies and gentlemen, if just once you had to walk the silent, desolate trail that is any trail through the black and gray dust of burned-over land, if you could see the pathetic remains of wild birds, of squirrels and rabbits and sometimes deer that couldn't run quite fast enough, well, then I think you would be very careful with your campfire, with any outdoor fire. Dried stream beds, eroded soil, dead and dying trees. These are the price of human carelessness and thoughtlessness. Ladies and gentlemen, these things I know because long before I became Perry Mason, I fought many fires in the forests of the Northwest. And believe me, fire uncontrolled is an awful thing. This is WRW 590 on your dial in Albany, New York. Peter, you two. I don't talk to strangers. Well, uh, we're not strangers, exactly. I I'm Mrs. North. Beat it, I said. Well, you don't have to get tough about go it. Go on, go on. Scram and don't come back. The only place I want to see you is in the morgue. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Joseph Curtin and Alice Frost. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, The Death Trap. A few miles uptown from where the Norths live, in the cellar of an old brownstone apartment house, a woman sits at a table playing solitaire. Her hair is blonde, platinum blonde, and her eyes are sultry. Behind her, an anxious young man is nervously pacing the floor. You're going to wear out those shoes, Benny. Won't be the first time. What the devil is keeping Nick? Well, give him a chance, will you? He's got to check the whole setup before we can lift a finger. What for? Don't he think I know how to case a job? Look, Beanie, Nick don't trust anybody when it comes to a kidnapping job. It's the way he works. Careful. You like it, I suppose. I like staying out of jail. I like a meal ticket that's nice and steady, too. Well, what's the matter with me? I'd be the best meal ticket in the world if you'd only let me. I'd give you anything you wanted, Flo. Anything. Sure. For a while, you would. For as long as you wanted me. Ah, oh, stop it, kid. You're dreaming. And what are you doing? Using my head. When you get to be my age, you don't run off with little boys that fall in love with you. You stick to somebody solid. Somebody that's been around for a long time. Like Nick. And how long are we going to go on like this? Making love behind his back. Aching to be alone together and having him put his fat paws all over you. What? <laughs> He's back. That you, Nick? Yeah, it's me. Well, how'd, how'd you make out? Set up okay? Looks pretty good. Looks like you had it figured right about the old man's money, too. Well, what kept you? He was getting worried. About me or your share of the setup? Well, don't say that, sweetie. You know you're the only guy in the world for me. Sure, I know. Got a kiss for Papa? Well, let's not stand around smooching all night. Let's get the car and put this show on the road. Car's outside, Benny. We're rolling 20 minutes. What are you carrying? Automatics. One upstairs and one on the hip. Ditch him. Huh? Ditch him, I said, and take the silencer. I don't think we'll have any trouble with this old guy. But if we have to shoot him, we'd better shoot him quiet. <laughs> I'm glad we decided to go to the early movie, Pam. I don't think I could have sat through the late one. 
Well, if I'd known you were so tired, dear, we wouldn't have gone to the movies at all. Uh, have you got your keys? Mm-hmm. Mr. North. What's that? Oh, uh, Mrs. Rowland, dear, across the hall. Mr. North, did you happen to see my husband when you came upstairs just now? Why, no, Mrs. Rowland. Is he outside? Well, I don't know where he is, Mr. North. He said he was just going down to put the car in the garage, but he left here almost an hour ago. Well, maybe he stopped off someplace on the way back. Oh, no, I'm sure he wouldn't do that. You know, he hasn't been well lately, and with all the work we've been doing these past few weeks, selling things and making arrangements, to live down in Florida. He's been getting to bed very early. Oh, I'm sure nothing's happened to him, Mrs. Rowland. It's only a few blocks from the garage. Oh. There. I'll bet that's him calling now. I hope so. Will you wait? I'll see who it is. Yes, yeah, sure. Hello? Mrs. Rowland? Yes? Are you alone? What? Yes? Who is this? Never mind. Just listen and don't do any more talking. It's about your husband, and it's important. What? Don't talk, I said. Your husband's with me. He's been kidnapped, and as soon as we can get together on the door, we'll let him go. In the meantime, keep your mouth shut. But he's not... I told you to keep your mouth shut. Don't say a word about this to anybody, and if you call in the police, we'll kill him. No! Remember what I told you, Mrs. Rowland. Now sit tight and wait for my call. I'll be in touch with you later. Hello. Hello. What's wrong? My husband... My husband, he's been kidnapped. Shouldn't have done it, Mr. North. You you shouldn't have asked Lieutenant Wigand to come here. They warned me not to call the police. Well, you didn't call them, Jerry, dear. Oh, if they find out, they'll kill George. No, no, don't you worry about that, Mrs. Rowland. I was very careful about coming here. And I made sure that no one saw me. Well, what's the next move, Bill? Tracing that phone call? Well, no, you can't trace a local call, Jerry. Not after it's completed. That's why I was so anxious to know when your husband left this apartment, Mrs. Rowland. Well, I, I told you as near as I could remember, Lieutenant. He left about 9.30. And the kidnappers didn't call till about 10.30. Which means that it took them almost an hour to get where they were going. If they called as soon as they got there. Oh, wouldn't you? Now, if you wanted to keep Mrs. Rowland from getting anxious and going to the police about her husband, wouldn't you call as soon as you could? Yes, I suppose so, Bill. But... I still don't know what you're driving at. Well, figure it out, Pam. The call was local. The driving time was at least a, a half hour more. Uh-huh. And with a kidnapped man in the car, they wouldn't dare risk going over any big bridges. Well, this is, so what does that mean? That their hideout is probably in the Van Cortland area or, or Upper Manhattan. That sounds like a good lead, Bill. Oh. Well, it's only a hunch right now, but bright and early tomorrow, my men are going to check every public phone booth from Dykeman Street up. <laughs> What are you doing, Nick? Why don't you turn the light off and let the old man get some sleep? He'll get sleep when the ransom door is in. And so will we. Well, what are you fiddling with those bandages for? You You're taking off the adhesive tape? I'm not taking anything off. I just want to make sure he can breathe underneath the gag. You all right, Grandpa? I'll take this thing off. Sure, he's okay. Well, he don't look so good, Beanie. Maybe that thing's choking him. Oh, quit babying him, will you? You shut up. You want this old guy to croak on us? Okay, okay. I'll take it off for a while and give you a whiff of fresh air. There. Oh. Thank you better, Pop. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Maybe we ought to give him a drink of water. Oh, for crying out loud. Ah, uh, look, why me? Huh? Why me? Why did you have to pick an old man like me? I- I'm sick. I've worked hard all my life, and now that I've got enough money to live on for a few years, you're going to take it away from me. Oh, listen to him. I just want a little place where we can take it easy for a while and have a little fun until we die. All right, Pop, that's enough talking. We've sold everything we own. He said that was enough talking, No, I've Pop. got to tell you, because I, I don't care what happens to me anymore. If you take that money, there won't be anything left. Are you going to shut up? No, I'm going to fight you. Even if you kill me, I'm going to fight you every way I know. Baby! You had it coming to him. Now maybe he won't talk so much. Darling, I wish you'd tell me what you expect to gain by all this snooping around. We've been in every diner, bar room, stationery store, and soda fountain. Now, and... now, don't be discouraged, dear. We've got to cover all the public phone booths in this uptown area. Why? Bill Wigand has 30 policemen out doing this job. Well, it won't hurt to have 32. 
Oh, don't you see, darling? There's so much territory to be covered, and there's so little time to do it in. If anything should happen to Mr. Roland, I'd never forgive myself. Okay, tonight. let's try the next one. Only if we keep going into all these bars, pretty soon I'm going to have to have a drink. Oh, not in this one, dear. It doesn't look sanitary. Pam, he heard you. Cleanest bar in the town, lady. Oh, uh... I wash every one of these glasses with my lily white hands. <laughs> uh, we, we didn't I'm mean to... I'm not kidding you, mister. I'm a bug on killing germs. I got disinfectant all over the place. Yes, I, I smell it. It smells good, don't it? Nice and clean. I put it in the mop water all the time. Believe you me, this place, this place here, gets a good going over. Well, uh... As soon as I close up at night, I chuck all them bums out of here. I wipe off the tables with ammonia, sprinkle cockroach powder in all the corners. Mm. You, you'd be surprised at all the dirt and filth that accumulates in just one day. And if you don't do nothing about it, well, you get mice. Uh, now, uh, what do you have to drink? Uh, we don't care for anything to drink, thank you. We're looking for some information. About a phone call that might have been made from here about uh, 10.30 last night. Do you happen to remember if anybody walked in here and used your phone about that time? Uh, a man with a slight accent. Oh, uh, uh, Greek or, or, or Italian. Gosh, you, you got me, lady. Uh, at uh, at 10.30 last night, we was all watching the fights on television. Oh. Wait a second. Uh, was this bird a short, stocky guy with black hair? Oh. We don't know what he looks like. We just know that he speaks with an accent. Well, uh, now that you mention it, I, I think this guy did talk kind of funny, and he, uh, he, he acted kind of funny too. Like, um, like he didn't want nobody to see him. You know? No kidding. Do you know where we can find him? No, no, I don't even know what his name is. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? That guy looking in the door. You see him? Huh? He's the one I was just telling you about. The one who made the phone call. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Richard, you've got to find out who it is. Oh, excuse me. I, I didn't mean to bump into you. That's okay. You looking for someone, mister? No. Are you? Well, not exactly. Hey, where are you going? What business is it of yours? Uh, well, uh, we're strangers around here. We thought you... Sorry, lady. I'm in a hurry. Oh, wait a minute. Take your hands off me, bud, or you won't have any. Well, you don't have to get tough. Don't I? I don't like your looks, mister. Now beat it and beat it fast, or you'll wind up with a slug in you. Nick should have been back by now. It don't take this long to walk down the block and put in a phone call. What's he telling that old lady? How we want the ransom, I guess, and when to have it ready. Even so, it don't take no 40 oh, minutes. Sit down, will you, Beanie? You're wearing out the floor again. What else is there to do? Want me to play nursemaid, old man Roller? You might go in there and see if he's okay. It was a pretty hard sock you gave him last night. Ah, he got over it. Yeah, he got over it. No, you didn't. You're just as jumpy as you ever were. Well, well, you can, that stuff. The old man had nothing to do with it. I'm, I'm jumpy on account of you. What did I do? What do you always do? Sitting there with that tight dress on, blowing smoke rings in my face. I'll, I'll jump right out of my skin if you don't put your arms around me. Don't, honey. Nick will be back in a minute. Oh, you're a great one. You say you're nuts about me when we're alone. You say I make love to you like nobody in the world, but you still won't run out on him. We need him, Bean. For what? We'll net at least 15 G's from this hall, and with that kind of roll, we can go anywhere we want, baby. Just the two of us. We could burn up the whole world. Oh, honey, if you get me started. Oh, don't push me away, sweetie. You know you've got a yen for me. And you know you're going away with me, too. Just as soon as we finish this job. Oh. Baby, if you just wouldn't lose your head all the time. Don't worry, Flo. I'll take care of you quick. <laughs> uh -oh. What took you so long, Nick? I thought you were coming right back. I couldn't. I ran into trouble. What kind of trouble? With the old lady? No, I didn't call the old lady. Didn't get a chance to... What are you talking about? A job. The whole job. It's no good. Somebody's on to us. Are you kidding? Sure. I'm laughing my head off. Now, get ready. Pack up some of your stuff, Flo. We're all pulling out wait of here. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Try to make a phone call on Dykeman Street. You'll find out. Cops? All over the place. Asking a million questions, too, in every bar room, drugstore, and soda fountain. I almost got picked up. That don't mean nothing. Don't be a chump, kid. They're too close for comfort. We're getting out of here. How about the old man? Leave him. Let him go back to his wife. I don't care where he goes as long as we get away. Nick, you're crazy. This job is practically in the bag. All we got to do is set Stop up... Stop arguing, will you? 
We gotta beat it, I tell you. And lose all the dough we could get from the old lady? You'll lose a lot more if we don't get a move on. Dough ain't important to us right now. No, huh? Well, it is to me. It's the most important thing there is, and I'm gonna get it, too. You'll get it in the neck if you don't do like I tell you. Put your head on and go on down and get the car. I ain't leaving the old man. Okay, then, stay. Come on, Flo, you ready? She ain't going, Nick. Huh? She ain't going. She's staying with me. What did you say? Ask her. What's this all about, Flo? What do you mean you're staying with him? Well, I didn't want to tell you this way, Nick. But if you're walking out on the job, maybe Beanie and me can swing it ourselves. I'm not talking about the job, Flo. I'm talking about us. Well? Four and a half years, Flo. Four and a half years, and you'd split up with me on account Nick. of... Get away from me, you lousy... Take it little... easy, Nick. Yeah, I'll take it easy, all right. I'll take it so easy. Uh, put that gun down. It's okay, Flo. He just wanted to make it plain to me. Now I know you ain't going with me. That's him, Bill. I know it is. I'd recognize that face anywhere. Are you sure, Pam? Are you sure this is the same man you bumped into at that bar uptown? Mm -hmm. Because this picture was taken several years ago. It's the same man, all right. Have you got a record on him? Oh, yeah, we got a long record. His name's Hadris, Nick Hadris, alias Joe Nicholas, alias Nick Haynes. Well, if you've got a line on him, the rest ought to be easy. We know he's in that uptown area somewhere. And if you pick him up, you can make him tell you where they're holding Mr. Rowland. That's right, Bill. All you have to do is locate Nick Hadris. Well, I'm afraid that's not enough, Pam. We've located Nick already. Oh, and he won't talk? He can't talk. By the time my men got to him, he was dead. No. Murdered? Mm-hmm. They found his body on the bank of the Harlem River. I don't know why, Lieutenant. I don't know why you can't find out where their hideout is. With all the men you've got working on this case, you'd think... Well, now, we're doing the best we can, Mrs. Rowland. I... I don't know how I can make you understand that. Bill, let me talk to her. Oh, you're talking, Mrs. North. They've done something to my husband. Something must have happened to him. Otherwise, they would have called me. Almost a whole day has gone by, and they haven't even tried to reach me. Well, you did get that postcard this morning telling you how much money they wanted, and they asked you to draw it out of the bank and have it ready. I know, but that postcard was mailed last night. Mrs. Rowland, let me call the no, doctor. No, no, please, I'm all right. It's just that I keep thinking about him, if he's warm enough. They let him rest. They give him enough food. You know, there's certain things that he can't eat. Starchy things. They just don't agree with him. Well, I'm sure that they'll... Wait. Oh, no, wait a second. Don't answer that phone yet, Mrs. Rowland. I want to switch on the recording machine and flash my boys on the line downstairs. Now, yes. if that's one of the kidnappers, keep talking as long as you possibly yes, can. Yes, we yes. may be able to trace the call. All right, you can pick up the receiver now. Hello? Mrs. Rowland? Yes? Did you get the money in small bills like we told you on the postcard? Yes, I I went to the bank this afternoon. Okay, then get this straight. Follow these instructions and nothing will happen to your husband. Is he all right? You haven't heard him, have you? Listen, you will run a knife through his back if you don't get these orders right. Now, this is your last chance, lady. All right, all right. I'll do anything you say. Okay, listen and listen careful because I'm only going to say it once. Stick that money of yours in the shoebox and take the white plane subway out to the end of the line. And come alone, do you hear? After you get off the subway, go two blocks north and one block west. Wait there on the corner for me. I'll drive by in the car at two o'clock this morning. Now, you got it? Well, Two uh... o'clock sharp, end of the White Plains line. Two blocks north, one block west. But my husband, how do I know that he's... Hello. Hello. No, it's no use, Mrs. Rowland. He's hung up. What about the call, Bill? Was there time to trace it? Uh, just a minute. I'll check with the boys on the other end of this line. Hello, Eddie. That tracer come through yet? Was there time? Oh, good for you. Have they got it, Bill? Do, do they know where the call came from? Yeah, but I'm afraid it won't do us much good. <gasps> this call was made from Grand Central Station. Now, look, men, this is a big job, but it's got to be done to protect Mrs. Rowland. I'm staking out this entire area around where she'll be meeting the kidnappers. Now, no cars are to be stopped, but... 
If anybody drives past this red line on the map after a quarter of two, nail him. If we don't catch him going in, we'll grab him going out. What are we going to do about the old man, Bean? He looks to me like he's getting ready to pass out. What do I care what he's getting ready to do? As long as his old lady shows up with that dough. You think she will? She better or there won't be nothing left to him. All right, come on, kid. Time to get ready. Ready for what? It's only 12 o'clock. You don't have to meet Mrs. Roll until 2. Well, I'm going to change the plans around a little. Just be on the safe side in case there's cops around. She's expecting me to drive up to that corner at 2 o'clock, only uh, I'm going to fool her. I'm going to have the car parked there instead, an hour ahead of time. Hey, that's a pretty smart dodge. Mm Mm-hmm. I got another one, too. I ain't even going to be there to pick up the dough, on account of they might be expecting me. Huh? Well, if you don't pick up the dough, how are we going to get it? That's simple. You're going to get it for me. going to get soaked waiting out here in the rain just to see what's going to happen. Did Bill tell you we could stand on the side of the street? If we keep in close to the building, we can. We can't be seen from the corner. Well, I hope that kid never shows up early. I'd like to get the sober with. So would Mrs. Rowland. Is she there yet? Yes, yeah, she's just coming up to the corner. Where's Bill? He's down the street away. If we see anything funny going on, we're to call him. Say, there is something funny. What? That parked car over there. I never knew there was a woman sitting in it. Neither did I. She must have been slumped down in the seat or or we'd have seen her. How long do you suppose she's been there? I don't know. But I'm going to find out. Ham. Hurry, Jerry. She started the motor. Hey, wait a second. Just a minute, young lady. What's the matter? Well, that's what we'd like to know. Uh, How long have you been parked here? Just a little while. I had a dizzy spell while I was driving, so I pulled over to the side to rest for a minute. Is this your car? Of course it's my car. Who are you? Why are you asking me all these questions? Because there's a police officer down there. Police and officer? Hey, what are you doing? Get away from that car. Jerry! Oh, brother, she almost knocked us down. Come on, don't stand there, Jerry. Get Bill Wagon. Hey, Bill! Uh, that car, Bill! Go after that car! Hiya, baby. Did you get the dough? No, oh, nothing. We're hot, beanie. Red hot. What are you talking about? That place up there was a trap. Cops were waiting for us. Cops? How did you get through them? How do you know they didn't tell you here? I don't. I just drove as fast as I could and left the car right out front. You crazy halfwit. What's the idea of leading them to me? What the devil did you come back here for? I don't know, honey. I was scared. I wanted you to help me. How can I help you if you bring the cops? I ought to bust you in the nose. Beanie. Shut up and get out of the way. What are you doing? Looking outside. Got to see if we can make a break for it. Anybody out there? I don't see anybody. Not yet. Hey, wait. Wait, two cops coming around the corner. Two more up the street. I told you, you shouldn't have come back here. Well, where else could I go? What could I do? Anything, anything at all but what you did. Hold it up. Hold it up in there. The guy has been. The guy has forgotten. Not me, they ain't. I still got an ace in the hole. The old man. Roland. You heard me. Go on back in the kitchen. Bring him out here. Quick. Open up, I said. Open up or we'll break right through. Get away from that door, copper. You try to bust in here and I'll kill the old man. I'll blow his head off. I'm warning you, copper, if you want the old man to live back up from that door. Get your men out of here. Don't be crazy. I haven't got a Get him out, I tell you. Get him out or I start shooting. Flo, where are you? We're coming. We're coming. What do you want to mean? Haven't you done enough already? Shut up. Yes, Mr. Rowland. Come on, copper. Quit stalling. Either you get your men out of here or I plug Rowland. Now, which is it? Make up your mind. Wait. I'll wait three seconds. One. Now, look. Two. Three. Three. Mr. Rollins, okay, lady. It's Beanie that ain't so good. That's what happened. Listen, no, she shot him. Shot him again and again. I'll take that gun, young lady. Go ahead. I don't need it no more. Mr. Rollins, are you all right? Here, let me help you. No, no, no. I, I just want to get out of here. You will, Mr. Rollins. We'll all get out. Bill, is it all right if we take Mr. Rowland out to the car? Sure, sure. His wife must be worried sick about him. Well, we'll see you out there, Bill. Yeah. I just want to talk to this young lady for a minute before we go down to headquarters. He was no good, Copper. No good at all. Is that why you killed him? Guess it must be. 
Funny thing about Beanie, he could just touch me and I'd feel like I was on fire. But he was just no good. No good at all. <laughs> We're on the front page of this morning's tin newspaper, Jerry. Oh, really? Does it say something about the kidnapping? Well, of course. Tells the whole story, dear. About the way we tracked down the first clue up in that bar room where we bumped into Nick? Well, uh, no, it, it doesn't say anything about that, dear. No? Oh, I suppose it plays up the car angle, the way we found that flow woman and tipped off the police about it. Well, uh, no, it, it doesn't say anything about that either. Oh, that's funny. Let me see that paper. No, don't be disappointed, darling. After all, they had to give the police some credit. Some credit? Well, I don't see our names mentioned at all. Oh, over there, darling. Huh? Where? It, it, down at the bottom. Uh, uh, see? Oh. After a harrowing experience which lasted some 32 hours, the victim, George P. Rowland, and his wife, Margaret, returned to their apartment at approximately 3 a.m. They were driven home by some neighbors across the hall. Next week, more adventure of Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Alice Frost and Joseph Curtin. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Carter, something terrible has happened. So I found out too late to stop you, huh? Too? What do you mean? You're going to tell me that you've had another period of temporary insanity, aren't you? Yes. Yes, that's right. I don't remember what happened, but when I came out of it, I... I found this knife in my pocket. Yes. I expected that. Those stains on it. Carter, they're blood. Now for the case of the barefoot banker. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by a new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. It's four o'clock on a Monday afternoon, and Arthur Colby, portly, dignified, and respected, walks through the huge bronze doors of the Colby Trust Company and crosses to the curb where a uniformed chauffeur opens the door of his limousine. I won't need the car just yet, Marvin. I think I'll walk a few blocks before going home. Yes, Mr. Colby. Uh, don't close the car door yet, though. I want to get in for a moment to take off my shoes. I beg pardon, sir? To take off my shoes. It's such a fine day. I think I'll walk barefoot. Mr. Colby, barefoot on Park Avenue? Yes. Good idea, isn't it? I can't imagine why I never thought of it before. Why did you do such a thing? You, of all people. I tell you, I don't know, Lauren. I can't even remember it. It was like waking from a sound sleep to find myself in the street, crowds laughing at Can me. Can you blame them? Richard, keep quiet. Yes, sister dear. And that newspaper photographer, I tried to smash his camera. And you only succeeded in giving him a better picture than he'd hoped for. It's on the front page of every tabloid in town. Don't remind me of it. <laughs> you with your Homburg hat, striped trousers, and bare tootsies swinging that gold-headed cane at the camera. <laughs> you shut up. Arthur, dear, please don't get excited. We'll all forget that it ever happened. Yes, why don't you relax, old boy? Here, have a cigarette. One of those Turkish atrocities of yours? No, thanks. I'll stick to my pipe. Says? Not now, Richard. Aren't we swanky these days? Monogram cigarettes, no less. Yes, yes. They're not paid for either, by the way. Uh, uh, could you let me have a couple of hundred, Lorna? I'm stone broke. When are you going to quit sponging on your sister? 
Well, if you'd make me a decent allowance, it wouldn't be necessary. Richard, you should be ashamed. Arthur's done a great deal for you. I know. And he never lets me forget it. Well, if you don't like living in my house... Oh, but I do, I do. It's very convenient to have a sister with a rich husband. Even though he is a bit eccentric. Well, I am not eccentric. Well, I was trying to be polite. Most people would have said balmy. Richard, that's enough. Well, it's not as if this were the first crazy thing he'd done. How about the way he hides things all over the house? And the time he put the goldfish in the wall safe? If that isn't a sign of something not Get quite... Get out of here! Get out of here! Very well. I'll go. You'd uh, better watch out, sis, or you may wake up some morning with your throat cut. Arthur, dear, now, now don't pay any attention to him. Yes. Maybe he's right. Perhaps I am losing my mind. Oh, that's nonsense. You're only tired and nervous. But what if during one of these mental blackouts I should harm you? Don't even think about it. Tomorrow we'll see Dr. Henderson. Your Honor. Arthur, what's the matter? There's something in this humidor. Something buried in the tobacco. Buried in the tobacco? Look. It's my watch. The one I lost two days ago. Well, maybe you didn't put it there, darling. It might have been Richard playing a joke on you. No, no, no. I hid it there myself. I remember now. But, Arthur, why? I don't know. Heaven help me, Lorna. I don't know. I should like to buy a knife. Is it? A kitchen knife? I... Believe so. Yes, a kitchen knife should do nicely. Uh, what kind, sir? What kind? Oh, yes, sir. Paring knife, butcher knife, carving knife? Uh, butcher knife. Yes, a large butcher knife. Please. Of course. Now we have them at various prices. The price doesn't matter. Just so it has a sharp edge. A very sharp edge. You see, it's for my wife. And that was the knife they found under your pillow, Mr. Colby. Yes. I don't remember putting it there. I don't even remember buying it. And you want Nick to protect your wife against what you might do in the future, Mr. Colby? No. No, I told you all this, Carter, so that you'd understand the circumstances. What I want you to do is find the sum of money I mislaid during another of these spells. Oh? How much money? $20,000. Well, quite a bundle. When did you lose it? Yesterday. Teller at my bank said I drew a personal check for 20000 at about 2.30. And did you? I examined the check this morning. It's my signature, all right. But you don't remember signing it? I don't remember anything from about 2 o'clock until I arrived home at 5. Go on. The bank guard saw me leave the building at 3, but where I went or what I did, I don't know. Then you don't know whether you were robbed or lost the money or gave it away? I'm more inclined to think that I hid it somewhere. I... I do hide things lately. Hmm. Well, I'll see what I can do. But frankly, I think there's only one thing that'll get your money back. What's that? Luck, Mr. Colby. Just plain sheer luck. Patsy, there's something wrong with Colby's story somewhere. Huh? What do you mean, wrong? It doesn't ring true. I'm no psychiatrist, of course, but I've always understood these mental cases followed a definite pattern. Well? The pattern isn't right. Up until now, he's been hiding little things about the house. Oh, $20,000 isn't a little thing. Not in my dictionary. No, mine. But he didn't hide it in the house this time, either. Yeah. That's one thing. And this business of buying a knife and hiding it, it's completely outside the pattern. Do, do you think he's lying? Well, it certainly doesn't make any sense that he should try to railroad himself into an asylum... Unless... Unless what, Nick? Unless he's planning something big. And all this is just a build-up. So that he can plead temporary insanity. You mean... Something like murder? Well, could be. You have the name of Colby's psychiatrist? Yes, it's Dr. Miles Henderson. He has an office in his home out in Eastview. Try to get me an appointment with Dr. Henderson. Let's find out whether he thinks Colby might be faking. Okay. Oh, and ask him to have Mrs. Colby there, too, will you? Perhaps she can tell us how her husband acts during these so-called periods of forgetfulness. Why did you ask me here, Mr. Carter? 
Has Arthur done anything violent? Oh, no, no, no. No, Mrs. Kobe, nothing like that. Yes, and just what is this all about? I'm coming to that, Dr. Henderson. You see, Mr. Kobe has retained me to recover some money he thinks he's hidden and forgotten about. Is that so? How much money? Twenty thousand dollars. Twenty thousand? Yes. He said he drew it out of the bank during a period of amnesia yesterday afternoon. And he didn't have it when he got home. Why? You are going to say something, Mrs. Colby? I... No, no, I was surprised, that's all. You shouldn't be. I warned you that his condition was getting worse. Will you have a cigar, Mr. Carter? Oh, no, thank you. I believe I will. It's a rather large knife to use as a cigar cutter. Oh, I don't think so. I picked it up in the Orient several years ago. Oh, I see. Yes. Uh, Dr. Henderson, you've been treating Mr. Colby for some time, haven't you? Only about two months. At first, he complained of headaches and absent-mindedness. Then he began to find his personal belongings in odd places with no recollection of putting them there. Well, how about these periods of amnesia? They started three weeks ago, and they're getting progressively worse. At first, he did silly things, but now his actions are becoming more ominous, such as buying that butcher knife and hiding it under the pillow, you mean? Exactly. For her own safety, I've been trying to persuade Mrs. Colby that her husband should be placed in an institution. And I can't believe that's necessary. I won't believe it. Not until... Until it's too late, perhaps. Richard keeps at me about it, too, until sometimes I think I'll go mad. And who's Richard? My younger brother. He lives with us. Well, I'm afraid Richard's right. He isn't right. You know what he's thinking of, Doctor. Money. Now, just a minute, just a minute. I'm afraid I don't follow this. I love my brother, Mr. Carter, but I know his faults. He thinks if Arthur were in an asylum, I'd control Arthur's money. I and... see. Huh. Tell me, Dr. Henderson, have you ever observed a case quite like Mr. Colby's before? In my own experience, no. But the pattern of behavior is... It's not really unusual. That's what I was really wondering about. Up to this point, Mr. Colby's condition corresponds exactly to that of a French editor described by a Dr. Wilhelm Schweigert in his book, uh, Psychopathic Phenomena and Aberrations. On this other case, did it start and develop in the same way? Step by step, they are exactly similar. That's why I'm so positive Mr. Colby should be confined. Why? What happened to the French editor? He murdered his best friend. <laughs> Did you find out anything from your conversation with Dr. Henderson yesterday, Nick? Just enough to make me even more curious. Patsy, I want you to get me a book. It's called Psychopathic Phenomena and Aberrations by a Dr. Wilhelm Schweigert. Nick, I'm sorry, but I can't find that book you asked for. I've called every publisher and bookseller in town. Nobody ever heard of it. I don't think there is such a book. Hmm. In that case, Patsy, get me the County Medical Association. I see. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson. What do you say, Nick? You're right, Patsy. There is no such book. And there never was a Dr. Wilhelm Schweiger. Well. Not only that, the Medical Association has no record of any such person as Dr. Miles Henderson. Carter. Carter, you've got to help me. Something terrible has happened. So I found out too late to stop you, huh? What are you talking about? You're going to tell me that you had another period of temporary insanity, aren't you? Yes, last night. I started for my club about eight, and I don't remember any more until I awakened in my own room this morning. And during this so-called period of forgetfulness, what did you do? Murder your wife? No. No, thank heaven Lorna's all right. But look what I found in my pockets this morning. Why, that's Dr. Henderson's paper knife. I saw it on his desk yesterday afternoon. Yes, yes, I must have been there last night. And these stains on the knife. They're blood. That's what I mean, Carter. I'm afraid I killed the doctor. Well, instead of being part of Colby's plan to cover up a murder, the false Dr. Miles Henderson, it appears, has himself become Colby's victim. We'll see what happens next in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the Barefoot Banker. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by a new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. 
when Arthur Colby recovered from his latest period of amnesia, he found in his pocket a bloodstained paper knife belonging to the man who called himself Dr. Miles Henderson's psychiatrist. Nick and Patsy have gone to Henderson's office in his suburban home to see what really happened. Well, Patsy, he's been stabbed, all right. I'll see. Do you know with this sort of a wound, it strains that Colby didn't have any blood stains on his clothing. Maybe he was wearing something else last night. Oh, possibly. Huh. Must have talked for quite a while before the killing took place. Huh? What makes you think so? These ashtrays. One on the doctor's side of the desk, and another by the chair at this end. Judging by the amount of ash... What's the matter, Nick? Patsy. These are cigarette ashes. So what? Colby smokes a pipe. And the doctor smokes cigars. Oh, but Nick, where are the cigarette stubs? There aren't any. No. At first I thought Colby was framing an alibi. Now I'm beginning to wonder whether someone isn't framing Colby. What? You mean Henderson might have been stabbed by someone else? Someone who smokes cigarettes? Exactly. Oh. There must have been something unusual about those cigarettes. Otherwise, why would the stubs have been taken away? Well, maybe you can tell from the ashes. Hey, wait. Ah. Here's a few shreds of tobacco. Good. We'll take them down to the police laboratory for analysis. Okay. Is, um, is there anything else to be done here? I want to take a look in this filing cabinet, labeled Case Histories. See if I can get the names of some of Dr. Henderson's other patients. I'll get a pencil and write them down for you. That won't be necessary, Patsy. Huh? Looks as if Colby was the only patient I faked Dr. Head. You mean the file is empty? Not quite. Look what I found here. It's money. A lot of money. It certainly is. I think we found out what happened to Colby's $20,000. You mean I gave the $20,000 to Dr. Henderson during my spell of amnesia? I don't think it was amnesia, Mr. Colby, nor insanity either. Carter... What are you driving at? Tell me, how did you happen to start going to Henderson? Well, I met him at the house one night. Who brought him there? I don't know. There was a big party. Many of the guests were strangers to me. Uh, friends of Lorna's, friends of Richard's. I see. Go on, go on. Well, Henderson mentioned being a doctor and a psychiatrist, so I told him about the headaches I'd been having. He suggested I come to see him the next day, and I did. And that's when your real trouble started, wasn't it? Yes, those headaches were the first symptoms, he said. What kind of treatments did he give you? Why, the usual routine, I suppose. I'd, I'd talk about my problems, then he'd explain the hidden meanings in what I said. Wasn't there ever anything else? Well, sometimes he'd give me a sedative first, then he'd talk to me until I fell asleep. He, he said it relaxed me for the actual treatment. Ah, yes. And after one of those treatments, you'd pull some ridiculous stunt, wouldn't you? Are you trying to tell me the doctor was responsible for the spells I've been having? Colby, he wasn't a doctor. He was a fake. He, what? And unless I'm mistaken, the reason for your peculiar actions was not insanity. You were hypnotized. This is the garage, sir. My room's directly above. And if anybody had taken one of these cars out last night, you'd have heard it, wouldn't you, Marvin? Yes, sir. I did. You did? Then one of the cars was gone last night? Yes, miss. Mr. Colby took the convertible about 11.30 and brought it back a couple of hours later. Yes. According to the medical examiner, that's just about the time Henderson was killed. How do you know it was Mr. Colby, Marvin? Well, I know the sound of the motor, sir. It's quite different from the other. I didn't ask about the car. How did you know Colby was driving it? Because it's Mr. Colby's personal car. But you didn't actually see him. I... No, sir. That's what I wanted to know. Thanks, Marvin. Well, Nick, what now? We're going up to the house, Betsy. For a little friendly conversation with a killer. Isn't this rather useless, Mr. Carter? We all know what happened. My brother-in-law killed Henderson in a fit of temporary insanity. I still want to know whether anyone left the house last night at 11.30. Can you tell me, Mrs. Colby? No, I'm afraid not. My room is in the east wing. Too far away to hear the front door. How about you, Mr. Ames? 11.30, I was sound asleep. I'm sorry we can't be of more help. Will anyone have a cigarette? No, thanks, Richard. Mr. Carter? Miss Bowen? These are rather special if you like all Turkish tobacco. Nick, don't you... Oh, no, thanks. I uh, don't smoke. I wonder whether I may make a phone call, Mrs. Colby. Well, of course. Richard will show you where the phone is. Yeah. Well, while you're making that call, Nick, I'm going to work on a little idea of my own. 
What sort of an idea, Betsy? Oh, never mind. But I may have a surprise for you. I hope Marvin doesn't come in the garage and catch me snooping around Mr. Colby's car. He might think I'm stealing it. But there must be an ashtray in the car. And if there are any stubs from those special cigarettes in it, the kind Richard smokes, <coughs> it'll prove who took this car out last night. Yeah. Here's the ashtray. Oh, darn it, it's empty. Going for oh. a ride, my dear? Mrs. Colby, I... I thought I'd like to watch a detective at work. So I followed you. Oh, well, I... That is, Nick's the detective, not me. I... Well, I just wanted to see what it felt like to sit behind the wheel of such a beautiful car. Do you like it? Oh, it's wonderful. I... Why, how funny. What's funny? The rearview mirror. I can see through the back window perfectly. That's what rearview mirrors are for, isn't it? Yes, but... But Mr. Colby is tall. If he'd driven this car last night, the mirror wouldn't be adjusted to fit me. Get out of that car. So I was right. It was, Richard. How clever of you, Miss Bowen. But I can't let you tell anyone what you've learned. <gasps> Mrs. Coley, put down that wrench, please. <gasps> oh. Nicely done. Hmm. The skin isn't broken. Her hair will cover the bruise. <laughs> I'm afraid your meddling has caused an unfortunate accident, my dear. So foolish to start a motor in a closed garage. Uh, people die that way. And as Mrs. Colby closes the garage door, Patsy lies unconscious behind the wheel of Arthur Colby's car with the motor running. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the Barefoot Banker. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. <clears throat> Leaving the motor of her husband's car running, with Patsy slumped unconscious behind the wheel, Lorna Colby closes the garage door and starts toward the house. Oh, just a moment, Mrs. Colby. Oh, Mr. Carter. I've been looking for you. You have? Thought you might like to know that your brother did not kill Henderson. Well, of course he didn't. My husband... No, Mrs. Colby, not your husband either. You killed him. I killed... Oh, well, that's not a nonsense. I don't think so. And you're not leaving me just yet, Mrs. Cole. Let go of my arm. You took your husband's car and went to see Henderson late last night, didn't you? No, I didn't. You called with him about the $20,000 he stole from your husband. I don't know what you're talking then about. Then you picked up the paper knife from his desk and stabbed him. That's not true. It was Arthur who did it. Remember the blood, Mrs. Colby? The blood that stained your dress? No. I found that dress with a blood stain still on it. You're lying. I burned it this morning. Thanks for the confession, Mrs. Colby. Perhaps we'd better drive down to headquarters now and make it official. It was a trick. You didn't know anything. Oh, yes, I did. But I had no proof until you gave yourself away. Come on, let's go. No, not to the garage. I'm going to let you drive me to headquarters. I won't go in there. I won't. Oh, yes, you will. Wait till I open this garage door. Let me go. Let me go. Where's the motor of that car running? Uh, I don't know. There's someone in it. No. Good heavens, it's Patsy. <laughs> Well, Nick, they say I can leave the hospital tomorrow. Isn't that wonderful? Wonderful that you're alive, Patsy. Another couple of minutes in that garage and you'd have been my late lamented secretary. Oh. Well, I'm sure glad you came along when you did. But tell me, Nick, how did you know Mrs. Colby killed the doctor? I knew because Richard smoked turkey cigarettes. But the laboratory analysis of those shreds of tobacco in Henderson's ashtray proved that they came from some ordinary popular brand. Oh, and that eliminated Richard. Yes. Colby smoked a pipe, so he was in the clear... So it had to be his wife. Uh, I don't follow that, Nick. Couldn't it have been some completely unknown person? Ah, <laughs> but you're forgetting that the knife was found in Colby's pocket. And outside of Richard or Colby himself, the only person who could have put it there was Mrs. Colby. Well, yes. Yes, but what was behind all this business? There's a plot to get control of Colby's money by having him put in an asylum as a homicidal maniac. Mm -hmm. That's why Mrs. Colby hired Henderson. An ex vaudeville hypnotist, mind you, to pose as a psychiatrist. Uh huh. And by putting Colby under hypnotic influence, Henderson could make him do peculiar things the next day and then forget all about them. He could and did. 
And after a few incidents like that, all before witnesses, mind you, Mrs. Colby would have no trouble at all getting her husband put away as a dangerous lunatic. Then Richard was completely innocent. Didn't know a thing about it. Huh. You know, the whole scheme might have worked out. If Henderson hadn't got greedy and used hypnotism to make Colby draw that 20000 out of the bank and bring it to him. Yes, that was a fatal error. I should say it was. Made Mrs. Colby furious. So that's why she killed him. That was one reason. She also saw a perfect chance to get rid of the only person who knew her plans and at the same time put her husband in the asylum as a homicidal maniac by putting the blame on him. Mm, what a dirty frame-up. Oh, by the way, Patsy, you get 50% of the fee on this case, you know. I do? Mm-hmm. Why? Because you caught the killer before I did. Even if you didn't know it. <laughs> well, I hope I never catch another one. <laughs> Catching criminals is all flay hard on the head. Well, Nick, how about a little advanced dope on the adventure that new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week? Certainly, Bob. But first, I wish to ask everybody who's listening to clean up their plates at every meal. And if anything's left over, don't waste it. Make it do for tomorrow. In this way, we can help save valuable food that is so desperately needed by people who are not so fortunate as we are. I'm sure we all agree with that, Nick, and we'll do all we can to ease the present world food emergency. And now, about next week's Nick Carter adventure. Bob, next week, we're going to meet a couple of crooks who spend a lot of time looking for a lady that was six inches high and covered with jewels. And Nick had to turn me into a spook to find them. Spooks and six-inch ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a fascinating combination. Uh, what do you call the story? I call it The Case of the Jeweled Queen. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cudahy Packing Company, makers of new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mr. Collins. It surely is. You see, I'm Mrs. Collins, Gail Collins, and my husband Greg is a prior detective. If you found your husband making love to a redhead and he said he was only trying to solve a murder, would you think it was the truth or would you make him take the consequences? Well, I'll tell you what I did. I'll be back in a minute to set the stage for our puzzle in crime. It's a crime, Mr. Collins. Now, Mrs. Collins, what did you start to tell us about finding your husband with a redhead? Her name was Julie Myers. Mm hmm. Well, Greg and I knew nothing about the case when it began. Yeah? Julie and her boyfriend, Philip Cairns, had just stepped off a boat from Hong Kong. They were standing with their luggage on a dock in San Francisco, our hometown. It was a dismal, wet, very foggy night. Julie and Philip were looking for a taxi. Well, uh, there isn't a cab in sight, Julie. Oh, well, we just got to find one, Phil. Darling, why don't you wait in the doorway? I'll go look for one. All right, but hurry. Why are you taking the box with you? Why don't you leave it here with the luggage? I'm taking no chances. Oh, well, hurry, Phil. I will. 
Taxi! Taxi! Found it. Julie, go back. Don't follow me. You'll get pneumonia. Is that you, Julie? I can't see a thing in this fog. I said, is that you, Julie? Who's there? I... No! Let go! Put down that knife! Oh! Chinese bowl. Someone must get the bowl to Mason's. The Chinese bowl. I'm... Philip Cairns was murdered in that fog in the San Francisco waterfront. Greg and I, of course, know nothing about this yet. We were at home having troubles enough of our own. Very interesting. Greg Collins, this is final. If you get involved in just one more case where you go romancing around with attractive suspects... Now, oh, come here, sweetheart. You're one little Indian who's not going to wander off the reservation anymore. Now, oh, come on, honey. Greg. Oh, Greg. Get away from me. Oh, beautiful. Oh, go away. You're changing the subject. Okay. You know, you haven't exactly repulsed all the handsome males we've met either. When it comes to handling men, Greg, you're looking at an expert. Whenever they get too fancy, I upset them and gives them the old one, too. Fine. You telegraph that right of yours so much. I don't use my hands. I use my foot. I take the heel of my shoe and I dig it right into the young man's instep. That stops him. It's a jiu-jitsu trick. I uh, learned it from my husband, uh, Mr. Gregory Collins. He picked it up in the Marines. Ever meet him? Oh, yes, yes. Charming. Of course, um, he does cast a roving eye at other women. Hmm. That again. They're running some fine little choo-choo trains to Reno these days, and I've got mad money in my piggy bank. I'm warning you, Greg. <laughs> By way of appeasement, Greg off to take me for cocktails and an elaborate dinner at the Knob Hill Hotel. He also decided to get me a gift at Mason's. Mason's is a world-famous spot in San Francisco that specializes in exquisite oriental art. Greg was moseying around on the main floor when Mr. Shaw, the manager, came over to him. I beg your pardon, Mr. Collins. Oh, hello, Mr. Shaw. Say, this dinner gong is beautiful. Uh, could we discuss it later? Would you step into my office? It's terribly important. Oh, I surely... <laughs> This way, this way. We're lucky you were here just now. Uh, I have quite a problem, Matt. Oh, what's wrong, Mr. Sure? Look through this panel in my door. See the red-headed girl sitting on the chaise? Oh, brother. Why do they worry about who's on the moon when they got stuff like that down here? Her name is Julie Myers. Mr. Collins. Have you ever heard of the Ming Lu San Bowl? I'm not a connoisseur of that type of art. The painting's my hobby. The bowl was created during the Ming Dynasty. It's priceless. It's a very distinctive red. One collector called it Temple Fire Red. The design on it is incredible. Oh, the craftsmanship. Oh, what's happened to it? A very prominent family in the Orient has owned it for many, many generations. However, as a result of the bloodshed in the Far East, the family was evacuated to Hong Kong, became penniless refugees there. They decided, very much against their deepest feelings about it, that they would sell the bowl to us here at Mason's. Are you send somebody for it? Yes. Philip Cairns, a highly trusted employee. He, he was to bring the bowl here to San Francisco. He got it. He landed here 48 hours ago. He stepped off a ship and then... Yeah? He was murdered... Viciously attacked with a knife and cut down in the fog by the docks. Any witnesses? No. He'd stepped away from the pier to find a cab. Got lost in the darkness and fog. Nobody saw a thing. You make the trip alone? No. 
That gets us to the young lady sitting outside, Julie Myers. She was with Cairns at the time. She claims they had one of those sudden, overwhelming romances that they met in Hong Kong and were married. Believe it? I'm not sure. The police questioned her for hours, but... No doubt, huh? They had to let her go. Couldn't prove a thing. Where's the bow? Miss Myers came to my office a half hour ago. She said Philip purposely carried an empty box with him as a decoy. He knew he might be attacked. Whoever killed him made off with the empty box that night. Where was the bowl hidden? In Miss Myers' trunk. She followed Philip's instructions. She brought it here. Is it here now? Look at this, Mr. Collins. The bowl in this box. Here. Oh, careful, careful. Oh, yes. It's packed in shavings. Sawdust always gets on a man's suit. Uh, there we are. Uh, this is what Miss Meyer gave to me. A moderately good imitation of the Ming Lu San Bowl. Any more to the story? That's it. Now we cannot depend upon the police alone, Mr. Collins. We have too much at stake. We must employ our own man to investigate this. You've got to help us. Does, uh, does Miss Myers know you've discovered the bowl is a fake? No. I told her there would be some formalities and asked her to wait. Mr. Shaw. Yes? Tell Miss Myers everything's fine. Bit a good afternoon. You mean just let her go? That's right. I tell go on. We're losing time. All right, all right. I presume you've some plan. Plan? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to find out if it's true what they say about redheads. Redheads. Keep your ears pinned, friends. I'll be back in a minute with more of our story. <laughs> Mr. Shaw dismissed Julie Myers with his best store manager smile, and she left Mason's. Greg followed her. She sailed into the lobby of the Knob Hill Hotel and took the elevator to the roof, where the cocktail lounge has one of the loveliest views on earth. Julie sat down at a table by herself. Greg, meantime, took his old friend Marco, the head waiter, aside for a little chat. Marco. Uh, yes, Mr. Collins. Uh, what shall I do for you? You know that girl who just sat down? The redhead? No. Do something for me about that girl? Uh, certainly. Uh, what is it? Huh? Get fresh with him. Mr. Collins. No, 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 nothing crude. Just be a nuisance. Mr. Collins, I've always been only too happy to cooperate with you, but this is unspeakable. It'll be worth five bucks to you. Oh, it is unforgivable. Me, a man of my position. Ten. Going over to a guest and deliberately insulting her. Why, it is fantastic. Fifteen. Oh, I, I'm, I'm really surprised. Uh, the very idea I... Twenty I, bucks. I, take it or leave it. I'll take it. Marco strolled over to Julie Meyer's table and began to act like what is commonly termed an eager beaver. Uh, Madame is expecting someone? Oh, yes, I am. Is there something I can do for you in the meantime? No, thank you. Oh, it would be a privilege to do something for the loveliest lady in the lounge tonight. I don't want anything. Now, if you just... Of course, if the gentleman you're expecting doesn't appear, why... Why what? I was just hoping, uh... I am off duty soon. Get away from this oh, table. Don't say no, please. At least, of course, right away. Perhaps he... If you don't get away from here, I'll... Excuse me, ma'am. I couldn't help but notice that Marco's been up to his old tricks. Oh, Mr. Collins, Beat it, I... Marco. Leave the young lady alone. I don't know why the management lets you get away with this. You're always trying it. With every good-looking girl who comes why, here... I, I, I said I... get going. Get well, just as you say. I, I was... Why, thanks. Oh, that was nothing. Oh, don't go away. Oh, but I... Oh, well, sit down. Let's skip the formalities, Greg. That stunt you pulled with Marco so corny makes me think you're another detective. Not the police convinced yet that I couldn't have killed Philip Cairns. I don't work for the San Francisco police. Oh, then where are you from? And those hideaway. What are you after, Greg? 
Well, if you'd tell me a little bit about yourself in Kansas, it'd save a lot of wear and tear in my shoe leather. I've told everyone the story. I met Philip in Hong Kong. What were you doing there? You're entertaining. I used to sing in clubs in the States. I got mixed up with the wrong boys. Ended up in Hong Kong. And Philip Kansas met you in a club there. Huh? That's right. We fell in love. He asked me to go back to the States with him and marry him. You fell in love, huh? Big romantic deal, huh? Yeah, would be bridegroom has been dead for less than three days, so you're here, dressed in... like that. Waiting to have high balls with a new boyfriend. You must have been so sorry when Cairns got knocked out. All right. So I'm not the sentimental type. Did Cairns tell you much about the Red Bull? I knew all about it. I was with him when the Chinese family turned it over to him. And they took it very seriously. They wrapped it in fancy drapes. Just the bowl and the drapes in a beautiful wooden box. I see. Oh, Greg. You have to keep talking about that. How about a drink? Uh, no, thanks. I've got to... Uh... Oh, just one, Greg. Now, look, look, I'm I'm married, and there are rules. Oh, well, they're the old-fashioned rules. <sighs> Scotch and water. Good. And don't sit way over there, Greg. Come closer to me. Ah, that's it. Now, Julie, I... Good evening, Mr. Collins. Oh, good evening. Now, Julie, is that... Gail. Yes, Gail. <laughs> Pull yourself together, chum. I don't believe we've met. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Ju- Julie Myers, this is my wife, Gail. Oh, how do you do? I'm happy to... Oh. Uh, won't you join us, Gail? Uh, sit down. I- I'll order something. No, thank you. I'm going over to the bar. We did have an appointment, Greg. Never mind. Hey, Gail, come back here. Excuse me, Julie. Gail! Now, look, Gail, I, I can explain everything. This is a case. I'll have a drink by myself here at the bar. You go and enjoy yourself with your girlfriend. All right. Have it your way. Your wife seems rather upset. Yes, I... Uh, I'm sorry, she... <laughs> um, getting back to the Chinese bowl. Uh, what about the boyfriend you're waiting for? He hasn't shown up, and I'd like to meet him. I'm meeting him right now. Oh, hello, Benny. This is Greg Collins. He's a detective. So what? Why do you make dates with me and then sit around with every guy you find in the bar? Easy, pal, easy. We were just talking about Philip Cairn's Chinese bowl. I ought to take you, Julian. You get it to Mason's? Yes. Have any trouble? None at all. Sit down. You're running quite a temperature. I don't sit down with detectives. What's your business with the bowl, Benny? See? Right away with the quiz questions. All right, Collins. I stole the bowl and I killed Cairn's. And tonight I'm going to knock off a small but fat little bank. Okay. Sure. Could be. Excuse me, I'll be back. And don't hurry yourself. I can wait. Marco. Marco. Oh, yes, Mr. Collins. Marco, you'll have to help me again. Oh, delighted, Mr. Collins. I'm going to make a phone call. While I'm in the booth, the red-headed guy and the gentleman with her will probably try to leave. Call the house detective. Let him pay the check. Then have the houseman pick him up and hold him somewhere. That Mason's, Mr. Shaw? Yes, Greg. I'm in the cocktail lounge at the Knob Hill Hotel. I've got your murderer. You have? Yes, I know who killed Philip Cairns. What about the bowl? Do you know where the real bowl is? Yes, I think I do. Can you come right over? I'll be there in less than five minutes. There's no doubt about it. He's a honey of a detective, is my husband. In just a minute, we'll bring you the climax of the case. (coughs) While Greg was in the phone booth, Julie and Benny left their table, paid the check very quickly, and then, at the elevator, Marco stopped them very graciously. He turned them over to a kind of chubby little gent who must have been the house detective. The three of them took a down elevator. Greg came over to the bar where I was and briefed me on the whole story. 
It's all very interesting, Greg. If it's all true. Of course it is. You'll believe me when Mr. Shaw gets here. He'll corroborate the story. There he is. Now we'll see if it was absolutely necessary for you to follow that redhead. Oh, Mr. Shaw. Oh, there you are, Mr. Collins. Uh, hello, Mrs. Collins. Hello, Mr. Shaw. Uh, let's have a table, shall we? Or do you prefer staying here at the bar? No, no, there's more privacy at the table. Oh, here's one. You okay, Gail? Yes, Greg. Uh, this is better, isn't it? Now, uh, tell me, what have you found out? Have you sent for the police? Uh, not yet. Oh. Well, uh, what happened? I know who cut Philip Cam's throat down at the ducks. And I know who has the real bowl. Are you positive? Yeah. Well, who was it? Who killed Philip? And who stole the bowl? You did. I was afraid you might say that, Mr. Collins. So I brought a thirty-eight revolver with me. It's in my pocket. You can't see it. But the gun is less than a foot from your wife's heart. I couldn't possibly fail to kill her at this range. <laughs> Smile, Mrs. Collins. You too, Mr. Collins. And both of you keep your hands on the table. Now, tell me what you know and talk quickly. When Julie Myers spoke to me before, she said the real bowl was packed in ceremonial drapes. So the bowl she brought to you would have been packed the same way. But the one you showed me was packed in excelsior. You even warned me about getting the sawdust on my suit. Very good, Mr. Collins. I've always admired your ability. You tried the obvious first. You killed cans in that fog and stole the box he was carrying. But the box was empty. So you played your other card. You'd made a phony bowl. You hid the real one she delivered somewhere in your office. Then you took out the fake one and called me. I'd suspect Julie. Can I ask you a question? Yes, but quickly. You could never have gone to a fence with that bowl. It's too well known a piece. Why did you take it? I would gladly have killed half a dozen people to have the Ming Lu San bowl for myself. Now we're going to leave the table. I'll take your arm, Mrs. Collins. Craig. If you try anything, Mr. Collins, remember the gun will be closer to your wife than it ever was. Where are we going? Out onto the terrace to admire the beautiful view. Many of the guests do that. We're so fortunate. It happens to be empty at the moment. Stand up, both of you. Now, stay close to me. If you turn around or put your hands in your pockets, I shall kill your wife. But why the terrace? Mrs. Collins... You and your husband are the only two people who know the truth. It's dark on the terrace, Mrs. Collins. So dark that it's quite possible to stumble. You and your husband are going to fall off the roof. Terrible accident. It's a 30-story drop. I shall be overcome with sorrow. Open the door to the terrace, Mr. Collins. No, wait. Stay right where you are. The head waiter's coming over. Careful what you say. Is there something I can do for you, Mr. Collins? No, Marco. Nothing. Just to call me. I am at your command. Open the door to the terrace, Mr. Collins. Now, we'll step outside. That's it. Close the door. There's a point in that safety fence. It's rather low, Mr. Collins. At the very edge of the roof. Stand there by that huge electric sign. Craig, be careful. Back up a bit more, Mr. Collins. Craig. Back up, I said. That's it. Now, I shall let go of your arm, Mrs. Collins, and you will walk over and join your husband. Oh, it's always so difficult for the police to prove that it wasn't an accident when people fall off a building. Go on, Mrs. Collins. Walk over to the edge. Don't stall, or I'll pull the trigger and... Oh, my foot! Good girl. I'll take it from here. Oh. Grab it, Greg. You'll fall off the roof. Oh, all right.
Much later that night, Greg and I were home again, and I was in a different mood. Greg? Uh-huh. I forgive you. About the redhead, I mean. You done a little bit of... Greg, why'd you have the house detective hold Julie and Benny if they were innocent? And Julie was next on Shell's list. He knew she might say something that would trap him. Maybe Cairns told her about Shaw's morbid fascination for rare objects. Besides, by killing her, he'd leave me on a dead-end street without any suspects. So I just had her stashed away downstairs for a while. You're a big smarty pants, aren't you, Gregory Collins? Oh, oh it was nothing, really. I just did what any ordinary, everyday genius would do. I wasn't so bad, either. That trick for handling wolves that I told you about came in mighty handy. See how I dug my heel into Shaw's instep? Saved us from falling off a 30-story building. Gail, I... Uh, I want to tell you something. Yes, Greg. Darling, I... Yes? Say it, Greg. Say it. I'm hungry. Oh, revolting unromantic... House for Strawberries Jubilee at the Cirque Room. Eat, eat, eat. Greg, if you had a choice, and you could never eat again, or never kiss me again, which would you choose? Mm, come here. Mm. How's that for an answer? Mm. Correct, Mr. Collins. Now, do you want to try for the jackpot question? Moral of the story, if you think your husband is interested in other women, you should always have faith and trust him. As far as you can throw a 30-story building. In just a moment, we'll be back with you. We hope you enjoyed our adventure, the Chinese bowl of Temple Fire Red. Be sure to visit us next time for another puzzle in murder. For where there is crime and romance, there you'll find Mr. And Mrs. Collins. It's a Crime, Mr. Collins, was produced in the studios of Hector Crawford Productions by Dorothy Crawford. California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger is my stock and trade. If you're up against something you can't handle and it has to be kept strictly confidential, you've got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> Mr. Valentine, the day after tomorrow, a boy 16 is getting out of a work camp after a year. Instead of trying to get a new start, he swears he's going to do something that'll take him right back there again, or even worse. You've got to help him. You've got to save him from himself. I don't have much money. I'm only 16, too. Only 16, too. But I'll work the rest of my life paying you if you'll do everything you can to help Eddie. I'll be waiting for you tomorrow morning at 7 in front of the Lincoln statue in Chelsea Square Park. It's just signed Emily, George. Yeah. Chelsea Square Park, huh? Brooks, see, that's right in the middle of that slum jungle where those so-called wolf packs have been running wild. Yes, and kids just about this age. Always good for an editorial. Young hoodlums, a challenge to society. And well, that's where it usually ends. Brooksy, looks like we're going to be on the job early tomorrow morning. <laughs> George, wait a minute. What is it, Brooksy? Over there, sitting under the statue of Lincoln. There, feeding the pigeons. Oh, yeah. Looks like our girl, all right. Come on, Angel. Let's see how unlike an editorial we can be when we talk to her. 
Now that's all the crumbs I have. No use hanging around. Go on, scoop, scoop, go on. <laughs> Emily? Yes? Oh, Mr. Valentine? Yeah, that's right. Gosh, I didn't really believe you'd come, and I... Hello, well, Emily. I... This is Miss Brooks. We work together. How do you do? Hello, Miss Brooks. If things weren't so terrible for Eddie, I'd... I'd feel pretty silly. I don't have anything in the world, and there's no reason for you to help me. Well, let's just say you write a darn good letter. Now, what about Eddie, Emily? He's a boy I know. He gets out tomorrow. Why was he sent away? The police found him in a stolen car. I see. But he didn't steal it. He thought he was delivering the car to a second-hand dealer for somebody, just to make a little extra money. Well, didn't he tell that to the police? No. He just kept insisting over and over that he didn't steal it. He wouldn't even tell me who got him into that trouble. But he says that since everybody is so sure he's no good, he's going to prove they're right. You know what that means. Oh, now, Emily. Well, I know Eddie. He's lost his temper a lot of times, and he got into scrapes, but... Well, he's not bad, not really. Emily, you're pretty sure of that, aren't you? I suppose when you believe in somebody, you just do, that's all. All right. Now let's see what we can do. He has no place to go, Mr. Valentine. What do you mean? He only has his father, and Eddie was supporting Mr. Prokosh, selling papers. Yes? Well, when Eddie was arrested, Mr. Prokosh told him he never wanted to see him again. And Eddie's very proud. He'd never go back home now. Well, people change a lot in a year. Do they? My mother and father haven't. They still think Eddie's no good. And even now, when I went to help him, I have to meet you in the park before I go to school. All right, Emily, suppose you leave Eddie to me. I'm going to secretarial school now, and in another year I'll start working. And if you don't mind waiting, oh, I suppose could... you leave that to Mr. Valentine, too. Then you mean you'll do everything you can? <laughs> that and a little more, Emily. Now, suppose we go and have some breakfast so you can tell me all about Eddie. Then I'm going to have a talk with his father. I don't care who you are. I want to hear nothing about my son. I got no son. Now get out of my house. Now just take it easy, Mr. Prokash. Look at me, mister. You see this cripple leg? I got that making honest living. Honest living. I know. That's dreadful, Mr. Prokash. But there's still Eddie to think about. I get few pennies from the company every month. I even bite my tongue and take charity from the Morrissey Association. But better I should hate myself than take one dirty penny my son steals. I don't need it. But maybe your son needs you. I told you, lady, I got no son. Okay. Okay, let's just call him another boy, age 16, a boy in trouble and headed for more. But not everybody sold off in the way you are, his own father. You know, Mr. Prokosh, you can worry so much about being right that you can be wrong. Right, Such fancy talk I don't understand. Hey, Prokash, I want... Oh. So you got company, huh? What you want in my house? Well, these characters are blow. There's something I want you to tell me. Ah. Uh, just who is this imitation Bogart? Huh? Hey, uh, look... His name is up. Dan Lucas. He's the worst hoodlum of them all. Look, Pop, Eddie's time's about up. When's he getting out? I gotta know. I tell you nothing. You heard me. I gotta know. Oh, and you're gonna tell me. Oh, I... You what? Let go. That flashy tie you're wearing. You don't knot it half tight enough, so I'm gonna help you. And it's not good manners for a tough guy like you to be pushing helpless people around. Stop it, will you? You see what I mean, Stanley? George, look out. See the kind of knife he carries? Yeah. Not the kind you peel potatoes with. Why, I ought to... George, let go of him. I... I just got one thing to say to you, mister. Stay out of this neighborhood after dark if you want to live. Which way do you want to go downstairs? On your head or on your feet? I ain't through with you. You need a pro guy. Beat it. Take that collapsible stiletto with you. Let's hope the cops find it on you. Still have nothing to say to us about Eddie, Mr. Prokash? Nothing. You see the kind friends he has? I would rather die we than... Know. All right, let's go, Brooksy. There's one more place I'd like to stop before we meet Eddie tomorrow. What do I know about Eddie Prokosh? 
Just about everything, Mr. Valentine. Good, good. That's why we dropped in to see you, Mr. Morrissey. Mr. Prokar says you and the Chelsea Square Association have been helping him out every month. Well, Miss Brooks, we're sort of a political club, as you know. But we believe in really taking care of our own down here. So I understand. Naturally, we hope to win votes. But in a tough neighborhood like Chelsea Square, there are other things that are more important. Giving out turkeys come Thanksgiving and arranging a boat ride in the summer just aren't enough. Oh, we do much more than that. We cooperate with the police, even get to the judge when one of our boys gets into trouble. We've been talking about putting up a playground, too. Well, I could get the bare facts of what happened in juvenile court, but I thought a man like you, whose business it is to know what's going on, could tell us more than that. We understand Eddie didn't even try to defend himself on that stolen car charge. Yeah, I know, but I'm afraid there was very little he could say. He was caught red-handed. Very unfortunate case. But I'm afraid not at all unusual. Say, tell me, Morrissey... Why would a young hooligan like Stan Lucas be interested in knowing when Eddie gets out from the work camp? Lucas? No, oh, that one. There's really a neighborhood problem. Mm, I can imagine. But Stan's almost a man now. I don't see what he could have had to do with Eddie Prokosh. Apparently he had a lot to do with him, Morrissey. But it looks as though we won't get the real picture of Eddie till we talk to the boy himself. <laughs> How about a lift, mister, huh? Oh. You going in the town? How about a... Oh, Why knock yourself out, kid? I'm going back to town. I'll give you a lift. What? Oh, I didn't see you parked under that tree. Hop in, Eddie. Okay, thanks. What? How did you know my name? I've been waiting for you, kid. But we'll go into all that later. I don't listen to Emily. She's just a crazy kid. <laughs> and I suppose you're a brainy old man. Yeah, well, I know what I'm doing. And you can let me off with the next cross and I can get a bus, you know. No, just keep your shirt on, Eddie. Ah, uh, that kid gets crazy ideas. I know what I'm doing. I don't need anybody's help. Okay, okay, so you're on your own. Well, let's set it up this way. Look, I live by myself. What do you say we go home and have some chow? You might decide to bunk over with me until you know what you want to do. I know what I want to do. Hey, uh, mister, you sure you're not a cop? <laughs> well, some of them are my best friends, Eddie, but I don't happen to be one. No, it's just like I said. I had a little talk with Emily while she was feeding the pigeons in the park. You and... mean Emily still sits by that statue and... Well, uh, okay, I guess there's no reason why I shouldn't eat your food. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eddie. There's only one thing a woman likes better than to see a man clean up that last drop of gravy on his plate. Oh, what's that, Brucey? Two men doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I sure packed away a lot, didn't That's I? That's why I was here, Eddie. Go on, rave some more about my cooking to Mr. Valentine. It may help. Uh... See you in the office in the morning, George. Glad to meet you, Eddie. Yeah, me too, Miss Brooks. Well, thanks, Angel, for being chief cook and bottle washer. I do see those dirty dishes in the sink. <laughs> Good night, George. <laughs> oh, uh... Mr. Valentine. Yeah, Eddie. Thanks a lot for the meal, but I gotta get going now. No, Eddie, no. You're gonna stay right here tonight. Now, look, I look, said it. You're stewing about something. You can't wait to get it out of your system without thinking of the trouble it's gonna cause everybody, including yourself. Will you stop preaching at me? You got no right just because you give me a meal. I'm getting out of here. Not tonight, you're not. Now, look, kid, give yourself a chance to sleep on it. You may feel differently in the morning. I'm leaving by that door, so get out of my way. Now, I don't want to have to get tough with you, but yes. I'm... Okay, you asked for it, are you? Oh! You asked for it, too. Oh, what happened? Just a little judo oh. trick I had to learn once. Oh. Yeah, it came in pretty handy in Salerno. Hey. Hey, you mean you were in that fight in Salerno? That's right. And the guy coming at you wasn't supposed to land on a nice, soft couch like you just did. Oh. Well, Eddie, there's no reason why we shouldn't settle down and listen to the fights now. Oh, yes. What? When you do go to bed, just remember, I'm a very light sleeper. So? So, don't get any fancy ideas about running out on me.
Okay, Eddie, time to get up. Hey, Eddie, did you hear me? Rise and shine. Oh, that kid. Say, Eddie, if you want to try my new electric razor, you can... Why, that little... Now, where... Oh, great. Well, he did leave me a note. That's something. I wasn't asleep like you thought when you went in to take your shower. I even washed the dishes to pay for my room and board. Now, you and Miss Brooks and Emily better stay away from me. You were so anxious to know what I was going to do, now I can tell you. I'm going to take care of Stan Lucas. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about wear and tear. Most motorists believe, and quite naturally, that automobile engines wear out faster when they're running. But that's not true. Your car faces its biggest danger when it's standing cold. For that's when rust, caused by condensed moisture inside cylinders, starts to work. And that's where RPM motor oil can help you avoid a repair bill. RPM's special compounds keep a rust-proof oil film on all engine parts all the time. Whether your car is running hot or standing cold, RPM clings stubbornly to vital wear points. And consequently, rust never has a chance to get started in your car. No wonder it's the two-to-one choice of Western motorists. Next time you need oil, ask for rust-fighting RPM motor oil at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station. While you're there, ask for a free copy of Batter Up. It's a wonderful handbook on baseball, a gift to you from independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine and to Chelsea Square, a jungle of tenements in the middle of the city and a wolf pack of boys stalking the streets. That's the background for George's present job the specific challenge to keep 16-year-old Eddie Prokosh from committing a serious crime, as he promised. Good morning, George. Uh, hey, you only shaved on one side of your face this morning. Okay, so that's the side you can kiss me on. <laughs> but look, we're in trouble, Angel. What? Yeah, playing Big Brother a la Spencer Tracy didn't work out. Eddie beat it while I was shaving. All right, Donnie, take it easy. Uh, he left this little note. He's out on the prowl. To quote, he's going after Stan Lucas. Oh, no. Yeah. I've got to stop him somehow, Brooksy. I only knew where to find him down there in that Chelsea district. What pool hall, what dark alley, what hallway. And stand with that knife. What can we do, George? Well, I'm going to have another talk with Eddie's father. Look, you find Emily. But where? Well, she gave us the name of the secretarial school. Call her. Get her to meet you in the park. Maybe she can give us a clue on how we can find Eddie. Okay, George. And remember, Brooksy, it's a race against time. <laughs> Eddie can't do that. He mustn't. Emily, stop crying. <laughs> yes, Miss Brooks. Emily, I'm not going to talk to you like a child. If you're old enough to fall in love with a boy, this is no time to let him down. I know. I know. You came to us for help. Now we need yours. Can you tell us some of the places where Eddie might be looking for Stan Lucas? It could be anywhere, but I... Yes, dear? I... I should have told you this before, but I couldn't. I mean about Stan. Stan? Did he have anything to do with that stolen car business? I'm not sure, but that's that's not what I meant. What did you mean? Miss Brooks, you said you weren't going to talk to me like a child. Well, I'm not going to talk to you like I was one either. All this year, Eddie was up in that work camp. I've been going around with Stan. Oh. But I had to. Everybody does what Stan tells them to. I wasn't afraid just for myself, but what he said he'd do to Eddie when he came out. Does Eddie know that? No, you know how men are. And I wouldn't want him to know. Oh, you poor kid. Well, what could I do, Miss Brooks? Stan said he could even stop the few dollars Mr. Prokosh gets from the association. And he needs that money to live on. Stan was just talking. But you don't have to worry about him anymore. Mr. Valentine knows how to take care of him. I'm only thinking of Eddie. If I could only talk to him, I've got to find him. Wait, Emily, I'll go with you. We'll both look for him. (laughs) 
All I want to know, Mr. Prokosh, is whether Eddie's been here or not. He knows better than to come here. Oh, yeah. And I suppose that makes you a great father. Hey, look, Eddie's wandering around. A few words well chosen might save his whole life. And all he gets is a door slammed in his face. I got nothing more to say, Mr. Valentine. Well, I have one more thing to say. Your son's out to kill somebody. K-I-L-L. That's the kind of thing you get the big rap for. Even a kid of 16. My Eddie, he would not... First a thief, then a murderer. Okay, Prokash, I can't waste any more time on you. A 16-year-old girl had more faith in your son than you have. And I've got to keep faith with her. Well, that stubborn old... Remember me, big shot? Well, at least I didn't have to look for you, Stan. No, you didn't. Because I was looking for you. Jump, boys, jump. Hold against that wall. Look at Stan. Hold him. Ah, uh, twist his arms back, Slim. Yeah. Oh. I want to do this right. Hey! No! Oh. I owe this mug something. Oh. Imitation Bogart. Oh. Huh? Oh. You had something to say about my knife, didn't you? No. Oh. How do you like it, Oh. Now? I had to carve my initials all over that face oh. of us. Oh, hey, don't it do it, Stan. Oh, no, I won't do it. It's really going to be a pleasure to work him over so even his own mother wouldn't recognize him. I... I know my diction isn't very good, Lieutenant Riley. Valentine, what's the matter with you? Where are you? Just about got to the hall phone... Look, you got to do me a favor. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But what's wrong with you? I thought I could keep the police out of a boy's life, but it's way over my head now. I need your help, Lieutenant. Okay, shoot. Look, pick up two boys down on Chelsea Square fast. Eddie Prokosh, about 5'8", freckles on his nose, wears a leather jacket. And Stan Lucas, get it? Stan Lucas, yeah. He's a, a dirty, vicious little... Oh. Valentine! Yes. You stay where you are! Don't worry, Lieutenant. I can't help myself. I know, George. I know what you mean. Guy doesn't look his best in these hospitals. Oh, darling, your face. Look, what about Eddie? Did they pick him up? Yes. Before he got to stand? Uh-huh. Oh, good, good. Not quite so good. What happened, Brooksy? Lieutenant Riley has Eddie in jail. Huh? They found a gun on him. But if he didn't get to stand, The then... gun was taken from a watchman in a holdup this morning. Eddie? No question about that gun. But, Brooksy, with well, that guy's wrecking and now this... I know. But, George, what do you think you're doing? Where are you... Oh, I'm getting out of here and have a talk with Eddie in jail. <laughs> Eddie, you gotta talk. What about you and that watchman? What difference does it make what I say? Nobody will believe me. Come on, Eddie, come on! Oh, I bought that gun from Swenson, the pawnbroker, just a couple hours ago. What? Yeah, I was going to use it on Stan. Well, didn't Lieutenant Riley check with the pawnbroker to see if your story was right? Yeah, sure, but Swenson told him he hadn't seen me since I was sent away. Uh-huh. Shouldn't be any surprise to me. I should be used to getting framed. Now, look... You told me the truth, huh, Eddie? I tell you, I was nowhere near that factory this morning. I was out looking for Stan. And it was Stan who framed you on that hot car deal. That's right. Well, why didn't you say so when you were arrested? Well, what proof did I have? He, he would have lied his way out of it. And he wanted to get rid of me so he could have Emily for himself. Yeah, I know all about her going on with him while I was away. One of the kids up at camp told oh, me. Oh, now, wait a minute, Eddie. You got Emily all wrong. Yeah, yeah, You sure. know why Emily was going out with Stan? She explained all that to Miss Brooks. I'm not interested. She was afraid of what Stan would do to you when you got out. And he, he said he could stop the allowance your father was getting every month. What? You, what's that? You heard me, Eddie. If Emily were giving you a run around, she wouldn't come to me to keep you from making a darn fool of yourself. Yeah, but... Uh, nobody does anything for anybody unless there's a payoff in it somewhere. Nobody gives a good hoot about me Look anyway. Look at me, tough guy. My face, I mean. Stan and the gang did give you a good going over, didn't they? Oh, yeah, yeah. Very artistic job. You think I'd look like this if I didn't give a good hoot about you? Well, and I... And I suppose the payoff on this for me is going to be a million bucks. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Valentine. I... Okay. Okay, Eddie. We understand each other. Now, I'll show you how much I believe in you. Here, take this. 
A knife? Yeah, that's right. Wolfpack style. A la Lucas. I don't get it. I'm going to talk to Lieutenant Riley. And you're going to have a chance to talk to Stan alone in a cell when they bring him in. You, you mean you're going to let me loose with him? With this? That's right, Eddie. Oh, that'll be just dandy with me. Now, look. We've got to get Stan to talk. And he's not giving out for the police or for me. You're the only one who can make him talk. Now, you listen closely. All right. All right, I don't mind playing ball with you, Valentine. I'm all for helping the kid. Thanks, Lieutenant. But you realize the spot I'm putting myself in, letting Eddie have a knife when he talks to Stan? We'll be right next to the cell door. Go right in, Mr. Morrissey. We're coming waiting for you. Thank you. Well, it's good to see you, Morrissey. How are you, Lieutenant? Miss Brooks. Hello, Mr. Morrissey. Hi, Hi, Morrissey. I see they're keeping you stepping down there in Chelsea Square. I'm afraid so, but we do our best. Well, Valentine uh, thought you ought to be in on this Prokosh case. Eddie's one of your boys, you know. I know. Yeah, we're going to hear Eddie's side of the story. And if it sounds convincing, we know you'd want to help. I'm glad you thought of me. Okay, let's get going. Sergeant! Bring the Prokosh boy to cell nine. We'll be right there. Okay, Eddie. The lieutenant says you can talk to this guy in five minutes. Thanks. Well, well, well. well. Where'd you get out, Prokash? You didn't stay out very long, did you? No. You saw to that, Stan. Come on, you're talking through your head. Am I? You want me to give your regards to anybody when I get bailed out? Emily, for instance? You're not getting out of here. What are you doing? You ought to know this trick. How to hide a knife in your shoe so they don't find it when they search you. Hey, Eddie, put that thing away. I've been waiting to catch up with you, Stan. Look, stay away from me. You frame me, running those stolen cars. Well, now you're going to pay for now, it. Look, kid, take, take it easy, will you? Didn't you? Look, I, I, I didn't mean to frame you, Eddie. It was all a mistake. Help! Somebody help! He's going to... Stop him! Well, I was looking around for a gun, and sooner or later I'd wind up at Swenson's. So you planted that hot gun there. Yeah, 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 that's right. But look, kid... Help get this guy out of here, you hear me? Get him out of here! Well, get him out of here, all right. They were right. trying to murder me. Hey, what are you doing here? You got a good memory for faces, Stan, especially ones you've been working on. Gosh, Mr. Valentine, it worked. Well, you heard him, didn't you? Yes, Eddie, we heard everything. Look what's going on here. You got no... Shut order. up. Mr. Morrissey, get me out of here. I didn't do nothing. Well, the less you say, the better, Stan. Look, you can't let him railroad me like I'll that. I'll do everything I can, same as I would for everyone else from our district. I guess you're going to stay put, Lucas. And the rest of your gang will be sent to a place where they can learn to do something useful with their lives. Come on, everybody. Wait a minute, Lieutenant. Huh? Isn't it going to be kind of crowded in here for Stan and Mr. Morrissey? What are you talking about, well, Valentine? Stan. What do you mean, George? That was some nice double talk between you and Stan a second ago. The less he says, the better. The better for you, you meant, didn't you, Morrissey? Now look, Lieutenant. And you, Stan, Stan, you said, you can't let them railroad me or I'll... Well, I... Uh, or you'd I, give I, away I, the whole works, wouldn't you? Morrissey was the real guy behind the stolen car racket and a lot of other rackets down in Chelsea Square. Morrissey, you were using Stan to bully the other kids in the line. That's why Stan boasted he could cut off the little money Mr. Prokosh was getting from the association. Well, you don't seem to have much to say, Morrissey. Everybody knows my reputation. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, the big power of the neighborhood. Big enough to make Swenson the pawnbroker perjure himself so you could be rid of Eddie. I think you can get Swenson to talk now, Lieutenant. I told you he sold me that gun. Hey, you got this all wrong, Valentine. This Lucas boy here has caused all kinds of trouble. If he tries to implicate me, surely no one is going to leave Look, Marcy, you're not going to walk out and leave me holding the bag. Valentine is right. I got lots of proof. Keep quiet, you little rat. See what I mean, Lieutenant? On second thought, it wouldn't be safe to leave them both in the same cell. <laughs> Mr. Valentine, what's that saying about an old fool? <laughs> well, I don't know about that saying, Mr. Prokosh. Why not settle for another one? Better late than never. Except for you, I would have made a terrible mistake. Thank you. George, come here. Ah, what is it, Brooksy? Look down there, out of the window. Huh? There's Emily and Eddie sitting on the stoop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Offhand, I'd call that romance, Angel. And offhand, I remember a saying, too. Hmm? Speak for yourself, John, if you know what I mean. Uh, 
And now, a message of importance to motorists. The merry month of May means a merry vacation for a lot of folks. And if you're one of them, here's the way to start out safe as well as happy. Just make sure your car gets a vacation check at a standard station or an independent Chevron gas station. Do this a day or two before you start out. When the men at these service stations inspect your tires, battery, crankcase oil, spark plugs, all the vital parts, they give your car the same thoroughgoing care they'd give their own. While you're getting this important vacation check, get a new keyless gas cap, too. It has a simple combination lock, no key to lose. And it guarantees your gasoline is safe from theft during your vacation trip and whenever you park your car. Keyless self-locking gas caps are another better motoring item available at independent Chevron gas stations and at standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Oh, hello, Angel. Oh, darling, I thought you'd never open your eyes. Oh, why doesn't somebody turn that radiator off? It's hissing. We're back in the man lock at the tunnel, George. Yeah. Oh, what happened? Well, you were down here this morning, and you must have come up too quickly, and you got the bend. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember now. Then coming up, and then everything went blank. There was another accident in the tunnel. What? Oh, hey, I'm beginning to remember a few things now. And I'm pretty sure I know what causes these accidents. Brooksy, quick, help me over to that phone. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Mary Lou Harrington as Emily, Jay Novello as Dr. Prokosh, Tommy Cook as Eddie, Tony Barrett as Stan, and Herbert Butterfield as Morrissey. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. The Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak, for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. You gotta put it in block letters because down on the waterfront in San Francisco there's a price tag on everything. You gotta do that or marry a rich widow. I don't like to work that hard. So I rent boats and do anything else that's cash and carry. Oh, it's all right if you don't mind trouble. Because that's one thing you can't duck. It's like trying to dance the minuet in skis. And the best trouble always looks good from the outside. You're all smiles and feel like a kid opening a hand grenade under the Christmas tree. I found that out Tuesday night. It was around 7 o'clock. I was getting ready to close the office when this little guy showed up. He was about the size of a golf bag with arms. And if he had a cigar box, he could see over a pool table. He walked up to the desk and started talking in a voice that made you think he was trying to put Lily Ponds out of work. Hello, you know that? You're doing all right so far. What's on your mind? I'm Jackie Gregg. You heard of me, huh? You're the shy type, I know. I'm Jackie Gregg, the jockey. You heard of me, huh? All right, now I heard of you. Put the show on the road. I'm looking for a horse. 
You want to find me a horse? Yeah, I breed him in the back room. What color do you want? You're so tough, I got to take that from you? Calm down before you wind up in a boys' choir. If you got anything to sell, put it on the line or beat it. I'm riding a horse tomorrow called Fleet Lady. She's disappeared. She's not here. I'm supposed to ride the sixth race with her tomorrow. The Bonanza handicap and she's gone. All right, she's gone. Maybe your horse likes to go out at night. I haven't seen her. Get to the point. I'll give you 200 bucks to find that horse. Somebody took her in a van. I uh, trailed her down here at the waterfront. But you lost him up at the ferry building. That's right. Something funny's going on. My mom disappeared and you gotta find her. This is a big waterfront and where's the 200 bucks? You'll get that all right. Down by Pier 19. The van turned in. Think you can find Fleet Lady? I don't know. Who owns her? Woman named Sybil Thornton. She's, uh, mixed up, I think. Yeah. Why steal your own horse? I don't know. Run a ringer, maybe. That's a tough trick. This woman's got some good ones. You want the 200 bucks? Yeah. How are the odds? What's the difference? You're gonna open a book? You better take the 200 bucks now. Yeah, the dough will keep. You sound frightened, Junior. And you sound nosy. Here's the 200. I want you to find the horse. You let me know at the Kingston Hotel, huh? Sure. And if you don't find anything around the waterfront, maybe you better try the track. Ask around there. Yeah. By the way, how do you fit in? How come you got $200 interest in that horse? Maybe I love horses. What do you care if maybe I love horses? I don't. A guy like you's got to love something. Oh, yeah. It was a sweet proposition. A jockey in search of a horse. There's something phony about the whole thing. I had the 200 bucks, but I didn't feel good. It was like a guy stealing a murder gun to help out in a scrap metal drive. Well, after the little guy left, I closed the office and started to hit the docks, but it didn't work out. You know, you can buy good whiskey these days, so you feel funny walking up to some guy on the pier and asking, have you seen a racehorse around here, mister? By nine, I was sure the horse wasn't around, so I borrowed a car and drove out to the track. I found out where Sybil Thornton's horses were quartered and headed down that way. It was pretty dark, so when I bumped into her, all I got was a vague outline. She had a good-looking vague outline. Oh, I'm very sorry. Yeah, I'm full of regrets, too. Should we try it again? But you're a little mixed up in your animals. They keep horses here. You don't seem to mind. No, you lean nicely, but you'd probably feel safer with a platform. Yeah. Well, we try this again when I've had three good meals. That's a horse. Yes, I know. In fact, I own it. I see. That'd make you Sybil Thornton. Yes, what would it make you? A guy named Pat Novak looking for your horse. I was hired in the waterfront to find her. Why, they grow big on the waterfront. You must get a lot of sun. By the way, is Fleet Lady missing? Your jockey says she is. That's why I'm snooping around. Didn't know he had any friends. He's got a checkbook. How about Fleet Lady? Is she tucked in bed? Yes. Well, let's take a look, huh? Find it very dull, Mr. Novak. Yeah, that's what they said to Anthony. Let's see the horse. Suit yourself. She's down this way. Okay. I'm doing this out of the bigness of my heart. I think you're wasting my generosity, Mr. Novak. I don't use it all this trip. It's from the stable. Come on. Down about here. Fleet lady stall. Here. There's a flashlight on the wall. All right. Oh, poor thing. Do horses die broke, too? Who is it? Fleet Lady? Yes. Are you satisfied? No. I'm going to ring up headquarters. You crazy. Then I'm going to call Jackie Gregg and tell him his hunch paid off. I wouldn't do that, Mr. Novak. Stop kidding me, sweetheart. She didn't get killed in a fight with another horse. Gregg figured somebody was telling the machine. That's why Fleet Lady's dead. That's why I'm going to call headquarters. Suit yourself, but remember what happened to Fleet Lady. Are you getting tough, Angel? No. You just wouldn't look good with a saddle, Mr. Novak. <laughs> Watched her as she turned and walked out of there. It was the kind of a walk that makes you flip the calendar and find out how far away spring is. I looked around a while, but it didn't do any good. The place was full of doors, so whoever killed Fleet Lady got out easy, like a rumor at a church picnic. I closed the door and went down the line to call headquarters. So I stood in there talking, I saw Sybil Thornton drive away. It was a long convertible with red asbestos seat covers. After I called headquarters, I went back and waited near the stable. About a half hour later, a police car pulled up, and when I saw who got out, I began to get unhappy like a three-legged man in a ballet school. It was Hellman from Homicide, and he had a squad with him. All right, all right, I'll talk to him. Hello, Novak, where's your trainer? Your boys get paid to laugh at you, Hellman, I don't. Yeah, where's the horse? 
What are you doing on the case? I came for the ride. You mind, Novak? No, I just wondered if they wised up downtown. Yeah? Because you could find a dead horse helmet. If they staked it out in the middle of Market Street, you'd find it before long. I'll try this time. Where is it? Stall 18, over there. Uh, keep an eye on them, boys. I'll be back in a minute. In here, Novak? Yeah, the one with the teeth like yours. You better shut up, Novak. Don't get jumpy. I, you haven't seen the horse. Just shut up, huh? It wasn't going to be much of a conversation anyway. What color horse was that, Novak? What do you mean? Take a look at it. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I just took a look. It's a smart horse, Novak. What? That's right. A dead horse in there is wearing a double-breasted suit. Hellman got the message straight. I walked in and took a look. Jackie Gregg was lying there on the floor as dead as last year's love. The sickness didn't show until we rolled him over on his stomach. Somebody had gone duck hunting in the middle of his back. I began to feel a little sick myself, and I was ready to send out for the same gun when Hellman started to talk. You forgot to mention the guy when you phoned headquarters. He wasn't there. I was in here before, and the guy wasn't around. What was he doing under the horse? I don't know. Hellman, maybe he crawled out of a crack. I don't know. There were two shots. I came in and found the horse. Yeah? Check the horse. You're trying to tell me the horse shot back? Who is he? A guy by the name of Jackie Gregg. He gave me 200 bucks to find a missing horse. Yeah. A horse called Fleet Lady running in tomorrow's handicap. This is the end of the line. How do you know it's the same one? I don't. Maybe you got to be a horse to tell. Why don't you ask one of your boys? <laughs> yeah, your boy's real tough. Call him off, Hellman. He's nasty. We all hate him, Novak. It's all right. I'll put it on your bill, Hellman. That's good. You can write it up at headquarters. Hellman, you ought to rent an idiot. The heavy thinking's too much for you. I can piece this together. We come out here and find a dead man with you kicking up dust 40 feet away. Look, Hellman, I didn't kill the guy and call up headquarters. I know they're bad in homicide, but I'm not that big-hearted. We got a spare hook for you, Novak. That's where you stay until somebody gets you off. Well, you can start out with Sybil Thornton. Another horse? She's got the speed for it. Look her up. She owns Fleet Lady, and she was dashing around in the dark here, playing easy to get. I'll look her up. You better leave the boys behind, after all. She's only a woman. When you see her, ask her about that van down on the waterfront and what she was doing before I made that phone call. I'll tag all the bases. Don't worry, Junior. And if things fit together, you'll both be in the jug. I'll see you later. I got work to do. Yeah, it's getting late. You better put the boys back in the cage. I began to worry after Hellman left. There was no murder gun, and he didn't have too much to go on, but there was no one else wanted my job. Oh, I knew the girl was going to have an alibi, and I was the last guy that Jackie Gregg had seen. I had about as much chance as a fat girl at a Princeton prom. Hellman didn't like me, and he was a smart cop with a disposition like a ton of rhubarb. Well, I had to start right from scratch. I felt like Adam the first morning he woke up. So I looked up a guy named Jocko Madigan, an ex-doctor and a boozer who will give you a lift if you show him where the stirrups are. Well, he's a good guy, but he thinks all food makes a gurgle. I hit all the bars and finally found him up at Maggie Nielsen's apartment. She's a good-looking voice that lives up on the hill, and Jocko was working his way into her liquor supply. Hello, Patsy. You're just in time to join me for my first drink of the evening, uh, or uh, one of my first at least. Yeah, I see. Maggie's not here, but I found her whiskey. It was in plain sight, locked in the closet under some newspapers. All right, Jocko, when are you going to sober up? Oh, I plan to do it briefly on April 1st, when the rest of the world plays the fool also. Look, I'm in trouble, Jocko. you got to help me. Good. I have a special bottle I use to forget your troubles. Now look, stop caressing that jug and listen to me. I'm in a jam. Patsy, there's nothing in nature so sad as a half-empty bottle. It's like a broken vow or an unfulfilled promise in the skies. A falling star, almost. All right, Jocko. A falling star, and you shrug it off, never realizing that a whole world has ended at that moment. Yeah. A hundred million dreams, maybe, and you watch it fall and make an asinine wish. That's all the good it does a star to fall. It gives some kid a chance to wish for a bicycle. You all finished now, Jocko? Yes. What kind of trouble? Anything I could aggravate? I'm mixed up out at the track. A guy by the name of Jackie Gregg is dead and I don't look good. Oh, Hellman? Yeah. The guy's a jockey and he hired me to find a horse named Fleet Lady. Did you? The horse and the jockey ran a dead heat, but there's something funny about the whole deal. Did you talk to the jockey? No, not enough. 
Oh, Patsy, you've got to break yourself of the habit of waiting until people are dead before you think of a question. Jocko, I want you to hit all the horse rooms. Find out what you can about the six race tomorrow. It's the Bonanza Handicap. Now hurry up, will you? Well, if it's the six race, why can't we wait a while? Start now. Get everything you can and call me. I'll leave a message at your place. Where are you going? I don't know. Maybe up to see the girl. Oh, Patsy, you're going to be waving at the hangman's wife when they spring the trap door. I gotta see her. She owns Fleet Lady. Well, why don't I see her? She's got a stake somewhere, and I got a lot of questions. What could you do up there? Ah, oh, yes. If it weren't an academic question, I'd argue the point. Oh, it looked like a bum deal right from the start. Patsy, you have the instinct for recognizing trouble, but not the intelligence to duck it. Save your breath, will you? You're like a man walking under a scaffold on a building. You realize it may crash down and kill you, but instead of hugging the building where you can't get hurt... Like every other dope, you scurry for the edge of the sidewalk where you're bound to get hit if it falls. Jocko, will you get out to those horse parlors? I need facts, not fables. Now, give me a hand. All right. Give my love to Fleet Lady. Her name's Sybil Thornton. I'll bet I'm not far wrong. Good night, lover. <laughs> looked up the NBC program director, Paul Stangle. We pulled out the clips on Sybil Thornton. They were nice and fat because she'd been to Reno four times and hadn't broke training for years. She'd been traded around more than a Red Sox pitcher. The clipping said she was 32. There were a lot of pictures. And from her eyes, you got the idea she was around 35. But there were arguments the other way, too. Well, there weren't any stories on her for the last few months, just a few items from the columns. They all said the same thing. She was hitting the night spots with a gambler named Rudy Hauser. There were pictures of him, too. Now, he would look good in a cave with heavy curtains. I asked Paul. He said Hauser had a gambling place out on Geary, so I took a cab out there. For ten bucks, the guy at the door said Sybil Thornton had left the place an hour ago. That made me feel good. When Hauser opened the door to his office, I lost the glow. Yeah? What's with you? I got a problem. You got the wrong door. Well, you can't get any tougher, so I'm coming in. Mm. Suit yourself. I never throw anybody out until I'm sure they've lost all their money. What's on your mind? A horse named Fleet Lady. She disappeared at 7 o'clock tonight. Well, you check under the rug, I'll try the cabin. She got back just in time to greet somebody's guns. If I say no, will you go out and lose your money like a good boy? Fleet Lady was owned by a gal named Sybil Thornton. The columns say you're number five on her list. Well, they never lie. The whiskey's too good. Also, a little bird says she was in your office an hour ago. That's right. She said your name's Novak. Yeah. Next time you got a bombshell, give it a test run. With Fleet Lady dead, your money's gonna look real good in the six tomorrow. Well, it makes you think the gal would throw a race. For the same reason she goes out with you? Huh? When a gal takes a great dane like you out in public, it generally means the guy's a few bucks ahead of her. <laughs> You want to fight the team now, Novak? Mm-hmm. And just remember, sometimes you can't be right in a gentleman, too. Yeah. I hope that's the way you feel when they pick you up for Jackie Gregg's murder. Huh? Oh, you do a real nice double take, mister. The jockey checked out with a horse. I didn't know that, Novak. Yeah, with no brains, you built this gambling club. I didn't know he was dead. If I told you that, Novak, I'd meant it. He's all right for a little punk. I'm sorry he's dead. So's he. I'll see you later, Hauser. I got to nose around and find out where you were tonight. Yeah. You seem all right, Novak. So I'll tell you. If you got any dough left when you leave my table, it's better on a horse named Fleet Lady in the sixth race tomorrow. Do you always bet on a dead horse? You got the tip? Use it or bury it, but don't loan it out. Oh, the case was a regular grab bag when I walked out of Hauser's office. I began to tick off the things that didn't add up. First on the list was that van down on the waterfront. If it was Fleet Lady, who got shot in the stable? If it was the ringer, that meant Fleet Lady would run tomorrow. I couldn't figure out why Hauser was so sure she'd win. An idea kept racing around the back of my mind like an ant in a cookie factory. Jackie Gregg lied about that van down on the waterfront, but why? Not to bail me out of the poorhouse with 200 bucks. I got part of the answer when I stopped with the pay telephone and called Hellman. This Novak. I got some news. You'll have to put it on the back page. What do you got? Your friend Jackie Grade had some love life. Well, there's a chance for you, Hellman. Who's the girl? Sybil Thornton? Yeah, we found her picture in his wallet. The gooey kind. I bet she stole it for long train rides. What time did he die? The right 
Fit for you between 9 and 10 o'clock. Two shots from a 32 caliber pistol. How about the horse? 45 caliber. Two people. It's getting involved. Maybe, maybe not. You got two hands, Novak. Look up a guy named Rudy Hauser. He's got a joint out on Geary Street. I got enough friends. You look him up. I did. He's still talking about Fleet Lady and tomorrow's race. All right, maybe he's sentimental. Look, Novak, I'll pick out my own work. I don't need free help from you. Jackie Gregg paid 200 bucks and look what he got. That suits yourself, but Rudy Hauser and that gal are close friends. Yeah? Like two-part harmony in a telephone booth. Get off the dime, Hellman. Hauser's got that gal in his hip pocket. She owns Fleet Lady and he's betting her to win. You're trying hard, Novak. It's got to be a slow field to lose to a dead horse. Wake up, Hellman. You couldn't smell a rat in a basement full of cheese. I did all right in your apartment. Huh? That 32 caliber pistol, we found it in your place. See you later. <laughs> too worried about that. Hellman's smart enough to know a phony plant. I began to think about that 32 caliber pistol. It's a woman's weapon. Well, that doesn't prove anything. So is a bread knife if she's in a bad mood. Must have been about midnight when I got to Sybil Thornton's place. She was wearing black lounging pajamas tied tight around a slim waist. She looked like a wasp with a nice sting. She had company. Come in, Mr. Novak. Yeah. Mr. Novak, this is Ronnie Stark. Hello, Novak. Yeah. Well, he's not very friendly, Sybil. He's just parting because they're going to arrest him for Jackie's murder. How do you like Hellman? You've known him longer. Yeah. Somebody left the murder gun up at my place. Where you been all night? Please, Mr. Novak. You're embarrassing Ronnie. That's right. I'm blushing, and it's not the whiskey, Novak. I see. You must stay longer, Ronnie. <sighs> She's persuasive, huh, Novak? See you tomorrow. You won't forget, Ronnie. No, I won't forget. I'm betting on you, Novak. What won't he forget? Mr. Novak, I hope nobody ever asks you that question. Hmm. You don't want to talk about putting that gun in my apartment? No. Let's talk about Rudy Hauser, then. Hmm? Your meat grinder friend. We just had a good talk, and he opened up a new road. What'd you tell him? Don't break a spring. He's all right. Will you do me a favor, Patsy? Like not talking to Hauser anymore? Huh? That's right. Won't do you any good, Patsy. It'll do me a lot of good. How's he going to know which horse got killed? I bet you lied to him, Angel. It's my apple cart, Patsy. Leave it alone. Sure. But play your hand right, baby. Because I'm going to watch your cards. And if you got one that says Jackie Gregg, I'm going to call you the hard way. Patsy, you nice beast. I really think you would. Sit down. Yeah. A drink? No. Do you good? Not right now. Well... You've read the book. Just a couple of chapters. I bet they're the right ones. You better watch out, baby. I may be a long shot. Well, you care as long as I bet. I don't. That's good. I didn't think you'd mind. Aren't you beginning to crowd the beachhead? Don't be a sissy, Patsy. You can't live forever. All right, Angel. It's time to wire the folks. Mr. Novak, just wait until you know me better. That's for me. I left the number. It's your fault, then. Yeah. Hello, Patsy. What'd you find out, Jocko? Not much. Nobody seems to care about the sixth race. I care about it. Oh, that's because you killed one of the jockeys. The rest of the people have a more casual interest. How do the odds run? Oh, no heavy favorites. Vinair and Sleepy Time Gal figure to be the best at around five to one. What about Fleet Lady? Down the line somewhere. I talked to one fellow... He says she's a dog and couldn't beat a paralytic goose over a hundred yards. Yeah, what else? Well, that's all. What do you mean, that's all? Start digging, Jocko. We're not getting any place. Not even at your end? Huh? Well, I counted on you to do better than that. Good night, lover. <laughs> There was no story on Jackie Gregg, no details, and most of the story was a statement by Hellman on Hellman. There was no mention of Fleet Lady, and at one o'clock in the morning, there was nothing I could do but roll into bed. I woke up about nine, called Jocko. It was like sending a message out to the Farallones by Indian Runner. He just muttered and said he'd meet me out at the track. Well, I had to have some more dope, so I called Ira Snow. He calls the races and bets on them. The way he does it, a horse is a real beast of burden. He was playing elf when I got him on the wire. Yeah. Ira, this is Novak. What do you know about the Bonanza handicap? It's a horse race. Oh, you're funny. What about the field? Are the horses any good? Uh, for hamburgers, maybe. Nothing else. How about Fleet Lady? Eastern track. Nobody knows. Would she be worth a heavy plunge? Yeah, if you 
want to be a monk. What's this all about? Hi, I'm in trouble. How about a fix? Could they run a ringer in on Fleet Lady? Yeah, it's been done before, but it ain't easy. That's what I figured. How's Rudy Hauser on horses? He ain't. He got burned a long time ago. He never bets. Well, I think you're wrong. Look, Novak, I know every guy in town that's got the itch. Rudy Hauser, no. You know a guy named Ronnie Stark? Sure, he runs a book. Why? Nothing. May see you at the track. I'm going to make a bet. Yeah, I'll tell the horses. <laughs> That left me in a hole. If Iro was right, Rudy Hauser on Fleet Lady didn't make a bit of sense. I got out to the track about 2.30. Jocko was there, and Hellman was wandering around up in the grandstand where they couldn't push him into a starting gate. Sybil Thornton waved from her box as I walked by to get a better shot at the starting line for the sixth. They were almost at the post when Jocko came back from the betting window. Well, Patsy, uh, I bet two dollars on a horse called Scotch Victory. Uh, it seemed like a good omen. Yeah. I saw your friend Rudy Hauser at the window. Huh? He was pouring money down on the favorites to win. Well, that's why the odds have gone down on Vin Air and Sleepy Time Gal. Look at that board, will you? Yeah, Fleet Lady's gone all the way up to 12 to 1. Yeah, from 8 to 1, all the way up. Maybe the word got around she's dead. No. Now, that's the funny part. She's down there. See, number three on the rail. Not a peep out of anybody. Sarah Rock River is going to the front by one length. Sleepy time gal by a head. Fleet lady between horses is running third by one length. On the outside, it's Vinair and Old Soldier. Going into the clubhouse turn, it's hot weather by two lengths. Sleepy time gal by a half length. Fleet Lady is moving up on the outside. It's been air fourth by one length. An old soldier. Down the back stretch, it's hot weather by two lengths. Fleet Lady moving up on the outside is now second by one length. She runs Running well for a ghost. Yeah. Rudy Howes had better hurry up or he won't see much. What? He better hurry. He left the track ten minutes ago. Huh? Are you sure, Jocko? Yes, I heard him tell someone he had to make a phone call just before the bedding closed. Well... Jocko, you're a sweetheart. Oh, I like to think Come on, let's go to that uh, stable. Yeah, the race is no good. It was over five minutes ago. Well, how about my two dollars? Come on, will you? There's only one person who will try to fix a horse race. That's a horse. Well, I knew there was going to be trouble fast. The horses were just coming under the wire when I waved to Hellman and started for the stable. When we got there, Sybil Thornton was clearing out like a fire sale. I'm in a hurry, Patsy, darling. Let me by. No, you made a bad play, Angel. Stick around. Let me by, Patsy. You heard him, lady. Stick around. Thanks, copper. I'll take charge. That's a big gun, Hauser. I got a big beef. You let me drop a hundred grand, Sybil. It's your idea, Rudy. Not this way. You let me drop a hundred grand because you ran Fleet Lady. The program said Fleet Lady, and that's who ran. I brought those odds into line at the window. My other lady looked bad on Fleet Lady. You didn't stay to watch her trail the field. All right, I didn't stay. You lost your hundred grand. You killed a ringer. You were a smart big shot who was going to sew up the race. You ran Fleet Lady and cost me a hundred grand. All right, cop, I'll move away from her. Over this way, Sybil. Oh, don't let him do it, Patsy. I want to see how tough you are. Come on, Sybil. Let's you and me move against the stall. Watch out, Hauser. You're back into the horse. Grab the horse, Novak. He's going to trample him. You grab him. It's your idea. Dan. Yeah. You should have learned the first time you can't beat the horses. That's a bump joke, Novak. I guess it is. Now that we're all here, who do we book for Jackie Gregg's murder? I'll answer that, friend. Who's this guy? It's one you missed, Hellman. Hello, Stark. I am Novak. Well, what are you waiting for, Sybil? Tell the man you killed Jackie Gregg. Had enough trouble today, Ronnie. Well, you got more coming. Well, you figured it out yet, Novak? Hauser dumped his 80 grand on you. That's right. It's a lot of spending money. Wait a minute. Ronnie, I don't like this. Well, you get your half, baby. I'm going to write out an I.O.U. When they book you for murder and the vote's in, you can't use it. You wouldn't do a thing like that, Ronnie. A dead girl can't spend 40 grand. She killed your guy, Copper, and tried to palm it off on Novak. I was there, so I'll testify. Ronnie, you're a no good guy. Ah, don't be silly. I love justice. A booker for murder, Copper. I want to tear up that I.O.U. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Well, Hellman finally worked it out. It started out as a fixed race, and when they were all through, it was up to the horse. Rudy Hauser put the squeeze on Sybil for some dough. She offered to run a fast ringer in place of Fleet Lady, so Hauser could pick up a bag full. Rudy just wanted to make sure, so he sent one of his boys around to knock off Fleet Lady. Only the guy killed the ringer instead. Well, that was a break for Sybil. She made a deal with a bookie named Ronnie Stark to take all of Hauser's bets and guarantee him that Fleet Lady couldn't win because she wasn't that good a horse. It panned out that way. She let Hauser think Fleet Lady was dead. He spent the 20 grand at the window pushing up the odds on Fleet Lady and dumped another 80 on her to win. The moving van? Now, that was a phony story Greg used to get me to scare Sybil. He wanted in on the deal. He went back to the stable that night, got in a beef, and she killed him. She had him out in her car. When I went to make that phone call, she figured it was a good way to pass the buck. Well, Hellman asked only one question. Why would a nice, tame horse go crazy and trample a guy to death? Jocko had the answer. The horse that killed Hauser was a filly. <laughs> Casting Company has just brought you the fourth of a new series, Pat Novak, for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced and directed by William P. Rousseau. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. In our cast were Virginia Gregg, Tal Avery, Stacey Harris, Hugh Thomas, and Carlisle Bibbers. This program is being released to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Be with us again next week when over most of these same ABC stations we will bring you Pat Novak for Hire. This program came to you from Hollywood. listening reminder. Tonight, don't miss Jane Wyman when she guest stars and explains how she created her unforgettable role as the deaf mute in Johnny Belinda. Hear Jane Wyman tonight on this ABC station. This is ABC, the national broadcasting company. <laughs> the amazing Mr. Malone. <laughs> Operator? Operator, get me the office of John J. Malone. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Amazing Mr. Malone, an exciting half hour of mystery starring George Petrie as the lawyer whose practice before every type of bar has become a legend. Our locale is the city of Chicago, the time, the present, and... The hero of these weekly adventures, the amazing Mr. Malone. Malone's a name, John J. Malone, attorney and counselor at law. Tonight in our study of the cliché, let's take a gander at hard work never killed anyone. You can never prove that by Danny Braden. Danny is the dark-haired boy in the small furnished apartment on Chicago's south side. Danny is what is known in the trade as a solitary drinker. And he's just made an amazing discovery. The liquor goes a lot further that way. Danny. Danny. What the devil do you want, Thelma? Oh, I don't want to nag you, darling. You're certainly giving a darn good imitation. I only mean... What's the matter? You're deaf? See who that is. Sure, darling. Just a minute, I'm coming. Yes? I'm looking for a Danny Braden. What do you want with him? I'm an old buddy of his from L.A. Just tell him it's Jack Bucktell. Well, what are you doing here? Oh, hiya, Danny. Good to see you. What do you want, Bucktell? Now, is that any way to talk? Your little girl here would think you weren't glad to see me. She'd be right. That's gratitude for you. 
And to think the minute I stepped off that bus, I made tracks right over here. Shouldn't have bothered. There was no bother at all. How you doing, Danny? Swell. You don't look it. Well, you know me, Buck. I never believed in being ostentatious. Can you use a hundred grand? Are you kidding? Darling. Shut up. What? Where can we talk? What's the matter with this? Two things. One, you haven't invited me in. What's the other? Her. They're both no problems. All right, Thumb, I'll go take yourself a walk. No. You're going to get mixed up in something. Don't you understand English? I... Oh. I make it a nice long walk, like from here to Evanston. Uh... Well? All right, then. Better call me before you come home. I like a girl who can mind. Sit down. Now, thanks. You, uh, said something about a hundred grand? Oh, not so fast, Danny boy. There are one or two things we got to iron out first. Such as? I got to be protected. Okay. Then, um, sign right here. What is this? Just a little agreement that we split 50-50 on your income for the next ten years. You think I'd be stupid enough to sign this? Why? What do you got to lose? Well, if I went to work, you... <laughs> you wouldn't do a thing like that. Don't be so smart. Let's not kid each other, Danny. I know you from a way back. you got no more intention of doing an honest day's work than I have. Now, if you want to sign that agreement, okay. If you don't, that's all right, too. Give me a pen. Mm-hmm. Here you are. Daniel M. Britton. How's that? Oh, it's fine. Now, what's the deal? You remember a little girl you were married to named Gloria Mason? This your idea of a gag? How long has it been since she got killed in that fire? What, are you a comic? Uh, just humor me for a couple of minutes, will you? It was six years ago. As I recall, they never did find her body. Nothing left to find. Just some silver bridge work. I bet she can afford platinum now. What are you babbling about? She's alive, Danny. You're nuts. She started that fire herself. What? Why? Get away from you. What kind of crack is that? I tell you, Gloria's right here in town. Only she calls herself Glenda. Glenda? Yeah. That isn't all she changed. She doesn't have that red hair anymore. And she's married. Married? Uh-huh. To a fellow named Phil Stacy. Phil... The Stacy that owns the Belmont Casino? Uh-huh. I understand she's nuts about him. You must be out of your mind. Well, there's one way to convince yourself. Go up and see. And while you're at it, you might ask her for a couple of bucks. You know, so you can afford a cab back. I'm sure she wouldn't want her husband to walk. <laughs> Yes? Well, what do you know? What? I never would have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. Look, mister. What's the matter, Gloria? Don't you recognize your one and only? It's Danny. If you don't get out of here... What do you do, scream? Yes. Then go right ahead. Phil! Phil! Uh, of course, we both know he isn't home. I made sure of that. Now, look, mister. I don't know who you are. Oh, now, Gloria. You couldn't have forgotten all we meant to each other? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, maybe I know a way to show you. Does that bring back fond memories? What do you want, Danny? I knew it would ring a bell. What do you want? Only what's mine. You. No. Ah, oh, now you're my wife, honey. You don't know how I missed you. I'm sure you found someone else to beat up. Oh, now, Gloria. Oh, I beg your pardon, Glenda. There never was anyone like you. Well... What do you say? You pack your bags and I'll take you home. Let me go. Oh, come on, sweetie. You'll love it. Once you get used to the bugs. What are you after? I told you. You. I only hope Phil won't be disappointed. You're not going to say a word to him. I'll kill you if you do. Well, he's bound to find out. After all, he thinks he's married to you. How much do you want? Now, you think I came here for money? How much do you want? I never thought of it like that. <laughs> But, uh, if you'd rather stick with Phil, why, uh, far be it from me to interfere with your happiness. Let's, uh, let's make it five grand. That's a nice round figure. Don't be a fool. Where would I get it? Oh, it doesn't have to be cash, honey. I'll take your check. I'm sure you wouldn't stop payment. How do I know you won't be back again? Of course I will, Glenda. 
You're my wife. Now, what kind of husband would I be not to drop by when I'm in the neighborhood? And I intend to be around real often. Hello. Hello, Thelma. How goes the battle? Who is this? Jack Buxell. Is Danny around? Just a second. It's for you, Danny. Who is it? Mr. Bucktell. Hello. Hi, Danny. Fine. How'd you make out? How'd I make out? I understand you were up to see Mrs. Stacy this afternoon. Where do you understand that from? Oh, I got ways and means at my disposal. How did we do? We didn't do. I don't get you, Danny. Very simple, Buck. This isn't the right dame. Listen, friend. Well, I ought to know. I was married to her. Look, boy, don't try to hop me around. Never entered my mind. Sorry it worked out this way, Buck. But uh, maybe we can get together on something else sometime. Give me a call if you get any ideas. Some more coffee, Glenda? Uh, what? I asked if you wanted some more coffee. Oh, no, thanks, Phil. What's the trouble, baby? Trouble? We haven't said two words since we sat down. Well, I, I've got a slight headache. You want some aspirin? No, I'll be all right. Maybe if you ate something... I'm not hungry. You haven't been hungry for a week. If you don't stop picking on me... Sorry, honey. No, it's... It's my fault, Phil. I, I'm just on edge. Well, I'm going to call Doc Wilbur and ask No, no I, I don't want you to. I tell you, I'm perfectly all right. Then what's bothering you? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I swear. Look, Glinda... I promised when we got married I'd never ask any questions. I know that, Phil, and I, I appreciate it. But if something's worrying you and you want to tell Papa, he'll always be ready to listen. Remember that. Hello, Doris. This is Danny Braden. Oh, hi, Danny. My missus there? Hot huh, what? Thelma. No, no, she ain't. Oh, I just got in to find a note saying she's gone over to see you. Well, she left here ten minutes ago. I think she had an appointment with John J. Malone. Who? You know, that lawyer fella. What does she want with Malone? Well, I don't know, Dan... Oh, gee, I shouldn't have told you. You won't say nothing. Don't you worry, Doris. I won't breathe it to its... Just a second. I said just a second. Yeah? Uh, I'm looking for John J. Malone. If you try the Prescott building, I understand he's got an office there. His secretary told me he's never in. Oh. And then she said if it was real important, I could find him here. She's just a great big blabbermouth, ain't she? Uh-huh. Uh, skip it. Come on in, Mrs. Uh... Uh, Braden. Thelma Braden. Sit down. Well... You don't have to worry. I won't bite. I left my uppers on my other head. Why? Hey, don't try to figure it out. It's not worth it. What's your problem? Problem? There must be an echo in here. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Malone. It's just that I'm nervous. Why? Well, I, I... I've never done anything like this before. Danny would kill me if he knew. Danny, I take it as your husband. Yes. On a divorce? Oh, no. Then well, what is it? Well, you see, I, I married Danny three years ago. After his first wife died in a fire. Well? Well, just for the sake of argument... Suppose she didn't die. Suppose she was still alive. Well, she's still his wife. It doesn't matter. Oh, don't stop on my account, Malone. Didn't your mother ever teach you to knock, Lieutenant? Yeah, she also taught me not to be noisy. Now, sit down, Lieutenant. Thanks, I will. Look, Brooks, I happen to be very busy. And you're going to be a lot busier before the day is over. Pay no attention to him, Thelma. I'm afraid she's going to have to. I'm with the police, Mrs. Braden. What? How did you know her name was Braden? Oh, you'd be surprised what I know about her. She's 31, blonde, and uh, recently widowed. Widowed? All right, Sidney, what are you getting at? Her husband was murdered an hour ago. No. Yes. You're lying. You're making this all up. Ah, you know better. Are you accusing her? Uh-huh. Oh, no, no. Oh, I wouldn't worry, Thomas. 
Couldn't they tell you Malone was amazing? Why, with him on your side, all you can possibly lose is your life. Ain't that a comforting thought? You're listening to The Amazing Mr. Malone. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. East and West meet as Mr. Moto moves swiftly against those who would corrupt and destroy freedom-loving people everywhere. On the national front, Martin Kane, Private Eye, will find himself involved in plenty of action as he becomes involved in whirlwind adventures beginning July 1st. Mr. Moto and Martin Kane, two invitations to suspense, intrigue, and mystery over your favorite NBC station. And now, back to the amazing Mr. Malone. One nice thing you can say for my apartment, it's convenience. Within the space of five minutes, I had two visitors and both gifted conversationalists. The first was Thelma Braden, the second, Lieutenant Brooks, and the dialogue was real scintillating. Then Brooks got started on a monologue. That's when the party got dull. It's my duty to warn you, Mrs. Braden, that anything you say may be used in evidence. Why don't you shut up? Can't you see she's in a state of shock? Thelma. Huh? Can you understand me? He said I killed Danny. He didn't mean it. Didn't I? Now look, Sidney, use your head. Where's her motive? Oh, you're just talking to pad your part. Where's her motive? Why, that husband of hers used to beat her like she was whipped cream. That's not true. Are you kidding? Her neighbors told me he cuffed you around regularly. I didn't care. Then why were you consulting Malone? Well, I... That's a confidential matter. How did you know she was here? My friend must have told him. You mean Doris? You're right. Now listen to me, Thelma. Remember that matter we were discussing before he walked in? What? Well, you know about this girl you knew whose husband thought she was dead? The girl I knew... Yeah, the one who was supposed to be burned in that fire. What was her name? I... I can't think. You've got to tell me. Look, is this a private game or can a stranger take a hand? It's private. Uh, it's Stacy. Glenda Stacy. Phil Stacy's wife? I don't know. Well, I'll check. You go along with Brooks now. You mean I can have her? Don't get your hopes up, Lieutenant. She's only for a lend. I'll be back for her after I look up another prospect. <laughs> Come in. Hello, Phil. Well, if it isn't the amazing Mr. Malone, come on in. Thanks. Hey, hey, it's quite a place. You know, I've never been up here. Like it? Why shouldn't I? Didn't I furnish it? What are you talking about? Well, I figure with the dough I dropped at your club, I must have at least bought the drapes. <laughs> Sit down. Thanks. Drink? What do you got? Scotch? That's my boy. Say when? Yes, one of those things. Whoop. Yeah. What about you? No, I'll sit this one out. Well, like they say, here's to crime. Hmm. All right, Malone, what's in your mind? Well, can't a man just drop around for a sociable drink? Uh, not if you're the man. Well, I was kind of hoping to meet your wife. I've heard a lot about her. Is she around? No. Nope. When will she be back? I have no idea. In that case, suppose we have a little talk. Does it concern Glenda? Vitally. Then I don't want to hear it. I don't discuss my wife with strangers. How do you know I'm a stranger? Maybe Glenda and I have a big romance brewing. Oh, don't make me laugh. You know my reputation. Yeah, you're a sucker for a long shot. What's that supposed to mean? Take it any way you like. Look, Phil, I want to be on the level with you. I represent a Thelma Braden. I told you I wasn't interested. Well, you ought to be, because your wife's enough, Malone. I think you'd better go. You know, Phil, you're a remarkable guy. There are not many men around who would trust their wives so implicitly. I wouldn't know. Well, I would. Thanks for the drink, and tell Glenda I was sorry to miss her. Maybe I'll catch her on the next round. And you, Glenda? Yes, Bill. Okay. Let me help you with those packages. Oh, thanks, darling. Uh, how do you feel? Oh, much better. Good. Would you like a drink? I'd love it. You sit down right over here and Pop will take care of it. Did you bring the evening papers? Oh, I, I forgot. Oh, it doesn't matter. All the news is bad. Which reminds me, John J. Malone was up to see you this afternoon. Who? You know, a lawyer. But he's representing film. What did he want? I didn't give him a chance to say. Hey, don't you want your drink? What did he say, Phil? I told you I wouldn't listen to him, but I will to you. I... I... I don't understand. 
Look, baby, you know our deal. I never asked you about anything, but if you're in a jam, I want to know about it. I, I tell you, everything's fine, darling. All right, Glenda. Let it be like you say, everything's fine. And Malone or no Malone, Papa's going to keep it that way. <laughs> Tom. Mr. Malone? That's right. I'm so glad to find you in. You don't know the trouble I had getting your address. You shouldn't have bothered. Oh, I don't mind. All right, let's get it over with. I beg your pardon? Look, Junior, this is an old story to me, though. Generally, I find him waiting inside. Weren't you sent here to warn me off? How in the world did you know that? I'm amazing. Besides, that bulge in your pocket gave you away. Oh, you mean this old thing. Hey, isn't that kind of heavy for a little man like you to carry? But then that makes you a big man, doesn't it? Oh, definitely. Who sent you? Glenda Stacy? And why would Mrs. Stacy want to do that? Because we both know she killed Danny Braden. Did she? Absolutely. She was legally married to Braden, and he was probably shaking her down. Oh, so she took the obvious way out. See my point? Well, isn't there something you're overlooking? You're right. Pardon? I'd completely forgotten about her husband. Did Phil send you? Oh, why should he? Well, by his own admission... Oh, he... I wouldn't. If I were you. I was just trying to get a cigarette. Yes, well, you can smoke mine. No nicotine. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Now, you were saying? Oh, yeah. Phil would do anything in the world for his wife. Would he? Yeah, well, that's what he claimed, and I see no... Re Wait a minute. Now, don't tell me you thought of something else. Yes, indeed. Danny must have just recently found out Glenda was living. Would you believe I have no idea what you're talking about? Oh, it doesn't matter. I was just thinking out loud. you mind? No, not at all. Well, the way I see it, Danny must have learned about Glenda in the past few weeks. Otherwise, this whole affair would have been precipitated a long time ago. Now... How did Danny find out? Uh, may I offer a suggestion? Uh, please do. Maybe he saw her on the street? No, no, that's too convenient. There has to be another party who supplied the information. Does he? That's the only way it adds up. Now, who could have tipped off Danny that Glenda was alive? I have no idea. Mm. Well, thanks anyway, friend. You've been real sweet to let me run on like this. Oh! What's the matter, kid? Can't you take it down there? You... Yeah, I know. I ought to be ashamed for hitting anyone smaller than myself. But you don't think a bully like me would hit anyone bigger. Oh! C O N C. Hey, Sussman, how do you spell consensus? Don't tell him, Hank. You're no stool pigeon. Oh, no. Make for the hells, man. That man's here again. Look, you idiot. I want to talk to you. No speaker to anyone. I'm not kidding, Lieutenant. I got the whole thing figured out. When haven't you? I'm serious. Thelma Braden didn't kill her husband. Well, naturally you'd say that. Naturally, and I've just been with the boy who can prove it. Well, why didn't you bring him with you? He was in no condition to travel. He had a gun, and I saw no point in letting him use it. Coward. Who sent him? Well, I wouldn't say, but I'd be willing to hazard a guess. All right, let's hear it. Try and stay with me. Now, Danny Braden was blackmailing Phil Stacy's wife. Why? Because she was really Danny's wife. She was never legally married to Phil. Now, now, this couldn't possibly be as confusing as you make it sound. Well, if you think it's rough, wait till you hear the rest. Danny thought she was dead. Recently, he learned she was alive. Now, that information had to come from someone. Who was it? Well, you tell me. I'm the Schlemiel, remember? Okay. It came from the same guy who sent that punk junior grade around to knock me off. And who's that? Phil Stacy. Are you out of your mind? Well, who'd be in a better position to know all about Glenda's background? Well, why would Phil want to blackmail his own wife? That's what I keep telling you. She's not his wife. All right, why'd he want to blackmail Glenda? He's in the chips. Where do you suppose that bankroll came from originally? Glenda? Sure. She must be the one who's loaded. Phil's past is a mystery. And when Glenda left Danny, she must have waltzed off with all of Danny's dough. Uh, this assumes he had money at one time. Yeah. Now, let's see if I understand you. It's your theory Phil was blackmailing Glenda through Danny. Hooray, you caught on. Yeah. Well, I'll have to give you credit, Malone. You were right on one count. The information that Glenda was alive did come through a third party, only it wasn't Phil Stacy. It came from a fellow named Jack Bucktell. But if Phil wasn't the one who supplied the information... Then you were wrong on count two. Yeah, but don't feel too badly. You were 50% right, and for you, that's a 49% improvement. Keep it up, Counselor. You're doing fine. <laughs> You are listening to The Amazing Mr. Malone. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. They say there's a thin line between the real and the unreal. A place where time stands still. A land of silent mystery. We bring you excursions into the unknown. Journeys into the future and through the shadow-filled corridors of the minds of men, 
on Dimension X, a program designed to bring you the unusual. Tom Conway brings us back to reality as the debonair gentleman adventurer Simon Templer, who finds suspense and mystery awaiting him as the saint. And here's another program note. Be sure to hear Martin Kane, Private Eye, beginning on this station July 1st, and featuring the well-known screen star Lloyd Nolan. Dimension X, The Saint, and Martin Kane, three top programs designed for your summer entertainment over NBC, where the chimes are. And now, back to the amazing Mr. Malone. They say you can't keep a good man down, and they're absolutely right. For if Lieutenant Brooks thought he had knocked me out with his haymaker that Jack Bartell supplied the information to blackmail Glenda, he was wrong. It was a bad blow, all right, but I picked myself right off the floor and stepped into another. So Phil needed Glenda's dough, huh? Eh? Why, you schmo boy, Phil's been in the chips since 1930. All right, so I made a mistake. It's nice of you to admit it. I can't help myself. Where's this Jack Bartell now? You know, I had a hunch you'd ask that, and I happen to be prepared with an answer. Sussman, show in Mr. Bucktoe. Never mind, I can make it myself. Listen, Lieutenant, if you know what's good for Don't you... Don't be silly. If I knew what's good for me, I never would have been a cop. This is John J. Malone. So? So act impressed. He's a big man. Sit down, Bucktell. I want to talk to you. I got nothing to say. Lieutenant, could you leave us alone for a couple of minutes? So you think it's safe? He outweighs you by 40 pounds. Uh, yeah, on second thought, maybe you better stick around. Now, listen, Bucktell... How much did Danny give you? What do you mean, how much did he give me? Of the money he blackmailed from Glenda. No, he didn't get a dime from her. So he held out on you? No, he didn't. You just admitted there was no split? That's because there was nothing to split. He told me Glenda wasn't the right girl. But you knew better. I knew nothing of the kind. And when you learned Danny double-crossed you, you killed him? No. You went to his apartment and you shot him in the back? Oh, you're crazy. All right, Brooks, what are you waiting for? Did you hear him confess? No. Well, he practically admitted... I didn't hear him. You just haven't been reading between the lines. And all the reading you've done must have strained your eyes. He couldn't have killed Danny. Why not? Because at the time of the murder, he was in Detroit. He what? You heard me. Had to fly Sussman there this morning to pick him up. Well, that doesn't make sense. If he didn't kill Danny... Then it's barely possible your client did. Well, thanks for helping us out, Malone. I don't know what I'd do without you. Yes. I bet you're Glenda Stacy. I beg your pardon? Uh, my name's John J. Malone. Didn't your husband tell you I was around earlier today? No, he didn't. Well, I was. Unfortunately, I missed you. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Malone? Well, uh, you can invite me in. I think that'd be a mistake. Oh, hi, Phil. I didn't see you. It's pretty obvious. What do you want, Malone? Well, I just dropped by to apologize. Apologize? Yeah. Uh, can I come in? All right. Thanks. Now, this is uh, a lovely place you have here, Glenda. Glenda? Well, I feel I know you so well. After all, I've heard so much about you. All right, Malone, what do you want? You were much more hospitable this afternoon. You invited me to have a drink, remember? What do you want? Yeah, I guess I'll have to buy my own. I don't know where the money's going to come from. Gee, get to the point. Well, as I started to tell you, I represent a Thelma Brayton. I think you better leave us alone, Glenda. No, I want to hear this. I don't blame you, lover. It's pretty good yarn. You see, Thelma was married to a boy named Danny. You don't have to go into that. We read it in all the papers. Not all, Phil. You see, Thelma wasn't really married to him. Legally, he was still Glenda's husband. What? That's a lie. You should have told him, lover. Look, Malone, what are you trying to hand me? You folks have nothing to worry about. With Danny dead, there's nothing to prevent you from getting remarried. I don't like those kind of jokes. It's no joke, Phil. But I did do you an injustice. Some guns will come up to my apartment early this afternoon, and like a fool, I jumped to two conclusions. One, that you sent him. Now, look, Malone. Now, just hear me out. I also came up with a weird theory that you were behind a blackmail plot to shake down Glenda. Are you out of your mind? I must have been. Lieutenant Brooks told me you were the one with the money. I didn't take his word for it, so I checked with your bank. He was right. Where do you get I on? know. I got my nerve. They told me something else. That in the last month, Glenda here issued four checks to Danny Braden. I know about that. No. Sure I did, baby. He's telling the truth, lover. He saw the endorsement. So? So, being the kind of man you are, naturally, it took steps. And all of them in the direction of Danny Braden's apartment. No. Then later you sent that punk around to scare me off when you thought I was going to hang Danny's murder on Glenda. Are you trying to say I killed him? I thought I did. Why, you know... Lieutenant, good... he wants to slug me. Oh, I wish I hadn't come in so fast. Go on, you're too big a ham to miss a cue. 
Now fool the public and act like a policeman. <laughs> Hey, George, how about a little service here? Oh, what are you complaining about, Malone? We're getting as little as possible. Oh, I don't know why I come here every week. Everybody's a comic. Uh, listen, listen, Malone. What do you want? Uh, how did you know Phil killed Danny Braden? Well, it all came down to the process of elimination. Mm -hmm. You had a cast iron alibi for Jack Bartell. So? So, that took care of him. And as far as Glenda was concerned... It wasn't in character for her to commit murder, or she would have done it long ago. Look what she went through to get away from Danny. And then when he turned up again, she paid him off. Well, maybe, uh, maybe she got tired of it. Never. You know, the first touch is always the hardest for a blackmailer. Once the victim kicks through from then on, it's clear sailing. So, that took care of Glenda and left us Phil. Uh, oh, why didn't he let on to Glenda that he knew about Danny? Because that's the kind of a guy Phil is. He was crazy about her. If she thought she was keeping something from him, he wasn't going to let on. Now, does that take care of all your questions? No, no. This is all well and good about the process of elimination, but there's one party in this deal you overlooked. Who? Your client. Why couldn't Thelma have been guilty? Because you made the pinch. Well? Well, you were right last week, so now it had to be my turn. After all, I'm the one who's amazing. Good night, Lieutenant. <laughs> the story of a man who came up with an interesting theory about life and one of his friends shot it full of holes but as a lawyer I can tell you it was murder I'll fill you in on the gory details next week so why not pick me up in my office at the same time I'll be waiting for you tonight George Petrie was starred as John J. Malone with Larry Haynes as Lieutenant Brooks our program is written by Eugene Wang and directed by Richard Lewis the Amazing Mr. Malone is based on a famous character created by Craig Rice and produced by Bernard L. Schubert. The events and characters in this story were entirely fictional, and any resemblance to persons living or dead is entirely coincidental. Fred Collins speaking. The Amazing Mr. Malone has come to you from New York. Stay tuned for The Man Called X, next over most NBC stations. I'm Johnny Madero, Pier 23. You know, it doesn't pay to buy a fast car in San Francisco because most of the time you got to be in low gear. The town is laid out like the profile of a chorus line, and the only time it flattens out is where it runs into the bay. The waterfront goes from south of the ferry building out past the China docks. And on a clear day, you can see him batting baseballs over on Alcatraz. Pier 23 is over toward the left field sign. And not far from there, you'll find Johnny Madero's boat shop. My place. Oh, I rent boats and I do anything else that means long odds and short hours. It's a way to make a living. And if you never save enough to get married, at least you got enough to leave town. Maybe I should have left town Monday afternoon. I bought a paper and... I read about a build-up on a heavyweight fight in L.A. I stopped in at Lofty's, and the boys said neither one of those fighters could beat an egg with a power drill. About 3 o'clock, I started down Post Street when I spotted a new auction house. It was small, with enough dough-changing hands to buy back Manhattan Island. Inside, it was packed, and up on a wooden stand, a bald-headed guy was selling everything but his suspenders. So I sat down and back, and I noticed a girl standing up against the wall. She was wearing dark green sunglasses... But the rest of her was just about as secret as a plow on the bathroom floor. Her hair was the color of half past midnight, and her dress was made of the kind of goods you buy from spiders. After a while, she walked over to me. Right away, she started getting nervous, and when you look like her, you got a right to be. Mind if I sit down? Now, your legs, lady. If you want to rest them, rest them. Thanks. You seem to like the view. Just temporary. I'm leaving. Will you get excited if I ask you to stay? Are you going to be proud if I do? Please, I want you to do me a favor. It won't take long. It'll be a small one. How small? They're going to auction off a black leather suitcase in a few minutes. It belongs to me. I must have it back. Can you speak the language? Do your own bidding, huh? I don't want someone to know I'm here. It's important. 
I'll pay you $50 to bid for me. You just hired me. Just start bidding and keep on bidding till you get that suitcase. I want it at any price. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's a special item of interest. A black leather suitcase arrived yesterday. Contents unknown. It's handsome. It's beautiful. It's never been opened. Now, who's got sporting blood? The leather alone is worth at least 25 bucks. And it's heavy, it's heavy. It could be full of bricks and it could be full of gold. That's what makes it interesting. Now, who's going to start the bidding? Who's going to start it off with a big one? Two bucks. <laughs> oh, come on, come on. That's an insult. Two dollars? Who'll give 15? Ten bucks. Ten. Who'll give 30? Ten. Who'll give 30? Start pitching for our team, mister. Twenty-five bucks. Fifty. Fifty. Double it. A hundred. A hundred. The man in the gallery bids a hundred. You heard him, folks? One hundred. Who'll give two? Two hundred. Two hundred. You got competition, lady. I got you. Keep doubling. Four hundred. Four hundred. That man in the gallery's got second vision. He knows what the suitcase is worth. The bid's four hundred. Who'll give eight hundred? Four. Who'll give eight? Eight hundred. Eight hundred. The man in front here says eight. Who'll give a thousand? The bid's eight hundred. Who'll give a thousand? Go ahead. Surprise the man. The OPA won't like this. You're working for me now. Make it a thousand. A thousand. A thousand. Oh, man, in fact, it's a thousand dollars. Who'll get fifteen hundred? A thousand. Who'll get fifteen hundred? All right. A thousand once. A thousand twice. A thousand for the third and last time. Oh, through bidding. So to the men in the gallery. Please come up and say this price now. Here's the money. Pick it up and come back. I'll be waiting. Yeah. And don't let him open it. Whatever you do, don't let him open it. It's your party, lady. I won't even let him peek. Hey. The lucky man coming down the aisle now. Give him room, give him room. Now, here he is, and here's your suitcase, mister. Want to open it and uh, tell the folks what's inside? Yeah, what's in it, Mac? Just one of my relatives. Here's a dough. Yeah, sure, 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 all right. Now, we have another item here. Oh. Oh, oh. Sorry, son, I was just going for the empty seat. Yeah, we'll wait for your blockers next time, Pop. Where's the girl, the brunette with the dark glasses? Uh, it's a jail term, son. I don't follow him home anymore. Well, she was here a minute ago. You must have seen her leave. No. Think about it. She must have walked right past you. Think about it. No, son. When you get to be my age, you don't even do that. I felt kind of silly, the same way you do when you find a hole in your sock at the shoe store. But it wasn't my doll that bought that case, so I couldn't beef much. When I got back to the office, I started working on the lock with the key. The case was made of plain black leather, and it was kicked around more than Minnie's gong. Then I opened it. A shiny-looking saxophone was laid out in three parts. For a thousand bucks, you can buy a whole brass section. So I went through each piece looking for a reason. There was a paper box inside the case. It had a gross of reeds in it, the same kind you find on the mouthpiece of any saxophone. I couldn't do much more, so I wrapped up the case and put it up in my closet. Then the door opened, and if trouble had a face, this was the way it looked in the morning. He stood there in the middle of the room, and his eyes held me like a fly at the end of two needles. He noticed his eyebrows. They were bushy and thick, and if they got any worse, he'd have to hire a native guide. Hello, are you Modelo? That's my story. You got a better one? It's sadder than yours. I'm the guy you left behind at the auction. Who are you bidding for? Who are you asking for? Myself. I suppose we get real friendly. What's your name? Dunlap. Larry Dunlap. Now, introduce me to the girl who was coaching you. All right. She was a souped-up brunette with a disappearing act. Now, what does that prove? Unless you find her in the cemetery, never trust a woman. Especially Claire Underwood. Yeah. What do you want from me? I'll take that black leather suitcase you won at the auction. Look, I saved you some dough. Don't make a pig of yourself. Try to be nice. I will. I won't kick you when you're dead. Where's that suitcase? You're making me nervous. So if you got an itch, see a doctor. What makes you so big? Vitamins. I know all about the sax, my dear. It belongs to me. Give it to me or I start looking. You better have a license. A sax isn't that important. It is to me. Maybe I want to start a hot shop. I'll hold out for your girlfriend. She owes me 50 bucks and I need the dough. I'll double anything she gives you. If you mean money, give me a hint. Will 100 bucks do? Yeah. The sax is in the closet on top here. Come on. Give me a hand. Give me sure, a hand. Oh, sure. <coughs> You've got a hand, Madero. Now play it out. Some days you're not going to make out any better than an ice cube at a cocktail party. When Dunlap hit me, I folded up and my head got the size of a social worker's heart. Well, I started tossing around on the rug. It took me longer to stop than it took Hayden to quit Jersey. I knew that sax was gone, so there was no point in getting up. I started dreaming about that day a Cleveland bellhop gave me a key to the wrong room. It was going all right, too, until somebody began shaking me. In that small room, I didn't have to look up to know who it was. 
Because Inspector Warcheck of San Francisco Homicide is the kind of guy you stand next to in a hurricane. I wonder what happened to the weather ventilation. Making a wish, Monero? Yeah, yeah, so it didn't come true. What are you collecting? Alibis. What's yours for last night at 12 o'clock? That was in bed. You got a witness? No, you can't win them all. Yeah, that's the way a guy named Charlie Reiser felt. So maybe it's an epidemic. So maybe you started it. Someone shot him dead. The guy was a musician. Try some of the neighbors. I'll try you first. You're reaching, Warcheck. I never even heard of the guy. Oh, that's a handicap, Madero. Maybe you just heard of his instrument, huh? All right, let me guess. It was a sack. Hey, you're very bright. An auctioneer helped me trace it down to you. Now, what's the pitch? A wild one, Warcheck. A dame forced me to do her a favor. Uh Uh-huh. I bet you force easy. She paid me to bid for the sacks and then took a potter after I won it. You got an active memory. Does it include a name? Yeah. Claire Underwood. Run it down and see what it gets you. Oh, now, stop threatening me, Madero. I think that sex is tied in with the murder. Now, where is it? You're a little late. A torpedo named Larry Dunlap just walked in and sapped me for it. Yeah? How hard did he sap you, Madero? Hmm? There's a pool of blood behind your desk, and it doesn't look like yours. How'd it get there? I don't know, Warchick. Maybe somebody got lost and figured it was a blood bank. How do I know? Yeah. Maybe they thought it was a morgue, too. Left a body. Now, look around. Yeah, do that. Look under the rug, too. Maybe the guy was thin. All right, Madero. So far, you're in the clear. But if there's blood, there must be a body close by. It'll show. When it does, we'll turn it in for yours. I'll remember. Like you remember that thousand bucks? Huh? The auction house, Madero. The thousand bucks you gave the joint got homesick and left. I'm broke, Warchick. Yeah? You'll have to stand on your head to pin this on me. Maybe I will. Maybe you're right. I forgot about your head. Once Warchek sticks to you, you might as well try to pull a mustard plaster off a throw rug. He stood there for a minute, blinking at the light, and you could see big pebbles of sweat standing out on his forehead. He took a handkerchief out of his pocket, and when it came down, it was wet enough to wash all the windows in lower Manhattan. After a while, he walked out. I watched him out of the window. I tried to figure how I got into this. It was like trying to trace back a conversation to see what word started it. There were lots of questions and not too much time. Why was a saxophone and a grocer reeds worth all that dough? And who left his blood on my rug as a deposit? The girl must have known what was in the case, but why did she leave it with me? Uh, I couldn't make it add up, so I looked up the only good guy I know. A waterfront priest named Father Leahy. He knows most of the bad boys around the piers, and he's heard enough sins to start an art colony. Around Lofty's, they got his name above the line. And that's a tough trick, because along the waterfront, an archangel couldn't get a cup of coffee without hucking a wing. I found him over at the parish house having dinner. Hello, Johnny. You want some wine? No, thanks, Father. That's one of the good things about this job. You get wine with your meals. Yeah, I know. Except you've got to watch out. I knew a guy in the seminary liked to eat between meals. Yeah, yeah. But the bishop fixed him. He sent him to a rich parish, and the guy had to throw away half his sermons. I'm in trouble, Father. Did you buy elevator shoes, or is that a bump on your head? Somebody knocked me down when I wasn't looking. Did you get the license number? I just felt like a truck. I got hit with a club. That's why I want you to help me, Father. Johnny, you misinterpret my mission in life. You need a policeman. I'm only a priest. Besides, I'm eating. Look, Father, homicide wants to tack a murder on me. There goes my appetite. Who's dead? Anybody I could have helped? His name was Charlie Reiser. He was a musician. If he's going in the right direction, he may get some work. How did you meet him? I didn't. I never heard of the guy. It was all a surprise to me. Sounds more like a shock. I got a bum shake from the start, Father. A gal with a big purse promised to pay me something if I'd bid for a black suitcase at an auction. What was the matter with her? Laryngitis? She was trying to keep somebody from noticing her. But she must have weakened in the final stretch. What do you mean? I won the bid with a thousand bucks. But when I came back, the gal was gone. And you were left holding the bag. What was in it? A saxophone and a grocer reeds. You could buy the whole outfit with a $5 down payment. What makes it worth a thousand? I don't know, Father. The sax belonged to Charlie Reiser. A guy named Dunlap offered me 200 bucks for it. All that money for a saxophone, and they wouldn't allow me 40 bucks on that old organ. Dunlap slugged me when my back was turned and piled up a lead. Did the sax go for free? Somebody paid for it. When I woke up, there was a lot of blood on the floor. Yours? It was unclaimed, but I have an idea a body's going to turn up without it. You have nothing but murder on your mind, Johnny. Why don't you settle down with a good book? If Warcheck tags me, I'll have to borrow yours, Father. Right now, I need you to check on a few people for me. Sure, but I'll need a couple of names for them first. You know a lot of the combo boys, Father. Check up on Charlie Reiser's friends, especially his women. And find out where Larry Dunlap fits in. Will you do it, Father? Yes, Johnny, I'll do it. But if I find out you're calling them wrong, I'll drop over to Warcheck's side. Thanks, Father. If you help me out of this, you're a good guy. You're an angel. But stop pushing me. I'm not that anxious yet.
When I left Father Leahy, I ran over my leads. You could have counted them on one finger and you'd still have to cheat. The only guy worth looking up was the auctioneer on Eddy Street. Maybe that was all revenge. Why did he tell Warcheck that I took that thousand bucks back? Well, I figured I'd find out, so I grabbed a cab back to his store. When I got there, the joint was locked up, but a big neon sign blinked the name J.C. Cole. There was another light coming from the back, so I followed it down. Inside, Cole was working over his cash register tape. I didn't knock, and right away he started making funny noises in his throat. I noticed he was wearing a vest without a tie, and his sleeves were rolled up with big rubber bands. His elbows stuck out, and they were red and knotted up like a baby's face with cramps. And then he made his opening bid. It's a little late. Uh, what can I sell you, mister? A straight story. Huh? The one you told headquarters had too many frills. Hey, wait a minute. You're the same fellow who bought that suitcase. You got a good head, friend. How good is it on robbery? It, it was dark. I thought it was you, so I called the cops. You started fast, but you're fading in the stretch. A thousand bucks was gone. I figured you took your money back. That's an early mistake. It wasn't my dough. Y you sound like you're mad. Is that a gun in your pocket, then? If it makes you talk about that suitcase, I'll say yes. I don't know what you mean. I said you were taking your chances. A ton of bricks, a ton of gold, remember? i, I got to make a living, you know. You don't have to crowd them in. What gives a sex a thousand dollar price tag? Huh? I don't know, I tell you. I, I, I don't know what thing. Yeah, well, we'll go into politics later. I think you're lying. I, I, it, it was just another suitcase, an old leather suitcase with a sex inside. I, I just tell you, I, I don't know a thing. Yeah, keep it up, fella. You'll tell me everything that way. Now, how did you know there was a sex in that case if you never opened it? Well, I... Now, listen, mister, let's be friends. I got a little money. Let's be friends. Go on. I was just trying to get a little ahead. I got a wife and a kid, a big kid, so I switched saxophones. I took out the original sax with the reeds and put in an older one. What'd you do with the original? It was a pretty nice one, brand new, so, so, so I sold it to someone, uh, reeds and all, for $200. You're slowing down. Who's someone, a relative? He's a friend named Bud, but, uh, Bud Overbeck. He plays tennis sax at the downbeat club. That, that original was something special, huh? Yeah, you should have held out for a thousand bucks on both ends. Now, listen, fella, but, but Bud's a friend, a good friend on my wife's side. You won't hurt him, will you? I'll send you a pint if he believes. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. I'll say that. Anything else, huh? Yeah. Stop stuttering. You'll give that kid of yours a complex. <laughs> When he opened the door, you could tell he wanted to shake me worse than a summer cold. I didn't like him any better, but he'd given me something solid to work on. So I got over to the club downbeat. It's a jazz cellar that warms over King Oliver at six bits a throw. Five-piece combo was writing a chorus slow and easy, and you knew the only notes they ever read were on IOUs. There were a dozen or so jazz fans huddled around the bandstand, and if you looked real close at their faces, you saw something that looked like pain. I asked the bartender who Overbeck was, and he pointed out the blonde kid with a face made of warm putty playing a black saxophone. I walked backstage to a small dressing room where the boys grabbed their second wind with a short one. When I opened the door, Claire Underwood stood there holding her breath. Hello, Johnny. You look angry. Put away those daggers, hmm? I will, baby. I'll guess that you killed Riser for a saxophone. Guess again. Why should I kill anyone for a sax? Tell me why it's worth a grand, and I'll answer that one, too. All right, Johnny. I'm sentimental. Say, Charlie Riser was my boyfriend, and I wanted to keep his sax as a memory. Must have been quite a memory, baby. You didn't meet Charlie. But I did meet Larry Dunlap. He wanted the sax, too. Why? How would I know, Johnny? Maybe he was taking lessons. They weren't that kind. He has too good a lip. So have I. Only I use it differently. All right, stop puckering, sweetheart. I want some sense now. Please, Johnny. If you leave now, I'll give you double what I owe you from the auction. That's not enough. Look, baby, count up your bills and tell me what a murder rap is worth, huh? We'll haggle over it later, Johnny. Just meet me at the Ajax Hotel, and I promise you, you'll get a better figure. Yeah. You gonna add some interest? Come here, and I'll show you what I mean. I'm not running a service. I need some answers. Come on, come on. I want some action. Come on. You use your arms, Johnny. You got too big a mouth, baby. Somebody's gonna close it on you. Show me, Johnny. All right. Oh, the music stopped, Johnny. What do you care? We're not dancing. Johnny, please, you're, you're squeezing me too tight. Yeah, it's a bad habit. Now, tell me about that sax. Listen to me, Johnny. I told you I've got to see Overbeck first. I'll tell you everything later. Yeah, after you talk Overbeck out of his sax, huh? Yes. Is it a deal? You're too anxious to sign. I'll talk to Overbeck myself. All right, Johnny. I'll help you get him here quicker. Yeah, what are you going to do? Scream, Johnny. Scream. Listen. Louder, baby. You'll really need it in a minute. Help! 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 Hey, what's the matter? What was she screaming about, mister? She couldn't catch me. This man's drunk. He was trying to snatch my purse. Is that true, mister? Call a cop and find out. Yeah, I will. No, no. Please, uh, don't bother. Just get him out. Uh, just throw him out, mister Overbeck. You heard the lady, mister? Do I get rough? Save your strength, Overbeck. You'll need it later. <laughs> Claire had a 
nice act if you didn't mind playing straight man to a vulture. She draped herself on Overbeck's arm and she looked as cool as a vacation in Maine. As I walked out, Overbeck was still showing his teeth, but it didn't matter because you got the idea he wasn't strong enough to fight off a sneeze. Well, there wasn't much I could do except wait for Claire to show. But it started to drizzle, so I figured my best bet was her hotel. In the lobby, a rose-colored carpet with a touch of yellow jaundice led to the desk. The clerk told me she hadn't come in yet. But for five bucks, he could tell I was a friend. He gave me her key. I went upstairs, and when I opened Claire's door, I knew something was wrong. A lot of towels were thrown all over the floor, and everything was gone from the closet but the mothballs. Claire had skipped, and before I could walk out, Dunlap walked in. One hand was in his pocket, and the other had enough tape to wrap up a mummy. Can I come in, madame? You're old enough, Dunlap. Make up your own mind. I have. Where's Claire? You're early. I think she's still busy. Give me a magazine. I'll wait. It'll be a long one. I'm not hanging around. Oh, the fun's just beginning. Sit down. Sit down. I guess I am tired. Yeah, uh, this gun makes everybody drowsy. Now, uh, what's your time with Claire? Nothing that's deep-rooted. Are you writing a column? Yeah, the obituary, and you're going to make the morning deadline. You're too cocky, Dunlap. Don't turn your back. I won't. Claire blew her chance. The best she could do was disarm. Yeah, you ruined my carpet. When they pass your cup around, I'll be generous. In the meantime, you're going to stick around until Claire brings that black saxophone. I hope she's got some food in the icebox. What do you mean? Well, if you're waiting for that sax, we're going to starve to death. Claire's not going to show. What makes you a prophet? A guy named Bud Overbeck. He had the sax last, and Claire was working him over for it. I'll work you over for less. What are the rest of her plans? She was warm. Maybe she left smoke signal. All right. You're getting too stubborn. Put away the gun, Dunlap. You can only use one arm. I'll clean the bases with this index finger. Pick a spot to fall. Hey, don't clutter up the floor now, Dunlap. We got company. What's this, the wrong room? Claire said we'd be alone. We are, just the three of us. Who's he, Madero? Huh? What are you talking about? Claire told me to come here. She told me to wait for her. Look, fella, save your lip for another chorus. Just tell me where she left you. I don't feel so good. She was at the downbeat club. She was helping me put my sacks away. I I just came up here to wait. We were going to be alone. All right, fella. I'm cutting down the crowd. You're with Madero now. I'm leaving. Yeah, I, I'm going home, too. I feel sick. I'm going home. You'll never make it on your knees. What's the matter? I don't know. I guess I gave the new horn too big a ride tonight. I got a weak heart. Your eyes aren't too strong either. You're walking right into that closet. They told me not to play so hard. Maybe I played too hard. Help me, fella. You look familiar. I seen you somewhere, huh? You... You look fuzzy. Yeah. I don't know. I, I feel sick. Someone must have slipped me something. I... I never felt like... Like this before. I'm sick. Real sick, I'm... You'll never get any sicker, fella. Overbeck was dead even before he had a chance to see if Gabriel paid his boy's scale. He hit the floor and turned over on his back, and you figured he'd cross the River Jordan with a backstroke. I got a good look at him now. His face was all twisted up like bed sheets after a nightmare, and up near his hairline, a long, thin scar ran into his scalp. Well, I didn't know what killed Overbeck, but whatever it was, he didn't get two weeks' notice. I figured if homicide caught me here, I'd get my walking papers, too, right down to the last 20 feet. I started for the door, but Warchick opened it for me. He looked at the body and went over to me. You on a spree, Madero? If you're footing the bill, Warchick. The state will from now on. Now, tell me about the guy on the floor. He's dead. Must have had parents. What's his name? Bud Overbeck. He was a musician at the Downbeat Club. Yeah. Tell me some more. Roll him, Warchick. Maybe he's got a diary. Wallet. All right, Madero. How long you been here? Why? The wallet's empty. Well, that's too bad. Your girlfriend's going to have to get along in last week's presents. I trail a guy named Dunlap up to this apartment, and I find you and a dead body. Now, there's a tie any way you look at it. Mm-hmm. Now, just what happened? I don't know, Warchek. I didn't see the picture. I just tagged by for the end. You know? Must have been a sad one. I think he's poisoned. I don't like the look in his eyes. Get the girl who put it there. Well, just give me a hint. Huh? Overbeck was playing caveman with Claire Underwood before he came up here. What does that give him besides hair? Maybe a Mickey. When I left, she was warming up an argument for his saxophone. She get it? She didn't. Dunlap's losing man hours. He just walked out of here, and I think she's on his list. Yeah. I'm beginning to get an idea now myself. Does it hurt? You and the Underwood girl are running some kind of a racket for that saxophone. She left you behind her front for her. You haven't seen her, Warchick. She doesn't need that kind of help. But you will when I get through checking. Still got a few calls to make, and I want the lab to work over the body. By then, I'll have enough to come back and hold you, my dear. You couldn't hold a lap dog with a suction pump. All right, big shot. I'll go a long way to get you for this. A long way. You got the drag, were you? Yeah. It's going to slow you down a little. (laughs) 
Warchek wanted to mother the body until the coroner came, and when I left, he was squeezing himself into a chair. He fit tighter than a whale in a crib. Yeah, you can word it any way you like, but the big riddle was that saxophone. Claire had it, and Dunlap wanted it, and a couple of guys died for it. My only alibi was Dunlap, but you might as well ask Khan to hold still for Lewis. I buzzed back to the office, but there was no message from Father Leahy. So I stared out the window for a while, wondering how to bake a cake with a dynamite charge when the phone rang. Yeah. Hello, Johnny. This is Father Leahy. What'd you find out, Father? It's not pleasant, Johnny. I'm down at the morgue. The lab report on Bud Oberbeck just came in. He died of poisoning, huh, Father? The bitter kind. Oberbeck's heart couldn't stand all that dope. Hmm? Coroner found a used saxophone reed in Oberbeck's pocket. It was soaked in hop. So that's what made that saxophone so big. The grosser reeds. That's right, Johnny. Oberbeck was absorbing the stuff while he played. Oh. He probably never knew what hit him. Well, what about Riser? How does he figure? Riser was making his pin money peddling dope to nightclubs. He was getting his shipments from Mexico. Well, how did Claire and Dunlap figure? They were a couple of partners who wanted to ease out Riser and go into business for themselves. The idea must have gone to Claire's head. She's doing a solo now, and Dunlap thinks she has the sax. Warcheck feels the same way about you, Johnny. He's out to tag you for everything. He's smarter than that. I don't know him that well. But it adds up in his book because he thinks you're leaving town. Hmm? Someone's booked a passage on the 2 a.m. plane from Mexico this morning in the name of Jay Madero. I'm being jockeyed, Father. It's either Claire or Dunlap. They're both as black as sin. Maybe so, but Warcheck still thinks you're the dark horse. <laughs> Up until now, it was like trying to sell a toupee to a ball-headed eagle. But when the turn comes, everything happens in a hurry, and you began breaking more records than a disc jockey with a hangover. If Father Leahy was right, Claire or Dunlap had enough dreams in that saxophone to start a waltz contest, and I knew if they both got out of town, Warcheck would be around to tag me for the last dance. So I got out to Mills Field, and out on the far end of the strip, a twin-engine plane was warming up. Claire was standing with her back toward me, and even from here, you could see what a stiff tailwind could do to a landing gear. When she saw me, she raised her eyebrows and figured her temperature was even higher. Sorry I had to borrow your name, Johnny. You're too small for it, baby. I got a big ego. And that gun bolsters it, huh? That's my story. Well, tell it to homicide. They'll take a nibble on either you or Dunlap. Better throw them Dunlap. I got a date in Mexico City. It's a blind one, baby. You're going in the wrong direction. Larry, what are you doing here? I thought you... I want those reeds, baby. He'll be peddling pencils when I'm through with you. I'll leave the sides, too, baby. I'll be lonely. You won't need that kind of music where you're going, Larry. You're the ones I talk, baby. I trusted you. We were going to do this together. I trusted you. We all make mistakes. You got the short end. I'll stretch it a little. You got another chance. Let's team up again. Sorry, Larry. I'm crowding you out. You only think so. Now get out of my way. I got to make the plane. Make a grave first. I want that stuff. I won't miss again. Stay away, Larry. Put up a sign. Yeah. You missed again. <laughs> Give me the gun. No, I'm selfish. I'll hold on. Pull him off me, Madera. Pull him off. There's a lot. All right, baby. You you run out of chances. It's my turn now. No. Please, Larry. Put the gun away. You win. I'll split it with you now. You win. Honest, Larry, you win. Just to show you I agree. I'll... You're through, guy. Drop the gun. Yeah. Uh, what are the odds of my getting away in that plane? 70, 30, maybe. Uh... Things are too tough at 50-50. Come on, I'll ride downtown with you. Well, Dunlap told the whole story down at headquarters. It seems that Riser, Claire, and he were buying dope from Mexico and peddling it here in the form of soaked-up reeds. Riser was contact man in Mexico, but the only way they knew him down there was by his black saxophone. Claire and Dunlap decided to narrow the profits down to two by shooting Riser and taking over. Claire used the gun and, well, that started her to thinking that she could do even better with a single act. She needed that black sax, though. Riser got wind of it and hid the sax with the reeds in the basement. His landlady found it after he was tumbled and sold it to that auction house. And Claire had me buy it and then followed me back to the office where she tried to peg down Dunlap. The sax she took turned out to be a phony because the auctioneer had already sold the black one to Bud Overbank. The track was switched to him, but not soon enough. Overbeck didn't know the reeds were loaded, and after an all-night jam session, he folded up with a heart attack. Well, Warcheck asked only one question. Wasn't it tough luck for an innocent guy like Overbeck? I don't know. At least there was one time he played right out of this world. <laughs> John 
Johnny Madero, Pier 23, starring Jack Webb as Johnny Madero, has been presented by the Mutual Network. Johnny Madero is written by Herb Margulis and Lou Morheim. Gail Gordon played Father Light Leahy. And Bill Conrad played Inspector Warcheck of Homicide. Others in the cast were Helene Burke, Bob Holton, Herb Butterfield, Irvin Lee, and Herb Rollinson. Original music was composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and the entire production was directed by Nat Wolf. We invite you to listen again next week over most of these stations when Mutual presents another adventure in the life of Johnny Madero, Pier 23. Tony Lafrano speaking. <laughs> program came to you from Hollywood. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Johnny Dollar. This is Brad Porter, Johnny. Miniatures. Miniatures? You know those tiny paintings, portraits usually done on porcelain? Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. But I don't think I ever heard of any Reimer collection. A half a dozen of them stolen from the Reimer galleries in Philadelphia. Cost us something over $20,000 insurance. Never found them, huh? Well, here's the thing. I just got a phone call from Wilbert Reimer. He wants to see you just as quickly as possible. About those miniatures? He wouldn't say, Johnny, but I'll bet on it. And he insisted that you and only you be brought in. Huh. Funny, since I had nothing whatsoever to do with the case. Well, why not, with your reputation? But I thought you usually had a staff man to secure. Plus the fact that our company investigator at that time was Jerry Pitcher. Jerry Pitcher? Yep. The one who was suspected of complicity in some of the cases he was supposed to be investigating? That's the one. Well, wasn't he suspect in that robbery? Yeah, but neither we nor the police could ever pin anything on him. Hmm. All we could do was fire him and warn the other insurance companies to look out for him. Fred. Yeah? Any idea where Jerry Pitcher's operating now? Not the least. After the Reimer episode, he simply disappeared. There was talk of his having skipped the country, but nobody was sure of it. Hmm. I wonder if Reimer suddenly got a lead on him. There's one way to find out. Okay, Freddy, I'll grab the first train. CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Of the Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, Philadelphia office. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Reimer Collection matter. Expense account item one, eight twenty-five train fare and incidentals, Hartford to Philadelphia, PA. Item two, seventy cents for a taxi to the Reimer Galleries over on Walnut Street. Mr. Reimer turned out to be short, slightly gray, and very, very British. Uh, let's go into my office, Mr. Dollar, where we can talk and discuss. Yeah, sure, Mr. Reimer. Well, the art business must be pretty good with a crowd like this in the store. Pardon me, miss. In here, please. Hey, thanks. Well, the gallery is rather well patronized this morning, isn't it? Let me sit down, please. Thank you. Uh, I must say, Mr. Dollar, that I many times wished that you had been assigned to the case when these priceless miniatures that I brought to me from Europe were stolen a year ago. Oh, how so? Well, they were so vastly uninsured, sir. A man of your capabilities would have been able to find them for them. Yeah, maybe. You, instead of that, that Jerry Pitcher. I understand that, although nobody could prove anything, you suspected him of somehow being involved in that loss. Oh, yes. If only because of his failure to investigate it properly. But now look here, sir. This stuff, this check has a direct relationship with the unusual number of people visiting the gallery this morning. Uh Uh-huh. This check was made out by you? Yes. I intend to put it in the mails before the day is over. To the Mono Guarantee Insurance Company. $4,050? The exact amount I received for the loss of one of the miniatures, a genuine Pellegrini. 
But you collected something like 20,000 in all. On the 6th it was stolen, yes. But now, suddenly, and most mysteriously, the Pellegrini has been returned to me. What? And, of course, the people out there in the gallery, most of them connoisseurs, would be interested in seeing it again, wouldn't they? Yeah, I should think so. As a matter of fact, I've already found a buyer for it. Who? Oh, uh, Mr. Charles Cunningham, one of my regular clients. Well, just how did you happen to get this one back? Two days ago, when I opened the place, I, I found it lying inside the door, on the floor, under the letter slot with the morning mail. Just lying there? But it was wrapped in a bit of coarse wrapping paper, the sort of greengrocer might use, and it was tied up with a piece of dirty string. No note or anything with it? Nothing. They're very mysterious. But why was it returned? Who knows? Would you call it a pretty well-known piece, one that might easily be recognized? Oh, definitely. And, and, of course, there were pictures of it in the papers and of the others at the time that they were stolen. In other words, anybody having it stood a pretty good chance of being caught if he tried to sell it. Well, that does seem to be a logical conclusion, doesn't it? Yet there's always the black market. I mean, abroad in Paris... A lot of fine art that was stolen during the war has suddenly shown up over there. Yes, and I understand that otherwise perfectly honest collectors haven't hesitated to purchase it. Uh, things taken from the Louvre, from various museums in Germany, and... Well, I with Mr. Dollar, if the thief were caught, smuggling the miniatures out of this country... Yeah, I know what you mean. But now, why return these to you? There are one of them, Mr. Dollar. Okay, one of them, but why? Well, there is, of course, one possibility. Yeah. Like what? Well, if the thief himself were a connoisseur, one who would fully appreciate the value of the miniatures, well, I'm certain that he would never bring himself to simply destroy them. That is, after realizing that he couldn't very well dispose of them without being caught. So rather than destroy them, he decided to give up and return them to you? Well, it is a possibility, isn't it? But he returned only one of them. And, of course, this theory of yours rules out Jerry Pitcher. Well, yes. But it's puzzling, isn't it? Uh. Wait now, the paper and the string you found wrapped around it. What? Where are they? I'd like to see them. Well? Oh, how utterly stupid of me. What do you mean? I... I'm afraid I threw them out of the trash, Mr. Dollar. It was taken away yesterday. Oh, great. You might have found fingerprints on them, mightn't you? Yeah. And they might have given us a lead on whoever sold those things in the first place. I'm terribly sorry. It was terribly stupid of me. My reason for sending them for you I hope that by finding who returned this one, you might find the rest of them. Sure. In which case, your insurance company, well, needless to say, I would gladly return all of the money they paid to me. Make them pretty happy, wouldn't it? But now... Yeah. They might even feel like handing me a nice big fat commission. Now I've destroyed one possible clue. Well, there must be others, if I can dig them up. Oh, I hope so, Mr. Dollar. Or, of course, we, uh, we could just sit here and wait for the other five to be returned to you. I presume you're jesting, sir. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid so. Yes. So how will you proceed? Well, I'll tell you something, Mr. Reimer. Yes? Yes, Mr. Dollar? I haven't the least idea. And now, Act Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Rhymer Collection Matter. Expense account item two, 60 cents for a cab to Fred Porter's office at Bono Guarantee Insurance. And it was about the stolen miniatures that Mr. Reimer sent for you. And it was, Freddy. Over $20,000 worth, Johnny. Well, is he some idea now about who might have taken them? Fred, one of them, a Pellegrini, has just been returned to him. What? Yeah. Reimer's sending you a check in the amount your company paid him for that particular one. Well, who returned it to him? I don't know. He doesn't know. It was simply pushed through the letter slot in the door of the gallery. No clues, no nothing. Johnny, whoever returned it must have been the thief. Or someone who knows the thief has contact with him. So if you can find this person, whoever brought it back, we may be able to recover the other many times. Yeah. Did the police really do a job when they were stolen a year ago? Yes, and the only suspect was that so-called investigator we'd mistakenly assigned to Reimer because he seemed to know something about art. He was familiar with Reimer's place. I was Jerry Pitcher. That's right. But they couldn't prove a thing against him. And after all, it was only Reimer's theory that Jerry might have been mixed up in it. Why? I don't know. It may have been because of the sloppy way he handled his end of the investigation. And don't forget, it was about that time we learned that Pitch's reputation wasn't 
all that it might have been. Have you got any idea where Jerry might be now? As I told you over the phone, Johnny, there was talk that he'd skipped the country. Reason in itself to be suspicious of him, if you ask me. I'll tell you this, Fred. If he did skip, and if he had those miniatures with him, the one place he might have gone to... Listen, mind if I use your phone? It was right beside you. Help yourself. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Hello, operator. I want to put through a call to Paris, France. Paris? Johnny... Just take it easy, Freddy, and stay close to this phone so that you can hear. My call was to a strange little character whose name is de Marsac, but who calls himself a Chagri, the gray cat. His knowledge of the Paris underworld and everything that goes on in it is nothing short of fabulous. Yeah, because he himself is very much a part of it, of what goes on there. Not a single important work of art could ever hit the black market without his knowing about it. How, how we miss you, darling. This is your oldest, your dearest friend, Le Chagri. Oldest and dearest friend, huh? But of course. Oh, sure. Now listen to Marsac. I want some information. Maybe you can give it to me. Hmm. For a small fee, perhaps? Mm, perhaps. See, uh, a thousand dollar American... A thousand? You're out of your mind. Mm-hmm. Oh, 500? Uh, maybe a couple of hundred, if it's worth anything. Now, take it easy, Johnny. Let me handle this. Now, listen to my sack. Well, speak, monsieur. Well, I'm looking for a man named Jerry Pitcher. Ever see or hear of him? Jerry Pitcher? Oh, no, 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 monsieur. You're sure? Yes, I'm sure. Then what about the Reimer collection of miniatures? Oh, Marie. Yeah, there's some tiny paintings on porcelain. Yeah, but of course. They were here on the black market. You get that? I sure did. Go on, Johnny. Monsieur? When, de Marsac? When did you see them? Well, it is important. Are you kidding? Of course it is. Then, then you will pay me uh, 400, perhaps? <sighs> 200. Now, when? Huh. Oh, me. Well, three years ago. Three years ago? We, we won the purchase for the gallery there in the United States. Oh, well, that's a lot of help. But who who brought them for the Reimer Gallery? Who purchased them? Do you know? Well? Uh-huh. So that is the question. That's right. Well, then, then 300, perhaps? Oh, oh it's worth it, monsieur. Okay, 250. Now, tell me who. What well, it was, monsieur. Reimer himself. What? Reimer himself bought them there in the black market? Oui, monsieur. Ah, I see. Well, so perhaps it is really worth 400? Is no, on second thought, De Marsac, I'm afraid it doesn't mean a thing. I'll mail you a check. Well, of course, the last time I saw it... What? What's that? Well? Okay, 400. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was six months ago, sure. In June? Oui, June. I had the shop of my very dear friend. Oh, that scoundrel, that terrible crook, Francois Dubesson. Defense. But not for long. What do you mean? Because he could not sell them. They were what you call uh, too hot. Huh? Because they were known to have been so recently stolen from the gallery there in America. Too hot, huh? So whoever had them brought them back here. Excuse me, monsieur. All right, de Marsac. Uh, who was that fence that Dubosan, uh, who was he trying to sell them for? This man, Pitcher? Oh, no, no, monsieur. I told you I never heard of him. Well, who then? Well, alas, I do not know. And with a clever man like Dubison, well, 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 perhaps for you, my oldest, my dearest friend, and it might take some time and expense. Then no bother yet. Well, monsieur... Forget it. I'll send you a check. Only you can send it to him, Fred. Save putting it on my expense account. Oh, wait a minute, Johnny. If he can find out who was trying to peddle the miniatures over oh, there... Oh, you underestimate Le Chagri. What? If he's seen them, he knows what they're worth. So what? By the time he got that information, you'd have to pay him a thousand, maybe two. Well, even so, Johnny, if it leads us to the thief and the other miniatures that were stolen... It leads us to him or merely tells us who he is. What's the difference? And I thought you were convinced of Sherry Pitcher. Well, who else? Why? I don't know. Ask the police. Ask Reimer. Maybe I will. Or maybe I got a better idea. Item four, a dollar fifty for a taxi out to the Museum of Art, where I finally ran down one of the curators, a man by the name of Kingman. Well, of course I know the Reimer miniatures, Mr. Dollar. Priceless. And such a shame that they've been lost to the world of art. Stolen. Yeah. Uh. Stolen by a fool. Well, how do you mean, sir? Well, I mean the thief would never dare to try to sell them. But such well-known pieces, anyone anywhere would recognize them, would see that he was brought to justice. Maybe. 
How much would you say those six little paintings are worth? About? Two or three years ago, not very much. But now that their history is known, well, this often happens with works of art, Mr. Dollar. How much, Mr. Kingman? Well, somewhere I would say... That is, if they are ever found. Yes. Somewhere in the neighborhood of $200,000. You're serious? Well, among them is a body, for instance, and a genuine Pellegrini, yes. A Pellegrini? Pellegrini the Elder. And one of our wealthy collectors, Mr. Charles Cunningham, would pay Cunningham. almost... Cunningham? Listen, do you know where I can find him? I believe I have his address and phone number in my office. Good, come on. But to why all this interest, Mr. Dollar? I'll tell you about it on the way to your office, Mr. Kingman. Item five, ten cents for a phone call, only to learn that Mr. Charles Cunningham was out of town for the day. So item six, fourteen dollars even, is for a dinner, a room, and some breakfast at the Bellevue Stratford. Then early the next morning, item seven, another dime for another phone call. Insurance investigator, did you say? That's right, Mr. Cunningham. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Dollar? Just answer one question, please. How much are you paying the Rymer Galleries for a Pellegrini miniature? You mean the one that was stolen a year ago that has been recently recovered? That's the one I mean. What's the price? Oh. <laughs> well, now, I... I'm afraid that's something How much, I... sir? Well, it was a private sale, Mr. Dollar. A confidential transaction, then. Well. Well? I don't know whether you realize it or not, but only recently has the value of those miniatures become... Yeah, I know all about that. How much, Mr. Cunningham? Now, look uh, Would you rather be hauled in as accessory to a fraud? Genuine? Oh, it probably is. But you said I might be involved in a fraud. How much? I am giving Reimer 20500 for it. Maybe you'd better call your bank and have them stop the check. Stop the Thank check. you, Mr. Cunningham. It looks as though my hunch was right. What? Goodbye, sir. <laughs> Item eight, a buck for a taxi to Fred Porter's office. Item nine, another buck for a cab for the two of us to the Rymer Galleries. Will you please tell me what this is all about, Johnny? Have you got on the trail of Jerry Pitcher? No, Freddy, I haven't even bothered trying. Hey, listen, do you handle all of Rymer's insurance? I, I wonder his premiums do. Well, as a matter of fact, rather large, but slightly overdue now. Oh, why didn't you tell me that? What difference does it make? Well, if business were good for a man like that, wouldn't he keep up his insurance payments? I wonder how much else he owes. What are you getting at? Funny. Looks like we've arrived now. You know, you still haven't told me why we've come here to the gallery at the crack of dawn. Hey, yeah, buddy. Now, keep the chance. Yeah, man. Yeah. See, Mr. Reimer's already opened shop. Johnny? Come on, Fred. Well, Mr. Reimer. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I am indeed glad to see you. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, good morning, Mr. Porter. Mr. Reimer. Uh, look here, Mr. Dollar, here on this table. What? Another of the miniatures, a Lombardi. What? Yes, lying on the floor under the mail slot, just like the other that was returned. I can't believe it. Here, let me see. No, no, no touch it. And you see, Mr. Dollar, this time, I saved the string and wrapper for you. Oh? Why? Fingerprints? Yes, of course. Only I doubt if we'll find any. But you were most explicit. Matter of fact, if you didn't wear gloves in wrapping it up, you were pretty stupid. I beg your pardon. Ask that I be dragged in so that nobody would suspect you, huh? Suspect me? Johnny, what of Jerry Pitcher? Who knows where Jerry is, and who cares? Mr. Reimer, when was your last trip to Europe? In June, wasn't it? I make many trips to Europe in order to... In June? Well, yes, yes, it was, but, but now look here. Let's go back to your office. I want to look at your bank statements for the past year. Mr. Dollar. Or would you rather I just call in the cops? I don't know what you're talking about. Real honest business you've been running, huh? Of course. But you didn't hesitate to buy stolen, smuggled artworks on the Paris black market. Now, look here, sir. I suppose I should have started thinking when you told me those miniatures were considerably underinsured. What? Yeah, because you insured them before their true value really became known. But by the time you did know it, you'd already pulled the fake robbery, collected the insurance on them to keep your business going. Well, I've had a piece. You tried to sell them in Paris then, but they were too hot. That was in June. But you still needed money, didn't you? But have I denied it? So that you had to bring them back. After all, you'd only collected about 20000 on them. Now you could sell them for 200000 at least. Is this true? Ah, pretty nice profit. Even after you got through returning what you'd collected from the insurance company. Mr. Reimer? And how to get them back? 
have them mysteriously reappear one at a time and give out that cock and bull story about the thief not daring to sell them without being caught. Well, Mr. Reimer. Well, uh, do you think, uh, if I produce the others, if I, if I write and sign a full confession, the authorities will be more gentle with me? Son of a gun, why do they do it? Won't they ever learn? What's the matter with people, anyhow? Some people, that is. Oh, well, expense account total, including the trip back to Hartford, thirty-five fifty. And, Freddy, don't forget, a nice fee on this one, as well as a check to Le Chagri over there in Paris. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Harry Bartell, Ben Wright, Forrest Lewis, Junius Matthews, and Marvin Miller. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Hello, sweetheart. It's only me. Oh, Sam. Why so modest? Women, Effie. Age cannot weather nor custom stale their infinite variety. Huh? Against their incalculable wiles, mere man is a leaf in the wind. Oh, Sam, do you read... Oh. Who was she and how windy was it? Cyclonic, Effie. We had to close every window in the house. But I... If you will just contain your natural feminine curiosity for a few moments, I'll be right down to dictate my report on the bow window caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. To every man who says, I don't use a hair tonic, or I don't believe in a hair tonic, I say this. Decide for yourself, but don't decide until you've tried Wild Root Cream Oil, the entirely different hair tonic. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil, and it contains soothing lanolin. What's more, it grooms your hair the right way, neatly and naturally. So get the big economy-sized bottle and the handy new tube at your drug or toilet goods counter. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. A bow window. Hmm? A bow window. A bow window is a bay window that you look into instead of out of. Look into instead of out? Oh. Oh, Sam. (laughs) Get your book, Panther Girl, and slink on in. 
What was she trying to see through the, the, the bow window? Hmm? I mean, whose house was it? Her own. But if it was her own house, then why would she... Well, it just at... goes to show you, darling, what some women will stoop to. It does? Mm-hmm. There was a low window. Oh. Well, whenever you're ready, Sam. <sighs> uh, date, November 10th. Ninth. Ninth. Uh, correct. 1947. To Dr. Helmut Ries. I was right for once. Yeah. Oh. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the bow window caper. Dear Dr. Ries, I know that this report will not make pleasant reading for you, but you paid for it, so here it is. As far as I was concerned, it all started on Thursday morning when you called at my office. In your story, I gathered it had been going on for some time. You, you will say these are merely the actions of a jealous woman, Mr. Spade. But I assure you there's more to it than that. It is, it, it, it must be a carefully thought out plan to ruin my career, my, my whole life. In uh, what way, Dr. Rees? She spies on my private consultations. Insults my women patients. I can no longer even keep a nurse for more than a week at a time. Scenes, hysterics, she, outbursts of violence. I cannot continue my work under such conditions. Well, why don't you give her a divorce? Why, no, no, no. This is not her desire. If it were, it would, it would be simple. No, she wants to bring me to ruin. She wants to see me on my knees in front of the populace. Why? That is what I want to find out. Why? Doctor, I think you ought to take this case to a head doctor. No, I have consulted a psychiatrist. The examiner. She's perfectly competent mentally. For you see, there is here already some mystery. For which one comes to a detective. Uh, how long has this been going on, Dr. Reyes? Since three months only. But in this time, she has reduced me to utter desolation. Dr. Reyes was a very good divorce lawyer right down the hall from my house. No, no, no. I discussed the matter of a divorce with her a few days back. This was her answer. Uh, you see, a receipt for the purchase of a gun. And this note in her handwriting. I hope you will not force me to use this. Esther. Yes. Well, what do you think she has in mind? Murder or suicide? She refused to discuss it. But one thing I have noticed. Since she has bought this gun, a new development, a strange man watches my house. Several times I have caught him following me. Well, she might have hired a detective to check on whether you visit a lawyer. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps it is very simple, but it is all too strange to be harmless. <laughs> I uh, half-heartedly agreed that it might be, Dr. Reese, and when your check for 100 bucks didn't bounce, I went to work wholeheartedly. I reached your house on Pacific Avenue just as the street lights were going on. It's a quiet neighborhood, so I could hear it before I got close enough to read the number on the door. Get out! Get out of this house! Get out! You have no... They seemed to be slugging their way toward the back of the house, so I decided to risk an entrance. I found the doorbell, and I was about to punch it when I caught sight of your mystery man. He was crossing a clump of shrubbery that grew under the bow window at the corner of the house. He was still there with his eyes glued to the window when I walked up behind him. Hey, let go of me. Let go. Come on, come on. You're going inside. Listen, I'm not just a snooper. I'm I didn't only... say you were. I'm just inviting you inside for a better look. Now, I'm warning you. If you don't let go of me, I'm... Stop squirming, will you? Get <laughs> out! The kick he landed on me wasn't according to the Wrestling Association's rules, but I let him get away with it, mainly because I couldn't move for three or four minutes, and by that time, he disappeared down the street. When I recovered my faculties and staggered back to the door, I didn't bother ringing the bell. I just walked in. The hen fight was still going on somewhere in the upper reaches of the house. Then a door burst open on the upper landing, and a girl in a nurse's uniform ran down the stairs toward me... Pursued by a pale little woman with a pink face who was brandishing a pair of brass fire songs. You brushed past me, Dr. Reese, and headed off the pursuer. Esther, stop it! Stop it at once! Have you gone crazy? Give me those fire songs. Give them to me! What's the matter, Helmut? Afraid I'll mar your light of love's beauty? What started this? I caught her creeping about the kitchen. kitchen. She was going to poison my food. Explain to you, Mrs. Reese. The doctor said. Oh, don't, 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 don't bother explaining, what? Mr. Roberts. These morbid fancies of hers. Don't think I don't know what goes on in that office. That office where I'm not allowed anymore. That's only because you make the patient so nervous, Esther. I know what goes on. You and those women. That will do, Esther. Go to your room. Very well. 
But I won't have that woman in this house another day, Helmuth. Is that understood? Go to your room, Miss I'm going, I'm going. But remember what I said. I warned you both. I can't stand There, there, Miss Swabbins. Now don't. There. I can't stand anymore, Doctor. I tell you, it's making me a nervous <clears throat> wreck. I just... Uh, Dr. Reese, huh? Oh, Mr. Spade. You saw, you heard? Yeah. Uh, uh, come into my office. We'll talk. I think we'd better. Uh, doctor... There's still one more patient waiting to see you, Doctor. Well, just uh, yeah, have her wait a little longer. Yeah. Uh, uh, this this way, Mr. Spade. Nurse, how much longer? Well, the doctor wait? will see you just as soon as he possibly can. Have you been feeling any better, Mrs. Crowley? Uh, sit down, Mr. Spade. Thanks, but I can say what I have to say standing. Your wife's a very tragic woman, Doctor. Uh, I wish I could help her. I wish I could help you, too, but I can't. You heard her threat against Miss Robbins. Was that a joke? There's nothing funny about jealousy. Uh, but there is this man who watches the house and the gun she bought. I collared him outside just now. Oh, well, did you get him to talk? No, but I wouldn't worry about him if I were you. And about that gun, the Constitution says every citizen shall have the right to bear arms. Even Parnell Thomas can't do uh, Mr. Spade... I have not yet told you all. If I... Oh, Doctor, I'm, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt, but this patient, she's been waiting for more than an hour. Well, who, who is she? Mrs. Cavanaugh. Cavanaugh? Cavanaugh? Who? Well, has she been here before? Of course, last week. Here, here's her card. Oh. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, uh I'd, I'd better get it over. Uh, send her in. Yes, Doctor, and... And, Doctor, I'm resigning. I'll finish the day, of course, and, and then I'm through on... I'm sorry. Yes, yes, well. Very well, Miss Robbins. I, I, I can't say that I blame you. Good luck. Goodbye, Doctor. Well, I'll be going along myself now, Doctor. Uh, no, 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 no. You must hear me out, Mr. Spade. I have not yet told all. If now, if you just wait until I have seen this patient, uh, please, Mr. Spade, please. Okay, I'll wait outside. Oh, I beg your pardon. I beg yes. your pardon. Uh, come on in, Mrs. So, uh, you're leaving the doctor's employ, uh, nurse? I am, I am. Well, Mr. Spade, how does it look from the grandstand? Messy? Mm-hmm. You don't mind if I finish cleaning out his desk? Go right ahead. Thank you. What's the matter with Esther, anyway? Oh, I could sum the whole thing up in a single five-letter word, shall I? You have. Are you going to walk out on him? Aren't you? Yes. Yes, I am. Oh, but Esther isn't jealous of your type. If you don't mind my mentioning it. I feel heartened to think that you noticed I was different. Oh, I did, Mr. Spade. I really did. You don't seem uh, particularly nursey to me, either. I'm not. My, you have a fast pulse, Mr. Spade. Uh, yes, I've uh, been feeling very weak the last few minutes. I uh, need care. Oh, you know, you don't eat enough apples, Mr. Spade. Well, I guess I've finished. Oh, there's that old contact. I wonder. Mr. Spade, will you tell the doctor I've left and thank him for me again? Aren't you going to see him before you go? No, no, I'm not. It only begged me to stay, and it's... Well, it's simply out of the question. Oh, the poor guy. I just don't know what I'd do if I were in his place. For you, Mr. Spade. <laughs> I did, and I told her. She told me I was a victim of hypertension and left me with my mouth open and no thermometer in it. Five minutes after she'd gone out to the front entrance, your wife came down the stairs looking knowingly at me and the door to the doctor's office and left by the same route. Ten minutes after that, I was halfway through a 1937 National Geographic that was the latest edition on the waiting room table, and it reached the third paragraph on the natural beauties of Winona County, Minnesota. But I never finished it. I will be back in a minute. The first thing I saw when I entered the room was Mrs. Cavanaugh, your patient patient. Why? Why did she do it? You, doctor, were standing over her, nervously twitching off the rubber glove from your right hand. You tested her throat for pulse, then listened to a stethoscope. It was purely a formality. One of the 38 caliber slugs had entered the right temple. The other had torn through the base of the skull. 
How did it happen? I, I don't know. I had completed the examination and walked over there to put my instruments away. When I turned, when I turned back, she had a gun in her hand. Before I could stop her, she pulled the trigger. Suicide, of course. Why? Well, I just told her the truth. That there was nothing I or any other doctor could do for her. That she had perhaps a month, perhaps less. She had suffered great pain, of course, for some time. Uh-huh. You saw her shoot herself, you say? Yes, yes. The gun, she took it out of my desk drawer. I'd removed it from my wife's room earlier today. I see. Well, doctor, this is the neatest suicide I ever saw. No powder burns, and from the way she's lying, she must have shot herself in the direction of that window, at least ten feet away. She screamed before the shots were fired and had time to fire a second bullet into her head and throw the gun across the room before she fell. Well, Helma, at last it's happened, hasn't it? Esther, leave this room. I told Helmuth one of the husbands would catch up with him. Pretty, wasn't she? I don't remember this one. The expression on your face might have been horror or fear or both, Dr. Reese. But your wife was smiling. When my eyes left her face, I noticed a leaf clinging to the hem of her coat. It might have come from the shrub that grew up against the house. And her shoes were splotched with mud that could have and probably did come from the cultivated flower bed just outside the bow window. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. Better than four out of five users of Wild Root Cream Oil say they prefer Wild Root Cream Oil to all other hair tonics. Here is new and even more conclusive evidence that Wild Root Cream Oil is again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. So if you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked... How does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. It gives you the advantages that men consider most important. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. That's like the oil of your skin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, back to the bow window caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Obviously, there were two equally good suspects in the Kavanaugh murder... Either your wife had killed her in a jealous rage, or you'd killed her with your wife's gun to frame her for the murder. I decided to let the police worry it out and went home to bed. The morning headlines were a bit of a surprise. Nurse sought in shooting a mystery woman. Item. The cops had found Celeste Robbins' fingerprints all over the murder gun. And item. Mrs. Cavanaugh, the murdered woman, had given a vacant lot as her address, and her body was lying unclaimed at the morgue. I decided to pay her a visit. Maxie, hey, Maxie. What? Oh, Sam. Sammy, my boy. Hey, it's good to look on you. How are you, Maxwell? Oh, fine, fine. What brings you here, Sam? The Kavanaugh woman. The Kavanaugh? Oh, Kavanaugh, huh? Well, let's see who's with us today. Uh, Stiftel, Milton, Schwartz, Kelly. I knew him. Nice guy. Feige. Aha. Uh-huh. Kavanaugh. Rose. Hello, Rose. Hey, Sam, don't you want to look at Rose? No, I've seen her. Oh. Yeah, just checked her back in. Autopsy. Say, you do collect queer ones, Sam. Mm. Now, you take her. Why would anybody in the world knock her off? In her condition, all he needed to do was wait. A month, a couple of weeks. Bad as that, huh? Worse. Anybody claim her yet? Well, they... Hello. Something we can do for you? 
My name is Cavanaugh. I've come for my wife. He was standing with his back to me, and I didn't get a good look at his face until he walked over to the desk with Master. The voice tipped me even before I saw the face. It was the man I'd caught outside your office window less than half an hour before the murder. If he recognized me, he didn't let it show. I waited while he went in with Maxie. When he came out, there were tears streaming down his face. I'd been waiting for two reasons. I had had some questions to ask him, and I had wanted to pay back that jolt he'd given me the night before. I left without doing either. Sam. Oh, sweetheart, any calls? Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide, yeah. uh, Dr. Reese, mm-hmm. and there's a girl waiting inside. Wouldn't give any name. So you let her wait in my private office? Well, I don't think you'll mind when you've seen her. She's by way of being a knockout. Well, uh, thank you, Effie. That was, uh, very thoughtful of you, Dan. You're welcome, Sam. Sam, please, please don't be angry with me for coming here. I, I had to talk to somebody. What you need is a good criminal lawyer, Nurse Rod. Oh, no. Oh, no. Do you think I killed that woman? How did your prince get on that gun? Now, don't tell me she threatens you with it and you grab it out of her hand. No, no, I didn't. I didn't. Nothing oh, at all. Take it I easy, wouldn't... nurse. Take it easy. Would you like a drink or something? No, no, of course. Thank you anyway. I'll, I'll be all right. Well, she came in from shopping three days ago. Just as nice as pie. And she came creeping around. You know how she is. And she said, I bought something today. It's lovely. And with that, she hauled this gun out of her handbag. And so, to humor her, I took it and I looked at it. I was foolish. It certainly was foolish. When Nico played it, I deal service for fingerprints. And I remember she was wearing gloves. Struck me as peculiar at the time, but I'm, I'm so stupid. I didn't think of it until just now. Everything's a little peculiar about this caper. A woman who was dying anyway gets shot. Nobody even seems to know who she was. Doesn't make sense. No, no, it doesn't make much sense. What should I do, Sam? Give myself up? I think you should. Yes, I thought you'd say that. All right, phone the police. You got a lot of courage. Sure you don't want to drink? No. No, thank you. I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Uh, Homicide. Dundee. Uh, Dundee, Sam Spade. I got the Robbins girl here in my office. She wants to check in. Oh? Uh, Well, tell her to forget it, Sam. Reese's wife just made a full confession. That tore it. In my anxiety to see how you were bearing up under the shock, Doctor, I blew a buck and a half of your money on a taxi all the way out to your address on Pacific Avenue. To my astonishment, you were wearing a look of real distress. I I don't understand it, Mr. Spade. This confessing, it's, it's not like her. It's all too strange to be harmless. Dr. Reed, I'd like to talk to you alone. Do you mind, Mr. Spade? Go right ahead. my ears outside your consulting room, but all I could hear was a few vague murmurs. Then, for no good reason, I decided to have a look at your wife's bedroom upstairs. The cops had been there before me, so I didn't expect to find much, and I didn't. I was tapping the woodwork for secret panels or something when I heard a heavy tread on the, on the stairway. I wheeled around, my hands inside my coat. A jolly-looking character in coveralls was standing in the doorway. Home electronics. I beg your pardon? Jahagin, home electronics. <laughs> I come to take the equipment. What equipment? And a dictograph. She don't need it no more. <laughs> Ask me, she hurt too much. Mrs. Reese had a dictograph installed? Yeah, her metal type installation. Yeah, this here's a speaker. <laughs> yeah, my own design. Looks like a portable radio, don't it? Now, yeah, where's the other end? Where's the uh, microphone? It's in the doc's private office. Uh, you interested, eh? Yeah, turn it on, will you? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, we'll get it tuned in a minute, there. Uh... Oh, feedback. Wait a minute, I'll fix it. Let her talk. Let her talk. What can she tell? I don't know. But it's uncanny the way she Nice, huh? Every word we spoke together. <laughs> it's because of the dictograph. Deep rig, huh? Shut up. We cannot allow this terrible tragedy to come between us. We love each other. Nothing can change that. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, that's as nice, no, ain't it? Quiet, quiet. I, I just know, please, please, don't. Now, now stop it, Helen. I don't want you to. Please, don't. What is it, Celeste? What has happened, Jane? What has happened? You ask that. When I've been attacked by a mad woman and accused of murder all in the space of 12 hours. But it's all over now. Just so, Helen. Yes, all over. 
Hey, don't, don't you turn it up a little more? Sure. Oh, sure, sure. Turn it up. Hold it, hold it. I'm very, very ashamed. I suppose it was my usual thing. I always get sorry for a poor, weak man and, and get involved. But this time, I'm sorry for her. Yes, when I was a kid, I liked it. It used to make me feel powerful and, oh, to watch them squirm. But it's no fun anymore watching another woman in the agonies of jealousy. And you, I thought you were just weak. You're a brutal, unscrupulous murderer. What, what are you saying, sir? You killed Mrs. Cavanaugh. Why, that's, that's impossible. You stood deliberately in that window and you fired two shots right at Hey, what gives you? Why, were my fingerprints on that gun? Because... You were wearing your rubber gloves, Doctor. Celeste, don't say any more. No, no, no! <laughs> Let me get his shirt off, Mr. Spain. You've been shot. Who shot him, you? <laughs> Through the window, the same man, the one who watched the house. Oh, hold this tourniquet tight, please. Yeah, uh, it's nothing. A flesh wound. His aim was bad. Yeah, too bad. Cavanaugh, you still out there? You got nothing to worry about. He's still alive. I missed him. Give me a hand. Come on. That's it. I missed him. That was lucky. You're taking the rap of your wife's murder, too, if you're a better shot. He did it. He killed my wife. I was at the window. I saw him. What I don't understand is why his wife confessed. She loves him, Mr. Cavanaugh. You should understand that. I guess that's what happens to love when it gets crossed up. Why didn't you tell the police what you saw? They'd have hung it on me. She she was a stranger to everyone else. I'd been quarreling with her, suspicious, acting like a maniac. She never told me. She must have been going to one doctor after another, trying to find one that would give her one ray of hope. In pain all the time, too, and never letting on. Never. Even after that first visit she made to Reese's office, I didn't tumble. I I thought she was meeting him on the sly. And I followed her both times. That last time I carried a gun. I might have killed her if what I suspected had been true. Uh, I'm very sorry, Mr. Cavanaugh. I, I didn't realize. You're pretty late with your regrets, Doctor. I don't quite figure you either. Maybe the prison psychiatrist can. Dundee homicide. Uh, Dundee... Tear up Mrs. Reese's confession. Come on over and get the doctor. Dr. Reese? Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, he accidentally shot himself in the arm. Isn't that right, doctor? Uh, what? Oh, yes, yes. Accident. Why didn't she tell me? Why didn't she tell me? I don't know, Kavanaugh. Women. Sometimes they make too much sense, or we don't make enough, or... Maybe we're all crazy. <laughs> And that, Dr. Reese, is the crop. At the risk of laboring a point, there's also the mystery of why a nice girl like Celeste Robbins ever fell for a guy like you. You'll have plenty of free time to think it over between now and the trial. If you find the answer, drop me a line. Period, and a report. You know, Sam, that, that Celeste, I like her. I wish we could do something for her. Well, I've already thought of that, Evie. Oh? What are you going to do, Sam? Type that up, sweetheart, and I'll write you a happy ending. Here's how you can find out whether the hair tonic you're using today is giving you what you ought to get in good grooming. Ask yourself, does my present hair tonic groom my hair neatly and naturally, or does it leave my hair sticky or greasy? And does it relieve dryness and remove loose dandruff, too, or does it do just a halfway job? Unless you can honestly say that your present hair tonic does all that for your hair, you owe it to yourself to try Wild Root Cream Oil right away. Try Wild Root Cream Oil and see for yourself how it improves your appearance. Grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. It's non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin. Get the big economy size bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel and grand for the bathroom cabinet. Don't delay. Get it today. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Oh, here's the report, Sam. You want to read it over? I do not. File it under F. But forget. About that poor Celeste, Sam. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I made a date with Celeste to take her dancing tomorrow night. She, uh, needs cheering up, you know. Oh, what for? Well, you said she needed help. Well, that isn't exactly the kind of help I had in mind. Oh. I don't see why it's necessary Effie, to take this. we must each of us give what particular kind of help each of us is particularly equipped to give. Very well. She wished to... She used to make over men just to get the other women jealous. That she did. Aren't other women silly to allow themselves to get jealous when they know just what she's up to? Idiotic. Just idiotic. Sure thing. And 
Go home, Effie. I'm a lousy dancer. Oh, very well. Have fun, Sam. Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. This is Dick Joy, reminding you that next Sunday, author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, for quick, good grooming and to relieve dryness between permanents. Mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Inspector Faraday, had enough of your office tonight? Yeah, Rollins. Now I'm going home, get a good night's sleep. Hey, you sure earned it today, Inspector. Well, I guess it was the evidence we collected that's going to send Bill Clear to prison. Yeah, we did a good job, Rollins. I'm proud of the department. Thanks, Inspector. Well, good night, Rollins. I'll see you in the morning. Hey, Inspector, wait a minute. You aren't walking home, are you? Yeah, I think I will. The air will do me good. Well, maybe so, Inspector. Don't you think you'd better take a couple of the boys with you? What for? I know my way home. I know that, but what about the Bill Thayer mob? Well, what about it? What about it, Inspector? Thayer said he'd have his pals take care of you, and you know what that means. <laughs> Look, Rollins, if I worried about the threats I got from every guy I worked on, I wouldn't have time to do my job. But Thayer's got a lot of friends, and he's out on base. So what? His threat doesn't mean a thing. And neither does he. Now, good night, Rollins, and don't get into any trouble. Okay, Inspector. I wish you'd let a couple of boys go with you. I get it, Rollins. You figure you'll be one of them. You'll get a little of my wife's home cooking. <laughs> Some other time. Oh. Quick, Faraday. Quick, Faraday. Oh. Hey, Smith Thompson. Oh. Get an ambulance. Quick, they got Inspector Faraday and they got him good. And now meet Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie, enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friend. Hello, Faraday, old pal. Hello, Inspector. Well, at last the flathead is flat on his back. Oh, no. <laughs> Get out of here, Blackie. This is a hospital, not an amusement park. <laughs> well, I'm glad you told me. I haven't had so much fun in weeks. The nurse tells me you'll recover. Sorry, old man. Oh, Blackie, will you stop joking? Yes, maybe I should be sad about this, Mary. The nurse may be wrong. Maybe Faraday will live. Yeah, I'll live all right, Blackie. Takes more than a couple of bullets to stop me. Especially when they just graze me. <laughs> really? Hmm... Bullets can't stop you, but a simple question can all the time. Oh, now, Blackie, you stop. You didn't come here to tease the inspector. No, no, I didn't. But uh, let me enjoy myself before I tell him the bad news. Bad news? What bad news? Well, I might as well tell you now, Faraday. You probably haven't realized it yet, but this is one case I'm going to solve without interference from you. Interference from me? You're the guy who's always getting in my way. No, that's your opinion. Faraday, I'm going to get the guys who did this to you... And get them all by myself. I'm going after that fan mob. Doesn't that make you happy? Blackie, you stay out of this. I got him on that larceny charge, and I'll get clear for this, too. You lay off here. Not very well. No. Oh, you... Blackie, why don't you be honest with the inspector? All right, Mary. I guess you're right. 
Listen, Faraday, I'm serious about this. Yeah? Maybe you and I have had our differences, but I don't like the idea of anyone shooting at you. Yeah, all I want from you is two things. Stay away from Thayer and leave me alone right now. All right, Faraday. If that's the way you feel about it, come on, Mary. And right. don't come back, either one of you. We won't, Faraday. I'll be too busy getting Thayer for trying to get you. If I find out you're even down at Thayer's neighborhood, Blackie, I'll have you arrested. What's the matter, jealous? Uh, I'll He's jealous. Inspector Faraday, Inspector Faraday, what's the matter? That guy there is what's the matter. Well, the matter is leaving. So long, pal. Oh, Inspector Faraday, I'm terribly sorry. About what? I mean, about what? I had no idea that that man would upset you, sir. I, I wouldn't have let him in. I'm afraid seeing him has made you worse. Made me worse? Don't be foolish. Seeing the way that guy really feels about me is, has made me feel a whole lot better. <laughs> Look, James, he thanks to your stupidity and not knocking off Faraday. We don't dare stick our noses out of this room. What do you mean, my stupidity? If you turn the car the way I told you to, Faraday would be dead right now. I couldn't turn the car the way we planned. There was a truck in the way. Okay, so there was a truck. All I know is all I can do is spot Faraday and let him have it. Now, don't blame me because he's still alive. The way things work, we were lucky to put him in a hospital. Yes, and we're lucky if we don't end up in hospitals ourselves. The boss isn't going to like what we did. I did the best I could. You mean I didn't? Why, I ought to... Uh, but... Now, wait a minute, James. You were both out of line, blowing our tops, our nerves. You're going haywire. Yeah, I guess that's it. Only you shouldn't have tried to put the rap on me for messing up the job. I'm sorry. Guess the best thing we can do is think of a good story to tell the boss. Yeah, you're right, Barnes. You think you'll give us a chance to talk? I think so, if we talk first. Uh-uh, uh-uh. It's probably the boss. Maybe we'd better beat it, Barnes. No, that won't do any good. Put your gun in your pocket. Keep it there. All right. Good. Come in. Come in. Hello, Barnes. Oh, you gentlemen are in, are you? Oh, yes, Mrs. Ackley. Uh, you don't want the rent again so soon, do you? Aren't we paid up? <laughs> of course, Mr. Barnes. I just wanted to tell you a man phoned and left his number for you to call him back. Uh-huh. I wrote it down. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Mrs. Ackley. You're welcome. I hope I didn't disturb you, gentlemen. Uh, that's all right. Sorry. Bye. Goodbye. 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 Huh. Let's see the telephone number, James. Here. Recognize it? Uh, too well. It's the boss. Come on, we'd better call him up before he calls on us. Come in. Thanks for telling your pals outside to let me in, Fair. I'd hate to have to break in to see you. Might make a bad impression. I thought if you were fool enough to come to see me, Blanky, I ought to be smart enough to see you. Look, I'm not going to stand around here and spar with you, Thayer. I'm here to see you about those two thugs of yours who fired three bullets into Inspector Faraday last night. Yes, that's uh, why I thought you were here. Now, how about leaving? Oh, no. Very well, I won't argue, will you? I was prepared for this visit of yours. I hope you're prepared for the reception. Tony, Barker... What is it, Chief? Yeah, boss. Tony, Boston Blackie doesn't want to leave. Will you and Barker tell him you think he should? A pleasure. Sure, boss. Come on, Barker. You get him from that side. I'll get him from this. Maybe it won't be as easy as you think, Tony. <laughs> what are you using for a fish, Blackie? A mosquito bite? Oh, very good. Oh, yeah. Oh, he can take it. I'll hit him your way, Barker. Oh, oh, the table was in the way. He fell short. Push him over this way, Barker. Flash. Hey, Barker, don't let him hit back like that. He might get cute and think he can lick you. Oh, oh my God. You smashed the table on him, Barker. That junk off him, I'll finish him with a good right to the jaw. Oh. Practically out now. Not as out as you think, huh? How about this? Oh! <laughs> yeah, that did it, boss. That did it. Yeah, good, good. Now, uh, take Blackie outside and toss him in the street. You like what we've done to him, huh, boss? Yes, Tony, but I don't like what you did to my office. Now get busy and cart this broken furniture out of here. There's nothing I hate more than a must-up room. Oh. Now hold still, will you? Oh, oh that doesn't hurt so much. Oh, brother. <laughs> oh, that water on my face feels sort of good, though, Mary. Does it? Well, that's a nasty black eye you have, you know. You mean I, I have only one black eye? Just one black eye. 
One bruised face and one bump on the back of your head. What hit you, a train? No. No, two trains. The Tony Flyer and the Barker Special. But I'm not through with them. Now, you don't mean that you're going back there. Oh, yes, I am, Mary. I... This just about proves Faraday was right. It is this mob who tried to kill him. Otherwise, they wouldn't have given me such a, well, uh, ungentlemanly treatment. Just the same. It is foolish to go back there and try to see him. Think so? Well, I... Maybe... <laughs> maybe I'd better think of something else. I think so, too. Here, now, let me dampen that cloth for your face again. All right. Uh-oh. I'll get it, Mary. Well, all right, but you lie back so that I can keep this cloth on your face. Okay. Hello. Hello, Blackie. Yes, who's this? This is Rollins, Blackie. Sergeant Rollins, respect Oh, yes, Mary. Rollins. How's Faraday? That's what I'm calling you about, Blackie. Huh? What's the matter? Did he take a turn for the worse? Oh, I don't know what turn he took, Blackie. All I know is he didn't take it by himself. What do you mean? I mean, two unidentified men just kidnapped Faraday right out of the hospital. We can't find a trace of them anywhere. Come in. Hello, Blackie. Well, Rocky Baldwin. Too bad you didn't come ten minutes later. I'm on my way out. That's your hurry, kid. Sit down. My hurry is Inspector Faraday's been kidnapped, and I gotta find him. Aren't you in the wrong neighborhood, Rocky? I thought this was Thayer's side of town. Yeah, but Thayer isn't going to mind my coming over here. As long as I don't try to cut in on him. Then why are you over here? This is why I'm over here, Blackie. To see you. You mean the great Rocky Baldwin, tied with Thayer as the city's number one rocketeer, will stoop so low as to come to see me? Well, I'm glad I'm still nursing this face of mine so I didn't miss this. I've got a reason for wanting to see you, Blackie. The usual one, I suppose. You want to try to scare me into doing something for you. Well, I don't scare. I got beaten up a little while ago because I don't scare. <laughs> Blackie, you've got me wrong. I'm here because I want to help you. I know where Faraday is. Because I know who kidnapped him. Who? Thayer. Yeah, I'm on a known. And you know where Thayer's keeping him? Sure. And his hideout on Lane Street. Uh-huh. Very interesting. Except for one thing, I don't believe it. Why not? Because why should you cross there and help Faraday? Oh, that's very simple. I don't like cops, of course, but uh, Faraday is only one cop among many. But Thayer. Well, he's the one man who stands in the way of my controlling this whole town. Understand? Hmm. When you put it that way, I'd be a fool if I didn't understand. Ah, well, you're no fool, Blackie. But better hurry and get your friend Faraday before Thayer finishes with him. And Thayer, you know, works fast. And now back to Boston Blackie. Bill Thayer, gang leader, threatens death to Inspector Faraday if Faraday's evidence gets a conviction against him. Faraday is later shot at from a passing car, but is not badly wounded. Blackie, however, is determined to find out the men who shot the police inspector. So far, however, all he's managed to do is get himself beaten up. Then, to complicate matters, Faraday is kidnapped by two unknown men, and Rocky Baldwin, gangster, tips off Blackie that it is Thayer who has Faraday. As we return to our story, Rocky is talking to two of his mob. Now listen, you two, and keep interrupting me with questions if you don't get what I'm saying, understand? I get you, Rocky. Me too. What am I, a dummy or something? All right, now listen. James A., I sent you out to kill Faraday, but you bungled the job. You messed I it. I told you I was sorry about that. It was the car. Never you mind see... the car. Now, who is it that's getting blamed for trying to knock out Faraday? Well, who is it? Is it me? Of course it ain't you, Rocky. It's there. Everybody knows he threatened to give it a Faraday. So when you heard he threatened to bump the cop, you decided to have us do it. No one there would get the rap. Sure, boss. We knock him off, Thayer gets blamed. Right. Now, I got this Boston Blackie guy all steamed up that Thayer has Faraday hidden away. Blackie's on his way to get Thayer. Well, he's the guy who can do it, too. Blackie don't mess. That means Thayer's due to get his any minute and we take over the town. Good work, Rocky. 
You really fooled Blanky on this one. Hold it, you two. Yeah? Rocky Baldwin speaking. Oh, hello, Rocky. This is Blanky. Oh, hi, Blanky. Say, why aren't you down on Lane Street getting Faraday away from there? I'll be down there soon enough. But you pulled a pretty cute trick, Rocky. I want to congratulate you. What do you mean, Blanky? Thayer did kidnap Faraday. You'll see for yourself when... I'm not talking about that, Rocky. I'm talking about who shot Faraday. What Thayer did, of course. Why, some of his men do it. That's what you figured everybody would think when you sent Jamesy and Barnes out to kill the inspector, didn't you? What are you talking about? Don't be coy, Rocky. You know what I'm talking about. I do not. Where'd you hear such nonsense? From someone who should know, Rocky. From Jamesy himself. Oh, from Jamesy. Yes, he doesn't shoot too straight, but he certainly knows how to talk. Just thought you'd like to know that I knew. So long, pal. Hey, Blackie. Blackie! What's the matter, Rocky? Oh, nothing much, Barnes. So, Jamesy, come here a minute. Sure, Rocky. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing at all. That was Blackie on the phone. Going after Thayer, huh? Yeah, right now. But he told me something about you. He did? What? Said you told him a little story. I told him? Yes. I'm awfully disappointed in you, Jamesy. You've been one of my favorite boys for a long time. Well, thanks, Rocky. But I don't know... You really shouldn't have talked to Blackie, Jamesy. It means I have to do this. Uh, Rocky! What's the idea? Uh, Rocky, what... What you have to... Uh, uh, Rocky! What you killed Jamesy for? He talked to Blackie. He told Blackie that we tried to kill Faraday. Oh, no, Rocky. That was just a trick. I've been with Jamesy every minute since we shot Faraday, and he hasn't been there, Blackie. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, that's too bad. Looks as if maybe I've made a mistake. Oh, oh, Tony. Yeah, boss. You got Faraday tied up nice and tight? Yeah, Mr. Thayer. I got him so he can't even wriggle a finger. Good. Now that we snatched him and stashed him here, what do we do? I don't know yet. I got to have time to think. Find time to think after we snatch a cop. I had to get him out of that hospital before Rocky Baldwin got to him there. They killed Faraday on that joint, sure. And who'd have taken the rap for it? Me. Because sometimes even you talk too much, huh, boss? Oh, I talked out of turn just once. When I tried to threaten Faraday. Oh, what a sucker I was. All he had on me was a larceny rep. I had a good chance of beating that. Now we're too smart for cops, Mr. Thayer, ain't we? No, I'm not so sure. I don't know what to do with Faraday. If I turn him loose, Rocky will get him this time, sure, and I'll get it right in the neck. If I keep him here, I kidnap the guy. That means a chair. Not if we make a deal with Faraday. That's an idea. Only I don't think Faraday will buy it. I'll try. Hey, wait, wait, wait a minute, boss. You keep saying that all he has on you is a larceny rap. Mm. Uh, don't he know about the Edwards killing? He doesn't even suspect me in that one. Oh, no, huh? I don't like the way you said that, Tony. Well, uh, uh, it wasn't my fault, boss. You, you never said nothing to me about what Faraday was trying to pin on you. I thought all along it was the Edwards killing. Go on. Well, uh, nothing. I... I figured when we kidnapped him from the hospital, it was to bump him. So I got talking to him, told him what a sucker he was to mix up with a guy like you, a guy who was smart enough to take care of Big Jim Edwards. You fool, Tony, you stupid idiot. Faraday didn't know a thing about me in the Jim Edwards case. Now I know what we got to do with that cop. Gee, boss, I'm sorry. For never I... mind, never mind about being sorry. You've done it and it's done. Faraday is the only one who knows it. So if we fix Faraday, we're still safe. You mean kill him? Or make a deal with him. Come on, we'll go see what we can do. Okay. Hello, Faraday. Comfortable? You know I'm not, sir. I'm sorry about all this, Faraday, but it was one of those things I just had to do. Yeah. Just for the fun of it, I guess. No. To keep Rocky Baldwin and his men from killing him. Rocky and his men? Never mind about that now. I got something more important to talk to you about. What? Tony told you I killed Edwards. Didn't he? That's right. I'll let you go right now if you'll forget all you know about that. Sorry, Thayer. No dice. I'm not that kind of guy. And I'm not that kind of policeman. Well, you're a live policeman now, Yeah, uh, maybe a dumb one, too. But I'm an honest cop. 
Find a way to get the evidence against you and the Edwards killing. And if I get a chance to, I'm going to use it. All right, Faraday. I'm awful sorry. Tony. Yeah, boss. Get on the phone. Tell Harry to bring the big car down here. Sure thing. Harry should be here with a car in 30 minutes, Faraday. So what? I still remember you killed Edwards. Well, you got 30 minutes in which to decide whether you feel like losing your memory or your life. Good heavens, Blackie. Look at all those police cars. And all the policemen in the street. What's this going to be, a riot? It's not going to be a picnic, Mary. There has Faraday in the house across the street, and there may be a little argument about who does what. Stay here a minute. Here's Rollins. All right, Blackie, but please be careful. Yeah. Hello, Rollins. Oh, hello, Blackie. We're just about set. Glad you brought a lot of men, Rollins. This may be a battle. But not a long one if the shooting does start, Blackie. I've got a hundred men, and I don't think Thayer has more than two or three. But he has Faraday. Aren't you afraid he'll kill the inspector if you open fire on him? Yes, I'm going to try reasoning with him first. Hey, Jack. Jack, hand me the loudspeaker microphone. I'll see if they are listening to reason. Yeah, boys. Thanks. Well, good luck, Rollins. Blackie, I-, I got scared sitting there alone in the car. Can I stand by you? Hello, Miss Wesley. Oh, hello, Sergeant. Blackie, can I? Yes, if you're a good girl, you'll be safe behind the squad car if the shooting starts. Go ahead, Rollins. Let's see if Thayer can be talked into showing some sense and showing himself. All right, there. We know you're in there. We're going to give you a chance to come out alive. Can you hear me, Thayer? Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Come out of that house, Thayer. Come out with your hands up. Nothing going. And we're coming in after you. Come ahead. I'll kill Faraday if you do. He means it too, Rollins. Ask him if I can come in. Oh, Blackie, Listen, no. Thayer. Can Blackie come in? What for? Tell him it's to make a deal and to see if Faraday is really still alive. He wants to make a deal and see if Faraday is still alive. Okay, Blackie can come in. But alone. With his hands in the air and unarmed. Good. Come here, Rollins. I've got an idea. If it works, we'll have Faraday out of there in no time. Oh, Blackie, you can't go in there. They'll kill you. Not if I do what they say. All right, Blackie, what is it? Yeah. Take yeah. my gun and keep it for me. Well, you're not going in there without a gun, are you? I am if I expect to come out alive. Give me a tear gas bomb. A tear gas bomb? Yes, give me one, quick. All right. Here's one. But, Blackie, they'll search you if they find it. But they won't find it. There. Now, wish me luck. Give me exactly three minutes and then come in fast. Oh, Blackie, I wish you wouldn't do this. I said wish me luck. Oh. Here, better get behind the squad car, Miss Wesley. If anything goes wrong, we'll have to start. Blackie? Yes, there. Open up. Are you alone? You saw me come across the street by myself. Open up. All right, Tony. Let him in. He's alone, Thayer. He's got his hands up, too. Good. Don't let him near me till you searched him. And thoroughly. I don't think you'll find anything on me, Tony. Hmm? No, there's nothing on him, Mr. Thayer. He's clean. Good. Let him in, then. Now, wait a minute. Take off his hat first. I'll take it off by myself there and put it over here on the table. How's that? That's good. Come on in, Blackie. Thanks. And I can put my hands down now? Yeah, yeah. Your hands down and your cards on the table. You want to make a deal. What is it? First, I want to see Faraday. I want to make sure he's still alive. Fair enough. Go bring Faraday out here, Tony. Sure. And if Faraday's alive, Blackie, then what? Let's wait until I see Faraday alive. You just don't trust me, do you, Blackie? No. Mind? No. No, I wouldn't have much respect for you if you did. Well, here he is, Blackie. Does he look alive? Yes, as much as he ever did. Hello, Faraday. Hello, Blackie. Well, your pal's alive, Blackie. What's the deal? No deal, Thayer. As far as I'm concerned, you can go ahead and kill him. Where's my hat? I'm getting out of here. Hey, Blackie, wait a minute. Blackie. Oh, uh, here's my hat on the table. Duck Faraday, I'm dropping it on the floor. Harry, what's that? Uh, tear gas. Let him have it, Tony. I shoot. I can't. I, I can't see him, boss. Where, where are you? Get over there, Tony. You don't mind if I borrow your gun, do you? Get me out of here. Faraday, are you okay? Sure. Where'd you get the tear gas? Quick, grab Thayer first. We'll have Tony out. Oh, wait. 
Doctor, are you all right? Yeah. Inspector Faraday? Yeah, Rollins. I'm wonderful. I've never been so, so happy in my life. <laughs> Oh, Blackie, isn't this a lovely evening for a drive? Mary, this is a lovely evening for practically anything. Oh? Did you say thanks to my hat? Uh, you... your hat? Why? Well, don't you realize that if it weren't for this hat, I wouldn't have had anything to keep that tear gas bomb under, and that there would have been no way of getting Faraday from there? Oh, well, nice hat, nice hat. Thank you very much. Blackie... What happened to Rocky Baldwin? He's dead, and so is Barnes, the man who killed him. They must have shot it out and both hit the bullseye. Oh, Barnes was angry because Rocky killed his friend Jamesy. Yes. Well, oh, Jamesy deserved to die. He was a killer. Well, quite I guess I, I made about him. I guess I guessed to him right, didn't I? When I called up Rocky? Yes, I guess you did, and I guess, too, there's good riddance. Gee, this was exciting, wasn't it? All the shooting and kidnapping... Oh, I don't know, Mary. I'd say it's the quickest case I ever solved. The quickest? Why do you say that? Well, what did I do to rescue Faraday? You put a tear gas bomb in your hat and you threw your hat on the floor so the tear gas would explode. Well, that's why I say it was the quickest, Mary. It's the first case I've ever solved at the drop of a hat. Ooh. <laughs> Mr. Collins. It surely is. After all, how would you feel if you found that your husband had a fan? And then found out that the fan belonged to a fan dancer? Yes, it's Gail Collins here. And in a moment, I'll be back to set the stage for our puzzling crime. It's a crime, Mr. Collins. So, you found out Greg had a fan, but the fan belonged to a fan dancer. That's right, Jack. Well, Gail, I guess you've just got to accept the fact your husband's a guy who gets around. I do. After all, he's a private detective, so I've got to expect it. But I guess you were pretty angry uh, about the fan, I mean. Angry? Oh, no. You've got it wrong. I felt sort of uh, sentimental about it. Hey, wait a minute. I, I, I thought you were jealous or something. Now no, you said that... <laughs> I guess I'd better put you straight. You see... Greg and I had gone out celebrating. Oh, I forget what, but there we were in a nightclub, relaxing like we hadn't for a long time. You want to know something? With a dame like you, I should dance with my eyes closed. Why don't you? I am. Because I'm enjoying as crowded as this, I might end up with some other dame. That proves you don't love me. I'd know right off I wasn't dancing with the right man, even with my eyes closed. Yes? 
Ah. Oh, the feel of your suit, the way your back muscles bunch when you go around the corner, the feel of your cheek on mine, the weight of your foot on my arch bean step. Well, what should I do? Send for Arthur Murray? Tell him to bring his own girl. I don't want anyone to play gooseberry at this party. Yeah? The music stopped. Well, should I leave off dancing just because the band plays too fast? Idiot. Here come and sit down. People are looking. Oh, Greg, how long is it since we spent a night like this? About four murders. I figure it rates another bottle of champagne. You see, I'm trying to break you down. I may even ask you to marry me later. You'll have to see my father. I've seen your father. I still want to marry. <laughs> well, what do you know? The management doesn't trust us. They put a bid on our table already. Or maybe they give you two bills just to break it gentle. Well, that's all the cheek. I've got a good mind to go to some other place. What the... Gail, this isn't a bill. It's a note, and it says... If you're the Greg Collins I think you are, I can use you. You better come back right away. Come back? You haven't been anywhere. Who wrote that note? Lola the Pink Lady. What? I tell you, that's what it says. Lola, the pink lady. I got a feeling you're being ribbed. Look around. Can you see any of our pals here who... Ah, so that's who it is. Gail, look at that photograph over near the piano. The shot of the blonde and all the feathers. Lola, the pink lady. Twice nightly. I don't get it. Well, I do. Lola's a fan dancer here. She wants us to go back to her dressing room. That is, if I'm the Greg Collins she thinks I am. And if I'm the Greg Collins I think I am, I'd never pass up the chance to meet a fan dance. <laughs> yeah, who is it? If that's you, Huey, I, I don't... It's Greg Collins here, Miss oh. Luther. I got a note that says... Oh, Mr. Collins. Oh, just a minute. The door's locked. Gosh, Mr. Collins, I didn't think you'd come back. I honestly didn't. Well, you better take a good look at me, lady. I mightn't be the Greg Collins you want. Well, if you're the private detective, you're the one. Well, that lets us in, I guess. This is my wife, Gail. Uh, this, uh, Miss Lola, Miss... Uh, Lola Cassidy. Hello, Mrs. Collins. Come in. Oh, thanks, Miss Cassidy. I'm sorry my room's in such a mess, but what with doing a scarf dance, a fan dance, and a bubble dance all in one night, I, I don't know if I'm Isadora Duncan, a bird, or nine out of ten Hollywood stars. Well, whatever I am, I, I'm in trouble, I know that. You just take it easy, Miss Cassidy. Greg will take care of you. Uh, before we start, Miss Cassidy, I'd better explain there are some kinds of cases I don't handle. Just so long as you handle murder, that's all I want. He's wonderful at murder. I didn't do it. I know what everyone will say, but I didn't do it. You didn't do what, Miss Cassidy? I didn't kill Abraham Lincoln. Uh, no. No, I, I guess that's one rap you could beat. If only I had an alibi, but I haven't. Oh, no alibi, huh? Oh, couldn't you just, uh, just explain you weren't born then? I don't think this is a very good time to make funny gags, Mr. Collins. Oh, Miss Cassidy, I think. Abraham it... Lincoln, of course. It was in the papers. He's dead. It was in my history book, too. Oh, not that Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Jefferson Lincoln, the millionaire plane manufacturer. I saw it on the newspaper headlines when we were catching a cab tonight. Headlines? Oh, you can say that again. Here, take a good look. It's like D-Day all over again. So that's the Abe Lincoln you mean. <whistles> mm, this is good stuff. Shot dead in his apartment in the stomach. Doctors figure he took three hours to die. Uh, Miss Cassidy, have the police accused you of this yet? Not yet, but they're going to. You see, Abe and me were friends. But if you were friends... We were friends. We busted up. Oh, it was terrible. We had an awful fight right out in public at a party. And I said... I said... You threatened his life, huh? I, I told him I was only sorry he'd probably die quickly. I said, I, I thought you should die a slow, painful death. You were friends? Well, that's how I felt. He said he was going to marry me, and all the time he, he never had no intention. All the time he had one of them society dames out in Boston. 
And because of your association with Lincoln, you figure the police will be around to see you. I know it. But you must have been here at the club when it happened. I was home sick. I thought I was getting the flu, so I stayed home last night. But how can I prove I stayed in all night? No one can prove you're at Lincoln's. Well, you can prove I might have been. I've got a key to his apartment. A key? I've still got it. About two months back, I was working at two different nightclubs in the one night. I used his apartment to change from one costume to the other. You see, the cab had wait for me. Yeah, I, I, I get it, honey. I, I get it. But look, aren't you beating the gun? If the police haven't even questioned you yet. Oh. Uh, maybe I spoke too soon. You think this is the police? Well, it could be. I just don't know, but it could be, lady. Oh, I hope not. You there, Mrs. Kesky. I'd like to see you for a moment. Oh. I'm sorry, lady. It is the police. Oh, come in. Hi there, Barney. Long time no see. Call it. Hello, Sergeant Barnett. How nice to see you. One of these days, you're going to get into a case so fast, Collins, I'm going to find you with a smoking gun in your hand. And I bet you make the mistake of arresting me. We'll wait and see about that. Right now, when you talk about arrest, I'm only interested in Miss Castle. Oh. Slip into a bubble, honey. I guess you know where we're going. I didn't kill him. I didn't kill him, and I- I'm not going to jail. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, stop no. me, Mr. Collins. Don't let him take me away. Lola, give it up. You're not doing yourself any good. Drake will help you, honey. He'll prove you didn't do it. Don't say she didn't. For a dame who's innocent, she's shedding all the feathers. He was a nice guy, that Sergeant Barnett. But he didn't have Greg's imagination. On the other hand, not many hours later, Greg had imagination but almost no head. So keep your ears pinned, friends. We'll be back in a moment with more of our story. A couple of hours after Sergeant Barnett had taken Lola Cassidy in for the murder of Abe Lincoln, we all met up again. All, that is, except Lola. Greg told Barnett he wanted to look at Lincoln's apartment. And Barnett said, sure, only he wanted to be there, too. I might as well tell you both right now, his apartment isn't exactly a picture. This is a... Uh, how do you mean, Sergeant? The poor guy took a long time to die. Has anything been touched, Barney? The thing... Go on in. Because we dusted the joint for fingerprints. Nothing's been moved. Well, what do you want to know? Well, tell me how it happened. Well, it's easy. He shot here, from the front. Fell down, lay a while, then he dragged himself this way to the bedroom and died in there. Oh, poor man. The motive was probably jealousy. You know he told the Cassidy dame he was going to marry her. So you're sure she did it? I'm sure. I'm not but then she's your client. You want one good reason why she didn't kill Lincoln? Because she's a battler. She's a girl who makes a living in a tough racket. Kids like that, the hoofers, the strippers, the cigarette girls, they don't crack easily. Who got here first, the girl or Lincoln? What was the matter? She had a key. She didn't bust in. As a matter of fact, Lincoln was here when she arrived. It was a half-smoked cigar on the ashtray. See, it's still there. The photographs I saw of his body, Lincoln was still dressed in his top coat and scarf. Well, that's right. What about it, Sergeant Barnett? Did Lincoln sit around home in a coat and scarf? Okay, so she was here when he arrived. Smoking a cigar? He was smoking it when he walked in. He put it down before she shot him. What about this liquor cabinet over here? Who poured who a drink? Ask the dame. Well, seems like they got to a lot of liquor. There's a bottle missing from this set. Every kind of alcohol except scotch. It's on the lower shelf, Sherlock Holmes. Eh? Oh, yeah. Well, have you seen all you want to see? Yeah, I guess so. By the way, I thought your men didn't move anything. That's what I said. Then Lincoln kept his footstool in a funny place. Usually you find a footstool in front of a chair. His is on the hearth, under the mantelpiece. And we found the salami sausage in his cheese dish. Maybe he liked living a crazy bohemian life. How do I know? Why don't you give up Collins? The dame had a motive. She had the opportunity. People have been sent to the chair on that much before now. If Lola Cassidy killed Lincoln, I'll take over her act. So you think Lola was framed, Greg? That's the funny part, I don't. She just happens to fill the bill, that's all. Well, forget about it tonight. We're home. If only someone knew for sure that Lola spent the night in her apartment last night. Poor kid. She really is a nice girl, you know. Yeah, and the crazy part is the only place we'll find the answer to this is in Lincoln's apartment. I'll make you a nice hot cup of coffee. You'll feel better. Liquor, cigars, overcoat and scarf. Yeah. 
What kind of a setup is that? Barnett knows he's only got half a case because... <laughs> run, baby, run! The fireworks have started! When the first shot came, Greg went down as though he'd been hit in the middle with a tank. He lay against the car and tried to push me out of the way. There were two more shots, and then silence. Somehow, Greg got himself on his feet, and we half ran and half staggered up to our apartment. Oh, wouldn't you know... It starts at a quiet night dancing and ends up like this. How badly you're hurt, Greg. Uh, there's a lot of life in me yet. Oh, darling, you're not going to... The only thing that worries me is that I'm tracking a lot of blood along this corridor. Oh. Yeah. The key's in my side pocket. My coat. I've got it. So, so Barnett thinks Lola shot Lincoln. <laughs> you know that... That's so funny. It makes me laugh. Just a little more, Greg. <coughs> Try to swallow the lot. <laughs> oh, if I drink any more of that stuff, you'll have to send for Alcoholics Anonymous. Ooh. I sighed. Well, try not to move, darling. I've got you all strapped up. Is that why I got shot? Well, you weren't exactly shot. You were kind of grazed. You mean, all that gore was for a, a graze? A deep graze, just over your hip. When I got your shirt off, I could see you weren't going to die. And when I called the doctor, he said the same. Doctor? <laughs> doctor? It's okay. It was Frank Norman. I told him you were working on a case, so he won't contact the police. Greg, you know, I think we're dealing with a fiend. I got scars to prove it. I'm serious. You remember Sergeant Barnett said Lincoln was deliberately shot in the stomach. Yeah, that's right. A couple inches to the side and the same would have happened to me. Isn't that a fiend? Either a fiend or a rotten shot. Oh, I don't like this case. Oh, I do. It's full of human interest. Like, for instance, we, we both feel Lola didn't kill Lincoln because she isn't the type. Too much control. But the person who did kill Lincoln is so lacking in control that as soon as I come into the case, they start shooting. So, who's hysterical? I am. And apart from Lola, Barnett, and me, you don't know anyone who's mixed up in this affair. Anyhow, I, I'll report this attempt on my life to Barney. Maybe it'll make him ease up on the girl. And tomorrow we'll have a long talk to Lola about Lincoln's friends. The hysterical ones. Sergeant Barnett here. Who's calling? Barney, it's Greg Collins. Greg Collins? You mean the Greg Collins who wants to make the world safe for fan dances? Ah, uh, have a heart, will you? Can I help it if I believe in the girl? My wife believes in fairies. She thinks when she wants a mink coat, all I have to do is wave a wand. The fact that the wise hind who runs the mink shop won't let you through the door unless you wave $500 don't impress her at all. So don't talk to me about what people believe. I believe in the Grand Canyon, and that's as far as I go. Only one. I thought you might like to know someone tried to kill me tonight. <laughs> Justifiable homicide. I see here. Okay, so I'll send a detective over to investigate. But if you're trying to tie the fact that someone tried to kill you with the fact that Lincoln was murdered, you're wasting your time. Now I know why you wear a snap-brimmed hat. It matches your snap-brimmed brain. Good night. Now we've got to prove that girl's innocent. After that little conversation, I got a feeling the police won't want to renew my license. No use, Mr. Collins. You've been asking me questions now for four hours, and I still can't tell you who'd want to kill Abe. But there's got to be someone, Lola. Someone who knew him fairly well. And someone who lost their nerve easily. You think it was a woman, don't you? It seems fairly likely. And uh, you can't think of anything that'll help us. Not a thing. Well, that's that, I guess. How are they treating you here, Lola? Fine. Look, Sergeant, he's sure I did it, but he doesn't bite when he barks. What about bail? They gonna let you out? Yeah. The judge said I could get out when someone staked me to $10,000. Do you know anyone with that kind of dough? It may surprise you as much as it does me, but I do. There's a guy who works at the same nightclub as me, a comedian. He's gonna put up the money. 
When will you be out of here, Lola? In a couple of hours' time. If you want me, you'll find me at the club. You mean you're going to work? Keep your chin up, lady. We'll call around tonight to let you know how things are going. Well, do you still like the case, Hawkshaw? Ah, lay off that stuff with you. I'm worried. Well, you can say that again. Cops haven't got much of a case against her. Well, she'd never have gotten bail. We haven't got much of a case either. There's something about the whole affair that doesn't make sense. Where to now? Back to Lincoln's apartment. I keep feeding the answers there. Take a look at my car, will you? Four bullet holes in it. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Those holes could have been in your head. In just about where you were when you fell down on the pavement last night. Whoever fired us must have been pretty close. The slugs went through one door and straight out the other. Anyway, like you said, it... Now, that's funny. Through one door and out the other. So what? <sighs> so nothing. That makes everything crazier than before. Let's get over to Lincoln's apartment. By the time Greg got through at Lincoln's apartment, it was well after ten at night. Don't ask me what he was doing, because I don't know. All I can tell you is he was thinking. And not liking what he was thinking one little bit. And then, it seemed like he couldn't stand it any longer. He went back to Lola. And walked in on trouble. Thirty-two caliber trouble. Mr. Collins, I'm so glad you've come. I've been hoping and praying you'd get here before they took me away. Well, lady, will you quit wasting time and get him some street clothes? The DA's waiting for you. Hey, what goes on here? Barnett, it seems like you're enjoying I'm it. I'm enjoying nothing. I got a warrant. Do you want to see it? So you came here looking for evidence, and what did you find? I found this in the laundry basket in the corner, buried under a pile of clothes. A gun? A thirty-two caliber pistol, the same kind that killed Lincoln. And if you like to wave it under your nose, you'll find it was fired not long ago. This is what Sergeant Barnett was waiting for, the clincher. The piece of evidence that made it seem Lola was guilty. But Greg had his own evidence. So hold tight, folks. In just a moment, we'll bring you the climax of the case. Dug the murder gun out of Lola's clothes basket. It looked like she was set for a trip to the chair. And I have to confess, it looked that way to me, too. Lincoln was killed with a gun like that, huh? 32. He wasn't poisoned with cyanide. But it's not my gun. I've never owned a gun in my life. Tell it to the DA, sweetheart. You're not going to take her in just because you find a gun in her room, are you? What should I do? Take her to Coney Island? Miss Cassidy, will you kindly... Now, wait. Now, look, Barney, think about it. Just imagine a scene in Lincoln's apartment. I don't have to imagine it. She can tell me. I tell you, I can't. I wasn't there. Barney, this is going to sound crazy to you. But I'm going to tell you how it was. It was X, the murderer. Sometime before Lincoln got home, X got into Lincoln's apartment. With a key. Her key. Not with a key. Through the fanlight over the front door. Uh-huh. Uh, uh. Okay. X is in with maybe half an hour to spare. So what does he do? He. Now it's a he. It almost has to be. You see, he lit himself a cigar. Okay, he sits smoking for a while. Then he feels like a drink. So he pours himself one. Puts the bottle back on the lower shelf. Then soon after, Lincoln arrives. And X shoots him in the stomach. Later, he tries to shoot me and clips my side. He shoots again. And the bullets go straight through my car about three feet from the ground. Get that? Straight through. Even though you'd expect them to be traveling downwards into the seat, maybe. This is all very interesting, except it bores me. Well, what do you expect me to make out of this pile of junk? Well, well, when you put it together like that, and when you realize he had to stand on a footstool to reach the cigars... It seems to me Lincoln was shot by a... a little man. A little man. A leprechaun, maybe. Barney, it sounds crazy, but I was thinking... Now, this will be the car. Hey, Lola, I just heard tell the police... Oh, no, no, I won't believe it. There are no little man. It's a dwarf. A three-foot-high dwarf. Well, what? You're crazy. You is my friend. You wouldn't frame me for murder. Look out. Slam the door, Gail. Don't let him get away. Okay, Greg. Hey, what's going on here? I came in because I heard Lolo was in more trouble. Well, someone tell me who this guy is. I think I'm going crazy. That's Huey Dennis, the littlest comedian in the world. He works at the club here. He may be the littlest comedian, but he's also the littlest murderer. You're nuts. I never murdered no one. He put up the bail for me. Look, I I've known Huey since I was a kid in the business. But it's Fletz. 
It must be right. How could Colin have come up with such a crazy solution and not be right? Dennis, I don't know exactly what we've got on you, but I'm going to have to take you in. Well, sure. Sure, take me in and see what'll get you. But just before I go, there, there's one thing I want to take care of. Thank you, good night. Oh, Dennis, don't be a fool. She deserves to die. In all the years I've worked with her, she, yeah. she'll never be even notice me. Come on, you got one murder on your conscience. Don't try to make it two. I wasn't going to let him have her. I did for him. Then I was going to let her burn. <laughs> Okay, Bob. Just, just take it quiet. I don't believe it. I, I just can't believe it. We've always been friends, Huey. Oh, it would have always been the same. Sooner or later, that would have been another Lincoln. I couldn't go on killing people, could I? Don't you see? It'd it have to be her as well. If I was going to get any sleep at night, it'd have to be her as well. That's why I hid the gun in it. Clothes basket. <laughs> you want any more, pal? No, I don't need any more. Only, only there are times I hate my job. This is one of them. Greg. Yes, honey. Do you feel like dancing? Not much. You want to go home? I thought maybe if I stayed here a while, I'd forget myself. Don't feel too bad. At least an innocent person won't be punished now. I guess not. Honey, I'm sorry I'm like this. Like Bonnie says, there are times when you don't like your job. But don't worry. I'm not going to get a conscience about this. Shall we try another bottle of champagne? I don't know about that. My mother always told me to beware of gentlemen who wanted me to drink champagne. My mother always told me the way to a woman's heart was with champagne and diamonds and pearls. Your mother was a very wise woman. She was? But I guess I'll just settle for her son. The only diamonds and pearls we'll ever have will be on time payment. At least you're all mine, Mr. Collins. Don't go away. In just a moment, we'll be back with you. Well, folks... Gator and I hope you enjoyed our adventure, The Pink Lady. Be sure to visit us next time for another puzzle in murder. For whether it's crime and romance. There you'll find Mr. And Mrs. Collins. That gun away, Mr. Harper. Get in the car, do you hear? Well, we'd better do as he says, Jerry. Okay. Not in the back seat, in front. You're going to drive. And if you don't, I'll kill you. I'll kill you both. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Alice Frost and Joseph Curtin. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, Dead Giveaway. The theory that you can judge people by the kind of friends they have is not necessarily true. Take Pam and Jerry North, for example. They have a friend named Clara Kendall. She's not a close friend, true, but she's a friend nevertheless. So what kind of people would you say Pam and Jerry were if you judge them by dowdy, middle-aged Mrs. Kendall as she stands white-faced and trembling, talking on the telephone? But my dear Mrs. Kendall... Don't my dear Mrs. Kendall me, Dr. Cowles. Do you realize that your incompetence has endangered my life? Nonsense, Mrs. Kendall. Your brother... My brother is insane. Mrs. Kendall. Dangerously insane. That's why I placed him in your sanitarium, Dr. Cowles. No, Mrs. Kendall, that is not why... I'm not going to discuss it with you any further, Doctor. Now, are you going to notify the police of Charles' escape, or aren't you? But it's not necessary to notify... Then I will. Mrs. Kendall, will you please... The fool... Philip? In here, Clara. What was that all about on the telephone? It was Dr. Cowles. Cowles? Oh, yes, the sanitarium fellow. What did he want? Not more money, I hope. Philip, Charles has escaped. Oh, no. <laughs> Not again. 
<laughs> you know, I, I don't think Charles likes it there. Philip. I can't say I blame him. The Middle West never appealed to me as a place This to... is no joking matter, Philip. Charles has been gone two days. He could be here in New York by now. Oh, why in the world would he want to come here? He hates me. Well, what do you expect? You have the poor old devil declared mentally irresponsible. You have him committed to an institution. Then you get control of his money. <laughs> Do you think he should love you for that? My goodness, Clara, you can't have everything. Stop it, Philip, stop it. Charles is dangerous, you know that. I know nothing of the kind. The worst thing I know about him is the slobbers when he eats. If he ever gets the chance, he'll kill me. Oh, Clara. He will. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Where's my coat? Are you going out? Yes. Where? Just out. I have an appointment. A business appointment? Oh, don't be bitter, dear. Please, Philip, don't go. Don't leave me here in this apartment alone with Charles. Oh, for heaven's sake, Clara, stop being so silly. Charles isn't within a thousand miles of here. They'll find him just the way they did before, curled up, sound asleep in a haystack not two miles from the sanitarium. Now, look, I'm already late, so... What time will you be home? I'm not sure. Late, probably. Will you be here for dinner? No, I... Philip! Oh, for... <laughs> Let go of me, Clara. Clara, let go. Please, Philip, stay home with me. I'm frightened. Let go. Now, will you please... I know where you're going, Philip. I know. You're going to see her. Her? Who? Vivian. Vivian? Yes, Vivian. Vivian Ames. You didn't think I knew, did you? But I do. I know all about... You don't know anything because there's nothing to know. You're a liar. And you're a silly, suspicious, neurotic old woman. Why, you... Get don't... out! Do you hear me? Get out! Yes, I hear you. Then pack your things. You keep them, Clara. You paid for them. Don't think you're ever going to come crawling back. Oh, don't worry, Clara. You haven't got that much money. <laughs> oh. Hello? Uh, Mrs. Kendall? Yes? Uh, this is Pam North, Mrs. Kendall. I-, I wonder if I could drop by and talk to you for a few minutes. Oh, uh, what about? Uh, about serving with me on the finance committee of the Women's Club. Uh, I'd like to make it around four o'clock, if, if that's convenient for you. Uh, well, I'm sorry, Mrs. North, but I couldn't see you today. I... Mrs. Kendall? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mrs. North, but I thought I heard something... Um, what time did you say you wanted to see me? Well, about four o'clock. Uh, but if you can't... No, no, that... no. Four o'clock will be fine. I'd love to see you. Oh, that's awfully nice of you. Bye. Goodbye. I didn't hear anything. I couldn't have. I... I just didn't... Ima- I did. Someone came in. Philip, he came back to... Philip? Is that you, Philip? No, Clara. It isn't Philip. Charles! Hello, Clara. Charles! Go on, Philip. Then what happened? Oh, nothing, darling. Clara told me to get out. I took her at her word. Here I am. And you didn't admit anything about us? Of course not, Vivian. Well, then, it probably isn't as serious as you think. I wouldn't be surprised if Clara's calling all over town right now, frantically trying to find you to ask you to come home. Well, it won't do her any good if she is. I'm through. Now, Phil. I am, Vivian. I mean it. For the first time in four years, I feel like a young man. You are young, darling. But you don't feel young married to a woman nearly 15 years older than you are. When she pays your way, you don't even feel like a man, young or old. All right, Philip. So you're through. Now what happens? When Clara gets a divorce, we'll be married. On what? I'll get a job. Doing what? Well, you sound like you think I can't get one. Of course you can. You'll have to. But what kind of a job will it be? And how much will it pay? Well, how should I know? Then I'll tell you, Philip. Based on your business experience so far, you could make $50 a week, if you're lucky. 
At that rate, we could just about pay the rent on this apartment. Of course, we couldn't eat, buy any clothes. We wouldn't have to live like this. But I like living like this. And if I can't pay for it any longer, you'll find someone who can. (laughs) I thought you loved me. I did. When you were a man. A man? Yes, Philip. That's what Clara's money made you. A smart, attractive, self-assured man. I don't care what you felt like. That's what you were. Well, now look at you. Without her money, you're nothing but a frightened little boy. I'm sorry, Philip, but there's no use kidding ourselves. No. (laughs) No, I guess not. Now, look, darling. Go back to Clara. You can. She'll take you back. I know she will. And then we can go on. All right, Philip. But you're being a fool. Maybe. Where are you going, Philip? I'll be back. Yeah, that's right, ma'am. The candles are in 318. Oh, thank you. Here we are. Turn to your left, third apartment on your right. Thank you very much. Uh, 314, 316, 318. Well, that's funny. Door's open. She must be in. Where could she be? Uh, anybody home? Mrs. Kendall, uh, are you here? Uh, Mrs. Kendall? <gasps> Mrs. Kendall. Mrs. Kendall! Hello? Jerry. Oh, hello, darling. Oh, Jerry, something horrible has happened. Pam, what's the matter? Call Bill Wagon and get over here as soon as you can. Over where? Clara Kendall's apartment. Uh, what is it? What's happened? Clara Kendall's been murdered. What? She's strangled, I think. Uh, I had an appointment with her, and when I got here, the door was open. I walked in, and I saw her lying on the... Pam. Pam. Jerry. Darling, I just heard a noise. There's someone else in the apartment. There's someone... No! Pam! Sure, I got a pass key to the Kendall apartment, but that don't mean I can let in just any Tom, Dick, and Harry. Can't you get it through your head that Mrs. Kendall's been murdered? That's what you said. And something's happened to my wife. Here's the third floor. Come on. Look, mister, I think we ought to call the police. Oh, but I told you I've already called them. Or my secretary did. They'll be here in a minute. Now, are you going to unlock the Kendall apartment, or do I have to take the... Okay, buddy, okay. Let's go. This is the key. Here's 318. Open it. Okay, okay. Hurry, will you? I'm hurrying. There. Pam! There's the telephone. Pam! Hung up just like it should be. Oh, come on. Let's look in. Hold it. What? Listen. I don't hear it. No. That's Pam. Pam! Sounds like she's in that hall closet. The key's in the door. Pam, darling. Are you all right? Just hold me for a minute, darling. Shall I? Oh. Oh, darling. I've never been so frightened in my life. What happened, sweetheart? I, I was talking to you. I, I heard something. I, I started to turn around. Someone grabbed me from behind and dragged me into this closet and locked me in. Did you see who it was? No. It was a man. That's all I know. Where's Clara Kendall? In, in the living room. Well, let's go in and... Jerry! Bill! Hey, what's all the excitement? Well, didn't Jerry tell you on the phone? I had Miss Brown call while I got over here, Pam. And uh, all Miss Brown said was for me to get to this address right away. There's been a murder, Bill. It's what? Clara Kendall, a friend of mine in the women's club. She's been strangled, Bill. I found her body. It's on the couch in the living room. Well, uh, let's have a look. Right. This way. There she 
is. On the couch over by the whip. Bill. Jerry. She's gone. What are you standing there looking at me like that for? You, you can see for yourself she's gone. We've got to do something. Is uh, this the couch she was on, Pam? Yes. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. You don't think I imagined it, do you? Oh, of course not, dear. Well, you, you could at least say it with a little more conviction, Jerry. Clara Kendall is dead, I tell you. And I didn't imagine it any more than I imagined that someone grabbed me and locked me in that closet. Well, let's have a look around the apartment. The telephone. I'll get it. Hello? Philip? No, this is the police. Police? Who's calling? I, I'm Vivian Ames, a friend of the Kendall's. What are the police doing there? What, what's happened? Well, we're not sure, Miss Ames, but we think Mrs. Kendall's been murdered. What? Oh, you... You're joking. Clara can't be dead. Oh, how do you know? Because she just walked out of my apartment not five minutes ago. That's all I can tell you, Lieutenant. What time did Mrs. Kendall arrive here at your apartment, Miss Ames? About four. That's impossible. Well, it, it might have been a little after four. It's I don't... still impossible. Damn, dear. Well, it is, Jerry. At four o'clock, Kara Kendall was lying no, on No, no, no. Take it easy, Pam. Oh, that must be Philip. Mrs. Kendall's husband? Yes, I, I took the liberty of calling him at his hotel after you said you were coming to talk to me. I hope I didn't do wrong. No, not at all. <laughs> Excuse me. Bill, that woman's lying. Please. Pam. She is, Jerry. She must be. Let me handle this, Pam. Uh, Philip, this is Lieutenant Wigan. Hello, Mr. Kendall. And you know Mr. and Mrs. North. Hello, Bill. Oh, yes, hello, hello Pam. Pam. Jerry? <laughs> now, what's this wild story Vivian gave me on the telephone? Well, Pam says she saw your wife lying in the living room of your apartment strangled to death. Now, Miss Ames says your wife was here in her apartment at about the same time Pam says she saw the body. Well, obviously someone is mistaken. Or lying. Why should I lie about a thing? Uh, just a moment, Miss Ames. Well, I assume you searched the apartment, Lieutenant? Of course. But uh, someone could have carried the body out of the apartment, uh, out the back way, while I was locked in the closet. Locked in the closet? Just after Pam saw Clara's body, some man grabbed her and locked her in the closet. Uh, Mr. Kendall, Miss Ames says she called you at your hotel. Now, uh, does that mean that you and your wife had well, a... Clara and I had a quarrel, that's all. Uh, must have been rather a serious quarrel if you moved out. Oh, but it wasn't, not really. That's... Well, that's why Clara came to see me. To see if I knew where Philip was so she could get in touch with him and make up. And you told her where Mr. Kendall was? Yes. And she said she'd call him right after she kept her date with her brother. What? Huh? Her, her brother? Well, that's where she was going when she left here. Good Lord. What's the matter, Bill? Uh, Clara must be out of her mind. To see your brother? Yes. You don't understand, Lieutenant. Charles Harper's been in a private sanitarium, a, a mental institution in the Midwest. Mm. We just found out today that he'd gone away from the place two days ago. Is he dangerous? Oh, he is to Clara. She's the one who had to have him committed. He hates her for it. Once he threatened to kill her. Then why should she make a date to meet him? I don't know. We've got to do something. Yeah, well, there's only one thing we can do. I'm going to headquarters and get out a bulletin on Harper. Uh, Jerry, you and Pam take Kendall to his apartment. Okay, Bill. And you can give me a description of your brother-in-law on the way downstairs, Kendall. All right, Lieutenant. I'm coming with you, Philip. Oh, come on, Pam. Let's... Hey, Pam, what's the matter? Darling, this is crazy. Everyone's acting as though Clara Kendall was still alive. Oh, sweetheart, isn't it barely possible that you were mistaken? Jerry, do you mean you're taking Vivian Ames' word against mine, even though you've got proof that she's lying? What proof have I got? What proof? For heaven's sake, didn't you hear me when, when I told you she was? <laughs> Up right in front, Jerry. Right. Clara's got to be home. She, she has to be. Please, Philip, you mustn't get your... But if anything happened to her, I'll never... It's her car. What? It's her car. The one right ahead of us. It's Clara's. You sure? Well, it's just like hers. Well, let's have a look. Then maybe Clara's home. Maybe she stayed. And maybe she didn't drive the car today. But she did. She told me she was driving. It is Clara's. That's her license number. Yes, it's Clara's. She's in it. What do you mean, Jerry? Look on the floor of the back seat. 
Uncle Jerry. <gasps> Clara. Clara. No, Phil, don't touch her. She's dead. Close the door. Huh? Now, look, Philip. Go up to your apartment and call Bill Wigan. Pam and I'll wait here. Oh, uh, all right, Jerry. Uh, you'd better go with him, Miss Ames. Oh, yes. All right. Go, go. You see, darling, I was right. Clara was killed up in the apartment and, and then carried down to the car while I was locked in the closet. That still doesn't jibe with Vivian Ames' story about seeing Clara after you found her. I don't care. Vivian Ames... Oh, hold it, hold it, dear. We've uh, got company. Excuse me, but you're in my way. I want to get in my car. <laughs> Your, your car? Yes, mine. Mine. It's my car. Everything she owns is mine. She? This car, her apartment, everything. It all belongs to me. She stole it from me. My money. She stole it. Now, get out of my way. I'm sorry, Mr. Harper. How but do you know my name? Well, we don't, but... You call me Mr. Harper. Why do you call me Mr. Harper if you don't know who I am? Now, look, we... You're from there, aren't you? Uh, there? That place. The sanitarium. That's where you're from. Yeah, she lied to me. She said I didn't have to go back. And I won't. I won't. Oh, take it easy, Mr. Harper. You uh, look don't... out, Jerry. I won't. Put that gun away, Mr. Harper. We're not Be going... Be careful, darling. Get in the car. Now, now wait a minute. Get you... in. Uh, we'd better do as he says, No, Jerry. not in there. In the front seat. You're going to drive. And if you don't, I'll kill you. <laughs> All right, I'll be right over. Thank you, Lieutenant. I mixed you a drink, darling. Here. I don't want it. Now, don't be nervous, darling. I'm not nervous. Oh, but you are. All right. All right, so I'm nervous. Why shouldn't I be? We took a big chance moving Claire's body down to the car, running the risk of Pam North spotting me as the guy who locked her in the closet. We had to give you an alibi for the time Clara was killed, didn't we? I'm not sure we have. Pam knows you're lying about seeing Claire at four o'clock. And Jerry and Lieutenant Wigan probably know it, too. Well, they don't know anything they can prove. And unless, of course, you really didn't see Clara's brother leave the apartment this afternoon. Did you see him, Charles? I told you I did. You told me a lot of things, but... But what? Oh, for heaven's sake, Philip. You know you can trust me, so why don't you be honest? Why don't you admit you killed Clara? Don't you ever say that again, Vivian. You understand? Don't you ever say that again. Jerry, we're going much too fast. Please, slow down. Don't talk to me, darling. You know as well as I do that the man who's really driving this car is in the back seat. And every time I try to slow down... Faster, I'll really... drive faster. You see? Oh, uh, please. Uh, Mr. Harper, we're going too fast already. This road is like a sheet of glass, Harper. Do as I say, go faster. If we ever start to skid, Harper, we'll all... Jerry, be... darling, we're skidding. You're telling me... Oh, stop, Jerry, stop. I can't stop at this height. Jerry, we're going to... Come on, Pam. Pam, darling, are you all right? Uh, I think so. How about you? Yeah, I'm okay. Bill, let me help you out. Oh, easy now. Uh, I'll be all right as soon as I stop shaking. Uh, Hopper. Darling, you may be hurt pretty badly. Look, there's a gasoline station up ahead. Get up there and get some help and then call Bill. Right. I'll stay here with Hopper. <laughs> through, please. Now, come on, folks. Stand back. Stand back. Let us through. Uh, here we are, Bill. Oh, over this way, Miss Ames. Come on, Kendall. Well, you've got yourself quite a crowd here, haven't you? Yeah, everybody loves an accident, Bill. Where's Harper? On his way to the hospital. How badly was he hurt? He'll live. I hope so. At least long enough to pay for Clara's murder. But he says he didn't kill Clara. Did you talk to him? Yes, Bill, while we were waiting for the ambulance. Harper says he saw Clara just after Philip left the apartment at two this afternoon. She told him she wouldn't have him sent back to the sanitarium. And if he came back about five, she'd have a certified check for the money she took from him. He's lying. He killed Clara because he's the only one who could have killed her after she left my apartment. Uh, Miss Ames, if you saw Clara Kendall after four o'clock this afternoon, uh, why did you call her apartment? You mean when I answered the phone, Pam? Yes. 
call to talk to Philip. But you told us before that you knew Philip had quarreled with Clara and, and gone to a hotel. Well, I... So you knew Philip wouldn't be at the apartment, didn't you? Well, Miss Ames? All right, Lieutenant. Uh, Mrs. North wins. I, I didn't see Clara this afternoon. I just said I did to protect Philip. Philip? Well, he went back to the apartment at three o'clock and found Clara dead. He telephoned me. I, I went over. Charles Harper had killed her. We knew that, but Philip didn't have an alibi for the time she was killed. And well, after that stupid fight he and Clara had, had, I was afraid the police would think he was the murderer. So the only thing to do was move Clara's body and try to make it look as though she'd been killed later. So you're the man who grabbed Pam and locked her in the closet, huh, Phil? <laughs> yes. Well, we knew she was going to be there at four, and well, we thought we could get Clara's body out before then, but we couldn't. That's why I had a lie about Clara being my apartment. How did you know I was going to see Clara at four, Miss Ames? Well, Philip told me. Well, then Charles Harper didn't kill Clara. How do you figure that, Pam? Because Clara would have been dead when Philip went back to the apartment at three o'clock. She was? Oh, oh, no, she wasn't. She was alive. Alive enough to tell you that I was going to be there at four. She's the only one who could have told you that. Philip. Oh, you fool. Why didn't you tell me Clara had... Shut up. Shut up. It's all your fault. I didn't want Clara's money. But you did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Come on, Kendall. And you too, Miss Ames. What are you arresting me for? You'll probably be charged with being an accessory after the fact. And that's a mighty polite name for your kind of woman. <laughs> Mr. North speaking. Oh, hello, uh, Jerry. Oh, hello, dear. Darling, on your way home this evening, will you stop in a stationery store and buy me a bookkeeping ledger? A bookkeeping ledger? Oh, what for? I was re-elected chairman of the finance committee of the Women's Club, remember? Oh, yeah. Well, we're starting a new fiscal year, so I'll need a new ledger and a bottle of black ink. Black a... ink, huh? Well, it sounds like you did a good job of managing the club's finances. And the other thing I want... Uh, I wish you could do as well with our personal finances, dear. We've never wound up in the black at the end of the year. Jerry, dear, will you let me tell you the other thing I'll need? Uh, how, how do you account for it, Pam? Why can't you manage our money just as well as you manage your clubs? But I do, darling. Uh, what do you mean? That's what I'm trying to tell you. I'll need a bottle of red ink, too. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, present... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, you say that Danny's alibi for the murder is good. It's airtight and positive, Patsy, but I still don't believe it. But he could be innocent, couldn't he? I doubt it. He started swearing he had an alibi even before he knew what time the murder occurred. Sure, but can you do anything about that? I can, and I'm going to. I've got an earthquake machine that's going to prove that Danny is the murderer. For faster, easier cleaning, I mean really faster and easier, switch to new post-war Old Dutch cleanser made with activated seismatite. Get two packages tomorrow. Then see how much faster new post-war Old Dutch cuts grease. Thrill to the new, almost effortless ease activated seismatite gives new post-war Old Dutch. It cleans, polishes your sink and tub with a new, smooth, gliding action that means less work, less rubbing. New post-war Old Dutch cleans away dirt and stains with new miracle-like speed in hard or soft water. Then, snowy white, it rinses away quickly when cleaning is done. So, try it, won't you, tomorrow. And see if it doesn't clean faster with less rubbing than any other cleanser you've ever used. 
That's new post-war Old Dutch cleanser made with activated seismatite at your dealers now in the same familiar package. Now for the case of the exploded alibi. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. The streets of the big city are strangely silent as a sleek black convertible purrs its way down Seaton Boulevard. Suddenly, what the deuce? Hmm? Oh, are we home already, Nick? No, Patsy, we're not. Then why did you stop? I'm curious to know why the art museum is all lighted up at three o'clock in the morning. Oh, Nick, don't tell me that you're going to stop and investigate just because there are a few lights on. I certainly am. Okay, Nick, you go prowl around all by yourself then. I'm going to stay right here and finish my nap. Come in. Yeah, that's right. I'll wait here till the squad arrives. Yeah, goodbye. Hey, something wrong, officer? Hey, who are you? I'm Nick Carter. I was just passing... Nick Carter? Hey, I've heard of you. Oh, thanks, but what's wrong? Plenty. Sam Hildred, the night watchman here in the museum, has been murdered. Well, how'd you happen to find him? You on duty here? No, no. I'm on the park detail, so this is on my beat. You see, I go off duty at 2 o'clock, and I usually stop in and have a cup of tea with old Sam before going back to the station. And that's what you did tonight? Yeah. Well, Sam wasn't in the office, so I waited for him, thinking maybe he was making his rounds. Did you hear anything while you were waiting? Not a thing. But when he didn't show up after half an hour, I went to look for him. And found him dead? Yeah. Lying on the floor in the Egyptian section with three bullets in him. And you didn't see anybody? Not a soul. The place was deserted. So I called headquarters. Uh Uh-huh. Do you mind if I take a look at the body? No, no, come on. I'll show you where it is. And a pretty sight, is he? Murder is never pretty, Burke. Say, this is rather odd. What's that? You notice how two of the bullets got him right near the heart? Both were apparently fired from a distance. Yeah, neither one of them would have killed him, looks like. Yeah, but this third shot, the one on the abdomen, that was fired from close up. Say, you're right. You can see the powder burns on his vest pocket. Well, look. What? This watch, or what's left of it, was in his vest pocket. Yeah, and would you look at that? The bullet shot the stem clean off of it. And stopped the watch at exactly 2.27. Well, that's one clue we got. The time of the murder. Apparently. Did you look to see whether anything's missing? Oh, I didn't take time. But there's a display case right over here that's pretty badly smashed up. Well, let's have a look. I just happened to see it when I was... It's smashed up, all right. Hey, what's that card say, Mr. Carter? This exhibit is from the collection of Tyler Van de Vries. Hey, ain't he that rich guy you always hearing about? He's not only rich, he's one of the most famous collectors of Egyptian relics in the world. Gee, this stuff must be valuable, huh? Can you tell what's missing? Well, there's a vacant space in the center of the case, but I wouldn't know it was there. Well, we can find that out from the museum, fellas. They'll know. Well, first, let's see whether... Hey, wait. Oh, there's a gun on the floor. Then that must be the murder weapon. Shouldn't be surprised. And judging from the smell of it, I'd say it's been fired very recently. Oh, watch out for fingerprints, Mr. Carter. Yeah, I'm watching. Well, I doubt that there are any identifying marks of any kind on this gun. If there were, it wouldn't have been left here on the floor. Mm-hmm. Three empty shells. There's no hey, doubt that... Hey, this... hey, somebody's coming, Mr. Carter. So I hear. Oh, dear, oh, dear. This is very bad for the museum's reputation. That ain't all it's bad for. It... Hey, is that you, Nick? Nobody else, Matty. Look, how come you always seem to beat me to the scene of any crime? I don't. Not always. Too bad they had to drag you out of bed at this unearthly hour, Matty. Yeah, hey, I'll say. <laughs> oh, Nick, this is Mr. Steiner, curator of the museum. Uh, Nick Carter, Professor. How do you do? Uh, you picked him up and brought him along to see if anything's been stolen. Mr. Carter, this is terrible. Such a thing hasn't happened here in 20 years. Is anything missing? Well, suppose you tell us that. Oh, dear me, I'll never hear the end of this. Oh, by the way, your suppose... watchman is over Heavens, here if you care to the see The Van de Vries case has been broken open. Well, the most valuable collection in our whole... Sergeant, the Ankara Tara Scarab is gone. The, it's gone. The what is gone? The Ankara Tara Scarab. One of Mr. Van Vries' most priceless pieces. One of the few remaining jewels of the Fifth Dynasty of Egypt, worn by the Princess Amun-Ra herself. 
Obviously a collector's item, then? Oh, definitely. Only a collector would be interested. Oh, how can I ever explain this to Mr. Vandebrees? Well, under hey, the... Hey, so- Sarge, what's all them things in the next room? That don't look like museum stuff to me. It isn't. The City College of Science is remodeling their engineering building, and they've some of their stuff here stored in the next room temporarily. Oh, I, I do hope nothing else is missing. I'll never be able to hold up my head again. Here's my whole life for... Sarge, you want I should wait? No, Burke, you go ahead. My men will be here oh, in the... Uh, Sergeant. Well, what do you got here? Oh, so you finally got here, did you, Williams? What do you mean, finally? You know what I mean. Now, look, you and McGlone get busy. Go over everything, get fingerprints, anything you can find. And have the boys sure, get... Sure, sure. Have the boys get plenty of pictures. Eh? Yeah, now, wait a minute. Doc Bradley, come with you? Yes, Sergeant, I'm here. Oh. I'm here. Show me oh. the body and let me get back to bed. Yeah, it's right over there, Doc. See what you can make okay, out of it. Okay, okay. He was shot three times, Doc. Yes, so I see. Yeah. Hmm. What is it, Doc? Any one of those bullets could have been fatal. How long do you think he's been dead? Oh, between two or three hours, can't say for sure. Well, what about those three wounds? Are they all alike? Uh, no, Carter, they're not. I'll have to probe for the two bullets in his chest, but the third one's right near the surface. It's funny. It was fired close to the body, but it didn't go very deep. That's because his watch stopped it. His watch? I don't see any watch. I have it here. Took it out of his pocket to examine it. Huh? Well, well, will you look at that? The stem was shot clean off. And the watch was stopped at 227, which may indicate... Dick, what in the world are you... Uh Uh-oh. Hiya, Patsy. Who's that on the floor? The night watchman shot by a burglar. So you were right, Nick. There was trouble here. Yes, Patsy, there was. Theft and murder. Mm. Well, I guess I've got all I can get here for now. Well, let's go then. It's not getting any earlier. Very sage observation, my comely and efficient young secretary. I shall act on it at once. Good night, Maddie. See you in the morning. Why, good morning, Patsy. <sighs> Didn't expect you for hours yet. Well, I was going to sleep late, but I couldn't. I was much too curious to find out about the murder. Uh-huh. The true professional instinct, Patsy. What are you doing now, Nick? Oh, I've been going through our files, trying to pick out all the crooks who would be interested in stealing that precious scarab. Would that be a special kind of a crook, Nick? It would. Why? Because in spite of the scarab's value, there's a limited demand for such things. The thief would have to know where to sell it after he stole it. Oh. And there are very few crooks who would know that. How many such crooks have you found? Only three. Who are they? Uh, Danny Merson, Jim Peterson, and Jack Grogan. Hmm. I don't seem to recognize any of those names, Nick. No, we've never had any active connection with any of them. Hmm. Well, let's see. Uh, Danny Merson stole a rare old vase from Senator Johnson's home three years ago and is now in state's prison. Which that's him now. Wh- who's next? Jim Peterson. Let's see, he's doing time in Nevada for forgery and counterfeiting. His sentence has several years to run yet. And he couldn't have done it. Which leaves Jack Grogan. Wanted on a burglary charge by the Montana police. Disappeared six months ago, believed to be dead. And none of them could have done it. Uh, suppose you call Matty. See whether he knows anything about any of these men. Of course, Nick. <laughs> but haven't you any other clues? This seems like guesswork. Eliminating suspects is never guesswork, Patsy. Part of the routine work that solves many a case. Homicide. Sergeant Matheson. This is Patsy, Sergeant. Oh, top of the morning to you, Patsy. Sergeant, we've got three suspects. Yeah? Danny Mearson, Jim Peterson, and Jack Grogan. A fine collection of crooks. Would your record show where any of these men are now? Well, Peterson's still in jail as far as I know. But Danny Mearson was let out on parole three days ago. Nick, he says Mearson's out on parole. Oh, that's interesting. How about Grogan? How about Grogan, Sergeant? Our records show he's presumed to be dead. Yeah? Well, he ain't. He's been seen around town the last couple of days. Does Nick think he did it? Oh, Nick isn't talking yet. Not for publication. Uh Ah, well, tell him to hurry up. If he don't, I'll go ahead and solve the case by myself. Oh, do you have any good clues, Sergeant? Well, I... uh, uh, Why, of course I do. Well, good for you. Let Nick know when you catch the murderer, will you? Why, you... Goodbye, Sergeant. (laughs) What did he say about Grogan? Oh, that he's been seen around town in the last few days. Well, now, so Mearson is free and Grogan's back in circulation again. Which gives you two suspects. (sighs) Not so good. Well, Mearson's a better suspect than Grogan. He'd be needing money if I know him. But you can't have him picked up without something to go on. True enough. But I can call on him and see what he has to say. If you can find him. I think I can. He always used to stay at the old Santley house. I shouldn't be surprised if he were staying there right now. But do you think he'd go back to an old address after committing a crime like this? From what I know of Danny, he'd be so sure he left no clues that he wouldn't even try to hide. 
Suppose you tell Matty to have his men pick up Grogan and to meet me at the Santley house in half an hour with a search warrant. I'll bet we get results. Ah, uh, Nick, I give up. There ain't a thing in this room that shows that Danny Mearson ain't been strictly on the up and up since he got out. I'm afraid I have to agree with you, Matty. Uh. Uh-oh, that, that must be Danny coming back. Nonsense, he wouldn't knock on his own door. Quiet. Yeah. Well, well, if it ain't Jack Grogan. Who's that? This is darn nice of you, Grogan. Yeah. What's nice about it? Well, I had the boys out looking for you, and they couldn't find you, so now you find us. What you looking for me for? Just wanted to ask you a few questions. Questions? Mm-hmm. About what? Uh, suppose we go into that when we get down to headquarters, okay? You ain't taking me to no headquarters cover. Hey, wait, wait a minute. Hey, we don't be a fool, Grogan. You can't cover us both with that gun. Ah, uh, well, if either of you moves before I say so, you'll see if I can cover you both. Grogan, look at me a minute. Yeah? What can your mind cover? I just want to warn you. What's the matter? I told you. Oh, it was Jack Grogan who showed up at Danny Merrison's room in the old Santley house. We'll see what this means to Nick and Matty in just a moment. Try it. New post-war old Dutch cleanser made with activated seismatite. Compare it. See if it doesn't clean in less time with less rubbing than any other cleanser you've ever used. For only new post-war old Dutch brings you activated seismatite. And that means new smooth action, new ease, new snow white appearance. It's the first major cleanser improvement since the introduction of seismatite. So try new post-war Old Dutch on your sink, tub, pots, and pans. And see for yourself if it doesn't clean faster, easier than any other cleanser you've ever used. New post-war Old Dutch cleanser carries the good housekeeping seal of approval and is at your dealer's now in the same familiar package. Now, back to the case of the exploded alibi. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. When Sergeant Matheson invited Jack Grogan to go down to headquarters and talk things over, Jack objected strenuously. Ah. Nice work, Nick. That did it. Never thought he'd be fool enough to think he could keep the two of us covered. Not when we were on opposite sides of the room. Come on, Grogan, get up, get up. What you picking on me for, copper? You just pulled a gun on an officer of the law. Put your hands up. Okay, okay. Grogan, what are you doing here, anyway? Well, Danny and me, we... Well, he owes me some money. So you dropped in to collect? When he wasn't here. Yeah. I thought maybe... Look, uh, you and Mearson wouldn't have been working together on that job last night, would you? What job? Well, we'll talk about that down at headquarters. Are you coming, Nick? Oh, uh, no, no. I'm not through here yet, Matty. Suppose you turn Grogan over to the coppers waiting downstairs and then come back here, will you? Okay, Nick. Come on, Grogan. Come on. Take it. Now, look, copper. I tell you I don't mind come about here. Now, let me see. If Grogan and Mearson were working together, maybe Grogan came back here to double-cross Mearson. And if he did that, it may mean something's hidden here after all. What's... Uh-oh. Hey, what the... Well, hello, Danny. Nick Carter. Hey, what are you doing in my room? Why, just looking around. Looking around for what? I think you know. Don't try to be cute, Carter. You got a search warrant? Sure, we got a search warrant. You want to see it? Well, so you're in this, too. You're darn right I am. What are you to expect to find here? Something that disappeared from the museum last night. Well, you won't find it here. You seem to be right this time, Danny. We've looked and we haven't found it. Where'd you hide it? Seeing I don't know what you mean, I can't answer that. You mean you won't? Well, what's the matter, Sergeant? You look unhappy. I am, I am. I got a fierce headache. Didn't get enough sleep last night. Well, there's some aspirin in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom. Help yourself. Hey, I'll do that. Do you got a glass? I can't take the stuff in that water. Oh, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Sergeant, but... Well, I broke the only glass I had this morning. You broke the only glass, Danny. What's that on the shelf behind you? On the shelf? Oh, yes, I, I, I forgot that one. Here you are, Sergeant. Oh, thanks. I... Oh, I'm sorry, Sergeant. It slipped out of my hand. Okay, okay, I'll take it plain. Danny, you didn't drop that glass accidentally. 
Hey, what are you getting at, Nick? For some reason, Danny doesn't want you to have a drink of water, Matty. What? Maybe he doesn't want to run the water in the basin. Look okay, here, you dope. I just dropped Turn on about... the water, Matty. See what happens. You, you can't. We can't do what? I... I mean, here, I'll do it for you. That faucet is kind of tricky. Oh, yeah? You see, you have to... Get the car, 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 you don't move, Sergeant. Quick. I got my gun right in the middle of your back. If you make a move, I... Okay, okay. I ain't moving. And if your friend tries anything fancy, you get it. I understand, Carter? Yeah. yeah, I understand. What's your proposition, Danny? Uh, just take the thing you've been looking for and get out of here without any interference. Otherwise, you... Well, that seems fair enough. What do you say, Mary? I say you're crazy, Nick. You gonna let this... Shut window... up, Mary. Yeah, but I... You might say the wrong thing and make Danny sore. Look, what? you too. I got a gun in the sergeant's back and my arm around his neck. If either one of you guys try anything, we won't. You'll... We'll... Nick! Nick, I don't get it. No, Matty, be quiet. Going Clam up, copper. I can shoot you, strangle you, and if anybody makes a break, I'll... Matty, Matty, don't talk. All right, but... Just nod your head, yes or no. Oh. Now, what do you say? Should we make a deal? Oh, good boy, Matty, you got it. Get his gun. Oh, I'll get him. Hey, hey my arm. My golly, you breaking my arm. I won't break it, not if you hold still. Okay. I knew when I'm licked. Uh, Nick, <laughs> oh, you're a cute one. You know, I learned that trick of banging my head against the nose of a guy holding me from behind. But I forgot it till you reminded hey. me. Give me a towel, my, my nose is bleeding. Keep him covered, Matty. Yeah? I want to get the scarab. You mean it's really here? Say it is, unless I miss my guess. We got it, Nick? Not yet, but I'll bet that it's down. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, where? Here in the wash basin drain. Oh, it's a beauty. Are you kidding you, you mean that's what we've been looking for? That beetle thing? That's it, Matty. This is the scarab of Princess Amun Ra. Well, I'll be doggone. Well, Danny, there was a pretty smart trick suspending this thing in the drain of the wash basin by a thread. So that's why he didn't want us to run the water. Of course. If we did, the thread might break. Besides, the scarab just about filled the drain, and the water wouldn't have run off as fast as it should. Uh-huh. Well, Danny, are you ready to confess? Confess what? That you stole that scarab and knocked off the museum watchman. No. All you got on me is having stolen goods in my possession. As for the watchman, I got an alibi. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Suppose we all go down to headquarters so you can tell us about that alibi of yours. <laughs> Nick, do you really think you can prove Danny killed that watchman? Oh, that depends on how good his alibi is, Patsy. Yeah, but an alibi can be faked, can't it? It can. And I'm positive Danny's is. Excuse me. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Nick there, Patsy? Oh, yes, Sergeant. Here, Nick, it's Sergeant Matheson. Oh, thanks. Yeah, Matty, what have you found out? Look, that Danny's alibi is airtight, Nick. We can't beat it. Are you sure of that? I'm positive. The watchman was killed at 227. Between 210 and 235, Danny was in an all-night drugstore three miles from the museum. Are his alibi witnesses good? Well, the drugstore click remembers him, but what's worse, the cop on the beat stopped in there at 220 and talked to him. He knows Danny and swears to the time. Matty, that just isn't possible. Oh, maybe not, but look, Nick, we got to prove we're right before we can take him before the grand jury. Okay, okay. I'll find some way. Well, I hope you can, Nick, but make it fast. I'll try. So long. What'd he say, Nick? Danny's alibi is airtight. But I still don't believe it. Well, of course he could be innocent. Why are you so sure he did it, Nick? Because he started swearing he had an alibi before he even knew what time the murder occurred. And another thing. The watchman was shot twice from a distance, and once close up. It was a close-up shot that stopped that watch. At exactly 227. So what? Look, Patsy, the first two shots killed the watchman. Oh, I understand that, Nick. Okay, so suppose the killer took the watch out of the dead man's pocket, set it ahead to 227, then put it back in his pocket. And then in order to stop the watch, and also to make it look as though it stopped at the exact time of the murder, he shot the watchman a third time from close up. Well, you really think that's what happened? I'm sure of it. I've got to find some way to prove it. Oh, I'll say. No jury would believe that story without proof. No. Oh. Patsy, 
Let's go back to the museum. Okay. Maybe we overlook something that will give us the facts we need. Is there anything else you'd like to see, Mr. Carter? No, nothing I can think of, Mr. Steiner. But you still believe this Mason is guilty? I'd stake my reputation on it. But belief and proof are two very different things. Couldn't you try a lie detector on him? Yes, we could. But unfortunately, some juries still believe that a lie detector is only a makeshift and not real evidence. A clever lawyer can sometimes talk his client out of the results of a lie detector test. Hmm, I suppose they think a wiggly line running across a chart doesn't really mean anything definite. Ridiculous. Any scientist knows better than that. And take the seismograph, for example. I look at it every morning. That wiggly line, you seismograph. call it... Do you have a seismograph here in the museum? Why, yes. It's part of the apparatus the City College of Science stored in the next room. Of course, I remember now that you mentioned something. Have they had it running? Why, yes, they have. Then I want to see it, quick. But why, Nick? Let's see, that seismograph is going to prove that Danny Mearson's guilty of murder. <laughs> Well, that's a new wrinkle. A seismograph used as proof in a murder case. Just how Nick plans to use this information, we'll find out in just a moment. It's activated, ladies. The new post-war old Dutch cleanser is made with activated seismatite. And that means new speed, new ease in cleaning. So compare. See for yourself. On your pots and pans, notice how much faster new post-war old Dutch cuts grease thanks to activated seismatite found only in new post-war Old Dutch, it cleans, polishes with a new, smooth, gliding action that means less work, less rubbing. Then thrill to the ease with which new post-war Old Dutch removes dirt and stains from your sink or tub with new miracle-like speed and hard or soft water. And you'll find that new post-war Old Dutch, now snowy white, rinses away quickly when cleaning is done. Truly, here's the first major cleanser improvement since the introduction of seismatite. New post-war old Dutch cleanser made with activated seismatite. At your dealers now, in the same familiar package. Try it tomorrow. Now for the conclusion of the case of the exploded alibi. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. The scene is Sergeant Matheson's office at police headquarters. The sergeant and Nick are discussing Danny Mearson's case with Danny and his lawyer. Mr. Carter, I demand to know why my client, Mr. Mearson, is being treated like this. He's admitted to be a receiver of stolen goods, but he's guilty of nothing else. Mr. Amberley, you claim that Danny couldn't have stolen the scarab and killed the watchman because at the time the murder and theft were committed, he was at a drugstore some three miles from the museum. That's absolutely correct. Mr. Amberley, the watchman was apparently killed at 2.27, if we can judge by the time his watch stopped. But actually, he was killed exactly one hour and 12 minutes before the time shown on the watch. Why, that's impossible. The watchman's timepiece... The watchman's timepiece was set ahead by Merson to establish an alibi for himself, and I have positive proof of that. That's a lie. It certainly is. It's absolutely ridiculous. Is it? Well, the evidence I'm talking about is unemotional, truthful, and positive. It's a seismographic chart. Now, what's that? Here, Nick. What in the name of the saints is a size... size uh... A seismographic chart? Yeah, what you said. I'll tell you, Matty. Yeah? In the room next to the Egyptian collection in the museum, there's an instrument used to detect earthquake tremors. It's oh. called a seismograph. Uh-huh. And it's so sensitive, it'll record the slightest disturbance. My dear Mr. Carter, I can't You will in a minute, Mr. Amberley. I have here the chart that was made by the seismograph last night. Let me show you what well, it says. This is hardly the usual thing. Neither was murder. Now, look. At 12.45, there was a slight tremor. A trembling of the earth, probably due to some very distant earthquake. Well, what do you know? Go on. At 1.05, five minutes past one, there were two sharp eruptions in the immediate vicinity. I can't say exactly what caused them, but they're probably due to blasting in the neighborhood. Or to gunshots in the immediate vicinity. There was no blasting done last night. Get to the point, Mr. Carter. My time is valuable. So is human life, Emily. Now, notice. The chart shows that at 1.17, 12 minutes later, there was another sharp report, just like the previous ones. But from then on, until 15 minutes before 6, the line made by the seismograph shows nothing whatever out of the ordinary. Then there were no shots fired in the museum between 1.17 
and 5.45 yesterday morning. That's right, Matty. And that means that the watchman was shot and killed at five minutes past one. The killer then took the watch out of the dead man's pocket and set it ahead to 2.27 and then shot him again at 1.17. And that gave him plenty of time to get to the drugstore and set up an alibi. But see here, that doesn't mean... Don't that... waste your breath, Amberly. It happened just the way they said. And I'd have got away with it if it wasn't for that, that size... Let's call it a truth machine, Danny. Because that's what it really is. It tells the truth. And in this case, makes others tell the truth, too. Doggone it, Nick. That's sure a great machine. Yes, sir, a great machine. Friends, this is Nick Carter again. I want to state a couple of facts. One is that the tuberculosis death rate has fallen 80% since 1904. The other is that even so... Tuberculosis still kills one American every ten minutes. And with these facts in mind, let me ask you all to buy all the Christmas seals you can. I'm positive we all will, Nick. Now, uh, how about a couple of hints about the adventure that new post-war old Dutch cleanser is bringing us next week? Is it as exciting as usual? Well, Bob, there's nothing usual about next week's case. In fact, in my book, it's practically unique. It's a story of an old and valuable manuscript written by a great American man of letters. A manuscript that was the cause of three cold-blooded murders. And for a while, we thought it was going to be the cause of two more, meaning our own. Well, I see why you say it's unique. Uh, what do you call it, Nick? I call it The Case of the Priceless Prose. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cudahy Packing Company... Makers of new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Today's script was written by Jock McGregor. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Johnny Dollar. Al Turner, Johnny, over here at New Britain Mutual. Al, it's been a long time. Yeah, I know. What can I do for you? Plenty, I hope. Uh, how, uh, how old are you, Johnny? Well, next birthday I'll be 30. Huh? 30 what? Now, why? Well, it really doesn't make too much difference. You see, Johnny, I think it's time you entered a home for the age. I what? And if you think I'm kidding, I'm not. Okay, Al, what's the gag? I told you, I want you over at the Mackley Rest Home. Where's that? Frog Mountain, New York. Where's that? Down along the Hudson River above Poughkeepsie near Kingston. But, uh, just to pay him a little visit, not to stay. That's right. What goes down there? Sudden death, Johnny. Deaths. Oh? Four of them in a row, three of them insured by us. Well, after all, if they're old folks... That's the beneficiary of all that insurance. Yeah? The sole beneficiary of all the insurance on them just happens to be the Mackley Rest Home. Oh. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll, uh, kind of drop in on them. <laughs> CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Britain Mutual Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Paradise Lost matter. 
I decided my own car would be handy to have along. As usual, the gauge said nearly empty. So, expense account item one is five twenty for a tank full of gas. I drove west on 44, then cut across to Rhinebeck, then Rhinecliff, where I took the ferry over the Hudson to the town of Kingston, New York. On Route 28, I passed through Stony Hollow, and a few miles further on, I found a sign indicating Frog Mountain. It was on a side road to the left. At one side of it overlooked the famous Ashokan Reservoir, and I, uh, well, some pretty big fish have come out of that water. Thinking about it, I almost drove on past what was obviously a rest home for the agent, in among the trees. There was a large, very old frame house set on the side of the mountain, and sitting about on the front lawn, reading, chatting, playing cards, or just enjoying the afternoon sun were the happy-looking customers. As I stopped the car, a pleasant-looking middle-aged man walked over to me, smiled, and said, How do you do, young man? How do you do? Oh, how do you do? My name is Johnny Dollar. A pleasure to meet you, Mr. Dollar. I'm Justin Pe- uh, Perry. You have some elderly relative, perhaps, very dear to you, for whom you'd like to provide a quiet, comfortable retirement home. Well, uh, no. Oh, Justin Perry, I'm the owner of Paradise. Paradise? A really appropriate name for our lovely place, don't you agree? Well, uh, Just yeah. look at the happy faces of our guests and you can... But then you say you don't wish to send someone to us. Well, now, wait. Uh, this isn't the Mackley Rest Home? Oh, no, no, Mr. Dollar. This is Paradise. The Mackley Place is further up the road. Oh, 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 I see, I see. Well, thanks very much. Uh, Dollar, did you say... Oh, yes, that's right. Edward? Edward? Yes, Dad? Would you like to show Mr. Dollar the way to the Mackley Place? Sure, Dad. Anything you say. Then go ahead. Well, if it's just up the road. About a mile or so. Oh, then I'm sure I'll be able to find it all right. Whatever you say, Mr. Dollar. Sure. Thanks a lot. A very nice spot. And some of the folks on the lawn waved cheerily as they drove on back up the road toward the mountain. I wondered if the Mackley place would be the same. It wasn't. At least, well, it was brand new. A modern ranch type of thing built on a single level. A lot of native stone and glass. All very pretty and smart and practical, but lacking in warmth. The guests, the residents, though well-dressed and apparently wealthy, were sitting by themselves for the most part. Reading or just, just sitting. No one seemed to notice me as I parked my car, then walked in through the door at one side, marked off. Yes. Something I can do for you? Mr. Mackley? Yes, that's right. Peter Mackley. And, uh, who are you? My name is Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, yes. The insurance investigator. How are you? I am. Uh, Al Turner at the insurance company said you'd be coming along. Uh, would you sit down? Oh, he did? Yes. Just to be honest about it, I, I don't see why, though. You don't, huh? Well, now, what do you mean by that, Mr. Dollar? Well, it's quite a layout you have here, Mr. Mackley. Must have set you back a lot of money. Well, that's no secret. But I suppose it's all bought and paid for. Oh, no, far from it, Mr. Dollar. It'll be some years before we get our heads above water. Even with the help of two or three nice, fat insurance legacies? Now, look here, Dollar. I... Well... Uh-huh. If you're referring to the fact that some people happen to die and just happen to leave some insurance to us... Just happen to, huh? Now, what's that mean? Just exactly what you think it does, Mackley. Are you trying to imply that I or anybody if else... If the shoe fits where... Uh, if you're saying that you suspect we might have murdered those old Did people... Did I say that? Well, that's what you meant, isn't it? And you've no right coming here accusing me of something like that. Now, look, you... And what's more, you're not the police and you have no authority around here. So just go on, get out of here. Sorry. But I'm not leaving this place until I find out something more about how those people died. Dollar, you're going to be sorry for this. Is that a threat? You take it any way you like. Well, it may sound a bit corny, Mackley. Now just get out of Just remember that anything you say now might be used against you. Why, you arrogant soul. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Paradise Lost Matter. <laughs> All right, Mr. Dollar, I, I freely admit it was too bad that four of the old people died here within a month and a half. It's most pathetic, most unexpected. What's more important to me is that it gives our place a black eye. Unexpected by whom, Mr. Mackley? By everyone, including the doctor who comes up here from Kingston to attend them and who is always on call in case of emergency. Ah, uh, who is this doctor? He's Dr. Nathan Way. He's from over in Kingston. Just how did these four people die? Well, according to their death certificates, the first one was an accident. 
Old Mr. Bartley slipped and fell off the corner of the porch one night while he was walking in his sleep. Slipped? I was pushed. Now, look here, Dollar. Okay, not... okay. What about the other three? They were natural causes. That is, they... Well, their hearts gave out. According to the death certificates. That's right. So what really happened? Poison, perhaps? Something like that? Dollar. Dollar, you don't know what you're talking about. We'll see, Mr. McElroy. Now, where'll I find this Dr. Way? Uh, someone mentioned my name? Oh, hello, Doctor. Hello, Peter. Doctor, this is Johnny Dollar. He's oh. an investigator from the insurance company. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Dollar? Doctor. Dollar seems to have the absurd, the fantastic idea that the recent deaths here were deliberate. What? Yes. What? Yes, in order that we could benefit from the insurance, those, those fine old people were kind enough to leave us. Well, now, that is rather absurd, Mr. Dollar. Is it, Doctor? This place is up to its neck in debt. I it? told you that, Dollar. But isn't that to be expected when you consider the cost of building a fine new establishment like this? All right. After all, it's less than two years old. Now, what did you do before this, Mackley? In some business where you could go around making contacts that would assure you plenty of wealthy, gullible customers for this racket? Dollar. Well? Dollar. My wife and I have been in this business of taking care of old people ever since my parents died. That's over 15 years ago. Yeah, where? In Pennsylvania. I can check on that, you know. I know that, I know that. Why did you pack up and come here to New York? Tell him, Peter. Well, well, for one thing, the air, the climate is much better here than it was in the coal region. Yes. And? Tell him, Peter. Well, we had to close down over there. Why? Because our building, our... Our facilities were considered substandard, according to some new regulations. And suddenly, a lot of your patients started dying off? No! No, now that nothing of the sort. Peter is telling you the truth, Mr. Dollar. You investigated, Dr. Way? Well, no, not exactly. I see. But I have talked with many of these fine old people who moved from there to here, and they are intelligent, wealthy people. Wealthy? Yes. Yeah, I'll bet they are. Dollar, will you listen to me? And it was so easy to talk a lot of them into buying a hunk of insurance and making this place the beneficiary. Now, that's not true. Isn't it? Then how come three of the four no, people who no, suddenly died around here? No, it isn't true, Mr. Dollar. It was I who suggested to them, unknown to Peter that they leave something to this rest home. You? And they thanked me and wondered why they hadn't thought of it before. How many of your people are planning to leave you money, Mackley? I don't know, Dollar. I don't know if any of them are. And what's more, I don't care. My wife and I knew the financial responsibility we were taking on in the beginning. And unless we lose our reputation, our clientele, through more of these unfortunate deaths... Oh, sure, they're bad for business, aren't they? Yes, yes, they exactly, are. Exactly, Mr. Dollar. But as long as the insurance money keeps... Dollar, running, will you stop it? No. Now, Dr. Way. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I'm afraid these accusations... Tell yours. me this, Doctor. You issued the death certificates, huh? I did, for all of you them. You made autopsies on them all, huh? Well, good heavens, no. Why not? Uh, the accident, in case of Mr. Bartley, was all too obviously an accident. Was it? As for the others, well, after all, they were... Well, along in years. Oh, so you gave him a quick once-over, scribble down natural causes, and let it go at that. And that's why I want those bodies exhumed and autopsies performed. Mr. Todd. First, though, I'm checking up on you. Well, by all means, do. I want you to. Oh, I will. Meantime, <laughs> if you like, I'll drive back to Kingston and arrange for the bodies to be made available. Yeah, you do that. <laughs> I followed the doctor into Kingston, parked my stuff at a hotel, and dropped in at police headquarters where I talked with Lieutenant Art Connolly. A dollar, I'm glad you're looking into this. Frog Mountain's a bit out of our jurisdiction, officially, that is. But I've wondered about those deaths myself. Well, how much do you know about Peter Mackley, Lieutenant? Well, I've thought a lot of that man ever since he came to these parts. Oh? Yeah, he's not the kind you might expect to be running an old folks' home, but... Well, he's okay. I see. How well do you know Dr. Way? Well, one of the finest people we have here in Kingston. And without a doubt, the best man to make those autopsies you want. He's connected with the department? Yeah. Well, if you ask me, he'll get you results so fast it'll... Oh, now, wait a minute, Dollar. You're not thinking that Dr. Way... Exactly. 
Mackley, huh? And I'll tell you this about Pete Mackley, Dollar. It took a lot of guts for him to go to that place of his. What do you mean by that? I mean against some of the folks around town who were partial to Justin Perry, who runs the Paradise Home, who, who were afraid it might put him out of business. Mackley's place being so much nicer and modern and all. That still doesn't mean anything, Lieutenant. And you know, those old folks like things new and modern. And if Perry doesn't improve that place of his... Oh, uh, yeah? Oh, hello, Doc. Lieutenant, Mr. Dollar, I'll be able to make those autopsies tonight. When I'm finished, I'll uh, call you at your hotel. Sure, Doctor. You do that. I talked further with the Lieutenant, but I'm afraid I didn't get much help from him. He was convinced, a little too convinced, that Peter Mackley was all right. And he spent all his time defending him. A late dinner at the hotel was item two, 425. Item three was 35 cents for a magazine. I went up to my room, sprawled out in a big overstuffed chair, put my feet on the windowsill, and promptly went to sleep. Yeah, the combination of a big dinner and a quiet night had really got to me. Too much for my own good. He must have used a calling card to slip the lock on the door, because the first thing I remember was hearing the door close. And when the light switch went off... Huh? Who's that? What's the idea of turning off the... Oh, no, you... And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Oh. Easy now. Easy. Another piece of tape to hold this bandage on your head. You'll be... Doctor. Yeah. There you are. That's right. away. Now... Don't tell me you fell asleep and fell out of your chair and did this. Oh, no, no. Listen, oh, listen. and here, here. Perhaps a drop of this uh, medicinal brandy? No, no. no. Oh, yeah. Nice. Hey. Hey, look, it's morning. Yes, and I've done the autopsies. Oh, I knocked on your door and didn't get any answer. Doc, listen. But it wasn't locked, so I came on in and, uh, what happened? Oh, somebody sneaked in and slugged me. Who? Are you kidding? But come on, what about the autopsy? Yes, yes. Well, no question about it. Uh, Mr. Bartley's death was an accident. But the others? Poison. A poison that made it look like heart failure. Okay, then. Hello. Hello. Your order, please? Lieutenant Art Conley at police headquarters. I'll call you right back, sir. Emergency operator. This is a... Okay, okay. Hey, now, Mr. Dollar. The doctor, somebody at Mackley's rest home gave them poison, so that's it. But the only medicines those people get are the ones that I myself prescribe. And I have never prescribed even the most minute dose of sodium therapy. Lieutenant Johnny Dollar. Well, I'm glad you called, Dollar. Doc told me the result of his autopsy is on his way over to see you. Then you know. But I still refuse to believe that Peter Mackley... No. Is... Then why did he come here and try to put me out of the picture? He... What? I don't know what scared him off before he could finish the job, but I'm thankful something did. When? Last night I was asleep. Oh, well, then you're wrong. It wasn't Peter Mackley. No. Knowing that sometimes you have to suspect even your best friend on a case like this, I had Mackley here at headquarters all night. So, Dollar... Doctor... My prescriptions? Yes. I've been thinking about that. They're always made up at Pearson's Drugstore by Mrs. Pearson herself. Then she is going to have some visitors. What? Come along, Doc. <laughs> Well, Doctor, it's so early in the morning. Mrs. Pearson, this is Johnny Dollar, special investigator. Oh, how exciting. Mrs. Pearson, I want to know if you stock a drug called sodium therab... What do you call it, Doctor? I didn't, but it's sodium therabmalicillate. Oh. But I doubt very much... Yes, I do. You do? Old Dr. Morley, the veterinarian, used it now and then to take care of hopeless animal cases. And you have it here now? Yes, one of these back shelves. I have a single bottle that I... Hey, wait. Wait a minute. Yes? On that motorcycle out there with a the sidecar. 
He pulled away from in back of this place. Yes. He helps in the store and makes all the deliveries for me. And he must have seen us in here. Must have seen me. What? He makes all the deliveries, including prescriptions for the Mackley Rest Home? That's right. Doc. He's taking some of Dr. Way's prescriptions up there now. Good. No, no, listen. Now, let me find that bottle of... Doc, doctor, listen. That may be the answer. That he's the delivery boy for Mrs. Pearson? Yes. Well, I'm afraid I don't... Dr. Way? Look here. No, no, Doc, we've got to go after that kid. Here's the bottle, Doctor. Uh, I don't understand. Doc, will you listen to me? So many of them are missing. Unless we can... What was that, Mrs. Pearson? Well, a lot of these sodium theramalicylate tablets are missing. Then that's the answer, Doc. He's the answer. Come on. Have you ever tried to chase a motorcycle up a tortuous, treacherous mountain road? Well, I did. We did. And the sidecar was the only thing that kept him from running away from us. And the fact that he kept looking back, knowing we were chasing him. Oh, you killed him, sir. Looking back at us. That was his big mistake. You'll never make that turn. That was young Edward Perry's fatal mistake. Ed. Edward. He's still alive, Doc. Yeah. Here, I'll see what I can do for him. Now, now, Ed. Now, let's fix it easy. Now, fix it easy, sir. No. No use, Doc. <coughs> well, we can try now. We can try. But but why, Ed? I saw you there in the store. I saw a dollar there. All right, just take it easy. Yeah. No, you got wise that I was a... I was putting that... Poison and Doc's prescription. Give him something to knock him out, Doctor. Uh, I'm afraid there's no use. I'm afraid. Uh, but it was Dad who. Justin Perry. Dad made me. Said if enough. Enough people at Mackley's died off, they'd. Uh, now, he's a easy lad. Easy. They'd leave Mackley's. Come to Dad's place. Eddie, why? To the paradise. We'd put. We'd put. Mackley out of business. Barry's arm, Dollar. Right, Doc. Uh, put, put Mackley out of... Uh, so, so long, Doc. Doctor, it's all over. I don't know what the courts will do. Ask me, Justin Perry murdered his son as much as though he'd done it with his own two... Uh, I don't know. Expense account total, call it 50 bucks. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Harry Bartell, Edgar Barrier, Sam Edwards, Stacey Harris, Junius Matthews, and Forrest Lewis. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is John Wall speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.